Hello guys, welcome to my channel, let's give a big shout out to the author of this book, his name will be written in the description, and please do your best to support him. Without further ado, let's start the audiobook. Chapter 101, Confronting Pink Lotus Yua had a million things on her mind that she wanted to tell Rudra, she had rehearsed the script in her mind a thousand times as to how to tell him in the best way possible, painting her involvement as minimal as possible. Yet seeing his cold demeanor, all her plans went down the drain as she frantically began to explain. The Azure Lotus Guild had voted against suppressing the true elite's guild. I never wanted to wage a war of attrition against your guild. I am in an alliance ruled by majority, and the majority vote was 5 colon 2 in favor of suppressing the elites, I was bound to follow them with or without my consent, I had repeatedly made it clear that it was stupid to suppress such a small guild without reason. Yua was desperately trying to explain when Rudra snapped. Oh, no reason to suppress such a small guild. You looking down on us now? He said coldly. No, no, not at all. If anything it's shameful for seven first-rate guilds to ally and declare hostility towards a single guild. Yua clarified but only made things worse. Why so? Are we not in your league ma'am, did we not just repel a 10,000 men camp? Just what more do we need to do to earn some respect in this town? Rudra said, anger evident in his tone. Yua got annoyed too, seriously Rudra, ma'am. Sui pretending we don't know each other now, also it is not 1950s anymore, nobody uses ma'am. I wish it were you know, to think I actually considered you to be a good friend in this cutthroat world. Seems like I was a fool. Rudra said. Now this line just cut deep into Yua, she was exasperated she said almost screaming, why don't you get it, the alliance all have shares of each other's corporations, should I not go with the majority they can seriously hurt the Nakatami Corporation. Rudra received a private message from Orochimaru at this point. It said, Guild leader, I have insider information, the lady is here to invite you into Seven Guild Alliance, beware of her sweet talks. Rudra calmed down a little after listening to that, then he asked lightly, okay. I believe you, but then tell me, why did you not even message me? Why are you here, only today, only after the show of strength from my guild, you are here to negotiate terms aren't you? Yua had no retort, she indeed had not contacted Rudra over the weeks that his guild faced suppression, even though in her heart she was bleeding, she had no way to prove her innocence here. She was here only when the alliance wanted to invite the elites to make them one of their own. That. I really wanted to but my dad won't let me, well fine, it doesn't matter anyway, I was a fool to think he would believe me. Yua said depressed. Rudra's heart clenched, something about seeing Yua sue down and sad made his heart twist in pain. Then he sighed. Fine I believe you. Rudra said slapping his cheeks. Yua looked up teary-eyed. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. Rudra affirmed. So we are still friends right? Yua asked meekly. I think so. Rudra replied. Yua beamed, she smiled a very bright smile. Rudra felt a burden lifted off his shoulders seeing that smile. Boy was he smitten with this girl's charms. Yua continued, well I think it will all get better from now on. I'm here to invite you into our alliance, together we can be an unstoppable force in Hazel Groove. Rudra instantly frowned. He wanted to downright reject, however for the sake of courtesy he said, what are the terms? Yua explained, 21% share transfer, each member will hold 3% of your shares, conversely, you will hold 3% of each of them. The majority decision is final, and all guilds must comply, all guilds must open their resource logs and agree on trade of materials, also there is a technology treaty to comply in research of new technologies that can revolutionize the market, finally there is a rule to provide 3,000 men to the alliance for control over territory purposes, but looking at your guild's special condition it was waived and replaced with surrendering your bomb depot. VNs bulged on Rudra's forehead, how is this beneficial to me? Yua felt exasperated at this point. You get shares worth 21% from seven first-rate guilds, you get a cut from the taxes levied on the masses, when the alliance grows you grow with them, we are absolutely invincible that way. Not even all the 32nd-rate guilds combined can hold a candle to our alliance, we can become absolute overlords of Hazel Groove, how is it not a benefit? Rudra felt mentally exhausted now, he just said, the shares of the elites are worth a lot more, and there is no way in hell I would exchange them, also I cannot work on the whims of nonsensual guild leaders. 
I work on my principles and not on majority vote. As for money, my trade firm earns enough dough for my guild to live in luxury. I'm sorry but I would like to decline your invitation. Yua stood there blank for a minute. Rudra actually rejected the alliance invite. Not out of personal grudges but logic. She could just not wrap her head around it at all. You are making a big mistake you know, think again leader Shikuni. Yua said. I have, sorry I can't join. Rudra remained firm. This means we will be at odds you know. Yua said. If you don't let it affect our friendship, I won't. Rudra said. Don't expect me to trade insider news just cause we are friends though. Yua snorted. Rudra smiled but said nothing. Well if you have made your mind. It's your funeral, he'll recruit you once the alliance obliterates your guild. She said as she stood up to leave. Just before leaving however she turned and said, take care. Rudra sat there and smiled. Yep no matter how much smitten he was with Yua, he knew that until there is friction due to the fight. They both as guild leaders could never truly be friends. Rudra knew he would distance himself from her from now. And Yua knew she would too. Even though they resolved their fight, they both knew the impending consequences of today's choices. Maybe they were just not meant to be. However the thing Rudra was now interested in was how did Orochimaru get that piece of information. Coupled with his identity as Rudra remembered in his past life, the entire incident felt extremely suspicious to Rudra. It was worth pondering upon. He called for Orochimaru, as he decided to take the rookie, out in the wild for a little leveling. Shout out to Riley underscore Lewis and Chapter 102, Shocking the World Again after the true elites destroyed the camp around the endless ocean dungeon, many adventurer parties and small guilds had rushed in to try clear the dungeon. However soon faced with reality they understood the difficulties of clearing the endless ocean. The easy mode required the party to survive for 20 hours, the normal mode 25, and the nightmare mode to survive for 30 hours. Even the easy mode clear had not been claimed yet, as the big first-rate guilds had kept their pride and kept attempting the normal mode. Well they had started with the nightmare mode, but soon giving up, they left for the normal mode, after repeated failures there, the demolition boys decided to put their pride aside and first claim the first clear of the easy mode. Even the easy mode was not so easy to clear, as multiple parties failed their first and second attempts, but the demolition boys weathered in the storms of normal mode, found the easy mode easier to breathe in. As through much difficulties they cleared the easy mode. A system announcement resounded in Hazel Groove Kingdom. Hazel Groove Kingdom Announcement, congratulations to the guild Demolition Boys for getting the first clear of the dungeon The Endless Ocean in the easy mode. Party members I love smashing, destruction forever, breaks endlessly. The forums got very buzzed after the new announcement as various parties discussed the new development. The Demolition Boys claimed the first clear after all, as expected of a first-rate guild, they are above the average masses. Well, it was the easy mode, nonetheless having experienced the cruelty of the dungeon, I respect the achievement nonetheless. Well that's to be expected, they had been attempting the dungeon for three days now. So what? So are the other six first-rate guilds, they could not clear it nonetheless, the demolition boys did. Over all this heated discussions, someone brought the true elites into the discussion. The demolition boys are the true superior guild in town, the true elites also attempted the endless ocean after breaking the siege but 29 hours had passed yet there was no notification about clearing the dungeon. Hence most assumed they failed. There were people that wanted to argue that the elites may be attempting the nightmare mode. However these thoughts were quickly dispelled as the difficulty of the dungeon was not to be taken lightly. Coupled with Orochimaru's intel of Rudra and the crew returning to the guild. The demolition boys decided to call out the guild on the forums. They released a very bold statement on the forums mocking the elites. The world is full of narcissistic people and delusional guilds, some call themselves, elites, but only use petty tricks to be above the masses, bring guns to knife fights and hide behind NPC, s to act like lions, when it comes to skills those guilds are but just talk, thank god for the demolition boys to wreck those guilds dreams before they even start. Hashtag keeping it real. The post got widespread coverage, as it blew up, many called the demolition boys arrogant, however many supported them too. The factional support lines were basically based on individual beliefs, the people supporting the demolition boys were basically third and second rate guilds who could not hold a candle to the true elites, and were extremely jealous. 
the ones supporting the elites were the solo players and the small guilds and adventure parties. However their voices were currently heavily suppressed as the opposition had a lot of momentum. Many posts mocking at Chikuni were seen on the forums. However the entire game changed following a single notification about an hour later. Hazel Groove Kingdom Announcement, congratulations to the True Elites Guild for clearing the nightmare mode of the dungeon The Endless Ocean. Party members include Shakuni, Karna, Monkey King Enma, Poison Toad Gamabunta. The forums. What just happened, did everyone see that announcement, or am I hallucinating? Ha 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 ha, told you the elites are the best, where did the demolition idiots go now? Too strong, the true elites are just too strong. The other party had tried hard for days at end to just clear the easy mode, yet within an hour the elites conquered the nightmare mode, there is no comparison, the difference is of heaven and earth. I bet the demolition boy's leader is eating his words now. Following the announcement the suppressed guild members of the smaller parties bursted in support of the elites on the forums. Whereas the bigger guilds had to chew on their words. The worst came for demolition boys as their post became the biggest joke of the century. Once it was out there it could never be erased. Them calling out the elites had made them the butt of everyone's jokes. The guild leader was livid. He wanted to hide in embarrassment over the issue, his party struggled so hard just to clear the easy mode yet the elites cleared the nightmare mode on their first try. No they must have cheated. He refused to believe that his guild was so inferior. But no matter how much he wanted it to be false, facts remained facts and the fact was that the elites had cleared the nightmare mode. It was made worse by the elite's official reply on the forums. Dragons don't even turn their heads to look at the dogs barking, they are simply not worth the time. Hashtag actions speak louder than words. The statement said. Too funny, ha ha ha, he'll die laughing. What first-rate guild? More like first-rate trash. LOL, the elite's statement will keep the demolition boys awake at nights. They had the balls to call the demolition boys dogs. Okay, since they wanted to fight so bad, they shall have it. Chapter 103, Heroic Return Well that was that, the forums had exploded completely, the elites had completely crushed the opposition with tangible results. Well Orochimaru was in deep with the Ambani Corporation, for his wrong information, he had a lot of heat on himself with the superiors, especially when this was the first ever important information that he relayed back as a spy turned out to be so wrong. Orochimaru was left scratching his head as to how did the elites clear the dungeon when. He saw Rudra and the rest back here at the guild. However the excitement in the guild gave him his answers, following the announcement, the guild members lined up to welcome back a victorious vice guild master. Everyone was in high spirits as praises rained down on Karna as he walked through the guild premises, the players were clapping, the wolves were howling, it was a jolly atmosphere, and at the end towards the guild hall, was Rudra with a cheeky smile, clapping towards the returning hero. Well nobody had more emotions right now than Karna, today, right here in this moment, he finally truly became the vice guild master of the guild. Although the true elites were a guild banded with incredibly talented players, everyone here knew that this supercar's engine was the guild leader Shakuni. And although everyone played a role in the current success that the guild has, he as the vice guild master had done nothing to make him stand out as a greater contributor to the guild. Whether it was leadership, or recruiting or getting the members out of a jam, everything was handled by Rudra, and he had became an afterthought in the guild, although Rudra showed immense confidence in him, and his skills were at par with the standard bear, the truth was he was a special recruitment, and had not gone through the normal procedure, also his status as vice guild master was given to repay a favor that Rudra owed him, not something he earned. Now finally he could hold his head high, as he showed his real worth to the guild, while not just the dungeon clear. The loot he brought back was the real winner. Everyone was exited for that fact, as the guild members swarmed him asking for details on the expedition. Amongst the swarm was also Orochimaru, keen to understand where he went wrong. Karna smiled at all the enthusiasm but he said, Yes, guys I found the treasure, and yes we earned a lot lot, however before I disclose the contents I'd need to talk to guild master as to what or what not to censor. The things we got are worthy as being kept as guild secrets. Oh 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 oh, and oh h h h h h h h h reigned in the crowd as everyone teased Karna for being such a party popper. Karna did not mind. He was a responsible guy, he would not get carried away despite the situation. However he wanted to show off just a bit hence he said. Okay, okay before you guys die with suspense I'll tell you how much gold we earned this time around. 
he paused before saying. 2, 15, 14, 600 gold coins and 10,000 platinum coins. Silence. Utter silence, followed by a deafening cheer. Woha. We are rich, all hail vice guild master. Pour the gold. Pour the gold. Pour the gold. The chance to pour the gold into a sea of coins started, Karna looked at Rudra who nodded, and all the gold coins were taken out of Karna's inventory into the guild premises, making a huge mountain of money. Cheers were heard again, as some members clicked photos of them Celef swimming in pools of gold. Even Orochimaru silently clicked pictures to report back to HQ, as this was big big news. While Karna and Rudra headed inside to talk about what transpired. Karna briefly explained, how he survived in the tree and the treasure room. For some reason he did not reveal information about the devil fruit as it was his own gaming secret. Rudra of course knew something was amiss, however he did not pry. The man's honesty was unquestionable, if Karna did not want to say something it was best to not pry. At last Karna revealed the entire contents of the loot. Which included. Plus 2, 15, 14, 600 gold coins. Plus 10,000 platinum coins. Plus 640 max HP potions. Plus 640 max mana potions. Plus 640 max stamina potions. Plus 640 poison mist potions. Plus 1 blueprint, cannon. Plus 1 blueprint, pirate armor set. Plus 1 straw hat, atchisery. Plus 1 Zoro, S mouth sword. Plus 1 grand pirate ship, currently in a bottle. Plus 1 skill book, mouth wielding. Plus 1 skill book, critical block. Plus 1 skill book, sea of fire. Plus 1 retractable shield. Plus 1 small egg. At the end Karna said. Also for the first clear of the dungeon I got a special reward of some treasure map piece. Take a look. Rudra instantly grabbed the map piece. It was the last piece he needed for the treasure location. Treasure map, semi-legendary, three-thirds, the X is where a great treasure is buried. He finally had it. God bless Karna. Not only that, Rudra's eyes widened at the loot collection, he only knew about the retractable shield, much of this loot was not made known to the public. Rudra cursed his past life knowledge, not everything he knew was reliable. Either that or the loot depended on luck, and Karna was damn lucky. Rudra was tempted to hog the shield and the critical block skill for himself, however he showed restraint and said, let's add everything except the small egg that you have bound in the pirate ship, that can become a trump card in future into the guild warehouse, let anyone trade for it with GCP. Karna shook his head in denial, coincidentally he took out the retractable shield and the critical block skill and said, these are for you the rest goes in, I don't want to hear arguments leader, consider those a gift from me for everything you have done for me, if that doesn't convince you, take it as a reward I wish for for a job well done. Rudra was touched, he wanted to hug Karna, but that would ruin his image so he just banged a fist into Karna's shoulder saying thanks bro. Today he felt like recruiting Karna was the best decision he made. The man was growing more and more into the role he hoped for. Chapter 104, Gaging Orochimaru Rudra took a party of seven members, himself, Orochimaru, Karna, Mediv, Rhino, Monkey King Enma and Neatwit with him for leveling in the level 40 to 50 wild map, the village of trolls. Ever since the party set out on the Grey Mounts. They were a talking point of everyone in the city, and throughout the journey, everyone turned to look at the party passing, until they finally reached the leveling map. The first few trolls were easy to kill, as everyone warmed up a little, the party composition was sort of balanced with one knight. One swordsman, one mage, one tank, and two assaulters. Rudra was not sure about Orochimaru's class, however he knew the guy was a swalt type class as well, probably a barbarian. Orochimaru was smart, he kept trying to suck up to Rudra and the party throughout the journey. Innocently asking about guild secrets like, whoa, big brother Karna what a cool sword. Where'd you get it? And, what's that on your wrist guild leader, a new achisery? To everyone else who were unsuspecting of him. It all seemed like normal behavior. But to Rudra all this just added to his suspicion of the guy. The player was just a good, skill-wise, definitely worthy of being an elite, he could easily take down normal level 40 trolls one-on-one. -on -one. No problems. Everyone slowly started to acknowledge the guy, his strength, and as to why Rudra recruited him. He was worthy of being here. 
After about two hours of grinding and killing around 75 trolls, about 10 to 11 each the party members finally leveled up. Player name, Shikuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Emissary of Church, World Renowned, Heer of Augustus One Knight. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 43. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 216 plus 108 vit, 216 plus 108. Int, 216 plus 108 STA, 216 plus 108. PHY, 216 plus 108 HP, 19,000 slash 19,000. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy. 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, reinforced armor set, LV-30, lich's ring, concealer mask, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica. Skills, darkness bind, summon knight durahal, wind slash, critical absorb, berserk, darkness blast, death slash, eyes of truth, earthquake, critical block. Class-specific skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 28-200. The loot so far included. Plus 40 troll skins. Plus 5 gold coins. Plus 50 troll teeth. Plus 6 common troll clubs. Plus 8 rare troll clubs. Plus 1 gold sword. Plus 1 leather armor. The crew were not seriously injured or fatigued. Still Rudra decided to call for a short break, as the party camped in the wild, chatting merrily. Orochimaru was busy again. Innocently asking prying questions in this time, and Rudra was again busy observing him, slowly getting more and more evidence to his line of thought. After the break the party again continued with the grinding, on Neatwit's constant complaint of wasting time. For God's sake men, the guy was already level 47 now. About two hours into the grind the party faced a big problem. They met with a roaming world boss, the troll chieftain who instantly used a skill to summon two other mutated trolls. Although this was a great opportunity to most players. To a party of just seven this was an extremely precarious position. Petrified Troll, Elite. Level 40. HP 50, 000 50,000. Petrified Troll, Chieftain. Level 52. HP 8, 200, 0, 0, slash 8, 200, 0, 0. Everyone on the team felt an immense pressure from the petrified trolls. If the trolls were merely level 40 lords, they could hold the monsters back. However, a level 52 lord was many times more powerful than a level 40. On their team, only the MT could withstand an assault from one of these monsters. No one else could endure their attacks, much less pin them down. These level 52 petrified lords possessed combat prowess of at least three normal trolls of the same level these petrified trolls' attributes also dwarfed theirs. The same held true for speed. In addition, elite-ranked monsters were generally resistant to kiting techniques. If they could neither outrun nor control these monsters, just how were they supposed to fight against the petrified trolls? Rudra's expression was just as serious as the rest of his team. What rotten luck! It's even capable of summoning petrified trolls. The troll chieftain surprised Rudra. Unlike ordinary trolls, petrified trolls had petrification runes carved all over their bodies, which made their skin harder than even steel. They were also monstrously strong. They were famous for being difficult enemies. In the past, players that encountered these petrified trolls generally turned and fled. The three petrified trolls didn't give True Elite's team much time to react. Without hesitation, they pounced on Rhino, who currently held back the troll chieftain. Why are they always targeting me? Glancing at the approaching petrified trolls, Rhino activated his tier 1 class special skill called the Last Stand, reducing all incoming damage by 50%, weakening any impact he received, and increasing his maximum HP by 40%. Instantly, his maximum HP rose to 29,530. Pang. 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 Three silver spears struck Rhino's shield, 
one after another. Minus 6,717. Minus 6,809. Minus 6,784. Following which, the troll chieftain brandished its massive red greatsword and slashed at Rhino. Tier 1 skill, Storm Rage. Quickly adjusting his footwork, Rhino lifted his shield just in time to block the attack coming from his side. Meanwhile, the distant Mediv quickly cast a fireball on the another troll. Boom. When the troll chieftain's greatsword crashed into the rhino's shield, dazzling sparks flew as a loud boom resounded through the dead forest. Everyone felt the shockwave from the impact. As for rhino, numerous deep cuts ripped apart the ground around him. Chapter 105, A Fight to Show the Gap Rudra knew as soon as he saw the monsters that the party needed to go at at least 70% capacity to handle this calamity. He ordered the team, to get ready, Rhino was under immense pressure blocking the chief. Being at less than 40% HP currently. His situation did not look good, especially when the other two troll elites also joined in to attack him. Rudra knew that something big was needed currently, and the only spell strong enough that could damage the enemies was the tier 2 spell Sea of Fire, that Mediv had learned. However the spell had a tier 2 restriction on casting, and Mediv was currently only tier 1. However Rudra had acquired a trump card for Mediv, a potion that temporarily raised a wizard spell casting skill by one tier. He could only acquire three bottles with great difficulty, he never thought he'd need to use one so soon. There was a party of adventurers who slowly approached the scene, and were shocked to see a party of just seven take on three mutated trolls. Not even seventy of them felt confident on taking them. Rudra ordered Mediv to cast the spell The Sea of Fire. Mediv instantly sprang into action, downing the potion and starting the chant. After twenty seconds he raised his hands as flames started to burst around him in violent circles. The three-meter-tall petrified trolls transformed into two massive fireballs as the attack sent them flying, they crashed through numerous trees before they finally fell to the ground. Everyone involuntarily shivered when they saw the two monsters' bodies. Meanwhile, the two lords' HP bars shrank by a small chunk. Minus 13,485. Minus 13,504. Massive damages appeared on the trolls. As a third of their HP was chipped. The two horrific damages stupefied everyone on the team. If not for Orochimaru and Karna still struggling with the other petrified troll, they would have doubted that the two monsters on the ground were actually petrified trolls. What destructive power, Mediva's spell was beyond what normal people could comprehend, Orochimaru's eyes widened in shock, the elites had hidden their strength too deep, there was no telling who was a crouching tiger or a hyden dragon in this guild. He made a mental note to observe this Mediv guy. Even Karna showed his brilliance as he single-handedly dodged and damaged one of the elite trolls, following Mediva's attack. A continuous damage of minus 2,500 minus 2,500 appeared. But what was more shocking was he had his eyes fucking closed. WTF was going on here. The guy was simply dodging and toying his enemy with his eyes closed. Orochimaru felt like he was having a mental breakdown. He looked towards Rudra who was fighting the chieftain. And his despair turned deeper. The guy had some mysterious shield on his arms and the shield randomly formed at will, to block all attacks from the orc chief. Rudra got no to a pitifully low of. Minus 5. Minus 5 damage while fighting. While dealing a massive blow of. Minus 4000. Minus 4000. Minus 4900. Continually. Orochimaru felt like the only normal guy here, as he and Poison Toad Gamakichi fought together to push the last troll back. However out of nowhere Neatwit stepped into the fry, and unleashed the weirdest looking move Orochimaru had seen in the entire game. Black flames burst from Neatwit's sword as a single cut that looked more like a samurai slashing a target dummy, sliced the opponent in half clean. Minus 20,000 critical hit. The elite troll was dead. By a single hit of Neatwit. What was that sword he used? What was the move? Orochimaru was completely clueless. He stared at Neatwit dumbfounded. Five minutes later Rudra and Karna had defeated their opponents and the fight was over. A system notification followed, your party has slayed a roaming world boss troll chieftain, would you like to issue a system announcement? The system asked Rudra the leader of the party. However Rudra declined the offer, 
this was but a casual stroll, no need to blow matters up. Plus 50, 0000, 000, 000 EXP. Plus 50 gold coins. Plus 30 elite troll skin sheets. Plus 2 gold troll armor, LV40. Plus 1 dark gold troll armor, LV50. It was not a big loot dump, hence Rudra did not care much about it, however this loot would make most normal parties go crazy with joy. The elites were however absolutely immune, after seeing Karna's gold stack, they found 50 gold to be chump change. The audience was dumbfounded, what the hell was going on? Who was that bunch of players in black robes? Until someone recording zoomed on their insignia, it was the true elites. This was life-changing for those who saw this battle as they uploaded it on the forums using the tag, the elites having some fun in the wild. The adventurers did not know that this simple video would alter the history of the game forever. From Rhino S tanking of three enemy trolls alone at the start, to Mediv casting a devastating fire spell far beyond the capabilities of any other mage in the game currently, to Karna fighting an elite troll with his eyes closed. To Rudra overwhelming the chieftain alone. The chieftain was a damn LV-52 monster, yet in front of Rudra's shield his damage output was as pitiful as minus 5, minus 5. Just how strong was the shield? Even the tank, who relied on a shield as his bread and butter took so much damage, to them it simply did not make sense. However the truth was, the pitifully low damage was due to a lot of factors being accounted together. One was Rudra's epic shield, it was much better than Rhino's gold one. Two was Rudra's stats, his golden ratio passive made his defense higher than most tanks. And three was his defense technique. He having 20 years of gaming experience knew how to take strong blows, Rudra bent his knees slightly while letting each muscle in his body equally disperse the entire blow, making a small angle with the incoming blow as possible. Many did not know this, but damage was also dependent on angle of blow. As the angle became smaller the damage became more deflected. Hence his superior technique allowed him this. To finally the freakiest of them all, the one who occupied the top spot in the leveling rankings, Neatwit, he was a complete mystery. Orochimaru had never heard anything special about Neatwit, however seeing him here today, he needed to think again. Just amongst the seven members here there were four such characters, just how strong was the entire guild? Just how many experts were in there hiding their strength? Orochimaru shuddered at the thought. The true elites could not be provoked easily, he was reminded of that fact again today. Chapter 106, Bonus Chapter, What's Next? The video of the elite group slaughtering the troll party had became the most viral video of the season, it had more than 300 million views in just four days, with extensive coverage by news channels and media. There were panels of experts sitting and dissecting the video, analyzing the fight. Giving a reason for the bizarre abilities shown by the elites. But the thing was the experts sitting in the panel were a bunch of absolute morons who were completely clueless, it wasn't like they were from Cuber Corporation, they were just a bunch of old uncles who played Omega pretending to be analyzing the game mechanics. Expert 1 said like you see in this video, the player here, doesn't actually have his eyes closed, it was open at first, but then the camera angle is such and the player squints his eyes so much that he appears to have the eyes closed, ha 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 ha, he mostly is from country C with those small eyes. Noon can fight monsters with closed eyes guys, that's just ridiculous. Expert 2 said, the player using the fire spell, it definitely is the spell called Fire Wheel, it is a tier 1 spell that has recently been purchased off the market for 7000 gold coins. Sue so apparently an elite bought it. Expert 3, I think this entire video is a fan art, a scam. A conspiracy, look at the ridiculousness, I refuse to believe it, I am a level 40 player myself, Am I a fake gamer then, ITS a sham. A lot of heated discussions ensued on the forums also, but the elites were now undoubtedly painted in an unfathomable aura. Everyone stopped using common sense to evaluate the group now, they were a bunch of anomalies banded together. 7 Guilds Alliance Meeting, Azure Lotus Guild Headquarters. They actually rejected us. Ask the musicians in Guild Leader. How cocky. Real Manchester Leader said. You have not done your mission properly Pink Lotus. Demolition Boy's leader said. What can I do to persuade someone not willing to be persuaded? And that's guild leader Pink Lotus for you. You are glared at Demolition Boy's leader. That's enough fighting guys, what should we do now? Business is real bad after the elites wiped our members off the dungeon, the compensations, and overall morale has made us feel a big pinch. Sea of Poison guild leader said. 
What can we do? The NPC army is not to be trifled with, and we do not know how many more cards the elites have. That guild is just unreasonable, did you see that video? What ridiculous strength. Original Manchester leader said. We can't just have our authority challenged like this, it's bad for business, the elites still have a 35-day cooldown on their war counter, I suggest we lay low for those 35 days building strength, and then crush them in a one-and-done war. 35 days will really put a burden on our finances, we need to keep pressuring the smaller guilds except the elites. Demolition Boys leader argued. We can't, there's no telling when elites band up to kill our party, I'm not underestimating us, but a party of 500 can easily be wiped by those 50 madmen, if we have more than 1,000 troops stationed at a single place, though we become a target of the NPC army, for a party less than 50 members, the adventurers now refuse to give up without a fight, and the casualties have mounted a lot since the fighting broke out. Musicians Inc. leader argued. Damn those elites, how dare they put us in such a pinch. Sea of Poison leader was thoroughly underwhelmed by the situation. When the seven members were fiercely debating the next course of action a system announcement got their attention. System announcement, the second system auction will take place in 72 hours, real world time, IT will be a kingdom style auction with 40 common artifacts and 10 super artifacts to bid at. Everyone in the alliance became silent for a while, before wildly discussing about how to raise money for the auction. Everyone understood after the first system auction, how important was the auction items, just the armor set that the elites bought, made them untouchable in the market, gaining massive profits in the market. Now Noon wanted to lose the opportunity to land an important item. The True Elite's Lifestyle Store Rudra and Fatty Kalash were sitting in one of the three elite lifestyle store in the city, today was the launch of a new product line, the Advanced Mana Potion, it was priced at 100 gold coins per bottle, while it costed about 1.5 gold to make, with the overhead of the shop and all, it came to be 3 gold. The profit they were making were ridiculous, Kalash was nervous about the pricing, but Rudra was very confident. Of course he was, he knew that it went for 120 gold in his past life, 100 gold was already him chopping the price by 25%. Also the level 40 pirate set was added to the display and labeled as coming soon. To create a buzz. When they were talking, the new system announcement hit. Oh, what a good time. Rudra smiled. He had expected the auction sometime around now, but this just made the timing extremely sweet. Karna had brought back a crazy amount of dough. And the lifestyle would make a lot in the three days leading up to the auction, Rudra felt very confident. He thanked his stars that he got hands on the advanced mana potion, as from now till the auction, it was time to grind insane amounts of money. Rudra gave the shop staff and Fatty Kalash the green signal to go ahead, as a new post promoting the latest product was added to the forums. Chapter 107, Minting Money the advert of the Elite Lifestyle Store selling the Advanced Mana Potion at 1.3 million likes in one hour. Hey, hey, hey. This must be a false promotion right? Even basic mana potions are in tight supply, just how can they have Advanced Mana Potions for sale? Holy Mother Nature, I'm going to get one. 100 gold is too steep a price, we want discount. Has anyone actually been to the store to verify this rumor? Yes I have been to the store. Even bought two bottles, have used one as a trial, it works, instantly regenerated all lost mana. OMG. Just where did they obtain everything from? Meanwhile at the True Elite's guild headquarters. Orochimaru was tasked with gaining intel on the quantity of stock of potions that the elites paw seized. Whether or not they could generate a sizable income. Orochimaru began, innocently, asking members, however Rudra had long seen through his scheme. Rudra thought to himself, too bad for you snake, you met the ultimate schemer, Shikuni, himself. Rudra laughed inwardly at how he was going to play the child. Then he approached Orochimaru and said, don't you want to buy some advanced mana potions? Guild members get a 90% discount. Orochimaru was stunned for a second, then realizing the great opportunity he had he said, no sir, how can I reduce guild profits by taking a potion from the limited stocks we have? And make it suffer losses. He intentionally used the word limited stocks to probe Rudra's answers, if Rudra said he need not worry about stocks, then they had a sizable stockpile, if he did not it meant the stock they had was very limited. Rudra laughed, well it's a marketing stunt anyway, you don't need to worry about the stocks, I agree we could only produce a pitifully low amount of potions just a thousand or so, that two at 96 coins a bottle, 
this time it's just a promotional event to try bring customers to the store while silently increasing other commodities prices and gain an income. You go grab one now, it doesn't really matter much to the guild, I'd be more happy if it's in our members' hands. Rudra said. Orochimaru's eyes shined. He had stumbled upon important intel here. He thanked Rudra and quickly bolted to contact his superior in the Ambani Corporation. Rudra laughed. He wanted to see what organization was actually behind Orochimaru, and today from his reaction he knew that the fish had been hooked, lined, and sinker. In his report Orochimaru narrated his understanding of the incidents and that the shops should not have more than 50 to 100 stocks left. The seniors in Ambani Corporation immediately formulated a plan, and sent the demolition boys vice guild master to buy all remaining stock under the alliance's name. They analyzed that buying all stock should increase the reputation of the alliance, whereas remove the buzz around the elite stores. The vice guild master started streaming his feed live, with the title, Buying Advanced Mana Potion, Full Stock. As he approached the elite store that was currently under Fatty Kalsh. Rudra had long since told Fatry to fleece an incoming ship, so when an arrogant vice guild master came in there. Fatty naturally licked his lips to see the juicy target. The stream currently had 25k watchers, it was rapidly gaining viewers. This is insane isn't it? It costs 100 gold a bottle, not 100 bronze. They can't buy the entire stock can they? Speculation about the outcome was currently being made, when the vice guild master said. I want all bottles of the advanced mana potion in your store. The stream chat went insane, seeing the bold announcement he made. Fatty smiled politely. He knew exactly how to handle such brats. Fatty said, Sorry sir, we only sell two bottles per customer. Boo. The chat all booed the hell out of Fatty Kalash. But the response only reinforced Inieto's Mash's thoughts about the stock. They must have very limited stock, hence are not selling. I will pay 150 coins a bottle, just sell me all stock. He said. Oh, the crowd was not anticipating the shopkeeper's reply. It was amazing, the stream now had over 100k viewers. Fatty played it cool, he said, Sir, it's not about the money, we sell with principles, how can I make an exception for you? After a long long pause he added. Not that you could have afforded it anyway. In a low voice, that was meant to be heard. Inietto's Masha's eyelids twitched at the sarcasm. What did the guy just say? Okay, okay, you said it, you think I'm a beggar who is all talk and can't afford to pay up. I need to smash said. Obviously not, respected sir, it's just that you are not even the guild leader of your own guild, let alone the alliance, let's just say, you don't have enough authority for the sale. Kalash said polite words that were extremely scathing calmly. I need to smash lost it now. People on the stream started to comment. Burn bro. As they thoroughly enjoyed the diss. I need to smash contacted some superiors and presented a signed document to Kalash, signed by five Alliance Guild leaders saying that he represented the Alliance on this matter, in a legally binding Omega document that could not be forged or faked. Looking at the document, Kalash said, Okay sir, I apologize for my rudeness, however I still cannot sell you the potions. I need to smash was on the edge now, oh okay, so you throw mud at others, however when backed against the wall, you just laugh and say it was a joke, and walk out like nothing happened, no 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 that's not how it works. I know the truth, you probably don't even have 50 potions left to sell right. I've seen through your petty marketing ploys long ago. Kalash made shocked expressions as he pretended that words could not escape his mouth. It seemed like he was caught. I need to smash smiled, he thought he had him. Even the stream boiled with insults, as I need to smash kept demanding more sales. Finally Kalash pretended to give in and call Rudra, some time later he came back and said. You can buy all the stock at 200 gold a potion, all the stock not one bottle less. Ha, huh, okay I agree. I need to smash agreed. He found the increase in price ridiculous attempt to gain a little money. A legally binding contract was presented that stated that the alliance will buy the complete stock of advanced mana potions at 200 gold a potion, or assets of equal value shall be seized from the alliance to make up for lost income. I need to smash found the contract only a ruse to scare him from signing, as in front of two 50k streamers watching he signed it. Thunderous applause started in the live chat, as everyone appreciated I need to smash. It was at this moment that Fatty Kalash showed his sinister smile and said, Congratulations sir, 
the final amount comes to 2.4716 million gold. Chapter 108, Crisis at the Alliance Congratulations sir, the final amount comes to 2.471 million gold coins. Kalash smiled a sinister smile. I need to smash, s world just collapsed at this number, he felt like the earth was spinning under his feet. I am sorry, I think I misheard the number, will you please repeat it for me. I need to smash was loosing his damn mind. 2.471 million gold coins sire, but as you are purchasing it such a large bulk I will waive off the 0.001 fees and make it a round number of 2.47 million. Kalash smiled amiably. You, you, you. I need to smash wanted to speak. However no matter what he thought of, words did not come out of his mouth. Just what could he say? He had already signed a legally binding contract twice with the system. Upon Kalash's provocation he talked to his guild master who talked to other alliance members and signed a document saying that he was responsible for the negotiations on behalf of the alliance here. Then without inquiring about the stock that the guild had, relying on his information from superiors and wanting to look extremely cool on the livestream he went with the flow to sign another document saying he will purchase all stock at double the price. Who knew that the guild did not have 50, did not have 100, not 1000 not 10,000 but 12, 358 bottles of advanced mana potion. His information was not slightly wrong it was an estimation error of over 2000% it was not even in the ballpark. His guild did not have this kind of money, hell not even the alliance could fork such a huge sum like that, it would seriously affect the guild's day-to-day -day working cycle. He being the one responsible will be forced to take brunt of the blame, his career as vice guild master was over. All the fame, all the glory, all the power that came with being the vice guild master of such a prominent first-rate guild. All would be gone here. He looked at Kalash full of hatred he screamed, you cheated me. Fatty Kalash was a lot of things, he was fat, loyal to a fault to his friends, a bit of a nerd when it came to blacksmithing and business, however what he was not was someone who could be intimidated easily. He was a sly and cutthroat businessman who had no remorse for those he stepped over. He was not rude like Rudra, or dominating, yet in his own polite way, he would give his enemies nightmares for life. Kalash said calmly, I told you dear customer, your guild is not qualified enough to purchase our whole stock of materials, yet you insisted on buying them, that too at double the price, even signed an agreement, are you going to blame me now? The chat that was silent since the figure was announced was now suddenly in a burst. Holy mother of cows, they have over 12k advanced mana potions in stock. Too strong. The demolition boys are done for now, who asked them to show off so much. Ha 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 ha, this is too funny, suits you right you show off. R.I.P. Alliance. R.I.P. Alliance. R.I.P. Alliance. Even the Alliance members watching the stream were now hounding the demolition boys like mad hounds, they wanted absolutely no part in paying off the mad debt, the entire guild's capital system would collapse if they wanted to pay off the debt at a one-and-done type payment. The value of gold to USD currently was at 1 gold equals 423 US dollars and 60 cents. It was a commodity under constant fluctuation, it was at a crazy high at 1 gold equals 5000 US dollars at start of the game, however with more gold flowing into the game through mining the commodity value stabilized at 420 dollars and was at an increase since the announcement of the auction. Currently at 423.6 the debt in USD that the alliance owed the elites was 1,046,969,760 US dollars. Meaning over a billion dollars total. Every member though backed by billionaires themselves would feel the pinch of this buy. The stated time limit for payment in the contract was a pathetically low one hour. Hence I need to smash needed to act quick. He rushed out of the store as Kalash said. I need to smash wanted to vomit blood at the last line. But he persevered as he ran like a madman towards the guild headquarters, but in his run of madness he forgot an extremely important point, that his stream was still on. The guild master of demolition boys a love smashing was in a never before experienced peril. The alliance members shrugged off responsibility and had asked demolition boys to pay up themselves. He was in deep heat with the construction company behind the guild for this stupid decision. The alliance was based on a mutual exchange of shares, and the other six members promised to dump the 21% shares they controlled on the open market making the company price to go down a freefall, should they not bear responsibility themselves. Also a threat to kick them out of the alliance ensued. A love smashing contacted the Ambani Corporation, 
However at this critical moment the Ambani Corporation executives were unexpectedly out of reach. I need to smash barged into the office panting, as a love smashing lost his damn mind, he shouted at I need to smash, you piece of garbage. As he threw a vicious punch on the men. All the while, the live stream was on, the antics being watched by over 20 million people live. Chapter 109, Exposed A love smashing had completely lost it. He hurled insults after insults on I need to smash for his incompetency. I need to smash took it silently, without a single retort. After a while, when a love smashing calmed down, he began frenziedly calling the Alliance Guild Masters again to look for a way out. Only fifteen minutes in the deadline remained, and all the Alliance members had shaken off responsibility of paying the debt to Demolition Boys. The Ambani Corporation was out of reach. And their parent construction company absolutely refused to use the company's cash flow to buy gold for the guild. A love smashing tried to explain that it was not all bad, the potions they had were worth about $500 million. So it was only a loss of another $500 million. However no matter how they tried to convince anyone to buy the advanced mana potions from them, to generate even a little amount of gold, Noon wanted to buy it at the current moment. Only seven minutes remained on the timer. A love smashing started to calculate the guild's assets, the guild only had about a million gold to pay in liquid assets, the rest were fixed assets like, rare equipments potions and recipes. But the contract stated that the elites would get the pick of what to choose, should they default on the contract. He was having a mental breakdown, without the guild's cash flow, maintaining day-to-day -day operations was impossible. They had 12, 000 guild members, doing missions on a payroll, for the guild. How would they pay death compensations, how would they issue rewards for missions? Without the proper benefits the members would leave the guild in a flood. Without the members will they still be a first-rate guild? It was the snowball effect. Where a single bad choice would shake the very foundations of the guild. What if tomorrow they become a third-rate guild who the second-rate guilds start bullying? Those second-rate guilds who would usually bow in fear would now boss over them. This was unacceptable to a love smashing. He was a prideful man, he could not accept this outcome. However the parent companies held the shares of the parent companies of all alliance guilds. It was them who were the basis of the alliance. With the parent guild showing a strong stance of cutting off the demolition boys, and treat them as a lost project, they had no leverage left over the other guild members left, to make them pay the debt. With only two minutes left, the love smashing started beating the hell out of I need to smash in frustration, his tyrannical actions being witnessed by millions on stream. His desperate attempts to convince the other guilds, to the shallow unity of the alliance, everything was exposed today, as the true side of the first-rate guilds was revealed. A love smashing became public enemy number one, as sympathy arose for I need to smash. His brutal beat-up, agitated the crowd. Who turned from jeering the men to rooting for him? They had completely turned to his side here. Finally at only 30 seconds left, the love smashing sat down beside I need to smash and started laughing a maniacal laughter, were finished. All the snakes we worked with. The Alliance, the Ambani Corporation, idiots like you. My career's over. He name dropped Ambani Corporation here. Live in front of millions. The countdown hit zero as the system notification in red flashed on their screens for defaulting a contract. The Syatom then freezed all assets belonging to the guild, as a list of system evaluated prices was generated and sent to Rudra, to compensate in however form he wished to compensate for the agreed sum of money. Nothing could be hidden as all their cards were now opened before their enemies. The true elites. Every recipe they ever obtained. Every forging technique, every single equipment. Anything could be chosen by the elites now, as the system made a list of everything they possessed. They could only watch on in despair, as their hard work was legally and in broad daylight robbed by their enemies. Rudra took a good look at all the items they possessed, and although there was nothing too special the guild did have another page of Demon's Diary and Tier 3 one time use spell tome, Thunderblast. Rudra chose the two items at a 100k gold, the 1 million gold currency that they had, and other miscellaneous items and armor. He genuinely bought one or two pieces from a complete set, making the rest of the enemy's equipment worthless, as no set would trigger the complete set effect now. Although acting this way was a loss in the bigger picture, however the enemy suffered much more so he was content. Meanwhile, real world the upside, the grey tower. Ethan Grey was sitting on his desk. 
rotating his $40,000 Parker pen between his fingers. Focused on the challenge ahead. Is this life guru and current thorn by the side, Mithun Ambani? Ever since he lost his reincarnator edge, his confidence in himself became shaky, he felt everything he achieved was because of his knowledge. He had forgotten about the essence of the man Ethan Gray himself. However he snapped out of that illusion now. If war is what Ambani wanted. He would show him the power of the Gray International. Choosing Omega as his playing field, Ethan started to plot his own masterpiece. Ethan shrugged of his sloppiness that came after 2100 hit, he had became too reliant on Rudra and hence went too soft. For the coming auction he made a super plan. He decided to give $1 billion fund injection to true elites and $3 billion injection to the Grey Main Guild. His plan started with using his monetary strength to open a market in Omega, and he would follow through with Plan A in a grand fashion, just like that $4 billion worth of gold was purchased in a single day by the Grey International. Chapter 110, Auction, 1. Orochimaru got a lot of heat following his blunder from the Ambani Corporation. Whereas the name drop on the live stream caused a lot of suspicions and problems for the Ambani Corporation themselves. Orochimaru's Aiden TTE as spy was in a threat, however as the spy was not mentioned in the live stream, thankfully he was still of use. But he was walking on eggshells here as everything he would say from now on would be taken with a pinch of salt. However Rudra understood everything he needed to understand from that one line dropped. He knew Orochimaru was in the Ambani main guild back in his past life, he knew beyond shadow of a doubt who was pulling the strings behind the scenes. And boy oh boy did he plan to manipulate the opposition into his favor. Rudra had raised an incredible amount of money for the coming auction. Leaving over 2 million gold and emergency reserves fund for the guild, and 2 million more for operations which was already a bloated number as not even 50,000 gold were being used on a monthly basis by the guild. Not to mention the non-liquid assets like armors and swords and potions. Following Ethan's injection of 2.5 million gold into the guild and the robbing of demolition boys for 1 million more. The elites had a ridiculous amount of 30 million gold prepared for the auction. With an additional option of platinum, which they held over 20,000. It was to be noted that 1 platinum equals 1,000 gold. Hence the 20,000 meant another 20 million gold coins, bringing their total wealth to a whopping 50 million gold total. Yes the guild was filthy rich, rich beyond reason. Of course this was thanks to Karna and his escapade at the Endless Ocean Dungeon, without his loot of the 21 million gold and 10,000 platinum, the guild would still be more on the reasonable side. However Rudra felt incredibly confident in contesting for items with the amount of gold he carried for this auction. The other guilds could only watch in despair this time around. The Alliance already had the news about the 21 million gold brought in by Karna over the dungeon spoils as Orochimaru disclosed it, it was already a matter of despair for them as 21 million gold was not a sum they could fork out easily. However Orochimaru's information was now being scrutinized seriously, adding a margin of error, they estimated the elites with all their businesses to posse's 15 to 25 million gold. They decided to have a fund against the elites of at least 30 million, to outbid them on critical items. However unity was a big problem in the alliance, as not every one of the seven members could fork out equal amounts of money. The demolition boys were useless at this point, as everyone was debating their position within the alliance. However as barely as they were running, they were still scrapping by, hence they were allowed a seat for now. The alliance proposed its members to fork 3 million gold, for the six remaining members after a lot of infighting, and demolition boys sold more fixed assets to fork in 1 million. Through hook and crook they barely raised 19 million gold for the auction. It was a farkery from the 30 they hoped for, however they would restrain themselves and only bid for the more important items now. In the wild, grinding mobs, POV neatwit. Minus 2500. Minus 2500. Minus 2500. Minus 5000 critical hit. You have slayed 4 trolls. Plus 20,000 EXP. Plus 5 troll teeth. Plus 1 troll armor, rare. Plus 1 troll club, common. Level up. Player name, neatwit. Title, Pioneer. Class, Warlock. Subclass, Bomb Maker. LVL, 48. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 270 VIT, 250. Int, 190 STA, 
260. PHY, 220. HP, 17, 000 17, 000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, doom bracelet, shoulder pads, epic. Weapons, unnamed, semi-legendary, common bow, quiver of arrows, assassin's daggers, kunai knife. Skills, slash, jab, wind slash, dark devour, black rune attack. Class-specific skills, supreme assaulter, supreme mage. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, none. He had just leveled up, he was three levels clear of the next guy at level 45 on the rankings. He sighed in relief, then took a look at his precious unnamed sword, a mysterious semi-legendary sword he got from doing a quest. It was the reason behind his mad quick leveling and off-the-charts attacks. He then remembered that there was an auction coming up, taking a look at his inventory, full of monster parts. He sold everything to the system at 80% the market rate. For most players even carrying 100k gold was an astronomical figure, however the amount of gold Neatwit had on himself, far exceeded anyone's wildest imaginations at a whopping 6 million. Why was he so rich? Why did he have a semi-legendary weapon? Nobody knew. Not a single soul. He smiled as he transferred 5 million to Rudra, with a note, buy something good like bombs to make me help level faster. Rudra was shocked at seeing the incredible amount of money that Neatwit sent, this was the amount many first-rate guilds had combined. With Neatwit's last-minute addition and only three minutes till the auction start, there was a total budget of 55 million gold that Rudra walked into the auction with. The month and week is about to end, please give me the last push needed to enter top 100 in Power Stone rankings and top 40 in Golden Ticket rankings, any help will be much much appreciated. We are at 103, 44 respectively, not too far guys, should both goals be met, expect 3 on this Monday. Chapter 111, Auction, 2 The auction house seating was decided on how much money you walked into the auction with. The minimum requirement to take part in today's auction was 10,000 gold, with anyone having over 1 million gold being given the VIP rooms. In every VIP room, a total of 7 people could be invited to take a seat. Naturally in Hazelgroove Kingdom there were only two VIP rooms occupied, one by the Alliance and the other by the Elites. As green signs lit up above the rooms VIP 1 and VIP 2, everyone in attendance understood that the big players had arrived. Rudra had decided to bring Fatty Kalash and Karna along for the auction this time. Although Rudra remembered majority of the items that are to show up in today's auction due to past life memories, he still paid attention to the list of items being announced for auction today. The auction had two divisions this time around, with 40 common items and 10 super items to bring a total of 50 items to bid for. The list of common items to bid for was as follows. Weapons, 10 items, grade, rare to dark gold. Rare ingredients, 10 items, grade, rare to dark gold. Potion recipes, 3 items, grade, gold. Forging designs, 3 items, grade, gold. Incomplete designs, 4 items, grade. Skill books, 10 items, grade, rare to dark gold. For a total of 40 items. For a detailed list one needed to tap on any of the options to look at the in-depth items coming up for bidding. Rudra was honestly intrs aid in a few items like the skill books and the rare ingredients. For the weapons, his guild had plenty good ones, he would only buy if it was cheap. For other stuff like design manuals he would only bid at the incomplete ones. As the incomplete designs are usually part of a complete design that is epic grade minimum. He decided to keep a budget of 3 million gold for this segment. However the highlight of the auction was the last 10 items. The list was as follows. Electric net, dark gold, a net used to capture mounts in the wild for the very first time. Immobilizes the target, making them less likely to submit and thwarts escape attempts. Hephaestus's mallet, dark gold, upgradable, a must-have for blacksmiths, the mallet was designed keeping the forging god as an idol, increases crafting efficiency by 25%. A page from Demon's Diary. Spell book, endless devastation, turns the ground into a barren wasteland, debuffs everyone except the caster of the spell, in a 200 meter radius. Effect 1, minus 5% AGI. 
Effect 2, minus 5% PHY. Spellbook, Stormbringer, zaps the enemy with a huge bolt of lightning, sure to trigger lightning damage. Plus 200% lightning damage. 50% chance to stun the target. Plus 5% chance to trigger critical damage. Potion Recipe, Intermediate Mana Potion, a recipe to create a potion that refill lost mana quickly. Blueprint, Reinforced Brick, a blueprint for reinforced concrete bricks, makes a structure extremely strong. Blueprint, Fishing Rod, a blueprint to create a device that catch fishes and other ocean mounts. Hazel Groove Special Items. Red Jewel, Quest Item, an item wanted by Crown Prince Amon. Chances of Rewards Upon Delivering. Gold Chalice, being sought after by a mysterious faction. These were the 10 items out for auction today, the first 48 items were the same for all kingdoms across all continents. The last two items were special to Hazelgroove Kingdom and were linked with main story plot lines. Up till now in the game, quests and the main plot story played a very minimal role, as the player's strength was not sufficient to make an impact on the plot lines as a whole, as the tier 0 players were not even ants in front of those pulling the strings. But slowly as players started growing stronger, and progressing tiers, they would be engrossed in more and more quests and the game plot. The two items here the first red jewel entangled one with the royal faction of Hazelgroove, when the secret about the crown prince being practicing necromancy became known, there was immense retaliation from the masses, and the royal faction had to suppress the riots using force. It ended in a bloodbath. Should the one who delivers the red jewel to the crown prince choose his side in the war, they would suffer backlash from common NPCs and protesters. Should they oppose the royal faction, they would eventually be suppressed by the army. All in all it was a bad questline to get involved in, hence Rudra wanted nothing to do with it. However the second item had his interest, the chalice was wanted by the faction behind the blood merchant, the main storyline of the game. Whether or not he had anything in the auction, he absolutely wanted the last item at all costs. Rudra geared himself up after confirming the identity of all items to be the same as his past life. He was glad that his knowledge and actions had not changed the current world too much as of now. He had more than enough funds prepared for the auction, hence was confident at bidding for various important items. However the same couldn't be said for the alliance, completely feeling lost at what to buy, as sufficient information was not provided for any items, they felt they were at a big loss. Seven guildmasters kept arguing over what to bid and who should be the main voice of the bidding game today, as they just could not reach a consensus. The majority voting kept rejecting items after items that should be bid on, even after that the budget kept becoming an issue. Finally not even three items gained majority consensus. The situation was not in favor of the guild, as Pink Lotus felt frustrated in the room. Chapter 112, Auction, 3 The auction started as the announcer introduced himself. This time around it was surprisingly an female announcer for the event, a fairy at that with beautiful rainbow wings behind her white dress. Against common misconception, fairies are not palm-sized in Omega, they are full human-sized people, their distinctive feature from the winged human race was their rainbow transparent wings and their pointy ears. The announcer had an extremely pleasant voice as she started the auction with greetings ladies and gentlemen, the auction committee extends their warmest welcomes to everyone here in attendance today. We hope the bidding process will go smoothly and everyone will have a great experience. Before we start the auction process, please let me remind you off the rules. 1. Any raise of the plaque card would result in a minimum bid increment. There are no, mistakenly, raising of plaques, once raised, will be considered as a bid. 2. Borrowing of money is allowed this time around in the auction, just before making any bids, make sure the person making the bid, has the amount in person. All invalid bids will be denied by the system and the second highest bidder shall gain the item, whereas the invalid bidder will be subjected to monetary fines. Three incremental bids of money greater than minimum increment need to be spoken into the microphone provided to each participant. For the auction house shall have no responsibility of the item. Once delivered to customer. All right ladies and gentlemen. Please enjoy your time here. She said cutely as the first item was brought OM the stage. The auction arena had 18,000 participants this time around. Rudra was shocked to see the huge crowded arena, it was a slugfest. Rudra could imagine the intense bidding in this crowd of people. He thanked his lucky stars he was there sitting in VIP, the last time he participated in the auction he was one of those unrecognizable faces in the crowd. A small-time guild leader with just over 15,000 gold for the auction, desperately bidding on every item that could be afforded, 
but walking out without a single one. Sitting in the VIP he could not help but get nostalgic over his past. The first item was brought out for the auction, it was the weapon section that was brought out first, starting with a rare grade bow for 1000 gold coins minimum increment of 100. 2000 some enthusiastic kid shouted. 2100. 2300. 2500. 2700. Before even five seconds passed there were a variety of bids being thrown. Rudra sighed at these idiots. The bow wasn't even worth the initial 1000 they proposed. It was rare grade for God's sake, no need to fight over it like dogs. The first bid went to a third-rate guild leader at 6,700 gold coins. He had absolutely overpaid the price, however the respect he gained for the money forked out was probably worth it to him. There were murmurings going around, some couldn't believe someone just forked out 6,700 gold at once. How shocked would they become when Rudra started bidding later? The second weapon then came. Then the third. Fourth. Finally the last weapon was brought out for auction. It was a dark gold grade assassin's dagger. The initial bid was for 10,000 gold with a minimum increment of 500. The buyout was at 60,000 gold. The bidding opened. 11,000. 12,000. 20,000. 23,000. 25,000. 30,000. 32,000. 33,000. There was intense bidding competition going on. Finally just as the announcer said, 33,000 going one. Going twice. Rudra said, buy out. Boom just like that 60k spent. Everyone in the audience felt shocked. Just how rich was VIP one to increase the price from 33 to 60k without batting an eye. Even the previous bidder for the item felt baffled at the development. What just happened? Was he just waiting for others to fight like kids before just snooping in to buy it out? Fairy smiled as she said, congratulations VIP 1 for winning the item. Meanwhile at the Alliance VIP room number 2, they were all casually observing the situation developing, there were three Alliance leaders in favor of buying the dagger, but four were against hence they did not bid on it. They sure felt surprised at how easily the elite's box said buy out for the item though. Huh, idiots wasting money on small items, probably won't have enough left for the big ones, the love smashing sarcastically said. But Pink Lotus countered immediately, anyone with half a brain would know they are not to be underestimated, if anything this action proves they have deeper pockets than we think. The other leaders agreed, it made a love smashing look like a fool. So he just snorted and took his seat. However he kept glaring daggers at Pink Lotus. Yua just shrugged it off. She kept thinking about Rudra in the box across though, and how they always kept ending in different factions and were never together, how much did she long for them to be in the same box, rather than these bunch of arguing idiots. However things were the way they were in her wishful thinking was not going to change anything. Soon the second segment of rare ingredients came up for auction. The thing with this segment was, nobody really knew the real use of the things being displayed here, they did not know the worth, hence everyone was reluctant to pay up. Well everyone but the reincarnator who had the knowledge about every single herb being presented. Rudra just kept saying buy out after buy out for all 10 herbs, forking about 400,000 gold in the single segment. By now everyone just went crazy. Just who was that mad guy in VIP box 1? Before anyone could even place a bid for the initial sum, he shouted buy out. This way of gaming. Too rich. 600 stones, 1 bonus. 1200 stones, 2 bonus. 1800 stones, 3 bonus. 2400 stones, 5 bonus. 3000 stones, 7 bonus. Chapter 113, Auction, 4. The next item up was the potion recipes, now this segment had many INTRS aid buyers, potion recipes could be a one-time investment that would generate potentially endless returns, if all the cards are played correctly. But it is only worth being purchased at the right price, some potion recipes are having an extremely niche use, while some recipes are inferior to other products in the market, only for the correct price is it worth it. The first potion recipe up for bidding was the basic poison dispel potion. Starting bid, 15,000 gold. Minimum increment, 500 gold. Buyout, 100,000 gold. The item was not bad, and had many INTRS aid bidders, 
especially the two ND rate guilds, they wanted this item to become the backbone of their guild's economy. Most people looked towards VIP room 1 before placing the initial bid. They were scared that it would buy out the moment it was placed. After waiting for a good 10 seconds, and hearing no voice from VIP 1, someone shouted. 16,000. 18,000. 21,000. 22,000. 26,000. 29,000. The intense bidding war had started. Rudra looked at the product and the surging price, it was a good product to have to be honest, however because it was the basic poison dispel potion, he felt it didn't fit the theme of elite lifestyle, had it been intermediate or advanced grade, he would have bought it in a heartbeat. Kalash was baffled at how Rudra bid at the auctions, he was of an opinion that even if 1000 gold could be saved it should be saved, but his opinion fell on deaf ears as Rudra did as Rudra liked. Karna sighed at this scene, he did not understand Rudra's actions at all, buying ingredients whose name he had never heard, for the buyout prices, it was not ideal in his view. However time and time again Rudra has shown that his actions always have a deeper meaning, hence he trusted the leader and kept mum. Meanwhile the bid for the basic poison dispel potion reached the 50,000 mark. It seemed like a second-rate guild would win the bidding war as no other bids were being heard, when finally for the first time VIP2 placed a bid. 60,000 gold coins. A direct increment of 10,000. Although not as flamboyant as Rudra directly saying buy out, it was still flashy. The second rate guild felt despair, it did not have more than 70,000 liquid funds total, should he use more than 60,000 on a single item. It would be bad for the guild. Cursing in their minds, they kept their silence. The fairy auctioneer went on to say 70,000 going once. 70,000 going twice. 70,000 going thrice, congratulations to VIP2 for the item. The alliance cheered after winning their first item, the overall atmosphere had improved a little as it was decided that Scorpio the leader of Sea of Poison Guild would become the spokesperson for the auction, and all transactions under 500,000 will need no majority voting and could be decided by him alone. Hence under this agreement, the first part of the auction for the bidding of common items, would be taken care by him. The items kept coming, as more and more recipes were out for auction. Every item saw passionate bidding as the smaller guilds kept fighting over minimum increments to win the bidding war. The second item went for 45,000 gold to a second-rate guild. Similarly item 3 went for 50k to a third-rate guild. Item 4, 5, 6 were bought by other two ND-rate guilds in the neighborhood of 40 to 55k. Only when item 7 came out, did Rudra's interest peak. Item 7 was Appearance Alteration Potion. Appearance Alteration Potion, intermediate, put in a strand of hair of the person whose appearance you wish to take. Effects, changes your face and body type to fit the appearance of the target. Note, does not change the height and voice. Time limit, 30 minutes. Initial bidding price, 30,000 gold. Minimum increment, 1,000 gold. Buyout, 150,000 gold. The bidding started enthusiastically for the item. 40,000 gold. 45,000 gold. 50,000 gold. 60,000 gold. When the bidding slowed down a little after the initial outburst. VIP 2 bid 75,000 gold. Everyone turned their heads to look up at VIP 2. They were in awe of the grandeur of the big guilds. Still some second-rate guilds did not wish to leave the item as they countered at 80,000 gold. Scorpio was pissed by the counter as he said 100,000 gold. The second-rate guilds were silenced now, 100,000 was about their limit for a single item. The ferry went. 100,000 going once. 100,000 going twice. Buyout. A sound came from VIP 1. Rudra waited till the last second to buy out the item just to piss off VIP2, he had long made his mind he wanted it, and with VIP2 bidding he knew he would either get it at buyout or not at all. But still he wanted them to feel that they are winning the bid, until he crushed their hopes at the last moment. Ferry said, congratulations to VIP1 for winning the bid. Rudra was very pleased with himself, and Karna was shaking his head. He's a teenage kid, the leader's mental age is not more than 13. Scorpio had a vein bulging on his forehead, as he was extremely pissed at Rudra. They had no choice but to move on. The mood had worsened though, everyone in the room was a little angry. 
The potion recipes 8, 9, 10 were pretty much useless as the market already had those circulating, hence after the intense bidding for item 7, they went for the low prices of 30k, 35k, and 37k. The potion segment came to a close with that, and the next segment of the incomplete recipes started. Chapter 114, Auction, 5. Plot thickens. For the next segments Rudra let Karna take the lead. Men are unreasonable people who are superstitious, although Rudra did not know the exact reason, he felt Karna was an incredibly lucky man. And should he bid for the unknown items and that there will be something unexpectedly good coming out of it. Karna much obliged Rudra's request, actually he really wanted to get the bidding feeling, he was really exited to take part in the auction. There were, four, incomplete designs and Rudra asked him to buy all four of them. There was no information on the incomplete designs. Hence it could be any material. It could be design of a sword or design of some armor or even design of some accessories like necklaces. One had absolutely no idea what may pop up from the incomplete designs. However one thing was for sure, it would be incomplete. Half a design or one third of a design. If the blacksmith and engineer working together are talented enough, then they may figure out the rest. But for most complicated designs, it was impossible, and usually the self-guessed modifications would lead to an inferior overall product. Hence it was better not to waste time on it. Naturally even the alliance members were very much interested in trying their luck on these items. The incomplete designs were being sold individually, hence theoretically without any information, all four should have gone for the same price. However in reality that was not the case. Incomplete design, part, forward slash. Grade, an incomplete design of an object. Initial price, 60,000 gold. Minimum increment, 1,500 gold. Buyout price, 200,000 gold. The bidding started. 60,000. 66,000. 75,000. 90,000. 1, 0, 0, 500 was the final bid from a second-rate guild, it was then that the alliance made their first big bid. 1, 40, 0, 0, 0 from VIP box 2. Karna was just standing there, watching the entire bidding process, somehow he had frozen, he could not process how to bid currently as his heart wished to make minimum increment, however his mind told him to make a big increment to make his interest clear. Then there was also the reputation of VIP 1 to take care of, as Rudra was there making buyouts after buyouts. He bid 141,500 gold. Everyone in the audience was shocked, this was not VIP 1's style, he usually only did buyouts, yet right now he did minimum increment. Is he toying with VIP 2? The auctioneer announced it, we have 141500 from VIP 1, do we have 150000? 150,000 gold. Shouted Scorpio, clearly pissed with the ever incessant bidding of the elites. There was Karna bidding 151,500 gold. There was a loud laugh from everyone in the audience, everyone felt that VIP 1 was just messing with VIP 2. In a fit of anger, Scorpio directly said, Buy out. It's a buyout for VIP 2, congratulations on winning the item. The people in VIP 2 were a little annoyed at having to buy out an item, and a little exited to see what it was. They opened the design, it turned out to be a useless necklace. Pearl necklace, one half, rare, charm plus one. Restrictions, female only. Scorpio cursed their bad luck. What a useless item. They just paid 200k for it, what an absolute watts of money. Rudra just sighed, why was his vice guild master such a huge miser? Rudra said, oh god damn it Karna, you single-handedly have brought back more than 20 million gold to the guild, we have a budget of over 50, please overcome your base instincts and buy out the remaining items. He absolutely admonished Karna and asked him to buy out the rest three designs immediately. Karna wanted to argue, but also he understood, that yeah the elites were ridiculously rich and they need not worry for a sum of 600k gold. He did as he was told, buying out the other three designs. The alliance were feeling happy inside, as they hoped the elites paid a huge price for getting absolutely nothing in return, however boy oh boy were they wrong. The three designs turned out to be Automatic Arrow Shooting Ballista, one third, epic, a piece of the design of Automatic Arrow Shooting Ballista. Arrow Capacity in one round, 2000. Reload Time, one minute. Restriction, K 
cannot load heavy javelins. It was a damn good design. Rudra's eyes almost popped out of his sockets when he saw it. Karna was damn lucky, this was a great design. Rudra now anticipated the second design even more. Automatic arrow shooting ballista, two-thirds, epic, a piece of the design of automatic arrow shooting ballista. Arrow capacity in one round, 2000. Reload time, one minute. Restriction, cannot load heavy javelins. What the hell? Karna's luck was wayy too good. Rudra's heart was beating fast now. He didn't dare to even dream that what would happen if the last design was also an automatic arrow shooting ballista. But what if? Just what if? Automatic arrow shooting ballista, three-thirds, epic, a piece of the design of automatic arrow shooting ballista. Arrow capacity in one round, 2000. Reload time, one minute. Restriction, cannot load heavy javelins. It happened. He had the complete design. Rudra jumped out of his seat, as he tackled Karna into a hug. He didn't have words for this event. Karna's luck was just heaven-defying. Had anyone else opened the items, it would not have turned out this way, Rudra was sure of it. The item was way too good, Rudra didn't even care about the rest of the auction, just this score alone would make his guild untouchable in the near future. Untouchable, unstoppable, a true overlord. In the wilds, POV Neatwit. A man in black hood and robes stood in front of Neatwit, interrupting his mob grinding. The men said, Sir Naman, your father Mr. Ambani wishes to speak with you, it's been thirteen years since you left home sir, he wishes to make things right again. Neatwit glared at the men. He was angry. Chapter 115, Who is Neatwit? Neatwit glared at the men in the robe, he was absolutely furious. His so-called father had the guts to call him back home after everything that had happened. Neatwit, aka Naman Ambani was the son of Mithun Ambani and and then Mistress Nia Cage. Mithun already had a wife and two kids when he had an affair with Nia, naturally his first wife was not best pleased with the ordeal. However things got ugly when his mom Nia got pregnant with twins. Naman and his twin sister Naomi were born as a result. Mithun reluctantly adopted the kids and the mistress into the Ambani household where they were raised until they were six. Although a part of the same household, they were forced to live in the servant quarters and were never given the official recognition of family. Never brought to public light, never given the title of children of Mithun Ambani. Ambani's real wife absolutely loathed the kids, and so did his first two children, one eight and one six years elder to the twins, both bullied the small kids right from the childhood. The only company Naman ever had was his twin sister Naomi and his mom Nia, and he loved them both dearly. His mom was not a foolish person however, as living in the Ambani mansion, all she did for six years was gather evidence, irrefutable evidence that Naomi and Naman were indeed Mithun Ambani's children. Videos of his real wife calling them bastards, video of Ambani calling them a mistake, video of them and their treatment in the mansion. She also collected Ambani's hair and nails as DNA evidence that she got tested in lab as proof of bloodline. Then one day when all the evidences she needed were collected, she sent the package and her two kids to her best friend, as she went on to confront Mithun Ambani. Nia threatened Mithun to go public with all the overwhelming evidence if she and her two children were not given the official status of being Ambani's. And with official status she meant 6% shares in the company and a seat at the board. This was the first time, anyone strong-armed Mithun Ambani into signing a contract. A contract that made Nia a board member and her two children eligible to become board members and receive the inheritance when they turned 21. It was a big win for Nia as she celebrated on call with her best friend telling her the good news, asking her to send over all the evidence to the decided drop location. But the happiness did not last for long. Just after the Ambani Corporation received the drop package and had made Nia sign an agreement that all the contents within the package can no longer be used to threaten or leverage the Ambani Corporation in any form in the future, and will be inadmissible any court of law around the world. That same day, in the temporary hotel room she was staying in, she called her friend, and exitedly talked about her and her children's bright future. But suddenly Nia said, Who are you, how did you get in here? And following that, there were three gunshots heard on the phone, and then there were Nia's screams. And her best friend knew, Nia had died there. Making a quick decision, she quickly packed her essentials and grabbed the two kids and fled the country that day itself. Which proved to be the smartest decision she ever made, 
because had she not the kids would have died that day then and there and she with them. She raised the twins herself for fourteen years. Now they were twenty, soon to turn twenty-one. Numan and Naomi naturally had nothing but hatred for the so-called father of theirs, because of whom, they lived a life in an isolated village out in nowhere. No internet, no cell phones, no credit cards, nothing that can trace their identities back to them and give assassins a target. It is due to this that Numan had an intense desire to be at the top of the leveling spot. Where everyone could notice him, even his name Neatwit, was a direct contrast to the insults his stepbrother would hurl at him every day calling him a dimwit. Numan grew up to look strikingly similar to Mithun Ambani, hence when the file on the top-ranking player was brought up by the Ambani Corporation, it was quickly noticed he looked like the CEO, raising a huge mess inside the corporation as to those who knew what transpired. Should the twins turn 21 they would control 9% of the corporation each, inheriting their mother's share too for a total of 18%. Having two seats on the board. That was a very dangerous thought to have. They could cause the company serious irreversible damage should they wish so. 18% of a multi-trillion dollar company was no joke. It was in trillions. The Ambani Corporation had grown desperate over the years trying to find the two children. Even approaching the Cuber Corporation for the identity of the player Neatwit, upon discovery. On the surface it looked like the conflict of the Ambani Corporation with the true elites was stemming from the fact that they were supported by Ethan Gray. However the reality was it was because they recruited Neatwit, also the real mission of Orochimaru was to find out about Neatwit's actual hideout and current information on his in-game location. Only seven days remained until the twins turned twenty-one, the world was in for a big strum that day. Simply taking out his blade, Neatwit killed the messenger sent by Ambani Corporation, as he gained plus eighty infamy. The time for his revenge was nearing. The day he waited for fourteen years. The day to avenge his mother. Chapter 116, Bonus Chapter, Auction, 6 Neatwit went on to clear his infamy by paying a price at the temple, NPC, S did not take kindly to those with high infamy. He wondered about whether or not should he tell Rudra about his past. And his real identity, he initially had no plans to join a guild, or any organizations, however something about the carefree Rudra on the road to the capital singing songs and dancing captivated him. He longed for that carefree life, after the bandit attack, and seeing Rudra's strength he was convinced about the men, that it was his strength that let him be so carefree. Hence he decided to follow the men. When the live feed of the Demolition Boys guild leader name dropped the Ambani group, it was then that Neatwit realized that his presence had brought trouble to the guild. However he was having so much fun in the guild, where he had found a sense of belonging that he did not wish to quit. He decided to contribute to the guild to the best of his abilities and even sent Rudra a lump sum of five million gold to help the guild in the coming auction. It was partly because of his guilt, and partly because he was tired of running away now. Soon it will be time for his revenge, and when he became a trillionaire, he naturally wanted the elites to have a share of the pie. The seventh super guild, did not sound too bad did it? But still the waters ahead were not smooth, and Neatwit knew that, hence he decided that after the auction, he would sit with Rudra one on one and discuss openly about the future, should Rudra choose to not take part in the coming mess, he would quietly leave. However should he choose to take his side, then he would naturally repay the favor once he was a trillionaire. The attempt to meet him today meant that his father was getting impatient now. Well so was he. Back in the auction. The atmosphere in the VIP room one was so joyous that all three members were dancing. Yes there was the auction continuing downstairs, with people fervently bidding and trying to win items in the next segment, yet the wealthiest party inside VIP 1 did not even pay attention to what items were out for bidding as the three were dancing. Karna and Fatty absolutely had no idea how great the machine was, except that it was epic grade which shocked them, but seeing Rudra so elated made them very happy. The three were singing the song Fireball and dancing in circles. Especially Fatty, he sang in a high pitch like some opera singer. Now baby get your booty naked, take off all your clothes. And light the roof on fire. Tell her, tell her baby 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 baby. I'm on fire. I tell her baby 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 baby. I'm a fireball. They sang while shaking their butts. Yep, they were twerking. It was then that Karna had a weird thought and stopped dancing. What would happen if someone from the outside saw them shaking their butts in VIP 1? The guild leader, vice guild leader and the chief blacksmith of the true elite's guild, 
inside the VIP room of an auction, shaking their butt singing a song while the auction was ongoing. Embarrassing. Too embarrassing. After a good 15 minutes of celebration, they decided to give their bums a break and refocus their attention on the auction. A lot of items had been sold and currently the last section of the common items was up for auctioning. It was a skill book dark gold grade. Skill book, blink, dark gold, teleport to any spot within a 5 meter range of user, upon activation instantly. Cooldown time, 5 minutes. Caution, takes heavy toll on stamina. Initial bid price, 80,000 gold. Minimum increment, 5,000 gold. Buyout price, 400. 000 gold. Currently the bid was ongoing at 100,000 gold. 120,000 gold. 140,000 gold. Anyone knew the value of this skill in PvP? It was a priceless skill to own, and Rudra from his past life experiences knew the worth of this skill. He needed to have it for himself at any cost. 200,000 came the bid from VIP2, everyone fell silent hearing the bid. 300,000 came the bid from VIP1. Scorpio was in a turmoil now, he had bought 7 skill books in the last 10 minutes, and spent close to 1.5 million in funds, they needed the funds to compete for the important 10 items that were coming. The 300,000 saved here would go a long way. He really wanted the skill for himself, but showed restraint for the greater good of the alliance. The fairy waited for other bids but seeing none she said. 300,000 gold going once. 300,000 gold going twice. 300,000 gold going thrice. Sold to the gentleman in VIP box 1. Booyah. Rudra rejoiced, a great skill was added in his arsenal. Finally the 40 common items auction came to an end, and it was time for the special items auction to start. Everyone below a second-rate guild who did not have funds over 2 million side, they were nothing more than spectators now. Whereas the various second-rate guilds and the two VIP boxes got serious, the real auction was about to start now. The fairy announced, moving on to the second segment of the auction, we have some extraordinary items for you guys to bid from, there will be no buyout prices in this segment, we wish every bidder a very good bidding experience. The first item was brought to the stage. Electric net, dark gold, a net used to capture mounts in the wild for the very first time. Immobilizes the target, making them less likely to submit and thwarts escape attempts. Initial price, 3 million gold. Minimum increment, 100,000 gold. It was the mount capturing electric net, with an initial price of 3 million gold. Rudra knew the importance of this net, but with the entire True Elite's guild already having mounts, he did not see the immediate need of buying this product. But knowing that he could resell it for 9 million gold easily in the future with the expansion pack of flying mounts in the future, he was willing to fork out 6 as a long time investment. The bidding for the electric net began. 3 million came a call from a second rate guild, it was probably all of their funds, they would have to drop out after 1 or 2 minimum increments. However before any smaller guilds could even squabble, 4 million came the sound from VIP1. Loud gasps were heard in the audience. 5 million came the sound from VIP2. Everyone turned towards VIP2. The two big shots had finally started the bidding war. The second-rate guilds knew they had no chance now, and hence they resigned to watching the show. Just how would it turn out? The alliance needed the net much more than anyone out there, they understood the need for mounts, and good-natured ones at that. A few of their members had mounts, hence they understood the complications that came with getting good ones, they were too expensive for direct purchase and too hard to capture without proper tools. They needed this net much more than others. They needed to quickly fill their players' ranks with mounts to gain a better grip on leveling grounds, they were willing to purchase the item up till 7 million gold. 6 million, came the shout from VIP1. 7 million came the counter from Scorpio. Everyone was shocked at the intense bidding, the increments were of a million from each side. It was almost like the auction up till this point was a fake auction. Scorpio knew that this was his limit, even a minimum increment of 100,000 and he was out, he pushed for a million rays at once because he wanted to deter the enemy, thinking they were too interested in the item. Should Rudra bid 8 million, he would loose out on 900,000 gold at once as he would let go at 7.1 million. Should he not bid, 7 million was already acceptable to him. Either way he would win. But Rudra did not bid again. 
the alliance won the bid for the first item at 7 million gold. Chapter 117, Auction, 7. The next item up was the mallet. Hephaestus's mallet, dark gold, upgradable, a must-have for blacksmiths, the mallet was designed keeping the forging god as an idol, increases crafting efficiency by 25%. Initial bid, 3 million gold. Minimum increment, 100k gold. Buyout price, no buyout. Fatty Kalash was salivating for this item. He really wanted to have it. He looked at Rudra with those puppy eyes that only he could muster. The same one he had used since childhood to ask for food from Rudra's tiffin. Rudra was absolutely powerless to that gaze, he himself had absolutely no interest in the item, however he knew Fatty deserved it. He had worked hard for the guild, and had done a really good job in managing the lifestyle stores. Rudra rolled his eyes saying, fine. He placed the first bid for 3 million gold. The second-rate guilds were all out on this item, the only obstruction that might come was from the alliance in VIP box too. But even they felt that 3 million was a little too much for a hammer. They let it pass. 3 million gold went once. 3 million gold went twice. Sold. At 3 million to VIP 1. Ha, huh, cheaper than I thought it would be, Rudra thought, as he was prepared to go up to 5 million for the item. However he got it for 3. Kalash looked very happy with the item, as he smiled like a kid on Christmas. Rudra smiled, this was the whole point of why he made the damn guild. It was for moments like this, where the members could be genuinely happy. The next item came up for bidding. A page from Demon's Diary. Initial bidding price, 2 million gold. Minimum increment, 100k gold. Buyout price, no buyout price. Rudra had to have this item, he already had three pages from Demon's Diary, and every page he came across was important. Although up till now the three pages had shown no special effects, Rudra knew that down the line it would be something useful. He placed the initial bid for 2 million gold. 2.1 million gold. Came the bid from a second-rate guild. Rudra face-palmed himself. Who was this idiot, Rudra was sure that this guy had zero information on Demon's Diary, yet he only bid to gamble on the item, seeing the description. Rudra wanted to directly raise it to 3 million, to deter the small fishes, however if VIP 2 got a whiff that he was too interested in the item, they would make him pay. 2.5 million gold Rudra bid. It was the best number he could think of, that balanced both criteria. As he hoped for it worked. As 2.5 million gold went once. 2.5 million gold went twice. The item was sold to VIP 1 at 2.5 million gold. The audience was completely abuzz now, up till now in the auction, both VIP boxes had spent close to 10 million in gold. Now the real bidding war came, where the depth of one's resources would actually come out. Who had the most dough in this bidding round, would be figured out now, as all of the next items were worth drooling over. Spell book, Endless Devastation, turns the ground into a barren wasteland, debuffs everyone except the caster of the spell, in a 200 meter radius. Effect 1, minus 5% AGI. Effect 2, minus 5% PHY. Initial bidding price, 4 million gold. Minimum increment, 200k gold. Buyout price, no buyout. The alliance was interested in this item, and Sue was Rudra. The merit of this item was obvious as the debuff domain could be extremely useful for PvE. Especially a 200m domain was huge. However the drawback was also obvious, that it debuffed allies and enemies altogether. Rudra did not want this item for himself, however he knew it would be invaluable to some other guild members. Karna. Neatwit. Mediv. One of these three could benefit hugely from having this move in their arsenal, and for all intents and purposes he would give it to them. Rudra placed the first bid for 4 million gold. 4.4 million gold, came the shout from VIP 2. Rudra nodded, he knew this would happen. Let's see who has deeper pockets, Rudra thought. 5 million. He placed a bid. 5.4 million, came the bid from VIP 2. Everyone else aside, Scorpio wanted the skill for himself. He was not going to let it go easily. However the thing really choking him currently was the overall budget of the guild. 
he could not compete head-to-head -head with the elites, should he spend more than six million on the item, he should not be able to bid for any other items in the auction. Six million, said Rudra. Scorpio grit his teeth, as the six alliance guild leaders would not let him bid a penny more. Six million gold went once. Six million gold went twice. The item was sold for six million gold to VIP1. About 16 million of the elite's budget of 55 million gold was spent. About 10 million of the alliance's 20 had been spent. Naturally the advantage of the elite's funds would show, going forward now. The next item was up for bidding. Spellbook, Stormbringer, zaps the enemy with a huge bolt of lightning, sure to trigger lightning damage. Plus 200% lightning damage. 50% chance to stun the target. Plus 5% chance to trigger critical damage. Initial bidding price, 4 million gold. Minimum increment, 200k gold. Buyout price, no buyout. This was an item Rudra wanted for himself. His darkness blast was really lacking in damage output and he needed something strong in his arsenal going forward. Rudra placed the initial bid of 4 million gold. Yua actually wanted the item badly. However the alliance members would not allow a budget of 4 million gold for a single player item. In the end 4 million gold went once. 4 million gold went twice. The item was sold at 4 million gold to the players in VIP 1. The next item was the intermediate mana potion recipe. Potion recipe, intermediate mana potion, a recipe to create a potion that refill lost mana quickly. Initial bidding price, 2 million gold. Minimum increment, 100k gold. Buyout price, no buyout. This was supposed to be one of the most sought after items in the entire auction, however after the elites had the advanced mana potion recipe and capabilities of bulk production, no faction was too interested in buying the intermediate one. Initially even Rudra was not much interested, however Fatty Kalash came up with a brilliant idea that made Rudra interested in the item. They could use real-world corporate chain ideas and make sets of mana potions to sell in the shop. A set of three potions. Basic, intermediate, advanced. To sell as a single unit. In this way they would move more units gaining more profits. As they could brand it as a potion for every situation pack. They could also use the pack mentality to vamp up the advanced mana potion sales. As they would price the intermediate mana potions at 80 gold and advanced mana potions at 95, everyone would feel like the intermediate mana potions were too expensive and not worth it, however they would now gladly spend the 95 gold on the advanced mana potions as they would feel, they are getting more value for their money. It's the same logic of the small, medium and large popcorn tubs pricing in a movie theater, the medium is priced just a little lower than the large, making every consumer go for large popcorn. Rudra was impressed by Fatty Kalash's business mind and placed the bid for 2 million gold. Going once. Going twice. The item was sold to VIP 1 for 2 million gold. This is especially true because of you guys gifting me crazy sums of money day in and day out. Big big shout out to Leo underscore Crispy Eye for the 3000 coin gift. And to Justin underscore Bowen for the 2000 coin gift. Chapter 118, Auction, Final Everyone in VIP Room 2 were rejoicing about the idiotic purchases made by the elites. In their estimation, the highest funds the elites could have accumulated would be 25 to 28 million gold. With 22 million gold already spent by them the alliance estimated that they could at max bid for one item of the four left, and that they could grab the other three easily. Scorpio was in an especially good mood now as he was prepared to squeeze out max money for a single item from the elites. He planned on pushing the prices up to 7 or 8 million to route the elites in the next item itself. The next four items were the most valuable of the entire auction lot from a guild perspective, whether it was the two blueprints or the two Hazelgroove special items, they were all sure to have a huge impact on the overall guild dynamic and future plans. The next item was brought up for auction. Blueprint, Reinforced Brick, a blueprint for reinforced concrete bricks, makes a structure extremely strong. Initial bidding price, 5 million gold. Minimum increment, 250k gold. Buyout price, no buyout price. This item was pure gold, and Rudra knew it, it was a must-have item even for the remaining 30 million gold he had left. This item was worth it all. Why? Because he knew each brick sold to the kingdom itself at 500 gold, costing 200 gold to make, one could earn 300 gold per brick. 
Usually construction orders came for about 30 to 50k bricks at a time, meaning the guild would earn millions on fulfilling each order. Other than that, after the fourth update and the kingdom expansion pack, where guilds would take over kingdoms, the reinforced bricks would make the strongest forts and strongholds bricks could make. Golden Investment With huge returns both short-term and long-term. Rudra would absolutely not let this item slip. Bidding the initial 5 million, Rudra got the ball rolling. On the other side, Scorpio just gave a sly smile, let's see how much money you got. He thought as he bid 6 million. 7 million. Came the response from Rudra's side. The audience was already exasperated at the huge pools of gold being showered by the guilds. The increments they were talking about was in millions. Millions in good. At the current conversion rate of $435 to one gold coin. That was $435 million being tossed around as raises for items. Insane, truly insane. 8 million, came the counter from Scorpio. He felt uncomfortable making this bid, he was not sure if the elites would make a higher bid, so he was holding his breath here. But 9 million, came the sound from VIP1 as he breathed a sigh of relief. That's it, they are out of the game, he thought. 9 million goes once. 9 million gold goes twice. It gets sold at 9 million gold to the elites. The entire audience clapped at the win of this bid, it was truly exhilarating to watch these two titans go at it. For those keeping tabs the VIP one had spent 31 million gold in this auction up to this point. It was an absolutely astronomical amount, but most expected this to be their last bid, and that they were out. Even inside the alliance room, Hugs were exchanged as they were sure about winning the last three items without opposition. The next item was brought up to bid. Blueprint, fishing rod, a blueprint to create a device that catch fishes and other ocean mounts. Initial price, 5 million gold. Minimum increment, 250k. Buyout price, no buyout price. Now this was a item Rudra was not really interested in, however he knew that after the third update ocean expansion pack would be open and the guilds would battle out for ocean supremacy, those having ocean mounts would benefit greatly in that race. However with Karna bringing back the amazing pirate ship, he was still okay to let this item go. 5 million came Scorpio, S voice from VIP 1. He was almost sure that 5 million would be the last ever bid placed. But much to his dismay. There was almost immediately a second voice. 6 million. Came the voice from VIP 1. Everyone round the auction house looked at each other in shock. 31 million already spent, yet they still had 6 million left. Ridiculous. Scorpio wanted to pull his hair out. Just how damn rich were the elites? 7 million, he said gritting his teeth. That left only a little over 3.5 million gold for them, completely crushing their future plans to acquire other items. The alliance immediately went into panic mode trying to raise another 3 million or so in capital for upcoming items. Yet to their dismay 8 million came the call from VIP 1. 8 was Rudra's limit for the item, but little did he know that his simple bid of 8 million had completely crushed the other party's worldview. For the first time since the auction started, just because he couldn't stand it, Scorpio made a 9 million bid, without consulting other members. Yua was instantly furious. The item was not worth 9 million, Scorpio went overboard. Except a love smashing, every other guild leader expressed their dissatisfaction to this decision. Much to their dismay. VIP 1 did not bid 10 million. 9 million went once. 9 million went twice. It was sold at 9 million to the Alliance. Yes, they only had 1.5 million gold left now, probably out of the race for the Kingdom special items. The members frantically tried to arrange for funds, as it was a race against time now. The fairy congratulated VIP2 on winning the item when she introduced the last segment the kingdom special items to bid for. Hazel Groove special items. Red Jewel, quest item, an item wanted by Crown Prince Amon. Chances of rewards upon delivering. Initial bidding price, 4 million gold. Minimum increment, 200k gold. No buyout price. The item was introduced, and everyone expected VIP1 or 2 to bid for it. But three minutes passed and no bid was made. The second-rate guilds went crazy as three of the biggest ones allied on the spot to try pool their resources, barely making the initial 4 million bid. 
Their dreams came true when four million gold went once. Four million gold went twice. And it was sold at four million gold. It was crazy. The second rate guilds could not contain their joy. The atmosphere inside the alliance was not so joyous though, as the seven guilds put many things as collateral immediately to raise about 8 million gold pool total. They finally had 9.5 million gold to bid for the last item. Although it was not the outcome that they wanted, it was truly unfortunate that they could not raise money in time to win the red jewel. Finally the last item was brought up for auction. Gold chalice, being sought after by a mysterious faction. Initial price 5 million gold. Minimum increment of 250k gold. No buyout price. To their dismay VIP won bid 5 million for the item. Scorpio countered at 6. Rudra raised it to 7. When Scorpio countered at 7.5. Rudra raised it to 8.5. Scorpio countered at 9. Rudra countered at 10. The alliance members were stunned silent, 7 first-rate guilds. The absolutely biggest guilds with the best backing had lost bidding to a solo guild of 50 members called the True Elites for the entire day. How rich were the elites to have so much gold left to bid? Even after selling their assets as collateral they would still lose the bid for an item. This was unacceptable. They refused to believe they were so monetarily inferior to the elites. However what could be done, whether they wanted or not. 10 million went once. It went twice. And it was sold to the elites for 10 million gold. The audience clapped in mad appreciation of the tycoon in VIP 1, as Rudra was happy to end the auction with a lot of money still at hand. Seven of the last ten items had landed in their hands, it was an absolutely amazing show of strength. Speculations had been running wild on the forums over who was VIP 1 and who was VIP 2, while there was only the Alliance and the Elites however most assumed VIP 1 to be the Alliance, as they were seven top guilds together. However were they in for a surprise. All in all it had been a fruitful event. Chapter 119, A New Wave of Recruits, Fan Service Chapter Finally the task that Rudra had assigned Ethan had been completed. All of the existing true elite members, whether the main guild, or the lifestyle branch, had all been transferred with family to the upside. Well everyone except Orochimaru. And yes that included Neatwit, when he joined the guild even he gave his details to the administration department. However not one member knew about the relocation plan. Ethan Gray's agent showed up one day, with a video of in-game Rudra as Shikuni. Asking the guild member to relocate to the upside, where they had a new gaming tower. A private transport vehicle and jets escorted each member to the upside. Neatwit was originally very reluctant, however her sister Naomi and his adopted aunt both agreed to the relocation. Well everyone knew that the upside was the safest and best place to live in the whole world, if you had good ties with Ethan Gray. With their 21 ST birthday fast approaching. They needed to come out of their hiding anyway, hence when the chance came, they gladly accepted. The journey to the upside was full of anxiety, as Neatwit feared an attack from anywhere. However, the secrecy of Ethan Gray was top-notch, nobody found out how quietly, overnight the entire elite gaming branch had been relocated. Not only the original members, but 300 new recruits had been enrolled into the elite fold, flying them all to the upside. Ethan Gray had spent more than $7 billion in the construction of the true elite's gaming tower. It was a 120 storage skyscraper in the upside, with 30,000 6BHK apartments, two floors of gym, 37 swimming pools, a library, workspaces, an indoor bowling alley, tennis courts, martial arts dojo, and every other amenity one could think of. Each of the apartment was fully furnished and had custom-made gaming helmets to play Omega. The most striking feature was that the guild hall. Built on floor 60 at the heart of the building was exactly the same as in-game, guild hall, giving the players a sense of belonging. The last ones to arrive were Karna and Fatty Kalash, as they had been with Rudra in the auction. When everyone had assembled in the massive reception of the newly built elite tower. Amelia the guild secretary greeted all the members individually and started explaining the current situation. She told the members that starting now they will all be training and playing and living together in this gaming house and explained all the cool amenities of the upside. The guild members' mouths became completely agape, never in their dreams had they thought about receiving such a treatment. The initial resentment about flying them in without notice vanished in an instant, as the family members and they themselves had nothing but praises for the guild. 
Poison Toad Gamabunta aka Neath said, I knew joining the elites was the best decision ever. Poison Toad Gamakichi aka Nirvana said, Ha ha ha, I told you everything boss does is right. Mediv the Chief Wizard aka Miguel WN said, Now this is how you should live your life. Rhino the Chief Tank aka Raging Silver said, But where is the boss? Everyone wondered about where the boss Rudra was. Seeing everyone out of the game was very exiting, some people looked exactly the same, whereas some people looked nothing like the in-game character. One of those people was Vice Guild Master Karna aka Leo Crispy, he looked absolutely nothing like his in-game identity, being extremely jacked and tall in real life, he looked more of a t-shirt model. Neatwit Aka Naman Ambani was standing next to his sister, Naomi calmly chatting to every guild member who recognized him. All this was a golden feeling to him and his sister. It was the first time they had been a part of such a large gathering in their life. Such a good environment, and they were a part of it. Naturally both were very happy. It was then that Shikuni aka Rudra Rajput made his entry into the building, following him being 300 members in the clothes of the dojo called the No One. Everyone stopped what they were doing when they saw the boss walk in, cheers could be heard throughout the crowd. Rudra walked in towards the edge of the crowd, as everyone looked at him, he said, Floor 60, Guild meeting in 10 minutes. Saying so he walked off without greeting a single person, signing Karna, Fatty Kalash and Neatwit to tag along, he boarded an elevator with the three of them. When he entered the elevator, Rudra just closed his eyes and smiled, as the three bombarded him with questions, but he chose to remain silent. Floor 60, when everyone entered the guild hall looking area. Everyone who had been in the guild hall before cheered like madmen. The 300 new recruits were naturally puzzled at the reaction. Rudra took his usual place at the stage, as he looked at the 500 or so elite members in front of him, 350 combat division members and 140 lifestyle members, and 10 management members. Rudra finally took the stage as he said, Welcome to the elite tower guys. A loud cheer went throughout the crowd. Rudra raised his hand for silence. Sue, you like the new place? He asked. Again a loud cheer followed. Rudra smiled, it's a damn good place, isn't it? Worthy of the elites. It was then that someone from the crowd shouted. One for all, all for one. And every single guild member shouted, G.O. elites go. Cheers, were heard again. Now this is what Rudra wanted with his guild, he was extremely happy. He said, okay guys, listen up, first things first. Firstly we have fellow brothers from the No One Dojo, they are going to be members of the main guild from now on, please be kind to them. The members of the dojo all cupped their fist and bowed at the introduction. What Rudra did not say about them was that they were all ninjas and assassins trained in the mountain of Tai in Country F, they were all lethal assassins following a code of honor. Rudra knew about them, as in his previous life this group of assassins was the best ranked assassin group in the entire game who had successfully assassinated a super guild leader within his own guild hall. He had requested Ethan Gray to pull some strings to get those guys here as a part of his faction. It was not easy, Rudra had to defeat every single member 1v1 in a fight in game, before he gained their recognition and joined the guild. All 300 of them choosing the assassin class, they were a great addition to the guild's power lineup. The leader of the faction the no one was Sir Malanu Gatishio, however he was known throughout the world through his notorious assassin name, SMG. Everyone within the guild was extremely friendly towards the 300 new members as warm greetings were exchanged. Rudra continued, secondly, we have a rat within our ranks, a spy named Orochimaru, he is actually working for some other faction, and I know that this may come as a shock to many of you, but you know these kind of things happen in games, we should not let such incidences affect the guild's overall integrity, hence I decided to relocate the entire guild under one roof, this way the overall atmosphere shall not be polluted. Rudra's words were a consolation and a threat at the same time, the underlying meaning was, no one here is a spy, we are one family, however should you betray the guild, remember you are now living in country J and the upside. Now many of you may wonder, why did I not kick Orochimaru out, after finding out his identity, well. It's because he still has his uses, and we will manipulate him into doing the guild's bidding, hence never reveal important information to the guy, and also never let him feel that he is not a member of the guild, be warm to him. He is a lamb we raised to slaughter later. Everyone nodded in understanding. Rudra finally said, A lot will change, yet a lot will remain the same, but the guild structure will now see a slight shift, with there being elders, currently we will have five elders in the guild, 
our very own leveling freak Neatwit, our lifestyle manager and blacksmith Fatty Kalash, the dojo leader SMG, Amelia, and our very top performer Augustus one night. Rudra said as he pointed towards a masked man leaning in the corner. It was just a gimmick, and it was actually Ethan Gray behind the mask. However everyone in the guild looked shocked at the mention of the mysterious man Augustus one night who owned an NPC army. All right guys, the rest of the briefing will be conducted by Amelia later, for now let's all just party with each other and our families for the inauguration of the Elite Tower. Rudra said excitedly. Another round of cheers was heard. Today was going to be one of the best damn parties ever thrown in the upside. I promise everyone yet to be named that I have not forgotten about you all, and your time will come. Also great arcs coming ahead, the treasure map and the main quest line arcs, I know for sure you will enjoy. Chapter 120, A Confrontation Everyone was extremely happy in the guild hall, exited about their new life in the upsty. The party was extremely lively, with everyone fraternizing with each other and with each other's families. Little Max was the happiest, sitting with Fatty Kalash he ate slices of cake after cake, his entire face smothered in chocolate, he looked extremely cute. Rudra's parents talked with other parents. Naturally they were shocked and proud to see the respect their son commanded from everyone in the room. Rudra's mom was very happy, her nose arched 30 degrees higher than usual. Whereas Father Mahesh could only helplessly sigh following his exited wife. Ethan Gray was in the crowd, wearing a mask, and not many people approached him. This was not the first time Ethan had been to a party wearing a mask, but it was the only one that made him feel that he should not have. The atmosphere was so lively, he wanted to let loose too and enjoy the atmosphere. It was then that Rudra pulled his arms and pulled him on the dance floor with him. Ethan was stiff at first, but soon danced his heart out, seeing the men dance, many people slowly got rid of his unapproachable aura, and slowly he was included in a dance group. Ethan looked Rudra in the eye, and although no words were exchanged Rudra understood it all, Rudra said, Welcome to the elites. As he patted Ethan on the shoulder before moving on. Rudra went to the bar counter to get a drink, when his eyes fell on a stunning Asian girl beside him. Smooth jade-like skin, with exquisite features, a slim waist and a good bust. She was someone who would make people whistle at sight. Although dressed moderately in a loose-fitting dress, Rudra could see the well-defined figure beneath it. Beautiful, Rudra thought in his mind. She turned to look at Rudra, and caught him staring. The figure was none other than Naomi, Neatwit's twin sister, she thought Rudra must be staring at her because she looked like the female version of Naman. Hence she said, yes, I am Naman's twin sister. Rudra's brain crashed for a second, the information just breezed by without processing, he said, sorry, Naman who? It was an awkward situation, because Naman was right behind him, as he tapped on Rudra's shoulder, Rudra turned to look at Neetwit's face, and then it striked him, oh. Rudra said. Neatwit sheepishly scratched his nose, as Naomi giggled, Rudra cleared his throat as he extended his hand towards Naomi, guild leader Shakuni, but you can call me Rudra, pleasure to meet you. Naomi took his hand graciously as she said, Fastwit, level 36 healer, but you can call me Naomi. Rudra raised an eyebrow at this information level 36 healer at this stage of the game was an extremely impressive feat, she could easily get into any first-rate guild she wanted to, and they'd be happy to have her. Rudra asked, what guild are you a part of? Naomi smiled sheepishly as she said, none. Rudra looked at Neatwit puzzled as he asked, why not? Neatwit also looked towards the floor as he was too shy to answer. Rudra found the twins to be too reserved. It was awkward for him. Finally after what seemed like a long pause Naomi said, I want to join the elites, but fail to meet the threshold. Oh, so that's it, Rudra thought. A big conflict brew inside Rudra's mind at this point, at one side the male part of his brain wanted to be all chivalrous and accept the beautiful girl as a part of the guild, however the guild leader part had set a clear standard for entry into the guild. Both the male part and guild leader part argued for a while, before the finishing blow came as, she is talented level 36 healer, although not enough to be an elite, with the new members added to the party they needed more healers. Hence the male part won. Well, you can join. Rudra said in a deep voice. Naomi looked at Neatwit, her eyes sparkling. She really wanted to take Rudra up on the offer, however Neatwit spoke up, let her enter on her own merit, no need to give out favors. Rudra was internally extremely pissed at this cock-blocking brother, however externally he kept a big smile saying, if it's for an elder like you, 
and a talented priest like her, I think we can make an exception. Neatwit felt touched by Rudra's words, he felt Rudra was doing him a favor. His eyes moist he held Rudra's shoulders saying a weak, thank you. Rudra smiled, he wanted to get rid off this pesky brother and try flirt with Naomi a little bit more, ahem, ahem, no 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 he wanted to learn about her strengths and weaknesses in game to guide her towards a developing path. He absolutely did not want to talk to her because he was smitten by her beauty, or because he wanted to touch her flawless jade-like skin. Only because he was a nice guild leader who wanted to help his members, or that's how he lied to himself. However his plans were cut short when Neatwit asked him for private audience. He really wanted to reject the guy, but he did not want to appear rude in front of Naomi, so hesitatingly he decided to follow him. In the corridor where the two were alone, Neatwit sighed as he said, it's going to be a long story, however I think you should know about my and my sister's past, we are actually Mithun Ambani's children. Rudra's eyes widened at that statement, he was all ears now. Chapter 121, What's Next? Rudra just blanked out for a minute, the six trillionaires were pretty much celebrities in this world and their families were well known, often had Rudra been jealous of the beyond rich real life princes of sons and daughters that the trillionaires had. Yet never had he heard about Mithun and Bonnie having twin children. Seeing Naman's ugly expression, Rudra understood there was a story here. Naman said, look, I have to apologize to you, because I am in the true elite's guild it may be the reason why the Ambani Corporation is targeting the guild. It would only get uglier in the future, I have no good relations that side. If you choose so, you can cut me and my sister loose, there will be no hard feelings, I understand. Rudra raised his hand at this point and said, you are a guild member, the guild's slogan, one for all, all for one, is not just for show you know, any trouble that you are facing, you can count on everyone in the guild to have your back. Why be scared of some Mbani, let the world stand against us, I still promise you, we will come out of the scuffle being on top. We are the elites, and ain't nobody out there that we are scared of. Naman wanted to say more, but looking at the passionate look Rudra was giving him, all his worries disappeared, it was true, he had experienced it firsthand, that if the boss said they were going to win, then they would win. He had absolute faith in Rudra. Naman took a deep breath and started his story, my mother died when I was six, she was killed by my father. He sent assassins to murder my mom. My mother was not the legitimate wife of Mithun Ambani and hence me and my sister were born as bastards. Even though we lived in the Ambani mansion, we were never a part of that family. Abused, mistreated for six years, our mom was our only child. His voice cracked narrating this part of the story, Rudra could see he was trying hard not to cry. Our mom collected DNA evidence as well as various footages of different family members acknowledging our relation to Ambani over time and used it to gain 18% stock of the company. Rudra's eyes widened at this reveal, 18% was a lion's share of any company. The Ambani Corporation's net worth was $46 trillion, making Naman and you a multi-trillionaires with 18% stock. Naturally, because of the deal Ambani decided he was better off getting rid of the unwanted family, he killed my mom, and me and my sister were forced to go into hiding for the next 15 years. My mother's best friend took us in and raised us, growing up, we could never use credit cards, or internet, or anything that could compromise our identities at all, we had suffered a lot. Rudra could not even begin to imagine what they had been through. He chose not to offer fake words of condolences and chose to remain a silent listener. All these years, the only thing fueling me was my desire for revenge, I will burn the Ambani Corporation down, soon me and my sister will turn 21 and by law will inherit 18% of the company, that will be the start of Ambani's fall. Naman said, determination in his eyes. Rudra took a minute to process all the information bombarded at him. He then said, look, I don't know much about business, but Ethan Gray does, and I can vouch on his behalf that should you choose to trust him, he will bring the fight to Mithun Ambani like only he can. Naman seemed unsure of that option, but even he knew that Ethan was a tycoon well versed in the business ways, should that guy choose so, he could be a big help. Rudra then continued saying, in the game, we still need time, but should we cross paths with Mithun Ambani's main guild, we will find a way to absolutely crush them, and that's a promise on my part. Until that point, I am not afraid of a single thing that Ambani can pull off inside the game, and even less in real world. Even in his dreams he can't infiltrate the upside. Naman looked towards Rudra an incredulous expression on his face, never did he think that a game that he played casually will lead him to meet someone like Rudra. Who would help him in his purpose for this life, his revenge against Ambani? 
while sheltering him under his fold. He was genuinely touched by this gesture and swore internally that after he became a trillionaire he would become an economic backbone of the guild. Naman nodded, for sure. He said with a determined voice. He had a lot to think about now, he needed to ask his sister about her advice on involving Ethan Gray, should he trust Ethan Gray? The future seemed uncertain. Yet Naman never felt this calm. His vengeance was coming, and there was nobody who could stop him. After partying for a while, Rudra announced the end of the gathering, as he requested all members to meet in, game at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning in the guild hall. While everyone else exitedly went to their allotted apartments he went back to his house with family. He needed a good night's sleep before the long gaming session tomorrow. Chapter 122, Tasks Inside the virtual world, the true elite's HQ. The guild meeting was at 10 a.m. But Rudra along with Karna and the other elders met at 9 a.m. to discuss business. Rudra presided over the meeting as he said, Suhir, s the things we need to do for now. I have made a list, which I will be sharing with Amelia, but the gist of it is this. 1. The task for the Lifestyle Guild currently is to produce the automatic arrow shooting ballistas, we need to produce at least 17 ballistas in the following month, any and all expenses needed will be paid by the Guild, we just need to get it done. 2. The Demolition Boys are trying to sell their stock of advanced mana potions to gain back some capital, at 90 gold a bottle. Hence, to disrupt their chain we will roll out the pack of 3 potions as suggested by Kalash at $90 too. Although it will lessen our margins for a while, but I think we can gain greater volume while suppressing the opposition. 3. We need to start producing the reinforced concrete bricks, as much as possible, it can be slow, but the process needs to be started, I will bring the contracts to sell them, but the production needs to be handled by the lifestyle department. Hire more NPC if you are short at staff. For these two tacks I give Kalash full authority, get it done. Kalash nodded at the instructions, he made a note and started doing mental calculations on allocation of human resources for the projects. The next task for the logistics guild is to establish a new benefit structure for guild members, we have way too much money and we have absolutely no idea what to do with it, buy armors and weapons and stuff guild members require or just give them red packets, but as it cannot be given for free, create appropriate tasks with way too much rewards. Rudra instructed Amelia. Who also nodded. Most logistic departments were used for cost-cutting, however within the elites the situation was completely 180 reversed. The logistics had to actually work to reward the members more. Now comes the task for the main guild, Rudra said looking towards SMG, Neatwit, and Karna. 1. The chalice we obtained from the auction, I believe it to be part of a quest line, I once stumbled upon. The difficulty was off the charts for that event, hence I have reason to believe that the same will apply to this one as well. I will personally lead this storyline, however we will need another team to preside over another important task. 2. I have acquired a complete treasure map, I have been working on acquiring all pieces for over 3 months now, and now that we finally have it, someone also has to go forward for that event, we can decide on the exact squad later but one thing is for sure, wherever treasure is involved Karna had to go. Karna wanted to say something as he opened his mouth, but then he shut it close, the guild leader was actually right and he knew it. Also he did not really mind going treasure hunting. Well, as for the specifics of the treasure hunting. Rudra sighed. It was complicated to explain. After a while Rudra found the best phrasing, as he took out the treasure map and tried to explain the situation. Well the situation is like, it's less of a treasure hunting expedition and more of a robbery. Rudra said as plainly as he could. Everyone was perplexed as they studied the map, the map was actually a blueprint of a building showing the route to enter the security vault. The only locating feature of the map was a small line on the top of the sheet marking the exact latitude and longitude of the place. The map showed the secure royal vault of the neighboring Ninekut's kingdom. It was a facility built inside a mountain range, patrolled by over 50,000 NPC soldiers. Kalash cursed out loud, what kind of bullshit treasure map is this? Even Rudra wanted to curse, in his past life the treasure map compiled had something different, this was not something he had experienced in his past life, his knowledge was useless here. Rudra said the red line shows a way to infiltrate the secure vault, the passage is big enough to fit too. Although Noon can loot the entire royal vault, if two people can fill the inventory slots to the brim, it will still be an astronomical payday. Rudra looked towards SMG, he was calm in the situation. He had already started analyzing about how to pull it off. Rudra was impressed, 
He liked the level-headedness, he said, okay, SMG and Karna will take point on this, you guys make a highest team and pull it off. Karna and SMG nodded, they were actually exited to pull this off. Next let's talk about the alliance. Rudra said. Everyone's expressions turned serious at this point. Rudra continued saying war is coming guys, after our war cooldown is over, there is no reason to believe that war will not be over our heads. However we have enough power to crush the seven mice, so we welcome it. However preparations need to be made and every task done correctly will take us all a long way. Everyone in the meeting room felt relaxed after seeing Rudra's confident attitude against the alliance. If Rudra said victory was in the bag. Then it probably was. Lastly there is Orochimaru. Rudra said as everyone's expressions changed to that of rage. We will manipulate the guy into working for us now, I plan on taking him with me in the quest, let me handle that kid. Rudra declared. Noon voiced any objections. As it was almost 10 a.m. the meeting was adjourned as Karna took the lead for the guild's briefing today. Rudra had other important tasks at hand. He had to show Naomi around on her first day in the guild. Chapter 123, A New Path Begins Karna and SMG gathered about 48 other members, both from the old members and the newly hired assassins to make a team of 50 members for the robbery. Karna was pleasantly surprised to see that all 300 of the new recruits had all crossed the level 40 tier 1 threshold. They were worthy of being members of the true elites. He was satisfied with the overall strength of the group. The team had set out for Nine Clouds Kingdom on the signature wolf mounts. The Ent Rouge of 50 Black Hod men on wolves naturally gained a lot of attention, as it was common knowledge at this point that it was the elites. Unknowingly as it may be the elites had started to make a cultural impact. Especially in the Hazelgroove region, they were extremely popular and hence many wished to imitate the guild. Sculptors who made wolf figurines sold out faster than other animals, whereas black was the preferred color of all hoods. Even the term, I am an elite gamer, had to be modified in Hazelgroove. You either said, I am a professional gamer, or you said, I am a league above ordinary gamers. One could not use the term elite. Only the members of the true elites guild could call themselves elites. This was purely organic reaction that ordinary gamers had came up with, out of respect for the guild. Of course the larger second and first rate guilds did not accept the terminology, calling their core members elites. However the impact was definitely there. After repeated humiliation at the hands of the true elites guild, many were ashamed to call themselves elite gamers. It would take about three days time on mounts to move from capital city of Purple Haze to the mountain range having the royal vault. The party members chatted and shared in-game experiences as they journeyed towards the designated destination. In the true elite's headquarters, virtual world. Rudra was massaging his temples currently, Neatwood had just expressed his willingness to talk with Ethan Gray about the issue, hence he gave him the week off, to try sort things out. With Fatty Kalash being busy with lifestyle guild duties, Carnagon on mission, and Neatwood on leave, his workload had a significant increase. The investigations about the chalice were a huge headache. Rudra knew the storyline a bit from his past life experience. He knew that the organization needed the chalice as part of a religious ceremony paying tribute to the fallen angel Lucifer. The chalice was actually a sealed semi-legendary artifact which could be used to purify any liquid poured inside to its highest purity grade. Pour in basic mana potion, the chalice will make it highest purity advanced mana potion. Pour in pure water, the chalice will make it divine water with healing capabilities. Sealed by a tier 5 wizard, the artifact in his hand was currently meaningless, and his own power far from being sufficient in unsealing the object. It would be a lie to say that Rudra was not interested in the artifact, and had he not have his previous life knowledge never would he even think in his dreams that the artifact in his hand is actually a semi-legendary item. All kinds of inspect spells even those cast by tier 4 appraisers would not be able to see through this item. The unsealing of the item was an extremely ugly ordeal, with 10 tier 3 wizards sacrificing the blood of over 250 different species of humans and animals alike to cast a forbidden unsealing spell. The unsealing will cause a massive shockwave that will trigger the first calamity event in the continent, the eruption of Mount Tai. The entire ordeal was just bad for business, Rudra had two possible plot lines that he could follow, one was to surrender the chalice to the Church of Light, and request help from the Pope to unseal the item and protect it from the demonic forces. Or option two was when the mysterious faction came knocking, 
and yes according to his past life memories, some NPC's approached the guild who won the bid for the item. To negotiate a sale. To sell them the item, and extort maximum payment from them. Then after they unsealed the item, Rudra could storm the location along with his NPC army and his sister Patricia one night, doing a great meritorious service to the country while also regaining possession of the unsealed item. Option 1 was not risky at all, it would probably deepen his relations with the Church of Light and gain him some rewards. Option 2 was a lengthy plan with a lot of headaches, but as he already knew the location of the blood ceremony, and an NPC army at his disposal. He had some chances of succeeding. However should he fail, he would gain even less than the church deal. Rudra had a huge headache about which direction to move forward, when Amelia came in announcing the two hooded NPCs request audience. Rudra straightened his back, thinking oh, that was quick. I need to make a decision fast. He told Amelia, okay let them in, I think it's related to the quest item. Amelia nodded as she ordered an NPC made to guide the visitors in. One huge and one tiny figure soon entered the guild hall, and took a seat in front of Rudra, both took off their hoods and looked at Rudra. One was a girl, the other was a burly man, but from their body language it seemed like the little girl was actually the leader in the group. Rudra squinted his eyes as he said, to what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? The burly man instantly frowned sensing the disrespect in Rudra's tone, however before he could speak, the girl said, you are in possession of an item we require. It's a chalice that your guild has purchased in a recent auction, we want to negotiate the price to buy that item. Don't worry you all am ready for it. Two coming right ahead. Also comment what path do you wish Rudra to choose? Should he sell the chalice and try regain it later from the blood merchants? Or should he reject them and surrender it to the church? Finally a huge shout out to Cervantes91 for the 10,000 coin gift. I don't even know man, you literally made my father jump in joy today morning when he saw the notification, it just made my day. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Chapter 124, Neatwit Meets Ethan Gray Naman and Naomi had a long talk about involving Ethan Gray into their revenge picture. They talked about all the possible pros and cons of the situation and logically analyzed every aspect. The biggest con about involving Ethan Gray was, that they did not trust Ethan Gray. Although Rudra vouched for him, it was common knowledge in the business world that Ethan Gray was a ruthless business who stepped on his mentor to Mithun Ambani to climb the ladder. Called the cold-blooded tycoon, he had no treaty at ruining perfectly good businesses by pulling out investments. Although he had tremendous foresight, and was called the greatest investor the world had ever seen, the twins did not want to get in bed with this tycoon if they had the option. But the reality of the situation was, they had no option. They had no actual plan about what they would do after they inherited the company shares. Should they just dumb all 18% shares in a single day and become trillionaires? Should they hold onto the shares and become an eyesore for Mbani? Just what should they do? They needed backing, they needed advice and they needed assistance, their ultimate dream was to tear down Mithun Mbani's giant corporation, steal everything he valued from him, and leave him a ruined man. Just like he stole their most precious thing, their mom. Ethan Gray was a thorough businessman who knew their father better than probably they did, he knew inside workings of the Ambani Corporation and he was a nightmare of an enemy to have. Seeing no better options as their own personal experience in the commercial sector was dot zero, Naman asked Rudra to schedule a meeting with Ethan Gray, he wanted Rudra to be present, however the guild currently had lots of work to do, hence he understood that Rudra may not be able to be present. A chauffeur was sent to pick up the two of them from the elite tower to the Gray International Tower. After passing about three full body security checks, they were given entry into the tower. Escorted by twelve bodyguards and one secretary they were brought to the top floor office of Ethan Gray. Ethan was skeptical about the meeting, he did not believe that meeting some random kids from a guild could be worth his time, however upon Rudra's stern insistence of giving them a long and proper meeting, he freed up two hours from his schedule. Naomi and Naman entered the room, where Ethan was fidhating with a crystal ball, Ethan pointed towards the seats across him with a smile. Naman and Naomi took their seats, Ethan said, Rudra insisted that I take this meeting, I assume the two of you have something interesting to discuss. Naman nodded, he took a deep breath, as he narrated his story. We are Mithun Ambani's illegitimate children, we will own 18% of the company in two days' time. The criddle ball Ethan was fidgeting with hit the floor and shattered, Ethan stared at the duo dumbstruck, after a while he said, narrate your story, you have my attention now. 
Naman started to narrate, my mother died when I was six, she was killed by my father. He sent assassins to murder my mom. My mother was not the legitimate wife of Mithun Ambani and hence me and my sister were born as bastards. Even though we lived in the Ambani mansion, we were never a part of that family. Abused, mistreated for six years, our mom was our only child. Naomi had tears in her eyes at this point, Ethan could see she was trying hard not to cry. Our mom collected DNA evidence as well as various footages of different family members acknowledging our relation to Ambani over time and used it to gain 18% stock of the company. Ethan's eyes widened at this reveal, 18% was a lion's share of any company. The Ambani Corporation's net worth was $46 trillion, making Naman and Naomi multi-trillionaires with 18% stock. Naturally, because of the deal Ambani decided he was better off getting rid of the unwanted family, he killed my mom, and me and my sister were forced to go into hiding for the next 15 years. My mother's best friend took us in and raised us, growing up, we could never use credit cards, or internet, or anything that could compromise our identities at all, we had suffered a lot. All these years, the only thing fueling me was my desire for revenge, I will burn the Ambani Corporation down, soon me and my sister will turn 21 and by law will inherit 18% of the company, that will be the start of Ambani's fall. Naman said, determination in his eyes. Ethan nodded, everything made sense now. He smiled as he said, okay, I can help you burn the company down, the first step in that process is gaining 2% more shares of the company, you can leave that process to me, I will use all my efforts into securing the 2% share you need, as the company's bylaws state that anyone owning 10% or more of the company shall enjoy a seat on the board. Naman and Naomi were all ears, this was exactly the kind of expertise they were missing, these technical things like bylaws and shares and stuff. Ethan continued, after getting you on the board, we shall fire key employees and disrupt the profit cycle for this quarter, create investor panic and disrupt company reputation, all the while amassing more shares of the company while rotting it from the inside. Naomi and Naman looked at each other. Determined, it seemed like a good plan of action. Finally we will take a multi-trillion dollar payday at one point dumping all the stock collect over a single day, the huge share dump of a liquid asset like shares will take its toll on the already hollow company, many departments will shut down and Mithun Ambani will see his net worth reduced by nearly 80%. The twins' eyes sparkled at the reveal as they exitedly began to talk about details. A storm was coming for Mithun Ambani. I'm happy for it though. Keep it rolling. Chapter 125, Option 3 There is a chalice in your possession that you have acquired at a recent auction, is an artifact that our organization is extremely interested in, the little girl said. Rudra had two options here, one to politely decline their request saying he needed more time to think about it. While going to the church to hand over the chalice and exchange for some rewards. Option 2 was to play hardball with the two NPC here and squeeze them dry for everything they want to offer in exchange for the chalice. Rudra instantly shifted to mastermind Shikuni mindset as he started to lay his trap. Please, let us introduce ourselves before conducting business, I think that is basic Kurtsei. I will go first, I am Shikuni, the guild master of this guild. He said with an amiable smile. The pair looked at each other, contemplating for a while before the burly man said, Gary. Rudra nodded, Hello, Gary. The little girl introduced herself then, Megan. Rudra smiled saying, Hey Megan, Sue what organization are you from? Megan looked bothered with that question, but she tactfully said, We are businessmen. Here for a transaction. Rudra was internally happy at this response. A trade was indeed what he desired currently. Rudra signaled the maid to call in Amelia. When Amelia entered the room, Rudra went with her to a corner, whispering instructions into her ear, as he requested that the chalice be brought in the room. A few minutes later a maid came in with the chalice, after placing it on the table she quickly made herself scarce, going to a corner of the room. Sue, you want this item? Rudra said, fidgeting with the item. Gary nodded, he had a smug look on his face. He belly-ived that as Rudra had called for the item. He was interested in selling it for a good price. Knowing that there was no way the tier 1 adventurer could know about the secrets of the chalice, he was sure it was going to be cheap to buy. You say you have came for a transaction. I assume then you have something of equal value to trade. Rudra said. Megan took the lead in the conversation she said, you have bought it in the auction for 10 million gold, how about I make it 50 million gold to buy the item back. Megan was quite confident with her offer, 
any reasonable human should have had incredulous expressions on their face, at the mention of such a huge chunk of money, however Rudra remained unmobed. Rudra eventually said, that is an underwhelming offer for a semi-legendary purification equipment, don't you think so Miss Megan? Both Gary and Megan's eyes widened at the question. How was he aware of the chalice's identity? There were hardly any people on the entire continent who could pull this feat off. Megan quickly understood that the asking price has just went astronomically up. However the item was too important for her organization to give up. She needed to make a deal here. No matter the cost. Megan frowned as she asked, what do you want? Rudra smiled. He was a sly sly fox when it came to ripping people off, he said, you want my gold mine, it's natural you must offer another gold mine in return. Megan's worries deepened, she knew that ordinary treasures were no longer sufficient to satisfy Rudra's hunger. The organization owns three gold and two platinum mines, you can have your pick of two locations, they will be transferred in your name. Megan said, pulling out a map, marked with the location of the mines. Honestly speaking, Rudra used the gold mine line as a metaphor, however being offered real gold mines for an item, Rudra was completely over the moon. He chose the biggest gold and platinum mines as a compensation, whereas Megan came up with an agreement form, that surrendered the chalice upon the transfer of the mines. Both parties signed the agreement after reading it thoroughly, as Rudra quickly became owner of two mines. He was over the moon as a system notification explained the current situation of the two mines. The gold mine pumped nearly 200,000 gold daily. Whereas the platinum mine produced 50 platinum daily. The overall sum was an amazing amount and Rudra was very pleased. Following which he handed over the chalice to the duo, as they started to depart once the deal was done. However after exiting the guild hall, in a narrow corridor. The duo found them celebs between 50 people from the Church of Light. They were completely surrounded and upon turning around they saw Evely smiling Rudra. Gary and Megan both immediately understood that this was all Rudra's ploy and that they had played right into his hands. Gary was furious as he tried to charge towards Rudra angrily, however under a bombardment of debuffs and movement restricting spells he was frozen in his place. Cardinal Lee stepped forward as he made a polite bow towards Rudra. He said, we shall handle the heretics now. Rudra bowed politely towards the cardinal who took the duo away. The insults that the duo hurled filled the usually quiet true elite's headquarters. They gave Rudra quite the innovative curses, however Rudra thoroughly enjoyed it. He would soon visit the church to milk them for even more rewards, his plan was progressing smoothly, he was happy. The majority of you guys wanted to see both options happen, so both options shall happen. I had to spend the entire evening trying to come up with a creative way to approach the situation, but I assure you, you will like how the situation develops. Chapter 126, Playing Both Sides When Rudra asked Amelia to bring in the chalice. He also instructed her to send two guild members to the Church of Light and meet Cardinal Lee. Rudra gave a message for Cardinal Lee that he was currently stalling members of the same faction as the blood merchant in his guild hall, and that he should instantly provide reinforcement. Cardinal Lee had worked with Rudra before, bestowing on him the title of Emissary of Church, Hence his word carried weight as he instantly deployed the church's paladins as well as came himself to the guild headquarters to detain those in question. When Megan and Gary went out of the guild hall with the chalice in hand, they were naturally shocked to see a platoon of paladins standing. Their natural fear took the better of them as they reacted in a way only guilty people would. Being detained and dragged away to the church for questioning, they were naturally spewing insults at Rudra for framing them. However when they had time to calm down, they realized that the church had nothing on them, should they deny being part of any organization and behave wrongly framed, sooner or later the church would have to let them go. The cardinal was not yet informed about the importance of the chalice by Rudra, and naturally all inspections failed on the artifact, the case about detaining them was growing weak, and Cardinal Lee summoned Rudra to the church for answers. Ambani Corporate Tower, Country X, Real World Assistant Michael read a report to Mithun Ambani, Sir, your twin children have been spotted in the upside under Ethan Gray's fold, they are alive and well, they will turn 21 in two days' time and you will legally lose 18% stake of the company. They have been rumored to be in talks with Ethan Gray himself, and over the past 16 hours Ethan Gray has started to purchase the company stock at a 300% premium, spending close to $300 billion acquiring 2% stake of the company, as it sits sir, should he transfer 1% to the twins each, the company according to the bylaws shall have two more board members along with your son who owns 10% and you who own 50% of the company. 
Mithun Ambani had a deep frown on his face, one of his biggest fears is close to becoming a reality, yet he had a bigger problem at hand. Mithun Ambani's legal son and heir to his conglomerate, Amir Ambani had been depressed over the last week. Amir had owned 28% stake in the company. However he would only own 10% when his siblings turned 21. His net worth was reduced by nearly 70% and it was unacceptable to him. Refusing to eat or get out of his room, he was just popping pills and sleeping with prostitutes. Mithun Ambani never seeing his son in such a pitiful state was deeply concerned, on one side he wanted to alleviate his son's pain, however on the other side HW was not ready to give up his own shares to his son to console him. Mithun Ambani's hatred for the twins and Ethan Gray deepened even further, as he promised revenge. Ambani said pour money into Omega, strengthen the main guild, and also pour a bucket load in that alliance group. Bring the fight in game to Ethan's and the twins darling guild true elites, they are messing with my company, and although I cannot touch them in country J's upside, Omega is a different ballpark, I will destroy everything they loves there. Secretary Michael nodded, but his eyes widened at the figure his boss decided to pour into the alliance. The number was huge. A dangerous development had occurred for the elites. Church of Light, Inner District, Purple Haze City. Rudra walked in with a smile as Cardinal Lee responded with one of his own. Before Cardinal Lee could even explain the situation properly Rudra started to speak, I understand the heretics have been playing innocent, and without concrete evidence it is difficult to tie them to any crimes, however do not worry Cardinal, I have been working on gathering evidence for the past day and have uncovered some key points, may I be allowed to interview the detainees, I can make them confess their crimes. All of Cardinal Lee's worries vanished in an instant as an even brighter smile lit up his face, he pointed towards the holding cell and politely asked Rudra to follow him there for questioning. Rudra opened the room and took a chair against the restrained duo. Vengeful glares being sent his way by them, if glares could kill Rudra would have been dead for at least 76 times by now. Rudra just chuckled at the situation, as he requested a paladin to remove their chokers so that they could speak. Just as a choker was removed however a flurry of insults was hurled at Rudra by Megan. Pat. Rudra gave her a tight slap to Megan, Gary started to struggle madly after the slap, he wanted nothing more than to kill Rudra right here and now, however not a muscle moved in his body after he heard Rudra's next sentence. Cardinal Lee and the other paladins' blood ran cold at the mention of Lucifer, they were trembling currently. Just what was Rudra saying? The slap didn't stun Megan, however Rudra's follow-up words did. The color drained off her face, as she just stared at Rudra, her mouth agape. This week around, new targets for bonuses will be. 800 PS equals 1 bonus. 1600 PS equals 2 bonus. 2400 PS equals 3 bonus. 3200 PS equals 4 bonus. Let's do it you all. Let's go even higher than we already are. Chapter 127, Where Does His Loyalty Lie? The statement stunned everyone present, what did he mean worshipping Lucifer? Lucifer was a hated figure, especially in the Church of Life, the fallen angel had a notorious past and was once wooing the goddess of life. However things got ugly real fast, Archangel Raphael also loved the goddess of life. A confrontation between Lucifer and Raphael saw the goddess choosing Lucifer over Raphael, only to see her heartbroken as Lucifer had an affair with the ice giantess Hindera. Raphael was furious at Lucifer at breaking her heart, whereas the goddess of life absolutely hated Lucifer that point on. Naturally the church of life also did not take kindly to the heartbreaker of their goddess, the notorious fallen angel Lucifer. Not putting it mildly, he was absolutely loathed in the church of life. Megan was at a loss, the fact that they served Lucifer was a secret that even she only discovered after rising to upper Eclians of the organization. How did the outsider know the information? Was there a mole? There was no way she could accept the fact could she? Stuttering and quaking she tried to put a brave face as she said, Wow hat, non nonsense see triple you saying. Rudra chuckled, tough pretender aren't you, is the chalice that you procured for me not a semi-legendary item that can improve the purity of any poured liquid? The gift of Archangel Raphael to the goddess of life. Called the, chalice of purity. Megan was stunned to silence, even she only knew this information because she was responsible for carrying out the mission, otherwise even people higher than her in the organization had no access to that intel. But how did this seemingly nobody know so much about their organization? Cardinal Lee was stunned, the chalice was so valuable. Why could he not inspect the object? 
Gary was not aware of the chalice's identity he spouted, what nonsense, inspect the chalice for yourself, it's not what you say it is, or are we all who inspected the items fools and only you know its true worth. Megan also recovered from the shock, she said, yes, yes, the chalice is not what you say it is. Rudra knew he had this in the bag as he said, I knew you would spout such nonsense, hence I already gathered the necessary evidence needed. Rudra unflirted a scroll, it was a tier 5 identification scroll, that he had borrowed from his one night mansion. The scroll was worth over 60 million gold coins and Rudra had compensated the one night mansion 20 million in gold to borrow the item, it had absolutely emptied the guild warehouse, hence Rudra was betting big on this development. When he took out the tier 5 scroll, Megan panicked. She knew that the tier 5 scroll would reveal the identity of the chalice. Cardinal Lee was also surprised to see such a valuable treasure been brought out, as he granted his permission to use the treasure on the chalice. Rudra gave the scroll to a paladin, who infused his mana inside the scroll to activate it. The chalice's real stats were revealed. Chalice of Purity, semi-legendary, upgradable, a gift given by Archangel Raphael to the Goddess of Life, it purifies any liquid poured inside to the highest possible grade. The originally divine item has lost much of its power after falling into the mortal realm, however it can still purify a majority of the substances poured inside. Currently sealed by a powerful tier 5 mage, it needs to be unsealed to show its properties. Upgradable. Upgrade conditions locked. Everyone was shocked upon reading the item, it was clear at this point that the duo here were lying through their teeth and their identity was anything but simple. Cardinal Lee's expression turned cold as he said, beat the prisoners up, no food for them today. The paladins complied, as screams could be heard as Rudra and Cardinal Lee exited the room. Cardinal Lee now asked for the full story over the incidents and Rudra narrated it beautifully. When the two heretics came at my guild's door knocking, I took my time to understand their intentions, after understanding that they are connected to the same organization as the blood merchant, I knew something fishy was up. Rudra continued, Cardinal Lee was very impressed by Rudra's quick wits, however the Lucifer connection was not made yet. I sent my men to contact you on one hand, on the other hand I sent some hunters from my guild to go to the locations where this organization owns gold mines, when they followed a mine supervisor they stumbled upon a liar where they have captured many races for what seems like a blood sacrifice, and he overheard a conversation about the chalice. Rudra said. Finally, what happened is the last key was a slave captured by them who believes himself to be a descendant of Archangel Serial, the plan was to pour his blood in the chalice to purify it to the pure Serial bloodline to use as sacrifice to Lucifer, unfortunately we do not know the complete plan, nor do we have the strength to free the captured race citizens, I can only come to the church for help. Cardinal Lee's eyes widened, this was an urgent situation, he needed to contact Archbishop for this. Chapter 128, You Reap What You Sow Cardinal Lee obviously had a lot of work to do with the heretics and the information provided by Rudra to him. Now the AI for Omega gave NPC advanced intelligence with an IQ of about 120 on average to characters, with some characters having more and some having less. Hence they were pretty much like normal humans. The emotional range also, although not that varied was something they experienced. They became happy, sad, angry, and the like. The parent company Cuber never really intervened until a major imbalance appeared in the game, and they let all plot lines run as usual. However Rudra's recent actions had completely derailed the main story plotline of the rise of Lucifer, derailing major company plans. Naturally the AI decided that the impact of the actions was huge and notified the company. For the first time since its inception, the company had to have serious talks about intervention into the game to rectify the situation, as a major plotline had been foiled. Not many people knew this, but every kingdom had a main storyline about one of the angels, every kingdom's individual storylines intricately connecting to form the big puzzle and theme of the game Omega. Fallen Angel Lucifer was one of the key pieces of that puzzle and the derailment of the storyline in Hazelgrove had the higher-ups worried. A meeting convened as the team studied the facts about the current situation. Meanwhile, somewhere north of Hazelgrove Kingdom, in a mountain range separating the kingdom from Ninekut's kingdom. Karna and SMG were traveling for one and a half day now and they had bonded a bit over the journey. Karna had began to carry himself more like a vice guild master after he came back from the Endless Ocean dungeon. The dynamic with SMG was clear, although they both were very respectful to each other, Karna was the one running the show here. 
Karna and SMG had talked about a lot of possible ways to carry out the highest as they had bought 20 large capacity storage rings to provide extra inventory slots to maximize loot. The team of 50 also had more than 150 appearance alteration potions at hand prepared day and night with the support of the Lifestyle Guild. Nefariously when the guild members were looking for random hair strands, they also happened to stumble upon a bar full of Demolition Boys members, along with Leader Love Smashing and the demoted Vice Guild Master I Need to Smash. Karna was extremely happy, as he would probably go with one of their disguises just to make things more interesting should his face be revealed. Yes wearing a mask was made mandatory as soon as they left Hazelgroove Kingdom. As noon clues were to be left. The appearance alteration potion was for added security in case of an unfortunate accident making the mask fail. Either that or Karna might just decide to goof around and mess with demolition boys for fun. About half a day's ride later, the team of 50 arrived at the scouting location. They spread out and started the surveillance routines, only after thoroughly analyzing that, and making the perfect plan will they even begin to act on it. A very boring routine of surveillance started for the highest team. Real World, The Grey International Tower, The Upside It was 11.55 p.m., in five minutes' time the twins turned 21, and they were there sitting with Ethan Grey and a whole team of the best international lawyers to start the party at 12 o'clock. Numan and Naomi were really anxious, however really exited too, Numan over the last two days realized the importance of Ethan Grey. Ethan Grey and his team had been working day and night ensuring that the twins get what they deserved the moment they turned 21. Ethan buying billions in shares just to bridge the 2% they needed, was a help he never expected in his dreams. Of course his story was compelling, but Numan knew deep down it was Rudra's credit that got the ball moving. Just how strong was the boss in real life to make a tycoon like Ethan free up his schedule to meet a nobody like Numan and even going as far as investing hundreds of billions into a cause that won't see him get any returns in a long while. Naomi wanted to celebrate their birthdays and maybe care about the other stuff the day after, However Numan did not wish to waste a single second. When the clock struck midnight, the firms that were forcefully open under Ethan Gray's pressure at midnight made sure that the twins got the 18% shares they deserved. Adding the two from Ethan it went up to 20. Only when the shares were transferred and the twins were recognized as board members at 12.35 am did Ethan Gray wish them a very happy birthday. Access opened for them inside the Ambani Corporation Internal Management System, as a list of businesses and employee list and ongoing projects all was open to the twins. To Ethan Gray this information was more valuable than the billions he spent, with his expert analysis teams he could have so much leverage over Mithun now with this data, he could single-handedly rupture key projects and hurt the cash flow. There were a million new avenues open for him now. Numan delivered his first strike on the very moment he gained access to the system, his clearance as a board member was A grade, just below Mithun Ambani, However anyone be grade or lower could be fired unconditionally by Naman. Firing 24,000 key employees for the Ambani Corporation. Naman was sure he made a bold incoming statement as the board of directors. Naman said in a borderline psychotic voice, Are you happy with the return gift, father? Naomi watched her brother as chills went down her spine. She swore never to get on his brother's bad side, as it was too scary. In any case, when the world would wake up tomorrow, there will be waves for sure, as all hell would break loose. Chapter 129, Consequences An article from the Daily Reporter paper. A string of firings have been confirmed as over 25,000 employees have lost their jobs overnight from the Ambani Corporation. A shocking turn of events as two new board members have been rumored to have joined the corporation. The fire's employees are all rioting and filing wrongful termination lawsuits to the courts. Full story on page 9 of the paper. Ethan read the article and smiled, the buzz was created, the stock of the Ambani Corporation saw a 3% dip in a single day, that meant that Ambani lost more than $1 trillion overnight. He felt no guilt whatsoever for the string of firings he was responsible for, he was actually happy, as the severance package to fire an employee without notice was actually a lump sum in the Ambani Corporation. The fate of those who were fired was 100 times better than those who are not, as the shrinking company will see many employees let go and with notice at that, meaning there will be no severance pay. Ethan wanted to gobble up the Ambani group, and it will take a lot of sacrifices, he could not be shaken by the cries of those he stepped over, as his goal was to reach the top. Naman was faring even better. He was just happy to be 21, to be a thorn in his father's side. Naomi was the one who was affected the most. 
The string of firing scared her, as when she saw people protesting on the streets on media, she felt it was because of her. She wished revenge on her father, but not at the costs of innocent lives, she blamed herself for robbing someone's livelihood. She was sulking and her brother had became someone posseized, she could not talk to him about her problem at all. She tried a few times, however he just shot her down. Her aunt was finally having the life she wanted, enjoying after taking care of the twins for fifteen years, she did not want to bother her as well. The only person she kind of knew was guild leader Rudra. He seemed like an amiable and approachable person in the limited interactions the two had up till now. Hence she decided to message him to meet up. Cuber Corporation The entire thing seems absurd and ridiculous, according to the report the derailment happened as the player already knew about the plotline beforehand. A senior executive read. It's the same player we had to negotiate with the last time as well for the bomb incident, the guild leader of True Elites, Shakuni. But how can he know the plotline, every one of us only know bits and pieces of the plot. As everyone was only part of creating bits and pieces of the picture, the entire thing doesn't make sense unless multiple employees collaborated in leaking him the information. No that is not possible, ever since the last incident the AI has been monitoring the movements of every employee, there has been no contact whatsoever with the kid, in real life or the game. The atmosphere in the room turned grim. Had the information be leaked, they could have fired the responsible party, been the player and move on. However now they were back to square zero, they did not know the source of the problem at all. Let's remedy the situation, let's create a jailbreak for the two captured agents, and make them escape with the chalice, let's forcefully remedy the plotline for now and keep a close eye on the movements of the player Shakuni. Everyone nodded, they needed to analyze the situation more to pinpoint the exact cause behind the unexpected event. The game company commanded the AI to now record all statements and actions of the player Shakuni. Church of Light, Hazelgroove Kingdom Rudra was currently inside the church's warehouse, the same one that he entered when he obtained the Platinum Guild token. The one full of treasures of epic rank and above. The church had decided to reward Rudra with 100 million gold and one artifact of semi-legendary grade OE below from the guild warehouse, for his meritorious service to the church. Rudra was naturally elated, although a bulk chunk of it. 40 million gold would be given to the one night mansion as he was yet to pay on that due of tier 5 identification spell paper, however he earned a lump sum of 60 million gold, his entire expense in the auction had been recouped. The guild was rich again, not to mention the extra semi-legendary item he would gain. Rudra was extremely satisfied with this result, his decision to exploit all sides was paying off well. Just as Rudra was about to begin his search for the perfect artifact however an unexpected scene occurred. A paladin came rushing into the warehouse and reported that the two heretics had escaped along with the chalice, and the location suspected to be the base of operations for the hidden organization has long been evacuated. Cardinal Lee looked extremely worried, as he looked towards Rudra in desperation. Rudra himself had never expected such a situation to arise, this was beyond his calculations, how could two heretics flee the Church of Life's detainment, steal the chalice and run away successfully without causing a commotion? The two NPC were just tier 1, they did not have the strength to pull off such an escape, something huge was amiss here. But before he could figure out what was going on, a forced quest appeared. Forced quest, those who worship Lucifer, SSS, find and stop the heretics and save the son of Archangel Serial. Time limit, 29 hours. Failure penalty, all stats reduced by 60% for one year. You lose the favor of Church of Light. Rewards. WTF, a forced quest, what's wrong with the penalties? He was completely doomed should he fail. Rudra was completely shocked. What just happened here? I really write this story from the heart, and even though the grammar is subpar it takes me quite a lot of time daily to write this content. Chapter 130, The Forced Quest The game AI, Gaia, was paying a close attention to Rudra's every word and decision. Rudra was under heavy scrutiny. It was a race against time now that Rudra was on the clock, he had little more than a day to complete the quest. Although he was in a hurry, Rudra took in a deep breath, closed his eyes and took a moment to analyze his situation. After five long minutes to strategizing, he decided to look around the church warehouse again, now for an artifact that can help him on the quest. The first and most important thing he needed currently was the location where the ritual was going to happen. After half an hour of skimming he found a suitable item. Locating mirror, semi-legendary, 
infuse mana while clearly thinking about the name and facial features of the target, the mirror will display their current activities for 7 seconds. Cooldown time, 1 hour. Rudra absolutely would have never traded for such an item had he not been under the clock and absolutely desperate, but now he chose to take it as his reward. Cardinal Lee nodded, he was already getting frustrated when instead of working on the quest Rudra was looking around the warehouse for his treasure. However seeing the item Rudra chose, he approved of his actions. Wasting no time, Rudra thought about Megan, and the hazy mirror cleared to show a picture of the little girl. She was shockingly in a busy street in a bustling city. Cardinal Lee's eyes sparkled instantly, he seemed to have recognized the place. He said, it's the western port town of Bethlehem, seems like the market district there. Rudra had to take the NPC's word at face value, the town of Bethlehem was four and a half hours of journey on a mount, and Rudra had absolutely no time to waste. He stored the mirror, exited the valet and summoned his mount. The grey dire wolf went full speed toward the port town of Bethlehem. Rudra was racing against time here hence he had muted all communications and calls as the quest was his topmost priority. Whether he was lucky or unlucky, only God knew as both Yua and Naomi sent him messages about wanting to hang out today. Yua had a really bad fight with her father, after the auction scenario she wanted to withdraw from the alliance, her father also supported her decision and the initial formalities were being done, when suddenly some unknown investor poured a hell lot of money into the alliance. Her father now refused Yua to leave the alliance again. Yua was feeling choked in the alliance and she badly wanted out, hence frustrated she texted Rudra to want to meet today. Naomi also texted Rudra about meeting as she too was feeling sick after the backlash of her actions. She had noon else to talk to, and wanted to hang out with someone. Yet Rudra was oblivious to both these messages as he was focused on reaching the port town of Bethlehem as soon as possible. Rudra called up his stats panel to assess his cards. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Emissary of Church, World Renowned, Heer of Augustus One Knight. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 43. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI. 216 plus 108 vit, 216 plus 108. Int, 216 plus 108 STA, 216 plus 108. PHY, 216 plus 108 HP, 19,000 slash 19,000. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy, 0. Status. Healthy. Equipment, Pirate Armor Set, LV-40, Lich's Ring, Concealer Mask, Not Equipped, Retractable Shield, Epic. Weapons, Wind Cutter, Sword, Common Bow, Quiver of Arrows, Excalibur, Sword, Replica. Skills, Darkness Bind, Summon Knight Durahal, Wind Slash, Critical Absorb, Berserk, Darkness Blast, Death Slash, Eyes of Truth, Earthquake, Critical Block, Blink, Stormbringer. Class Specific Skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 48-200. Rudra felt better knowing that he had the Critical Block Defense card, the Blink Movement skill and the Stormbringer Damage skill added to his arsenal. His combat prowess had increased a lot, especially after equipping the level 40 Pirate Set and the Retractable Shield that Karna brought back from the quest. His defense was stronger now, along with the newfound skills and the added special stat bonus, Rudra knew he was unstoppable currently amongst all tier 1 players. If he failed this quest, there was probably noon else who could. After four hours of intense riding, the insane pace at which the wolf ran saved Rudra half an hour of journey time, Rudra patted his mount for a job well done before running into the city. Rudra found the marketplace where he last saw Megan, before finding a quiet place to bring out the mirror. Rudra thought about Megan as the hazy screen parted to show a clear picture, she seemed in the outskirts of the town, there were five people around her now, Gary being one of them. The spacing between houses was about one house every twenty meters or so, it seems like there was a church in the background. The image faded away. Rudra asked around in the marketplace, throwing bags of one hundred gold coins to the NPC's to tell whether they knew of a location that matched the description. 
After ten minutes and three answers that matched each other, Rudra decided to go to the eastern part of the town where the farmers usually live. Rudra had twenty-one hours left on the quest, he was getting more and more desperate, he ran without minding his stamina madly searching the location he previously saw. When he saw the church he saw in the mirror, a shriek of joy came from his mouth. He was so damn happy. He rushed over to the location according to the sun's position that could have been where Megan was walking. Rudra found it quickly as he rushed towards the direction the group was headed. All his actions were being monitored by the AI and the Cuber Corporation executives, there was absolutely nothing wrong that they found with the player, if something they were extremely impressed by the skills he displayed. Enjoy. Chapter 131 The Forced Quest Rudra silently caught up with the moving group. He had finally found Megan and Gary, there were even others who he did not recognize with them. Rudra silently followed the group from a distance, about an hour later the group disappeared after entering a rather large bark of a tree. Rudra hesitated to follow, the tree was obviously not big enough to fit five people. There was a teleportation device set up inside the bark, Rudra did not want to walk into the formation without knowing what would happen to him when he came out the other side. The cooldown for the mirror was up hence Rudra decided to scout first before entering the teleportation formation. What Rudra saw obviously stunned him, on the other side of the teleportation system was a party of at least twenty people who were waiting for an ambush. Rudra knew that the welcoming party was expecting him already. Yet the corner of his lips curled into an evil smile. Unlocking a cork from a spike bomb, Rudra tossed it into the teleportation formation. Minus 7500 critical hit. Minus 7500 critical hit. 4500. Minus 4500. Minus 4000. Minus 4000. Minus 3500. Minus 3,500. Minus 2,000. Minus 1,200. Minus 1,200. A string of damage appeared, after 15 seconds he entered the formation two swords outdrawn. Rudra appeared on the other side, he quickly used wind slash on everyone that was left standing, as he used quick and nimble movements to dodge every incoming attack. The party was utterly stunned after the spike bomb was dropped, they never expected such a move from the enemy, six died with the other fourteen being seriously wounded, their ambushing formation was utterly ruined as Rudra wreaked havoc upon teleporting. Megan and Gary fared the worst, the pair only had twenty percent of their total HP left after the spike bomb attack, yet they lost their minds upon seeing Rudra, the cause behind their sufferings. Gary rushed in madly, only to have died under a single sword strike from Rudra. Minus 2500 critical hit. Gary died. Megan screamed seeing her partner die af the hands of Rudra, she cursed and wailed at Rudra, how dare you kill my Gary. I will make you pay, I will make you suffer, and use some kind of forbidden spell around herself. Rudra got an ominous feeling at that moment and he wanted nothing more than interrupting that spell at that moment, however the last three men of the ambush squad attacked him. Diverting his attention back to the fight. Rudra made short work of the men, and focused back on Megan, but all he could hear was, I Megan Harp offers my soul to Lord Lucifer. Black liquid came oozing out of her skin as even her eyelids turned black. Little by little her entire body was covered in a black liquid, covering more and more of her body. A few seconds later, she was completely covered in a hard black liquid that was like a cocoon. What came out of that cocoon however scared the hell out of Rudra. An ugly creature, Tier 2, half metal half undead, an ugly creature born from a forbidden ritual, the user must offer her soul willingly to the god Lucifer to transfer into this inhuman creature. Threat level, extremely dangerous. Drawbacks, permanent change, the user will die within 48 hours of transformation. Rudra cursed his luck. A tier 2 creature created from sacrifice. This would be extremely troublesome to deal with. Megan herself was a tier 1 ranger that Rudra could make short work of. However the tier 2 creature was a different ballpark. Rudra had underestimated Megan, she willingly sacrificed herself to gain powers from Lucifer to deal with Rudra. The creature looked at Rudra with utmost hate. The men disgusted it. The creature charged at Rudra and used its hands to meet Rudra's dual sword strikes head on. However instead of the usual cutting through of the flesh and bone, the swords were flung out of Rudra's hands as the swords hit the metal body of the creature. Rudra was absolutely baffled. For the first time in a long time he was outmaneuvered in a fight. 
he retreated a few steps and immediately and unhesitantly used the Stormbringer spell. A bolt of lightning zapped the target, burning its already black flesh to an even deeper charred tone. A huge damage of minus 7,000 appeared on the target. Rudra checked the creature's EXP it showed, 8,000 slash 15,000. More than half was depleted. Stormbringer was definitely Rudra's ace in the hole, however the creature did not take long before recovering as it charged to meet the swordless Rudra head-on. Rudra gulped a max strength potion unhesitatingly, as he knew that he needed one to meet the creature head-on. Rudra had actually practiced karate and taekwondo do as a kid, Mother Rajput was one of the enthusiastic parents that made their children join every hobby classes. Although not proficient, Rudra could indeed fight a decent hand-to-hand -hand combat. The ugly creature's arms shot forward performed strange movements that tried to trick Rudra's eyes. However, he disregarded them and crouched to slide under his opponent. The ugly creature's attacks missed as kicked its legs and made it fall forward. The two of them were close, so the ugly creature tried to stab its fingers toward him. Yet, Rudra rolled on his back and pushed with his hands once his feet aligned with his opponent. Rudra resembled a spring when he used his arms to push his whole body toward his opponent. He didn't need to see the ugly creature to know where it was. There wasn't much that it could do while it was falling toward the floor. The ugly creature quickly stood up, but Rudra's kick arrived before it could resume any battle stance. His shin bone hit the ugly creature's head and flung it away again. Rudra chased after his opponent. The black metal seemed able to endure his blows now, but he would press forward until that material shattered. His leg rose when the ugly creature entered his range. The creature raised its arms to block the incoming kick, but Rudra missed them on purpose. Instead, his descending blow made his heel and his opponent's foot collide. The creature's foot bent upward. It wouldn't be useful as a foothold anymore in that condition, but Rudra lost his momentum after completing the attack. Rudra was attacked in that moment of weakness, however the retractable shield was used and Rudra avoided the blow. However he was flung by the force and got crushed flat on a nearby wall. Minus 2400, a damage appeared on Rudra's status bar. Rudra found himself unable to breathe for a second. He struggled to maintain his balance, and the ugly creature didn't hesitate to exploit that chance. One of its hands clung on Rudra's side while the other created a fang-shaped figure with its fingers that flew toward his collarbone. Rudra pushed himself backward, uncaring that his balance was completely off. He fell on the floor and dodged the incoming attack, but the ugly creature promptly jumped toward him. The ugly creature tried to slam its feet on Rudra's chest, but the latter rotated to the side. The ugly creature's attack landed on the floor, and Rudra used that chance to perform the blink skill, instantly teleporting above the creature's head and turning mid-air to give a vicious roundhouse kick to the creature's head. The ugly creature promptly ducked to dodge the incoming leg, but it didn't manage to perform it correctly in time to avoid it as Rudra's real move was not the kick but the concealed kunai knife in his hand, Rudra took it out a kunai from his inventory secretly during the fight and he pierced the kunai through the creature's head. 8000 critical hit. The creature died under the kunai knife. All of this makes me really happy as the author. Chapter 132, The Quest Continues. Plus 23, EXP, you have defeated a creature above your tier, plus 50,000 EXP. Level up. Level up. Level up. A bucket load of EXP was given to Rudra for killing the creature. To be honest it was a tough fight, and a weaker player would have failed twice. Only because of Rudra's insane stats that were far above the average player at same tier, as well as the strength potion that he consumed, was he able to go head to head with the creature. Not to mention his superior control and combat experience. Of course the largest part player was the Stormbringer spell which reduced the creature's HP by more than half, or else it would have been a close fight. Rudra called up the stat panel. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Emissary of Church, World Renowned, Heer of Augustus One Knight. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 46. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 236 plus 118 VIT, 236 plus 118. Int, 236 plus 118 STA, 236 plus 118. PHY, 
236 plus 118 HP, 29,000 slash 29,000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy, zero. Status, healthy, strength potion consumed, duration left 68s. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, lich's ring, concealer mask, not equipped, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica. Skills, darkness bind, summon knight durahal, wind slash, critical absorb, berserk, darkness blast, death slash, eyes of truth, earthquake, critical block, blink, stormbringer. Class specific skills, knight's companion, knight's valor, golden ratio. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, mysterious egg, incubating, 48 slash 200. He got leveled up thrice. The massive EXP from killing the ambush party was a sweet reward, proportional to the difficulty of pulling it off. Without the scouting of the mirror and the use of the bomb, even Rudra would have found the entire process extremely challenging. The AI had calculated the success rate for the mission at under 2%, hence the SSS rating, also it was designed on the spot, and all of Rudra's actions had been completely in line with the game, he was a legitimately skilled player. The doubts of the Cuber Corporation employees lessened as they started to enjoy Rudra's performance rather than scrutinizing him. They were very exited to see how Rudra would cross the final hurdle, and what the ramifications of his actions would be on the continent. Rudra moved forward in the passageway as it led to the second floor balcony that had a massive hall below, upon entering the balcony, he saw fifty different tribesmen tied to a pole in a specific star-like pattern with fifty edges. At the center of the formation was a golden pole, and on it was an extremely muscular and blonde human, who Rudra assumed to be the son of Archangel Serial. There were seventeen hooded figures in black chanting incantations in a specified location inside the diagram, whereas one figure in white robe stood at the center with the chalice of purity in his hand, facing the blonde human. Rudra calmly asses the situation as he inspected the strength of the opponents. The seventeen figures were all tier two mages, while the white robed guy was a tier three paladin. Rudra had already ditched the thought of saving the fifty tribesmen, the gears in his mind rotated at full speed as he thought of a plan to save the son of Archangel Serial. The highest team, in a mountain range in Nine Clouds Kingdom. Karna had been scouting the highest location for quite some time now, and the team altered between scouting and farming for EXP in the meantime. Karna leveled up after a day of leveling in the wild. Level up. Player name, Karna. Title, Heaven S. Chosen. Class, Swordsman. Subclass, Runesmith. LVL, 43. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 250 VIT, 230. Int, 180 STA, 230. PHY, 200 SE, 5. HP, 12-0-0-0-12-0-0-0. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck, 92 plus 3 slash 100, heaven's chosen one's luck. Charm. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, bracelet of possivity, Rymar's ring, true elite's guild robe. Weapons, slaughter blade, epic, common bow, quiver of arrows, assassin's daggers. Skills, mountain crash, defense break, energy slash, High knee. Class specific skills, heightened battle sense, weapon recall, doppelganger. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, small egg, incubation, 20 slash 100. That's when a guild member came and informed Karna that SMG had compiled the scouting report and that they were ready to proceed to the next stage of the highest. Karna thanked his stars that he had enough time to level up before conducting the highest. He had recently gained the title of Heaven's Chosen after he opened the three incomplete designs to form a complete design of the Aero Ballista. That title, S effect gave him plus three luck and added to his already heaven-defying luck to make it Heaven's Chosen one's luck at 95 points. Karna headed back to meet SMG, when he entered the encampment SMG said, we are ready to move forward with the plan, however there is a small problem. Expect better quality of my book in the future, also you can choose to reread the book after a few days. I feel exited for the future. 
the grammar part and the inconsistencies in the text as well as the calculations all will be corrected to form a coherent and smooth flowing text. Chapter 133, Winners Don't Make Excuses Rudra looked towards the time limit left on the quest. He had a little more than two hours to rescue the son of Archangel Serial. This was good news, it meant that the ceremony should last a bit longer. Any plan that involved attacking the enemies was suicide. Any confrontation with the Tier 3 Paladin and he was surely dead. Rudra needed an airtight plan, a deceptive one. Rudra calmly observed the structure of the room he was in and came to a conclusion that there were three key architectural spots that supported the ceiling, take all three down and the roof shall collapse. Taking down the roof could give him a crucial opening, however it was not enough. Rudra thought about all the tools in his disposal, to think of anything that could help him create a plan. He looked at everything that GE Pa seized and found a single bottle of appearance alteration potion in his inventory that Kalash had given him for sampling. Rudra blessed Fatty Kalash in his heart, his friend was a lifesaver in crucial situations there was no doubt about that. Rudra quietly crept back out of the balcony and went back down to the ambush spot. From the corpse of Gary, Rudra took a single hair and added it to the appearance alteration potion. Rudra transformed into Gary as his height increased and he grew a beard. Rudra slowly transformed into the burly-looking big guy Gary. Rudra felt odd in the new body, the feeling made his control over his body weaker, Rudra quickly understood that the appearance alteration potion was a dual-edged sword, his combat proficiency had drastically dropped in this new body as his mind was not used to the change in body structure and movement. Rudra summoned the knight Durahal and covered the guy in the best shining armor from one of the dead guys in the hall. Rudra handed Durahal a bloody sword and instructed him to retreat, run, and parry all incoming forces next. Rudra disguised as Gary inflicted self-damage and ran towards the balcony. Rudra screamed and seemed to dodge attacks as he stumbled down from the blackeny floor towards the ground. Thud. A loud sound interrupted the incantations as everyone turned heads to look towards Rudra. Rudra in the best acting he had done in his life stuttered as he said, They. They. Killed. Everyone. He said so and pretended to faint. Everyone looked towards the gallery as a figure wearing an armor could be seen vaguely through the gallery bars. Some of the tier 2 mages left their incantation spot and instantly chased after Durahal. Rudra knew that the opening he created would last a maximum of three minutes before Durahal is defeated. The tier 3 paladin frowned, the party in charge of guarding the teleportation portal seemed to have been completely routed. This meant that the ceremony could no longer be conducted in peace. The paladin stared towards the balcony, deciding his plan of action, he was looking for any intel on the intruding organization. The guy took one step away from the son of Archangel Serial. Then a second one, then a third. Rudra pretending to be unconscious just prayed for that guy to just move a little bit more, and his plan would work. The fourth and fifth step followed. Rudra sprung to his feet and tossed three water bombs to the three crucial locations needed to collapse the roof and one frost bomb at the feet of the tier 3 paladin. The paladin was taken by surprise as his feet were suddenly trapped by a ice layer. Boom. Boom, boom. The roof collapsed as large chunks of rock started to fall, one headed right for the trapped paladin, he raised his hand and casted a spell that completely annihilated the rock. But others were not so lucky. 50 tribesmen and 13 tier 2 priests were buried under the rubble. However there were two figures missing from the room, and they were Rudra and the son of Archangel Serial. The paladin looked furious as he broke free of the ice confinement, he dashed towards east, seemingly in pursuit of someone. Rudra had used everything in his arsenal to save the son of Archangel Serial, when he released the bombs, he had already started dashing towards the guy's bound place. When the bombs exploded, he had already cut the guy's confines. When the debris started to fall, he already had the chalice and the son of Archangel Serial tightly gripped in the two hands as he used his blink skill to teleport inside the balcony. All of this he achieved at under three seconds. It was heaven-defying speed and precision. Even though his escape and the mission's success were not yet a guarantee, his skill to reach this point was commendable. 99% challengers would have failed. On one hand his tools like bombs and his lich's ring played a huge role in his success, but one should not mistake it as luck. He would be lucky to obtain the items, however using them still needed personal skills, had Rudra not had the bombs, could he still complete the quest? The answer is yes he could, if he did not have the bombs he would just have figured out a plan that did not need them. 
had he not have the blink skill, he would not have chosen to collapse the ceiling. Everything was calculated and every execution was flawless. Even if the AI wanted to find faults with Rudra's performance, she could not find any, his performance was genuine skill, there were no rules breaked. The employees of Cuber Corporation watching on had became fans at this point as they sincerely cheered Rudra on. This was probably one of the most entertaining and exhilarating things they had seen in a long long time. Chapter 134, With Danger Comes Opportunity Caleb was extremely confused after the sudden development. He was just an orphan who lived most of his life with his mother working on a farm, however when her mother was critically ill a few months ago, some hidden power inside him activated. Divine healing powers radiated from himself stronger than even high-level bishops in the church. He was naturally stunned at the development, but extremely happy as his power helped alleviate his mother's illness. Yet her mother just sobbed uncontrollably after he healed her, she kept mumbling something about the seal being broken. It was then that for the first time in 18 years his mom revealed the secret about his father and his origin. His father was the Archangel Serial and he was in fact half-angel himself, divine blood flowed through his viands its power unimaginable. Yet the power was more of a curse than a boon, as unless he reached the pinnacle of tier 5, he would only be a pawn in someone's bigger scheme. Wanting their son to have a normal life, his mother pleaded Archangel Serial to seal her son's powers, and he did comply. Yet seeing his mother sick something inside him stirred and the intense desire to heal her mother made the seal break. With the seal broken various powers knew about the presence of an angel halfling as he radiated a faint divine aura. He was forced to leave his home in concern of his mother's safety and roamed the land slaying monsters and gaining strength when one day he was surrounded and captured by a group of hooded men and knocked out cold. When he woke up. He found himself tied up to a pole in an unfamiliar surrounding, around him were tribesmen from various species also tied to poles, blood dripping from their cut wrists as they all writhed in pain. He unconsciously looked towards his wrists, yet no cut was made. He was in fact in the center of the entire formation, Caleb got a bad feeling at that point that his fate would not be as simple as just a cut on the wrist. The cult members began chanting incantations and performing blood magic, when a powerful man in a white robe came with a chalice in hand. Caleb inspected the chalice, however it did not appear to be anything special, however at the end of the incantations a powerful blood magic was cast towards the white-robed men, but instead of attacking the men, it was all absorbed within the chalice. The powerful blood magic using the blood of fifty different tribesmen seemingly unlocked the item as a faint divine glow came from it now. Caleb could feel a faint resonance with the item, he was sure that the item was something related to the angels. After the chalice was unlocked, the white-robed man placed it at Caleb's feet and another round of chanting began. Caleb's eyes widened at the chants, the language seemed so familiar yet so foreign, he felt like he knew the language as he had heard it a lot, yet he could not make out the meaning of most words spoken. However there was one word he could not miss and that was, Lucifer. Then suddenly a man came falling from the balcony and pointed towards the entrance saying that there were attackers. Caleb suddenly felt hope, maybe someone had came to rescue everyone here. Yet what happened next left him completely perplexed, the men who fell from the balcony suddenly sprung into action throwing grenades towards the ceiling bringing the whole roof down. Just when he thought, Ag, there does my life, he was suddenly cut free and at the next second he was on the balcony, running with the fallen men. He looked at Rudra in confusion, his mind was a mess, he could not figure out the situation, he suddenly stopped running as he stared at Rudra blank-faced. Rudra who had one hand around Caleb's wrist suddenly felt resistance as he ran, Rudra turned to look at the clueless guy. Rudra said, I am Shikuni one night, here to save you, bad guy chasing, run. Rudra cut short the sentence into barely recognizable bits as he needed to save time, the tier 3 paladin must be hot on their tail and it wouldn't take him long to catch up due to the incomparable stat difference. Caleb's eyes regained some luster as he nodded and picked up the pace, he had a million questions however now was not the time. He just said, Caleb, running at full speed. Rudra and Caleb were almost at the teleporting array when Rudra felt a chill down his spine, instinctively he sidestepped. A powerful dark slash just narrowly missed his body, the tier 3 wizard was here. Rudra stopped running, he knew his priorities, even if he died he needed to save Archangel Serial's son. He just said, go. As he shoved him into the teleportation array and out of the area. The paladin had a deep frown when he saw Caleb escaping, he wanted to make quick work of Rudra and chase after Caleb. Rudra however had different plans. 
He knew he had one chance at success here and that was if and only if he could pull this trick off. Rudra used all of his strongest attack at the charging tier 3 paladin. Wind Slash, Stormbringer even Darkness Blast. The consumption of stamina was huge as Rudra instantly felt dizzy enough to pass out, his stamina bar went from green to critically red. The wizard just snorted, as he casted a protection spell to stop the incoming attacks and as expected he did not gain a single point in damage. However Rudra's goal had been accomplished, to defend against the incoming attacks he had to stop running and cast a protective spell. Rudra used Darkness Bind and restrained the paladin for just a little more than a second. But a second was all he needed. As he jumped with all his remaining strength towards the teleportation portal, but rather than going inside the teleportation circle he was going for the array itself, Excalibur in hand enlarged to three meters, Rudra came crashing down towards the array with an earthquake skill. Boom. The teleportation array was shattered, there was no way out of this place. The paladin cursed in frustration he could not believe that he failed his job because of such a weakling. He chanted a plethora of spells, any one of which could easily annihilate a party of twenty, as he hurled spells after spells at Rudra's location. Rudra rolled and crashed at the ground, the last thing he saw before dying was a storm of spells being hurled at his location, he closed his eyes and a system notification hit him. You have died. Sue Golden Ticket Department, Power Stone Department, get the gears running towards the next targets. Chapter 135, Simply Not Possible System Notification, You have been revived at the Church of Life in Purple Haze City. Minus 20% all stats for next 3 hours. Minus 2 gold. Dash, You have dropped the shin guards of your armor. Rudra did not care about the petty 2 gold he paid for respawn fees or the shin guards that he dropped, the first thing he did was to check the countdown on the quest, but much to his surprise, he had neither cleared nor failed the quest yet as the timer kept running. It had three minutes left, and Rudra gulped nervously, he was not clear on the quest as the details provided were too few, will he clear the quest should the son of Archangel Serial still be alive after three minutes? Does he have to go back to the western town of Bethlehem? He had no clue at all. The three minutes left on the countdown were the most nervous three minutes of his life that seemed to take an eternity to pass. Every second off the timer made his mind have a new dark thought each one being worse than the previous one. Finally the timer hit zero and a system notification came. System notification, quest, save the son of Archangel Serial, SSS, completed successfully. The son of Archangel Serial is looking for you to express his gratitude, make sure to meet him within the next three days, he will be at the Church of Life in Purple Haze City. Go to the church for other specific rewards. Rudra sighed in relief. A 60% debuff for failure would have left him crippled, his gaming career in jeopardy. However all was fine now. He was obviously interested in the rewards, however the intensity and urgency of the situation had made him game continuously at high mental capacity for over 34 hours straight now, he needed a break, hence he decided to just log out of the game for now. Cuber Corporation, HQ Location, Unknown, Real World The feed turned dark, which meant that the player had disconnected from the game. It was a quest full of twists and turns and the people overlooking the entire development were in awe of the skills Rudra displayed. The quest line although entertaining had increased their headaches by quite a bit. Rudra achieved something that was not meant to happen in the game, the son of Archangel Serial was supposed to die at this point triggering the wrath of Serial which would have resulted in the eruption of Hazelgrove's dormant volcano and first ever calamity event. Rudra actually succeeding in the quest had put the Cuber Corporation in a tough spot. While creating the game they had made sure that the players had freedom and that every choice they made had a very attached consequence, yet they had still set a very general direction for the game to progress in. However including Rudra there were 16 in-game players that were flagged by the AI that continued to defy the bounds of artificial programming. Especially Rudra, his actions of introducing the bomb so early in the game as well as making explosives within a week of getting the explosive artist subclass that were one of the hardest things to design was something that the AI and Cuber Corporation never anticipated. Forcing them to make a negotiation to bring balance back to the game and now he derailed a main storyline from its intended path. They had to make a choice now, should they forcefully make the volcano erupt? Or should they let the game take its natural course? The Cuber officials were in an intense debate. However one thing good that came from the episode was that Rudra became in the clear, just being marked at unpredictable and extremely skilled with a threat level of, 7 out of 10, in the books. Real world, the upside, at an ice cream joint. 
Naomi was feeling a lot low, nothing seemed to cheer her up as she could not focus on anything at all. Even playing the game she felt a pang of constant guilt hence she chose to log out and go out for an ice cream. At the ice cream joint a little kid was cutely licking a triple scoop ice cream about the size of his arms. Ice cream smeared all over his cheeks. Naomi instantly recognized him, he was Guildmaster's little brother Max, she had seen the kid in the inauguration party. She took a seat next to Max and ordered a chocolate cone while giving Max a big smile. Max looked at Naomi and the innocent eight-year-old just said, pretty, and went back to licking his ice cream as it was more important to him. Naomi blushed at the compliment, kids were the best they blurted whatever they thought and there was no malice hidden in their words. Naomi's impression of little Max just went up by plus fifty, as apart from being so cute and adorable he was also so sweet. She thought maybe the brothers were raised well as they always said sweet things to her. Trying to make small talk she asked Max, Sue what do you want to do when you grow up? Max looked at Naomi for a second, then realized that every second he spent talking, was a second he could have used eating ice cream hence he just ignored her and walked off, ice cream in hand. Naomi just watched on in shock, she was ignored and stood up by a little guy who called her pretty just seconds ago, she thought. And here the world calls girls minds fickle. Focusing on eating her ice cream she was a little sad as the cute little eye candy Max had gone away. However what she saw next completely blew her away. The guild leader Rudra was out running in a tank top and earphones. His lean body full of muscles made her gulp for a second. She thought, well, that's a fine snack too. When Max who just finished eating his ice cream saw his brother. He screamed brother, as he ran towards Rudra to hug him. Rudra was surprised seeing Max running towards him, but he showed the enthusiasm back as even though he was sweaty he took the little guy in for a big hug. Naomi's heart just went into meltdown seeing this scene, it was just so adorable, Rudra then put little Max on his shoulders as he continued a slow jog. When Rudra was no longer in sight her eyes disappointedly went back towards the ice cream she was eating, which had half melted by now. When a lady came out from a black Lamborghini and sat beside her ordering a chocolate ice cream too. Naomi smiled at the stranger, who politely smiled back. That stranger, was you Anakatami. Chapter 136 Heist, 1. What's the problem? Karna asked. Well to explain the problem, let me retell the entire plan first. SMG said. Karna nodded and SMG began his explanation, the first thing we need to do is we need to knock the three patrolling guards out in the eastern perimeter, the guard's strength is estimated to be peak tier 1 at a minimum of level 50, after we knock them out, three of our men will drink the appearance alteration potion and take their place in already plotted patrol routes and patrolling, making sure that noon gets suspicious. Karna frowned a bit, should they fight them head on, they would have ganged up three on one maybe four on one and easily defeated the guards, however one on one the task was much harder and to do it in one fell swoop without alarming the others was even more difficult. Karna said, Sue is that the problem? SMG shaked his head, no no, the assassins in my party can do it easily, the hard part is later I will come to the hard part in time, after knocking the guards down, we need to get to the starting point of the treasure map, the guard tower C, of course it goes without saying that we need to take out the guards on top of guard tower C before we can proceed further. There are two guards who guard tower C, one hunter and one archer, both can use the bow proficiently at level 52 tier 1, they have excellent senses and vision due to the class however to avoid raising the alarm we will need to sneak up on them. After we knock them out our two men will use appearance alteration potion and pretend to be the duo patrolling the tower to not raise suspicion. Karna nodded he said, okay Sue so sneaking on the archer and ranger is the hard part, I see, yes as we need to enter the tower from the top down, we will need to scale the tower first while avoiding detection. Hmm, hmm. SMG shook his head however and said, no no no, climbing the tower unnoticed and taking the guards down is easy, I haven't came to the hard part yet have patience, the hard part comes next. Karna was a bit dumbfounded now, climbing a 50 feet tower and taking on two excellent archers at least 10 levels higher without raising an alarm was easy. What was hard then? The next segment requires us to remove tile number 47 from the basement of the tower which will unearth the secret passage which leads to tile number 47 beneath the royal vault, to reach there the passage is narrow and small, one has to crawl on all fours for about 500 meters down, and then only using body strength, climb on all fours vertically for 200 meters. Push the tile open quietly and get into the vault. Karna said, okay no problem, we can do it easy right? SMG said, yes, yes, I see Monsieur Leo is really fit in real life as well, great muscles, 
Of course he can do the physical activity, no problem, the problem comes later, I will get to it. Karna blushed at the compliment, he prided himself at the fit body he had. Then we go in and steal everything we think is worth stealing, twenty storage rings equipped on both of our ten fingers each plus all our inventory, a lot of loot. SMG said. Karna nodded he said, Ag, so that's the problem, don't worry mate there is enough loot in the royal vault to fit two thousand rings, don't worry about the loot. SMG shook his head, of course there is, that is why we are carrying out the heist, no no that's not the problem, the problem comes next, wait I will get there. Karna was growing impatient now, what was the damn problem? We then leave the vault, put back the tile, slide out of the secret passage, leave the tower, leave the premises and flee Ninekut's kingdom. SMG said. Karna nodded, he said, AHA, so fleeing is the problem. SMG shook his head, no no, fleeing should be trouble free, we do not expect to raise alarm in the first six hours, then the knocked out guards will wake up and raise an alarm. It will take thirty more minutes for them to figure out that a highest had occurred. Then to find our trail they will at least need six more hours. As they will have no idea where we ran off to, by that point we would already have crossed the border back to Hazel Groove. Karna was pissed now as he said, Sue what exactly is the problem? SMG replied, the problem is Monsieur Karna, that we have not thrown the doubt towards the demolition boys, we have carried the hayest too cleanly, also if we use the wolves as mounts to escape it's harder to cast suspicion on the demolition boys, we need horse mounts. Karna was both impressed at SMG's long-term planning and insight and disappoint in his lack of common sense he said, then give some members appearance alteration potions, make them look like demolition boys members, go to a store and rent the horses, now when they backtrace the mounts they will go to the store and learn of their identity as a member of demolition boys, problem solved. SMG's eyes shined he was enlightened, bravo. Bravo. He clapped. The plan was finally set, every fine detail worked out, once the horses were hired, it would be time to carry out the highest. Chapter 137, Heist, 2 Two members from the heist group went to the nearest village to rent fifty horses. They had taken the appearance alteration potion and disguised themselves as two guild members from the demolition boys. They went to the storekeeper wearing dark robes without any guild insignia. However they did not use the hood. They let the shopkeeper deliberately see their faces as they handed two hundred gold for the transaction. The shopkeeper was elated and as the customers did not haggle over the price it left a good impression of them in his mind, naturally he would remember them later. While the two were busy buying horses, the main heist crew had started the action. It was sunset time in game, and according to the scouting they did for the past few days this was the most opportune time to take out all patrols. There was a 15-minute window between when the natural sunlight was a bit low and the lamps were unlit, hence the overall visibility was at the lowest. Using this short window the trained assassins of the Noon organization, who had probably done same kinds of missions in real life took out the three guards with exact sync. They sneaked up on them making no sound at all, and without them noticing they used the skill cutthroat giving critical hits to all guards as they died instantly. Minus 15,000 critical hit. Minus 15,000 critical hit. Minus 15,000 critical hit. The dead soldiers' bodies did not even hit the floor as without making a single sound their bodies were quickly disposed off, their armor worn and the appearances altered using a strand of their hair. All within two minutes. The patrols had been successfully replaced, phase one was a success. Karna had a chill down his spine seeing the whole scene unfold before his eyes, the assassins were terrifying, he was sure that should they choose so, he would die under their knives before he could even react. Phase 2 was next as pairs of two assassins sneakily moved cover to cover as they reached the foot of guard tower C, the four assassins got into positions, they were moving in pairs as they used the thief and assassin class special skill, anti-gravity to scale the tower. They looked like a bunch of ninjas from Kanoha as they ran vertically on the tower, reaching the end the assassin pair won through a small metal pin inside the observation deck to gain the archer and hunter duo's attention when the other pair stealthily entered from behind them and applied a MMA-style chokehold. With the choke tightly applied the duo gasped for air as they flailed around trying to get out of it, however before they could even move an inch, the initial pair of assassins entered the room and stabbed their hearts out. Minus 20,000 critical hit. Minus 20,000 critical hit. The corpses were stacked in a corner and one pair changed their appearances to match that of the hunter and archer duo. They took up the bow and arrows as they slinged it on their backs, and started to behave exactly like the duo would while on watch. 
the other pair went down the tower and killed the unsuspecting guard on the door before opening the door for Karna and SMG to enter. Just after Karna and SMG entered the tower the lampman came around to hang the lamps. Phase 2 of the mission was also a success, noon in the guard of the royal vault was any wiser as nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Karna and SMG made their way to the bottom of the chamber, where food and supplies were stacked, they started counting the tiles until finally finding tile number 47. They removed the tile to show a narrow secret passage underneath. They entered the passage, Karna first and SMG followed, and after going about 10 meters, the passage shrunk to the size where one could only get by after moving on all fours while using UR elbows, military style. After an arduous half an hour they finally reached the end of the horizontal movement chamber and towards the vertical chamber. Karna looked at his stamina bar, amused to find it depleted by January 3rd RD, the task was really laborious. Not easy at all, however he had an even more difficult climb ahead. The vertical climb was difficult as there was nothing to grip in the climb, one had to exert pressure on the vertical walls with their hands and legs while continually struggling upwards. Karna grit his teeth as he began the climb, thank god it was not real world, else the labor would have left him sore for days to come. Slowly and steadily they both made their way upwards until finally they hit the ceiling. SMG firmly planted his feet on the walls, and used his arms to give Karna as much support as he could so that Karna could exert pressure on the tiles to finally seeing a little bit of movement from the tiles, Karna wanted nothing more than to just flung the tile away with all his strength however he restrained his desire while slowly moving the tile towards the left providing an opening. When enough of the tile was slid, he placed his hands at the side and pushed it wide open, to finally climb into the vault. Finally with much difficulties he had indeed entered the goddamn royal vault. He was exited to look around at all the glittering treasures there, soon SMG followed, only to find a open mouth Karna staring at some object. SMG turned his head to see what the fuss was about, but he too found himself open mouthed when he used inspect on the object. He pinched himself twice as he thought, is this for real? Chapter 138, Rewards, 1. SMG rubbed his eyes twice to see if he was seeing the object in front of him correctly. Eternal Flame, Legendary, a flame obtained from a dying phoenix, it contains the power to resurrect the dead, it cannot be extinguished, if used against enemies, the burning will never stop. Effect 1, Flame of Life, the eternal flame can resurrect any dead NPC and can grant vitality to those nearing their deaths. Effect 2, the strongest forging flame, it can even melt the legendary metals to smith. Effect 3, the flame if us to attack will burn the enemy without mercy, it cannot be extinguished, the flame will only go out when the body of the enemy is completely burned. Caution, if the flame is not used properly and results in a town or forest fire, it will lead to a complete town wipe, the flame cannot be contained. Cannot be stored in inventory. SMG and Karna were drooling at this point, only when they read the last sentence about it not being able to be stored in inventory did they calm down. Carrying the flame around was the dumbest thing they could do. However it would be a lie to say that they were not tempted. It was a damn legendary grade treasure. With much difficulty their eyes went away from the golden flames towards the other objects. The royal vault was exactly like one would expect. Heaps of gold and platinum and precious stones were just scattered, artifacts were lying between them, it was just a massive collection of priceless treasures. Unfortunately no matter how much he looked for there were no other legendary items lying around, however there were semi-legendary and epic ones. And amazing artifacts at that. Seal of Draconia, Epic, a seal of the Dragon Kingdom of Draconia, grants a party of twenty to enter the Forbidden Kingdom. Karna was intrigued he immediately put it in the inventory, of course he wanted to go to any land labeled Forbidden and this was the one having the goddamn dragons. Macedoka Katana, Epic, rumored to be the sharpest blade in the kingdom, it is only for the most skilled of the swordsmen, built for accuracy rather than power. It is for the fast and precise. Effect 1, Ignores All Armor. Effect 2, Critical Damage plus 50%. Effect 3, The Skill Cutthroat when used with this weapon will result in 400% damage. It was a really really sharp katana and SMG gulped seeing it, he wanted it, it was almost tailor-built for him, he was the kind of agile and precise swordsman who used the skill cutthroat. But his dignity would not let him ask for it. Karna looked at SMG as he smiled and said, you should take it. SMG looked at Karna gratefully however he did not stand on ceremony as he equipped the weapon. He was extremely satisfied as he felt that joining the elites was a good choice, the people were good and not greedy, he swore internally to serve the guild better. 
Minotaur's horn, semi-legendary, the horn of a legendary creature, it can be forged into a great sword, as well as used as an alchemy material. A semi-legendary item. Although it could not be used directly it was still an amazing item nonetheless, and it went straight into the inventory. Elven sword, semi-legendary, a sword of the highest grade made by the elves, it is light and contains an inbuilt power to fight creatures of darkness, inscribed with the finest runes it contains a sword heart and will only show its true potential when it chooses a master. Current chosen master, none. Effect 1, can damage all darkness-aligned monsters including formless monsters like ghosts and spirits. Effect 2. Effect 3. Effect 4. Restriction 1, Righteous Faction. Restriction 2, Knight Class Only. Reading the description Karna immediately chose the item for Rudra, it was almost screaming his name. He stored it in his inventory without second thoughts. He next found an item that resonated with him for a change. Fruit of Luck, Epic, increases the consumer's luck by plus 3 permanently. It increases the eater's luck. Showing no hesitation, Karna ate the fruit there and then. Why waste an inventory slot? And a major change appeared in his character panel. Player name, Karna. Title, Son of Providence. Class, Swordsman. Subclass, Runesmith. LVL, 43. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 250 Vit, 230. Int, 180 STA, 230. PHY, 200 SE, 5. HP, 12000-12000. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck, 95 plus 3 slash 100, Son of Providence. Charm. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV40, bracelet of possivity, Rymar's ring, true elite's guild robe. Weapons, slaughter blade, epic, common bow, quiver of arrows, assassin's daggers. Skills, mountain crash, defense break, energy slash, high knee. Class specific skills, heightened battle sense, weapon recall, doppelganger. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, small egg, incubation, 24 slash 100. His heaven's chosen title was replaced by the title, Son of Providence. Of course the effect changed as well. Son of Providence, title, good things will automatically flock towards you with you not even having to try. Critical hit rate plus 30% for all strikes. This was just too strong. He had became more OP than he already was as one of every three hits he made were guaranteed to be critical hits. Just the thought made him yelp in joy. He hit it big this time especially when he read the line, good things will automatically come to you. Just a small difference of three luck points and such a huge change was seen in his panel. Now he only wondered what happens if he made the luck stat a full 100 someday. Anyway there were a lot more things to loot, he needed to focus back on the task at hand. He was a responsible robber after all, no treasure shall escape his hands. Chapter 139, Rewards, 2 Woa check this out, SMG told Karna. Platinum Guild Token, Nine Clouds Special, the token can be used to create the only Platinum Guild in the Nine Clouds Kingdom. Karna whistled looking at the item, although it was useless for them, it was actually a priceless treasure for a first-rate guild in Nine Clouds Kingdom. The thing could be either sold in an auction-type bidding war, or could be gifted to curry favor. Also the Grey International Main Guild was also based in Nine Clouds Kingdom hence it could also be gifted to them. Karna let Rudra decide on the specifics as he tossed it into the inventory. There were various types of forging materials lying around, various stones and rare gems. Whatever Karna felt may have use, he tossed it into the inventory space. Then he found something interesting. Weapon recall, skill, epic, recall a fallen weapon back to your wielding arm. It was an interesting skill to learn, it had many practical uses in battle. Karna tossed it into the inventory. Flame Steps, Skill, Epic, uses flames to increase moment speed and attack power. Propels the user forward with great movement boost. Low chance of dealing burn damage upon kicking. Plus 50 AGI. Plus 5 PHY. Duration, 5 minutes. Caution, 5 agility after time duration is over for 2 hours. Cooldown time, 
three hours. It was an amazing skill to learn. Karna appreciated it and tossed it into the inventory. Staff of Grand Mage Arahim, epic, staff used by Grand Mage Arahim when he was an apprentice mage. Plus 50 mana. Plus 50 int. Effect 1, all spells power plus 5%. Effect 2, casting time minus 5%. It was an amazing wand and Karna had no doubt Mediv would love it as he tossed it in the bag. Time was running out now, as the timer Karna and SMG set for escaping showed that they had 5 minutes left for the heist. They needed 2 minutes to get back out of the tunnel, hence that left them 3 minutes to loot. They frantically started putting everything into inventory that came in sight. Plus 250 million gold. Plus 3 million platinum. Plus 1000, LV50, full armor sets. Plus 1000, LV60, full armor sets. Plus 100 tier 1 return scrolls. Plus 100 tier 2 scrolls, ablaze. Plus 10 tier 3 scrolls, oceans tide. Plus 15 strength fruits. Plus 15 stamina fruits. Plus 15 agility fruits. Time ran out as second alarm hit Karna, it was time to move out, the night watcher's shift would start in 30 minutes and they needed to escape a good distance by then. However the sheer amount of gold they looted here today exceeded all of Karna's wildest imaginations, he genuinely had a feeling that they could all cash the money in and divide it amongst all guild members and just retire for good. However he dismissed that notion as quickly as it came. He loved Omega and he loved the true elites, this was just the start. It was a long road ahead. The two of them escaped the room as they carefully put the tile back on, before sliding down the vertical pit. Finally a minute later they were back in the horizontal pit and they started to crawl at full speed. Coming out of the horizontal pit they quickly covered back the tile number 47 that they used to carry out the heist and put back the food and other supplies over the tile to make it look natural. The two members on top of the tower quickly ran down upon receiving the let's go signal, as the four dashed out. The three members on patrol duty saw them escaping and took it as their signal to flee too as the five made their way back out of the courtyard and into the wilds. The horses were ready there as the party split into three to leave from that point forward in three different directions to mislead the pursuers. The three different paths would eventually merge before they all made way back into Hazel Groove, however for now the party of fifty broke into three groups and ran. Half an hour later when the group was miles away from the heist location. The guard who came to replace the patrolman raised the first alarm after not finding anyone on patrol. Soon the dead bodies were found and a red alert was issued. However the conniving thieves had long left the premises as they made headway back into Hazel Groove. Six hours of constant riding later, the group of three merged back into one as they entered the border town of Hazel Groove Kingdom. This entire event would be years later remembered as the greatest heist of the century as the value of all looted goods exceeded a trillion dollars. It was an insane plan executed to perfection. Well almost perfection, as a little part was still left yet. That was to frame the demolition boys. However it was not that difficult as opportunity walked itself towards Karna when the party was stopped on the road towards the capital by a bunch of alliance members, coincidentally all from the demolition boys. Karna acted like a pitiful player as the other guild members played along, he quietly gave them a loot of 200 gold coins as well as a few rare stones that he obtained from the heist. The demolition boys were naturally overjoyed and let Karna and group pass without any qualms, they had never expected such a huge spoil. They transferred the loot to the guild warehouse, as they received great praise from their superiors. Alas if only they knew the consequences of their actions. Chapter 140, Rewards, 3. Church of Life, Inner District, Purple Haze City. Rudra was inside the prayer hall of the Church of Life talking to Cardinal Lee about the spicophics of the battle. So at the end I destroyed the teleportation array from the inside so that the paladin could not chase the son of Archangel Serial, however I got killed by his spells as I am but weak. Rudra said pitifully. He had learnt the subtle art of humble bragging and he made sure to make his story sound extremely tragic to Cardinal Lee. Cardinal Lee was moved to tears learning of his sufferings as he showered praise after praise to Rudra. He then said, I had a talk with the Archbishop, he told me to award you as I deem fit for meritorious service towards the church, do not worry, the church shall not do you wrong. System notification, your title emissary of the church has been upgraded to honorary bishop of the church. Rudra called up his stats panel. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus one knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, reputable knight, 
Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life, World Renowned, Hear of Augustus One Knight. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 46. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 236 plus 118 VIT, 236 plus 118. Int, 236 plus 118 STA, 236 plus 118. PHY, 236 plus 118 HP, 29,000 slash 29,000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy, invalid. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, lich's ring, concealer mask, not equipped, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica. Skills, darkness bind, Summon Knight Durahal, Wind Slash, Critical Absorb, Berserk, Darkness Blast, Death Slash, Eyes of Truth, Earthquake, Critical Block, Blink, Stormbringer. Class Specific Skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 52-200. Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life, Title, you shall have unrestricted access to the Church of Life's most resources such as Holy Water and Infamy Reduction. You yourself will not gain any more infamy upon killing enemies as any you kill shall be considered an enemy of the Church. Any opponent attacking you will have no way of reducing infamy inside Hazelgrove Kingdom. Unless acquitted of treason, the local administration cannot capture or detain you. It was a very very important title, and its benefits were obvious, Rudra had a big smile on his face. However he was not satisfied yet. The pain he went through in the quest needed him to get more. He smiled at Cardinal Lee, I am honored that you found this lowly adventurer worthy of such a title. Rudra had fake tears in his eyes. As Cardinal Lee's heart moved again. He felt like Rudra was the purest soul around, reliable and a genuine devotee of the goddess. He was convinced in his choice of granting the title. Next Cardinal Lee said you may choose one of the three rewards next. 1. You may use this opportunity to get any one item from the church's warehouse. 2. You may use this opportunity to ask for the blessing of the Pope once. 3. You may use this opportunity to exchange for one tear of life. Rudra thought his ears were ringing. Did the Cardinal just say the tear of life? The tear of life was the church of life's most treasured poses shown, only given to the most elite paladins after years of service. Upon consuming it permanently gave a plus 50 bonus to all stats, excluding hidden stats, drinking it was akin to gaining ten levels at once. Rudra never expected such a treasure to be offered. The second option was intriguing too, he could meet the Pope to gain his blessing. The Pope was an extremely powerful existence at the peak of the power chain at tier 5 peak and some rumors saying at tier 6, any blessing from him could be worth a big deal. Rudra had been to the church warehouse twice now, hence he knew that there were great treasures inside, it was sure to be good. He had a big dilemma here to choose option 1, option 2, or option 3. Meanwhile the alliance meeting. Leaders, the backer who invested the large amounts of funds has sent a representative to state some demands at this meeting, please welcome Mr. Nikul. Introduced to Love Smashing. Nikul looked around the room in a cold gaze, as he sized the seven guild leaders sitting around him, then he scoffed and shook his head. Then he said, look, we all know your guilds are just trash compared to the true elites, and it will be trash until that guild exists in the kingdom, your current objective should be aimed at crushing the elites. Viennes popped on the guild leaders' foreheads upon hearing the rude men, of course they knew that compared to the elites they were inferior, however Noon wanted that fact being shoved down their throats. With great self-control and restraint Pink Lotus said, how would you suggest we do that? Nikul said, we have given so much money to you beggars, use it to hire more beggars, every goddamn third-rate and adventure group you can afford, buy them all and put them under contract, increase your numbers by a large margin. The elite's identity is their exclusivity, however against 100,000 soldiers even the strongest 1,000 shall fall. Yua wanted to bang the table hard, but she restrained herself barely. The guy treated had the gall to call her beggar. She the daughter heir of Nakatami Corporation. The leader of the first-rate guild Azure Lotus. 
She looked around to see that the other guild leaders were also barely swallowing their pride, if not for the truly immense funds poured, they would have slapped that dog to death. There are only nine days left in the elite's war cooldown meter left. It's time to nip that problem in the bud. Nikul said as he left the room. Noon wanted to meet each other's eyes at this point, as there was no point in discussing, they had to do as instructed, fortunately or unfortunately, they had become slaves of the Ambani Corporation after they accepted the massive investments. They could only prepare for the upcoming war and do their best to win now. I guess we will hit the Power Stone target soon so another bonus will be coming tomorrow. But I will gladly work three times as hard for the support and love you all show for my work. Chapter 141, Rewards, 4 Rudra thought about everything, and at the end he chose the Tear of Life, as stats were absolute, his biggest advantage currently was his stats that were way beyond anyone else at this stage in the game. His stats were already comparable to level 60 normal players at level 46, but gaining another plus 50 in all stats, would mean that with his golden ratio bonus, he would have plus 75 all stats, it was a huge boost in strength. Although meeting the Pope was an extremely interesting prospect for him, the rewards were not certain, and he felt his current self too lacking to meet such an existence. Had he been tier 3 or 4 he would have jumped on the chance to meet the Pope, but considering his current self, he decided against it. As for choosing an artifact from the warehouse, the only thing Rudra lacked currently was a suitable sword, Excalibur, replica, was a nice sword, however Windcutter sword was too lacking now that his level had increased. The damage from Windslash was also not up to par. However he had already browsed through everything in the warehouse related to swords in his previous visits, and found many extraordinary swords, just none of them were a good fit for him. Making up his mind, Rudra asked the Cardinal for the Tear of Life. Cardinal Lee was a bit surprised at Rudra's choice, however he gladly complied, giving Rudra the vial containing the Tear of Life for consuming. Tear of Life, semi-legendary, potion, reverse-engineered from the divine tears of the goddess of life, this is a potion that can give permanent stat points bonus to the consumer. Effect, all stats plus 50. Rudra felt no hesitation as he gulped the potion down. Immediately he felt a storm of power coursing through his veins as he felt a lot lot stronger. Rudra called for his new stat panel. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life, World-Renowned, Heer of Augustus One Knight. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 46. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI. 286 plus 143 vit, 286 plus 143. Int, 286 plus 143 sta, 286 plus 143. PHY, 286 plus 143 hp, 35,000 slash 35,000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy. Invalid. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, lich's ring, concealer mask, not equipped, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica. Skills, darkness bind, summon knight durahal, wind slash, critical absorb, berserk, darkness blast, death slash, eyes of truth, earthquake, critical block, Blink, Stormbringer. Class specific skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 53-200. Then an unexpected event occurred. System notification, you have achieved stats way beyond your current level. You have been granted the special title, Limit Breaker. Limit Breaker, Title, you will be valued in any NPC faction you choose to join, irrespective of their alignment. Rudra received a new title, although it was useless to him currently, it was a good title to have. Rudra had a huge boost in his already monstrous strength, he felt he was as strong as an early tier 2 player currently, and that was saying a lot as the difference between tiers was huge. Also Rudra was currently 14 levels away from level 60 where he can attempt the next tier promotion quest. It was Christmas come early for him. He thanked Cardinal Lee for all his help, and just as he was about to leave the church, Caleb entered the church. 
Rudra easily identified the striking son of Archangel Serial with his distinct blonde hair and build. It was only then that Rudra remembered that the kid was looking for him, however as Rudra was under the effect of the appearance alteration potion as Gary while rescuing him, he walked right past Rudra without paying him any mind. Naturally Rudra raised an eyebrow at the situation. He said, we meet again, son of Serial. Caleb paused in his steps as he looked towards Rudra, clearly puzzled, he said, sorry, do I know you? Rudra laughed as he said, the guy who saved you, Shakuni. Caleb's eyes widened at the reveal as he politely bowed, then asked, but. Rudra quickly said, appearance alteration potion, happy to see you safe. Caleb instantly understood everything, however before his conversation could continue any further Cardinal Lee jumped as he touched the son of Archangel Serial everywhere with tears in his eyes, making sure he was fine. Rudra rolled his eyes at this sight, he is not your birth son, Cardinal, Rudra said in his mind, however not a single sign of displeasure was seen on his face. Caleb was not used to this kind of treatment as he was clearly very awkward, however he did not have the heart to push the old Cardinal away. Rudra had no intention of sticking around to see the nauseating sight any longer as he looked at Caleb and said, True Elites Guild, Inner City, come if you have any business to discuss. And left the church. Caleb wanted to follow however he was stormed in the church with fanatic paladins and priests who were seeing him as if Serial himself had descended. However just as Rudra left the church Rudra got another system notification. System notification, you have piqued the interest of Archangel Serial, he will be watching your progress. Rudra felt a chill down his spine at this notification, he had never heard of any such event in his past life, and his guts told him. It was not a good thing. Keep up the good work guys, you all earned 7 bonus 4 golden ticket bonuses plus 3 power stone bonuses. Hoping to carry on the momentum and go strong next month too. Chapter 142, Mega Plan True Elite's Headquarters, Inner District, Purple Haze City, Virtual World the elders had all met inside the conference room, it was full attendance with SMG, Fatty Kalash, Neatwit, Karna, Amelia all sitting around and Rudra sitting at the center of the table. There was a lot of tension and excitement at the table, everyone here was busy with various tasks after the system auction. But by the looks of the things, everyone seemed to have succeeded in their tasks. Rudra had received the report about the guild's current finances from Amelia following the heist that SMG and Karna conducted. Honestly Rudra was pleasantly surprised to see such an amazing loot, he was extremely happy. Also the items they brought were exemplary to say the least. Especially the elven sword, it was an amazing addition to his arsenal, somehow the sword felt neither light nor heavy in his hands, it was just the perfect weight. To his disappointment the sword did not acknowledge it as its master right away, but even without the sword acknowledging it as its master, it unleashed terrifying power far beyond Windcutter could ever do. Hence Rudra swapped Windcutter for Elven Sword in his dual-wielding style. Apart from the semi-legendary sword, there was also the Golden Goose the Chalice of Purification, that Rudra stole while saving Caleb. He was now in possession of an unlocked Chalice of Purification, it meant that every potion of the basic grade could be upgraded to the highest purity by the guild for no extra cost. Just imagine the economic ramifications of such a cheat object, just imagine buying a basic strengthening potion for 2 gold, and selling in highest quality advanced strengthening potion for 250 gold. Whopping over 2000% profit. It was a cheap margin. Should the guild choose to sell it at a low price of 100 gold each? Would there even be competition left in the market? The true elites were going to own the monopoly in the potions market in the future, and that was a garandum tea now with this object. Should even a whiff about the object be leaked however, it would cause endless wars for the guild, even super guilds would not resist the temptation of a potential endless revenue stream. Hence even inside the true elite's guild, only Fatty Kalash and Rudra knew about the cheat object, not even Karna had a whiff about it, it was not as if Rudra did not trust the elders, however it was just that big of a deal that he took that one extra step. However even after all this, dare did Rudra say that the funds were barely enough, for the next plan he was going to propose. It was an insane plan, and Rudra never dreamed that such a plan may become reality, however now having more funds than every other guild in the Purple Haze City did combined, he finally got the courage to spend money like water. But before Rudra proposed his insane plan, he decided to get to know about the guild specifics. 
Amelia was ready with a report as she said, the Alliance have started a mass recruitment drive, they are providing guaranteed benefits upon joining the group and issuing great rewards for the guild tasks, it is estimated that the Seven Guild Alliance has recruited close to 1,000,000 people into their fold in the last four days and are planning on taking another 40,000 more. That would bring the total size of the Alliance to a whopping 4,000,000 players. It is no joke considering that eight days later our protection period would cool down and we will be able to receive war invited. The atmosphere in the room turned heavy. 400,000 troops was another ballpark, it was not possible to face such a massive platter of troops even if they had 50,000 bombs to bombard the enemy with. It was simply suicidal to face such an army. Rudra seemed unaffected with the news as he had long since anticipated such an event occurring. He had thought about many possible scenarios and now was not the time to worry about the bells of war, it was time to act on it, chip away at the opposition and make their stance known. If Rudra was not wrong, a massive riot is on the rise in Purple Haze City, within two or three days it should start brewing. The quest line involving Crown Prince Amon seems to have been going as he expected, the alliance threatened the three second-rate guilds that acquired the object in the auction with an all-out war over the object and managed to acquire it for themselves. And seeing that they were calmly operating and recruiting members, it was clear that they sided with the crown prince on the matter. Hence, when the matter of the crown prince being a necromancer would be revealed to the common public, and the outrage would start, they were sure to have a hard time. Rudra was just hoping for that event to happen, the alliance's nightmare would start with that riot and would be made worse by the war they would find them celebs in with the elites, and if everything went as Rudra hoped it would, the alliance will be driven out of Purple Haze City in two months' time. Rudra sighed things were going to get cluttered again. There were a million things to do, and a little time to do it all. It was time to tie up those laces and get to work. Rudra started to explain his plan. The mega plan to become the overlords of Purple Haze City. Hence we need to pump everything up this week to match that. New targets this week are. 1400 PS equals 2. 2100 PS equals 3. 2800 PS equals 4. 3500 PS equals 5. Really wish to hit the 3500 PS target. Big 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 shout out to Cervantes91 for the 10,000 coin gift. Chapter 143, Overlords of Purple Haze City. Karna was a little scared now as he said, Guildmaster, how about we recruit some more members, like a few 10,000 odd or so, even if they don't fit the build we can still choose good players at level 40 or above that we can rope in. Rudra just raised his hand, N.O. He said firmly. We are the elites and only the elites shall be worthy to stand amongst us. Rudra declared. Karna looked down sheepishly, of course even he wanted only the elites to stand amongst them, however the overwhelming numbers disparity between them and the opposing faction made him a little desperate for more help. Rudra said, I understand your concerns, however they are unnecessary, let a million of them charge on us and we will still stand tall on their corpses. Everyone's eyes widened in shock, where did the guild leader gain his confidence from? What cards does he have hidden? However relief was the emotion everyone felt, if the boss said they would stand tall. Then to hell with the number disparity they would stand tall period. Rudra began his explanation, if we play our cards right, the massive number of 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 can be reduced to nearly 2, 50, 0, 0, 0 even before the war starts, as for how and when, leave it to me. Everyone nodded, the boss had spoken. Rudra continued, the most important thing we need to do currently is to bait the alliance into declaring war on us, just that much, we just need those idiots to send a war request, for us to win the war with 100% certainty. Well everyone wanted to know, how that would change anything however Neatwit was the one to voice out that question for everyone as he said. Um, guild master, how would that change anything? Rudra chuckled as he said, the defending faction, chooses the terrain for the war. There are many different types of terrains that can be chosen, and some of them render numbers advantage useless. Everyone's eyes widened, although the war feature had been around for quite some time now with many guilds having chosen many different battlefields, although it was true that there were many terrains, but there was none that could negate such a huge numbers advantage. Sensing their doubts Rudra said, we will choose the battlefield, Fort Knox, it is a fort-type defensive battlefield that is ideal for defense, I know what you all are thinking, that although it's a fort in name, it has three massive gates that lead straight into the interior. It is far from impregnable. However naturally I have my own arrangements. 
Everyone dispelled their doubts, the leader had spoken, however what Rudra said next is what blew their minds completely. Rudra started explaining his big plan. The thing we should focus now, before the war is something completely else. First arrangement that I assign SMG is arming our members to the teeth, by the best armors, best weapons, best skill books everything, make an announcement in the guild that any weapon and skill book they wish to purchase, the guild will foot the bill, just make the troop stronger. SMG widened his eyes in disbelief, however he instantly nodded, he understood his duty and that was all that he needed to do. Augustus one night has informed me that there is a riot upcoming in the city, it will see a lot of turmoil inside Hazel Groove and especially in Purple Haze City. The Crown Prince is a necromancer and there will be a great public backlash when the news is leaked. The NPC shops will close and the city will go under protest, however for us it's an opportunity and we will strike big should it all as planned. Rudra said. We are going to buy every single plot of land available in Purple Haze City, Augustus is a duke and he can purchase the lands given enough funds. We are going to buy every single shop on sale, every single apartment, hotel and empty unconstructed lands available for purchase. Before anyone could process the information about Augustus being a duke and the guild undertaking a massive buying spree Rudra dropped another big bomb. We are going to employ the entire guards tier 1 division available for hire, the entire 20,000 guard division, it will cost close to 50 million gold a month to maintain the division, however we will undertake that expense. We will use the guards division to maintain order and enforce security of our shops and bought out plot of lands, as we will move through the riots protecting our assets. Rudra declared. The guild members found his actions puzzling, why not wait until the riot was over a month later to buy the plots of land? That way the hired guards could be put to better use. However questioned Rudra as all his actions always had a deeper meaning that they could not understand. And that was indeed the case, after the riot's end, there will be a flood of nobility titles awarded by the newly crowned King Amon, and the nobles would try use their authority to buy the properties available on the market. There would be a flood of opposition and the prices of the plots would skyrocket. Soon after the crowning of the new king the special event the city garrison would start and at the time guilds would compete to gain the garrison of cities under the rule of King Amon and Rudra intended to fight for the rights to Purple Haze City. Every shop he owned would turn into a bunkers and strategic locations and every soldier he owned into fighting force. At that time the value of this investment would show fruit. There are wars after wars as the game has entered a chaotic period, many guilds would rise and many would perish when all was said and done. However Rudra with his reincarnator knowledge aims for the biggest piece of the pie and he has started making the necessary moves. The first step to becoming the overlords of Purple Haze City required him to invest a massive sum of 300 million gold. A weaker man would not be able to spend so much in a single go. However Rudra was not a weaker man, he was a dragon and his hunger would not be satiated by a small drop in the bucket like 300 million gold. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Chapter 144 Oh, what a shame. The Royal Palace, Inner District, Purple Haze City, Hazel Groove Kingdom. Price Amon played with the red jewel in his hands as he looked at the seven people standing before him, the lacking strength of the group made him scoff, as it would not even take him a flick of his wrist to kill these ants. Even a basic death knight in his arsenal could 1v7 these adventurers. However he had to admit that they did him a huge meritorious service by bringing him this gem, and hence they deserved to be rewarded. Amon was planning on dethroning the current emperor his father and seizing power for himself. However it was not easy to seize power from his old but strong warmage father who was at tier 4. Amon knew he had to scheme to take the throne, and the red jewel was a vital part in his schemes. The red jewel was actually a very rare type of illusion stone. If powered using a formation, it could give birth to a very intricate and deathly illusion. Amon was confident of killing the emperor inside the illusion using his necromancy. The chief of royal guards was already on his side, hence there would be no problem in taking over the military after the forceful rise to the throne. What Amon was afraid of however was Patricia one night, would the one night swear their loyalty? Or will they rebel? Was a question he was worried about. However that equation changed when he met the adventurer Shikuni one night, inside the royal library. The nonchalant reaction the player had to him being a necromancer was intriguing to Amon. He needed such subordinates, smart but indifferent to his actions. He needed to somehow rope Shikuni in after he ascends the throne to consolidate his power. Amon was conflicted in how to reward the seven people here however and he finally decided that they should be rewarded only in the future after he took the throne. 
he decided to test the adventurers here, should they support him in his rise to power, they will be rewarded, if they choose to turn their backs on him, knowing his necromancer identity and his thirst for the throne, he would kill them right here right now and oust their guilds from the kingdom. Amon said, well done, well done, you have done a great meritorious deed for the kingdom by delivering this Sue very important gem to me. It loves mashing took a knee as he tried to butter up the king, he said, it is our pleasure to serve the glorious and righteous crown prince of Hazelgroove. Amon's eyelids twitched, he was a necromancer dammit, glorious and righteous would be the two worst words to describe him. However he continued, I plan on assassinating the king and taking over the throne through blood, I see you are a group of intelligent people, should you choose to support the uprising, you shall be appropriately rewarded in the future, so what shall your choice be? System Notification Quest, Help Crown Prince Amon Rise to the Throne, A, Help Crown Prince Amon maintain Civil Order once he rises to the throne through blood and riots break out on the kingdom streets. Rewards, Unknown. Pink Lotus instantly felt like this quest was a red flag, however looking at the exited expressions of her colleagues, she knew the outcome. Yet before anyone could express their thoughts she asked, what if we refuse? The six of them showed her dirty glares, as naturally this was not the majority opinion, yet Amon laughed at her question. He said, it's that or death, and knowing that you adventurers have been blessed by immortality by the goddess, it is probably infinite deaths, and also there will be no place for you and your guilds inside Hazelgroove Kingdom anymore as the royal guards would chase you out. Everyone had a chill down their spines hearing his reply, it was not an option if he put it that way now was it? Gulping, Scorpio said, of course it's our pleasure to serve his majesty the emperor. Scorpio deliberately called Amon the emperor to appease his anger, and naturally it worked as Amon smiled. He liked the sound of being called emperor. At this time a servant entered the room and passed a message to Amon that emissaries from the Nine Clouds Kingdom were here and that the king requested his presence in the court. Amon groaned, he had no intention of attending the court, yet he could not ignore his stupid father's summons for now, as he needed to play the part of the ideal son. He dismissed the alliance leaders as he went to the court. The Royal Court, Hazelgroove Kingdom Inside the Grand Royal Court lined with important and powerful ministers, stood a group of emissaries from the neighboring Nine Clouds Kingdom. The Emperor Cervantes 91 sat on his throne looking towards the group. His aura majestic and fitting of a ruler. Although Hazelgroove was a kingdom and not an empire, the history of Hazelgroove is such that it was once the strongest and largest empire in the continent. After years of battles and uprising, it shrank to its current size, however the emperor never demoted his title to that of a king. Hence he was still called the emperor. Cervantes 91 was an extremely skilled warrior who was a great general as well. In his reign, not a single inch of his kingdom was lost to enemy forces. The people were happy and he was revered. Amon took his place at the court, just below the emperor, as Cervantes gave him a slight nod, the attendance was now complete and the proceedings could start. One of the emissaries said, Your Majesty, the royal warehouse of the Nine Clouds Kingdom was raided and looted by a bunch of despicable thieves who escaped with a lot of valuable items. Upon tracing the thieves' tracks, we discovered that they entered Hazelgroove Kingdom. The thieves made use of a secret passage unknown to the kingdom to successfully carry out the heist, however they made a fatal mistake of renting the horses from a nearby village. The horseman saw their faces and has sworn on his neck that they are adventurers from a guild called Demolition Boys, we have the sketches here. They passed the sketches they obtained from the horse dealer and passed it to a court official. Then he continued, we request cooperation in capturing the responsible parties with the assistance of the Almighty Emperor of Hazelgroove. Cervantes 91 closed his eyes as he thought about the issue, he naturally despised thieves and robbers, however the thieves were Hazelgroove citizens hence he needed to be sure before granting punishment. He said, the royal guards will assist you in checking their posse scions, should the stolen items be found, they will be returned to Nine Clouds respectfully, and the thieves will be tried under Hazelgroove Kingdom's law and punished for their crimes. The emissaries bowed in respect of the emperor as they said, that is very gracious your majesty, we have no qualms in your judgment. With this the matter was settled, however Amon had a deep frown on his face. Wasn't one of the idiots who came to meet him a while ago the leader of Demolition Boys? If so this could be troublesome. Meanwhile, the grey international tower, the upside, real world. Ethan had became a lot more busy since he met the twins. A passion had been lit under him as he was grinding again in full gears, as he tried to destroy Mithun and Bonnie inside out. Ethan's greed had been ignited as he saw an opening that could make him gobble up all of Ambani's assets. 
his company, his businesses, he slowly yet surely make it all his. Ethan Gray was not a good guy at heart, and he was naturally not helping the twins without expecting returns. He decided to treat Rudra as his brother and his equal as he knew the terrifying power of reincarnation, as he experienced it himself and so far his decision had not been proven wrong. Amelia the logistic support that Ethan had given to the true elites and Ethan's spy inside the guild, reported the guild to have in-game gold assets that values more than $3 trillion. However the guild would tie them up inside real estate and such inside the game. Ethan did not understand the game too much, but he understood money and Rudra's ability to earn money was terrifying, it was way way faster than even he himself, and that was the only reason that Ethan did not exploit the twins and genuinely worked with them. As he did not wish to antagonize Rudra. If Rudra could earn trillions of dollars in the short time span he had been playing the game, then down the line the profits he would make would be even more impressive and Ethan would take 30% of it. Even if Ethan was the bigger man in the relationship for now, that dynamic would change in the future, and Ethan knew it. Hence he was glad that he decided to treat Rudra as his brother early on and he even did him favors by helping his guildmates. As these small things would take him a long way in the future. Bonus will surely still be there if either of the targets are hit. So try aim for it. Also congratulations to Cervantes91 as you finally get your own character in the novel as promised, it is also none other than the almighty Emperor of Hazel Groove. Chapter 145, Framed Purple Haze City, Virtual World A group of fifty guards and four emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom rode together towards the guild headquarters of the Demolition Boys in the Outer District. When the Ent Rouge of the red armor-wearing guards on white horse mounts traveled through the inner city, they naturally gained a lot of attention from the common players on the streets, who followed them to see what they were up to. Naturally most of those who followed were hoping for a special event or such to happen, however many just followed for the show as it was bound to be entertaining. When the Ent Rouge stopped in front of the Demolition Boys' headquarters, many murmurings could be heard from the common public. Everyone was curious as to why they stopped before the guild headquarters and what that implied. But as things could potentially get interesting, many started recording the event. Amongst the crowd was a struggling live streamer, called Dudipai. He had a small fan base, but he had yet to go viral and grab the big stage. He was naturally hungry for content, hence, he pushed his way to the best possible angle and began live streaming in a best possible spot. His stream titled, Guards at Demolition Boys HQ, What's Going Down? It had currently 67 viewers and the number was growing. Some Demolition Boys guild members wearing the guild robes were near the entrance and they naturally inquired about the sudden visit from the guards, and some people informed the higher-ups. One of the royal guards announced loudly, We have an imperial verdict from His Majesty the Emperor, the son of Hazelgrove Kingdom, the mighty warrior, Cervantes 91 To inspect the guild's assets, you have five minutes To comply with the warrant, or we have been authorized To use force. A loud commotion broke out, the guild was under inspection. What shady business did they commit to anger the emperor himself? Everyone started discussing at this point, and the Demolition Boys guild members naturally panicked. They were absolutely clueless as to what to do, however to their relief I Need to Smash came out to address the situation. I Need to Smash looked at the swarm of people in front of him as well as the royal guards and he contemplated for a while. Although he was no longer the vice guild master of the guild after his last slip up in buying advanced mana potions, he was still a core member and a higher up in the organization. I need to smash thought about the guild's activities and he found nothing that could implicate the guild. Although the guild extorted money and essentials from passing adventurers, they did not take part in any illegal activities that could stir trouble on a kingdom scale. I need to smash thought that this was his redeeming chance, as he began his act, he prostrated himself on the ground, as he began to speak, his face facing the ground and his hands over his head in a namaste as he said, the lowly citizen greets the royal soldiers of Hazel Groove. If his eminence himself has questioned our guild's activities, then it is a big disgrace for us righteous adventurers, we are law-abiding citizens of the country, please feel free to inspect the guild premises, I assure you, no illegal activities would be found. I Need to Smash made a compelling performance, some people in the audience were moved, however the emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom bought none of it. One of the emissari said, how dare you despicable thief play innocent. I need to smash pretended to be shocked, as he clutched his heart in pain as he rolled on the ground. Then suddenly he stood up and roared, slander. Fifteen swords pointed at his throat at that point, and I need to smash understood that he was in no position to play games. Hence he went back to playing victim. 
He clutched his chest and through ragged breathing said, We are the most ideal guild, the most kingdom-centric guild, we are innocent men, we are no thieves, that men with you lies. We have nothing to hide, please sire believe us. It was at this point that guild leader Elovesmashing came out along with guild elders. Elovesmashing was a bit worried that one of the guild members had pissed off some big shot and robbed them or something, hence he very carefully asked. I am the guild master, may I know which crime warranted the search of my guild? The emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom were livid now, as there was no limit to how innocent the other party tried to pottery them celebs as they said, does robbing the royal treasury of Nine Clouds Kingdom ring a bell? Murmurs could be heard everywhere. Robbing the royal treasury. Who did something so amazing? What exactly is going on? Duty Pie's stream had suddenly gained momentum as over 25,000 people were watching his content currently. Everyone commenting enthusiastically about how they felt over the development. A love smashing frowned. Then after a while he had a wide smile. This was a misunderstanding, he was sure that the guild did no such crimes, he could open the guild to investigations without problems. It was then that I need to smash creeped beside a love smashing and whispered in his ear boss let's invite the crowd outside to witness the investigation, since we are innocent might as well have witnesses and play the victim once we come out clean. Maybe we would gain some popularity and get more recruits. A love smashing nodded at the brilliant idea and gladly agreed as he said, we are a righteous guild, naturally we will accept the investigations and cooperate with the search, you may feel free to look around. Then he looked at the assembled crowd and said, everyone here is free to come enter the guild premises just for a few hours to witness the investigations and our honesty. Cheers could be heard from the crowd as they felt very exited. Who would want to waste such a chance? Alas it would turn out to be that it was the worst decision a love smashing made in his entire life that he would regret forever. Chapter 146 The Price The True Elite's Guild Headquarters Karna had invited Rudra and the other elders present at the guild to meet inside the guild hall. Where everyone was watching Dudipai's live stream on a monitor. The atmosphere was very lively as watching the demolition boys, s impending doom was really funny. Rudra popped in the popcorn as he laughed his butt off seeing the performances of I Need to Smash and A Love Smashing. Especially when A Love Smashing invited the crowd to come be part of the witnessing the investigation Rudra laughed so hard that he had to leave the room for a while as his stomach could not take it anymore. He needed a breather from the laughing, however the moment he came back, he saw I need to smash squirming and rolling on the ground while pretending to be grievously wronged, as he shouted, slander, this is slander. Rudra could not wait to see that guy's reaction after they got convicted of the crime. Inside the demolition boys headquarters. The royal guard started finding for the stolen loot everywhere. It was kind of like a income tax raid. Every member was brought to a separate chamber, where they were questioned, their inventories emptied and screened. Now a love smashing voluntarily went through the process, and as the guild leader went through the process, naturally the others had to follow. One by one many members and elders took the screening. Many members were afraid though, as many of the items they possessed were raided from others, what if the royal troops questioned them and jailed them? However, rumors spread inside the members' circle that the guards would not question the origin of the loot, if you just tell them that they were given by the guildmaster as a reward after completing a task. As for the exact origins they had no idea. Following this exact like, many members passed the screening with no problem, hence the other members also queued up and took the test. However trouble came when the party where Karna and others gave up their loots voluntarily, came for the screening. The guild had a strict policy of handing over all loot that was gained by extortion to the guild warehouse, where according to the value of products given, a coin reward will be issued to the members. But as the coin reward was only 10% the object's worth, sometimes the members kept a portion of the loot with themselves as to earn a bit more cash. The group in possession of the jewels from the Nine Clouds Kingdom Treasury were one of those greedy adventurers as they kept a few gems in their possession. The adventurer entered the screening room. The royal guard instructed him to empty his inventory in the bins in front of him. The adventurer complied as he already knew the answers he was supposed to say. The emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom searched the bin as their eyes shined upon finding the jewels branded with the insignia of Nine Clouds Kingdom, naturally part of the stolen loot from Nine Clouds Royal Vault. The emissary looked towards the royal guard and gave him a nod. The nod signified that the object obtained was part of the loot. The eyebrows of the royal guard arched, he had almost thought that the entire process was going to be a waste, the demolition boys looked too calm to have conducted the heist, his experience told him they were innocent, 
However now finding the proof, he was shocked for a second, however years of his training as a guard kicked in as he instantly regained his composure. The guard asked, this gem, where did you obtain it? This question was in line with what the guards usually asked every other adventurer during their screening, hence the adventurer was already prepared. He said, this gem was awarded to me by the guildmaster for my meritorious service to the guild. The royal guard made him sign a document regarding the authenticity of the gem where it stated, I swear by the honor of my guild and my guildmaster that the origin of the gem in my hand is as described. The adventurer never heard about anyone else signing such a document, however it was just a sign, he signed it and went out of the screening room. However he wasn't greeted to the sight of an empty room, rather twenty royal guards were there to restrain him, as he suddenly got a system message. You have been apprehended by the government officials for stealing national treasures of a neighboring country. Teleporting to jail in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 inch. Your account has been disabled and jailed for 7 days. What the hell just happened? The adventurer cursed, he was not prepared for the apprehension and account suspending. He tried to log into the game again and again, however he could not. His account had been disabled for 70 days. Sirens blared as alarms rang, the royal guards moved with force towards a love smashing. Everyone who were busy watching the guards search the premises all gathered at the hall where a love smashing was, where the guards went. One of the emissari said holding a gem in his hand, one of your guild members has been in possession of the missing loot and he has a sworn in testimony saying that it was given to him as a reward by the guildmaster. Anger was evident in the emissary's voice as his voice contained a tint of killing intent. A love smashing gulped. Things had developed in a direction he did not expect them to develop towards. The idiot must have robbed someone in possession of the gem, is what a love smashing thought, However it was harder for anyone to buy his I am innocent act when one of his men had already been implicated. However just in time I need to smash came to the rescue as he shouted slander. This is slander of the righteous citizens of Hazelgrove, oh oh the injustice, the hearsay. The emissaries glared at him angrily, they had enough of this man as they said, Sue, you still deny, you should really take this chance to confess your crimes and return the stolen goods, it will grant you a reduced sentence, should we find it ourselves, it would be ugly. I need to smash clutched his heart again and spoke in a deep voice, a hoax, it's a witch hunt. The emissary sniggered as they said, fine, guild master a love smashing, if you are innocent, you shall have no problem letting us go through the guild inventory now. Isn't that right? Naturally a love smashing knew that although it was a question, he was in no position to decline, as he smiled and said, please follow me. Chapter 147, Caught Red-Handed True Elite's Headquarters, Purple Haze City Rudra was leaning on Karna's shoulder, laughing so hard his eyes started to tear. The entire situation was too funny for him who is a knowing observer of the situation. Rudra praised Karna and SMG for their work at the heist, not only did they successfully loot a massive amount of treasures, but they also framed an opposing faction for a crime they did not commit beautifully. But all that aside, Rudra just found the entire situation too damn entertaining. He wanted to see how would a love smashing feel when he opens the guild warehouse to inspection, and stolen goods are found from within. Will he try to flee? Will he try to push the blame? Will he beg for mercy? The elders all had a heated debate as to what outcome was going to occur as they bet 1000 gold each on the outcome they think was going to happen. Rudra bet that he would beg for mercy like a dog, although it was a less probable option, Rudra would enjoy seeing it, hence he was rooting for it. The entire room was filled with energy as a love smashing lead the entire group towards the guild warehouse. Everyone wanted to enjoy the moment of impending doom. Outside the warehouse, Demolition Boys headquarters, outer city. A love smashing said, please due to safety reasons, only the royal guards may enter our warehouse, however to satisfy the public demand, I will let one of you enter. Duty Pie instantly raised his hand and shouted, me, I'm a streamer. A love smashing chose him as he gave him permission to follow inside the guild warehouse. A love smashing opened the guild warehouse using the guild sigil and biometric unlock technology. And he led a group of 10 royal guards plus 4 emissaries from 9 Clouds Kingdom and Duty Pie inside. Duty Pie's eyes widened seeing the stacked and beautifully lined up guild warehouse, all kinds of items could be seen inside, armors, gears, swords, potions, heaps of gold and silver a few platinum bars and even some objects Dutypai had no idea what they were. Most people in the live stream yelped seeing the massive wealth that the first-rate guild possessed, they were all thoroughly impressed. 
However Rudra watching on just said poor. When he saw the underwhelming loot that demolition boys possessed. The royal guard started to work, they started to search for the loot in an organized manner, however it did not take long for one of them to find a bag full of stolen gems. The royal guard called an emissary to confirm that this was indeed stolen goods and once the emissary did confirm, the royal guards clicked his knuckles preparing to pound the flub out of a love smashing. But the guard in charge of the operation knew his duties as he raised his hand and asked, what is the origin of this bag? Dudipai was capturing every moment, every dialogue from the best possible angle, as suspense built over an unknown bag in the guard's hand. Dudipai's stream now had over 25 M people watching live and the number increased by the thousands every second. It loves mashing naturally had no idea about the origins of that bag, however he could not just say that he had no idea, it would make him look like a fool inside the live stream, hence he said, whatever it is, must be legally obtained by my guild. The emissary sneered at this remark, it was a sly response, him using the word legally obtained was especially good. However to Love Smashing's dismay the captain of the royal guards was even more sly than he was, as he asked, state the exact time and date of you obtaining this object. Love Smashing knew that the object in question was not simple, looking at the other party's response, hence he carefully went to inspect the object in question. He looked at the bag of gems inside, now to be honest he had absolutely no clue where did the guild obtain the gems. But seeing as the matter was about a recently conducted heist of the royal treasury in a neighboring kingdom, the love smashing chose to say, the guild obtained it a month ago, inside a dungeon. A love smashing was just hoping that his excuse would work, however it backfired as the royal guard said, guild leader a love smashing, you are a liar and a thief, a disgrace to the Hazelgrove kingdom, a scum of the society who needs to be purged, with the authority vested in me by Emperor Cervantes 91 himself, I Ronan V, the captain of the royal guard sentenced the guild demolition boys to imprisonment and abolition, all members of the guild demolition boys who are caught, shall be whipped in public before being imprisoned, the guild grounds shall be confiscated and the treasury shall be awarded to the emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom as compensation. A big turn of events. A love smashing was stunned silent he did not know what to do anymore, should he get on his knees and beg for mercy? Should he fight back? Should he flee? However the shock came so hard that he was unable to move, he just stood there silently as the royal guards arrested him. The emissary from Nine Clouds Kingdom shouted with hate, you are in possession of gems stolen directly from the royal treasury, the heist took place four days ago, yet you claim to have gotten them from a dungeon a month ago. You liar. We knew from the moment we came that you and your guild was full of liars and scammers trying to play the saint. Where is the rest of the loot you thief, surrender the loot. Every demolition boy's guild member got a system notification that their guild had been blacklisted in Hazelgrove and Nine Clouds Kingdom and that they would be hunted down by the royal guards, hence in the tens of thousands members quit the guild instantly. I need to smash kept running around as the royal guards tried to catch him, he kept shouting, ITS a mistake, a miscarriage of justice, a slander. However the royal guards were quite fed up of his antics as he was mercilessly beaten down using a belt and a rope before restraining him. I need to smash squirmed every time the belt hit him as he kept yelling, A-G-H-H, I-T-S a hoax, a witch hunt, ag. If not for the thousands standing there watching him being beat up, most would have misunderstood the feminine moans he was giving. Dudipai made sure to capture everything as the guild grounds were confiscated and the elders caught by the guards. However none of that mattered at the moment as a love smashing, I need to smash, and seven elders were dragged tied to horses in the streets of Hazelgrove. The NPC citizens threw eggs and rotten tomatoes at them. While many shouted insults like, shame on you thieves. Shame to the glorious Hazelgrove kingdom. They were dragged to a public square where punishments were met out where they were tied and whipped. It was a humiliating moment for a love smashing as millions witnessed his whipping. I need to smash was even worse as he kept on mumbling, this is a conspiracy. Leading to even harder whips for him. The elders were all crying and covered in snot, as they cursed their stars to join demolition boys. Finally a system prompt jolted the party awake it said. You have been punished by the kingdom of Hazelgrove for crimes against the crown, you may choose either of the following punishments. A. 30 levels, minus 1 tier. B. Account suspension for 120 days. A love smashing wanted to puke seeing the two options in front of him, what is this punishment for a crime he did not even commit? Demolition boys as a guild was over. His career as a guild master was through. Yet vengeance filled his heart for whoever framed him, 
hence gritting his teeth, he chose option A as his level dropped back to LV-13 tier 0. Everyone on the whipping stage chose the same option. It was a huge mental blow for them, which would put them back a 100 days in the game. However the ones who staged the entire event were busy laughing and pointing out that none of them predicted that a love smashing would just freeze, hence no one won the bet. Chapter 148, Aftermath The aftermath of the entire incident was huge, the Demolition Boys, one of the first-rate guilds, had been disbanded. The guild had nearly 90,000 members previously, however with the recent shot of funds from Mithun Ambani they had recruited 30,000 more. However they lost everything in an instant. The guild had a total net worth of $450 billion in fixed and liquid assets. When the worth of every human working for the guild, every single equipment they owned and their tie-up with the alliance. They were valued at $450 billion by various experts. The collapse of the guild came as a huge blow to the alliance, who had just started gaining momentum after the new injection of funds. However the heaviest blow came to the construction company behind Demolition Boys as their stock plunged into freefall after investor panic. This was the first case of a billion-dollar corporation facing a 70% value depreciation overnight, and it was influenced due to not a real-world issue, but a virtual-world problem. The economists went crazy, featuring on all media outlets and news interviews. Claiming that it was the dawn of a new era. A new reality where the virtual world intricately linked real world. The forums went wild with speculation about who were the real robbers of the royal treasury after a love smashing appeared in a news interview claiming it was not the work of his guild. This stunned more people as if that was the case then Omega was a much more complex game than they first gave it credit to, if unexpected plot lines developed as a consequence of some actions. The Demolition Boys guild leader had absolutely no idea as to where the gems in his warehouse came from, and what caused his ruin. However those who sympathized with him were very very few. Most people wanted to take this chance and expand their power, as a major party had collapsed. Many second-rate guilds launched a recruitment campaign for guildless Demolition Boys members. Even the Once Alliance partners all frenziedly tried to recruit the lost manpower, however the guild members who quit Demolition Boys were reluctant to join the group. As the saying went, once bitten, twice shy, they were very reluctant to join a big guild again, as most wanted just a peace of mind to game. In the end only 40,000 of the initial 120,000 joined the alliance, the rest became independent adventurers or joined smaller guilds. Just overnight the alliance had gone from 7 first-rate guilds to 6 and lost 80,000 members. It was a devastating blow to their overall strength. As even the fishrod obtained in the auction through ardent bidding was confiscated by the royal guards when they raided the demolition boys' warehouse. The alliance members cursed their bad luck, and although there was no fraternity amongst the group, they had a sense of anger behind whoever was the cause of the incident. Naturally many doubted the elites' involvement in the matter. Things got really chaotic and out of control when a video of the elites was released on the forums with Rudra and Karna sitting on a pile of treasure and playing catch with what looked like precious gems. The same kind that brought doom upon demolition boys. The video instantly became viral and was the talking point of everyone. The caption clearly mocked the entire alliance as it said, one full down, six more to go. Clearly this text riled up many alliance members as this was a blatant disregard of their group. However the common public was the one that really won in the disputes between the true elites and the alliance as they enjoyed themselves thoroughly, watching the show. On the forums. Have you guys seen the latest video posted by the elites, they are the thieves. Don't mess with the elites, I warned you all long ago. The alliance is done for, Shikuni is too vicious. I wonder how they pulled the heist off. Someone report them to the authorities. This is a miscarriage of justice. I think it's just a hoax, I don't think the elites can really raid a royal vault, and if they did, they would not be flexing about it. The elites are not idiots, they probably did not steal the gems, however they took this opportunity to surely infuriate the alliance, they have taunted them now. I can't wait to see how the alliance reacts. There is only four days left till the cooldown of the guild war ends. Will the alliance declare war? The alliance are cowards they don't have the balls to declare war, dot. We want war. We want war. War. The flames of war were lit on the forums as everyone waited for the alliance to respond to the elite's provocation. And response did arrive when the alliance posted this. There are kids calling themselves elites and running around on wolves thinking they are special in Purple Haze City 
it's been long due that someone put that rowdy bunch in their place, for the good of entire Purple Haze City, the Alliance has taken it upon itself to do exactly that. Since the elites want to go on testing our patients, we inform them in advance that it is indeed thin and we will declare war come next Saturday. The post was pinned by 23 million players and was on top of the charts, just below the reply the elites gave them for the same post. The reply the elites gave them was, just bring it. The flames of war were lit. The clash seemed inevitable as tension started to build within Purple Haze. However another sinister plot brewed in the shadows Prince Amon planned to dethrone his father tonight, trapping him in an endless illusion with the power of the high-grade illusion jewel in his possession. Chapter 149 The Takeover Amon was moving swiftly in the cover of darkness, he was moving towards his father's bedroom inside the castle. Amon was LV-160 necromancer, and naturally his speed far surpassed the LV-70 guards of the palace as they were slain even before they could blink. Rahim the librarian slash wizard was the follower of the crown prince, and one of the strongest existences in the empire at tier 4 level 230. He was the one who would set up the illusionary formation. Amon's plan of killing the Emperor Cervantes 91 was simple. He did not dare confront the king one or one, or hell even five on one, as he knew the battle prowess of his father. He decided to take a dastardly way to ascend. He decided to trap his father's room, in an endless illusion using a powerful formation set up by Rahim, and powered by the red high-grade illusionary stone. It was more of a prison than a death trap, However without adequate supplies of food and water it would be only a matter of time before the emperor's strength started to wane. Slowly but surely causing him to die. Without foreign help, breaking the formation from the inside was not possible at tier 4, hence Amon was confident in his actions. Amon quietly peeked inside the royal bedroom, to see his father quietly sleeping. This gave him a sense of relief, he had no qualms as to making his temporary sleep a permanent one and granting him eternal rest. He summoned his best undead death knights and made them guard the corridor, nobody could interfere now, as Rahim started his chant. Amon detested his father who was still in the prime of his life, and powerful beyond reason. His father was righteous and talented and wanted Amon to be the same. However how could Amon be the same? His light shined so bright that Amon could only choose darkness to stand out. Ascending to the throne in a perilous time at the young age of sixteen, his father ruled with absolute authority for close to seventy years. However even after Amon was now forty, being the crown prince for over twenty years, there was no talks about him ascending. Amon understood at that point that the throne would not be given to him, he would have to take it. An intense desire for the throne propelled his descent to the dark side faster, and after being a necromancer for close to fifteen years, his perception towards the dead changed. He did not mourn death, but celebrated it. Perhaps that's what gave him the courage to kill his own father. Rahim started the chant, and the mana density around the room started to change. Cervantes 91 naturally felt something amiss, as he was jolted awake. If he wanted to, he could have dashed out of the room at that point, however something inside the men broke when he saw his son staring at him with black eyes and an aura of death. He knew what that meant, that his son was a necromancer. Not knowing how to process this information, he stared at his son for a while and alas that while was all that Rahim needed to cast the spell, endless illusion. Boom. Red energy swerved out of the gem as the entire room was covered with red runed. And sealed in an endless illusion. Rahim panted, his face pale, clearly the spell took a lot out of him. He looked towards Amon to gauge his emotions, whether he looked happy or sad. However Amon was emotionless, as he just said. Well the emperor is dead, time for the crown prince to take the throne. Rahim bowed politely, this was the guy he backed to get the throne. As to why a tier 4 wizard like him would back a tier 3 necromancer like Amon gain the throne. It was naturally realted to someone else pulling the strings behind the scenes, however his current job was to satisfy Amon's every demand, and he shall do it. The news that the emperor was killed by his own son spread quickly, as Amon did not hide his ascent to the throne, as his class as a necromancer was revealed without hiding. The kingdom plunged into chaos as riots broke out everywhere, the people of Hazelgroove would not acknowledge the murderer and practicioneer of dark arts as their emperor. The Church of Life got serious pressure from the public to do something about the situation, but not many knew that the church's hands were tied in this situation. The church had recognized the legitimacy of Prince Amon's claim to the throne when he was made the crown prince, and by law, when the King Cervantes 91 died, he would rightfully claim the throne. 
they could not challenge it even if his class was a necromancer. A new era had begun in Hazelgroove as the game's first kingdom-wide special event began. Kingdom notification, the three-day special event, Mayhem, has started in Hazelgroove Kingdom, Prince Amana Necromancer is now Emperor, the NPCs of Hazelgroove will riot in challenge of his authority and the royal guards will take action. The kingdom will be plunged into chaos as all government services will be suspended during this period, the kingdom is lawless during this three days, however beware of your actions as should imperial order be restored three days later, all crimes shall be judged by the new emperor. Rudra smiled seeing the notification. It was finally that time, the alliance's nightmare had just begun, and Rudra would make sure to make it a lot lot worse for them. Chapter 150 The Riots Riots broke out and the city was in a complete mayhem. Thousands of NPCs had taken it to the streets to protest against the blood succession. The royal guards had a hard hard time maintaining order as the protesters greatly outnumbered the guards. An imperial verdict was brought to bring in the army, but even the army was divided in two factions, there was internal turmoil as several key army figures refused to acknowledge the new monarch as the emperor. The entire kingdom was in a bloody mess and at the heart of the mess was the alliance. Summoned by Emperor Amman as a reserve force to quell the rebels. They were forced to patrol the streets under the imperial banner. The severe backlash that the guild received from the patrolling had just started, currently only they faced a severe shortage of manpower as they were required to patrol 18 areas in the outer district. Hence each guild was made to patrol three areas. A guild mission was issued for every member making it compulsory to take part in the riots. However the sheer casualty of party members dying in controlling the riots was taking a toll on the guild. The members were losing levels, losing equipment durability and losing time, time they could have used leveling. Over 20,000 members died each hour and the sheer amount of monetary compensations that the guild had to roll out were over 100k gold an hour for deaths. The guilds were bleeding money by the hour as well as deteriorating their overall strength, all in hopes of a ultimate reward to be given at the end of the endeavor, however Rudra knew that the reward will not be worth it. Rudra instructed the elites to take this time and just do leveling, stay in the wild and away from the chaotic city as much as possible. Neatwit took his first role as an elder as he took about 100 guild members under his wing for leveling. Naturally the guild members found it difficult to keep up with their maniacal leveling freak of a leader, as Neatwit kept grinding mobs after mobs without a single rest. The trolls were hardly his match, as his sword cut through them like butter. This was a much-needed exercise as every guild member was consciously working hard to increase their strength for the incoming war. However while the city was plunged into chaos and the alliance members had an absolute nightmare handling the riots. The worst was yet to come. Equipping the mask, Rudra changed his ID from Shikuni Augustus one night and started wrecking mayhem on the alliance patrolling parties. Wearing the true elite's robes, he decisively killed hundreds of patrolling alliance members. After he had gained the title of honorary bishop, his infamy did not rise by a single point. Hence he slaughtered at will. Currently he was stalking a group of alliance members of the Azure Lotus and real Manchester party members who had taken to raiding and pillaging NPC stores in the name of patrolling. Rudra hesitated for a second, as the members in front of him were from U.S. Guild, hence he decided to give them a pass for now, however an unexpected event changed his decision. The group which had looted more than 12 NPC stores now walked towards the elite lifestyle store. There were two guards guarding the store however they were no match for the 30 adventurer party armed to the teeth. Under usual circumstances, attacking those guards would have led to reinforcements coming from the royal guards division and arrest of the violating parties. However now that the royal guards were busy in handling the riots and that the city was currently lawless they dared to attack the elite lifestyle store. Rudra glared at the group. The audacity. The previous thoughts of mercy instantly disappeared from his mind as he felt the need to teach the party a lesson. A member of the real Manchester Guild said, I can't wait to raid the true elite's lifestyle, they have all kinds of great potions and armors, I really want to upgrade from this trash. Seems like we can now. He he he. Sniggers could be heard from the party. The daylight robbery had made them bold, they felt like masters of the world who could do as they pleased. An Azure Lotus member said, I have been tired of the rich elites, just a small fry guild yet they have more money than all of the alliance combined, just how good is it to have Ethan Gray as your backer? Everyone nodded, they were all having a severe inferiority complex to the elites. As everyone here knew that compared to them, they might as well be trash. However they could not accept that fact, hence they credited their success to their backing. 
If you are reading this book on any site except web novel you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform web novel. However should they learn that the elite's wealth was their own earnings, and the actual amount of assets the guild paw seized, their entire worldview might collapse. The elites were richer than the rich, having more money than the entire alliance's pool combined and doubled. All between 500-odd members. The party looked at the two NPC guards with killing intent as the two instantly took battle stance. However at this moment a figure landed from the neighboring rooftop between them and the guards. A figure whom the alliance could never forget. That madman. The one with the mask. The one responsible for the death of thousands of Alliance members. The infamous Augustus One Knight. Chapter 151, Terrified. Rudra landed between the guards and the Alliance member party, as he silently drew his sword. His intention known with this single move. He was here to kill. And they were his prey. Fear spread through the Alliance members, even thirty to one they were scared of Augustus One Knight. His performance on the dungeon camp was witnessed by many as they knew his prowess was no joke. However a bold guy from the group said, he, he is just one guy. We are thirty. He is strong, however the odds are in our favor. Another one pitched in, his real power is his NPC army, without it he is just a normal player. The group gained a bit of confidence, their eyes now shifted from hunted to hunter, as they thought about facing Rudra head on. Rudra smiled slyly, since the guys wished to fight, he would make them pay. Pay a miserable price. Rudra could have attacked the group, but being the schemer he was, he just casually strolled towards the party in slow steps, waiting for them to make the first move. He just wanted to bait them into attacking him first, as that would make them the enemies of the church, even if the city was currently lawless, the church retained its power and its paladins. Players still gained infamy upon attacking players, and would need to get rid of the red mark before city order was restored three days later or else they would be hunted by the royal guards. And it happened they took the bait, one of the party members took the first offensive strike, he casted a basic spell. Fireball. Rudra with his insanely high stats, dodged the attack no issue at all, however the faces of the party members turned pale following the attack. They received a system notification. System notification, you have attacked a bishop of the Church of Life. You are now enemies with the Church of Life, you will be unable to use any of its services and blessings for 60 days, you will be blacklisted by all paladins of the Church of Life, they may hunt you down and bring you to the church to repent. Should you be killed in the next 30 days, you will respawn in the dungeon of the church, where you will spend 3 days repenting for your crime. A panicked party member shrieked, he, 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 is a, b b b b b b. Bishop in the church. How will we get rid of our red marks? If we can't use the church's services. Another member said. I die twice a day in the riots. I don't want to be imprisoned for three days. A third person said. Everyone's eyes turned fearful at the masked man. Noon could see his expression, but his cold eyes told the entire story. They felt a chill run down their spine. They were doomed. However the initial shock turned to rage soon as they looked venomously towards Rudra, ready to kill him. The entire party of thirty sprung into action, if they were doomed anyways then might as well kill the schemer behind their miseries. However to their despair they could not even land a single scratch on Rudra. The big guy, the barbarian, with his berserk mode on was sent flying when their fists collided showing that the guy had far superior strength than even barbarians. However not only was his strength better than the strongest in their group by a mile, even the thieves and assassins could not even hold a candle to his speed. Insane speeds that slit the necks of the assassins before they could even use their moves was a major blow to their confidence as players. With their damage dealers being pushed around like children the support players became desperate, they tried their best to distract Rudra to create openings, however they could not. Rudra wasn't an amateur new to fighting, he knew how to focus and how to fight PvE, most attacks sent his way were damaging their own members rather than landing on him. Such was his battle prowess as within three short minutes all thirty members had been sent to the dungeons in the church. Effectively rendering them out of action for three days. Unbeknownst to Rudra a certain streamer had been recording his fight. A certain streamer who had came to light just recently with the fall of Demolition Boys. Yes Dudipai was at the scene. Everything from his entrance from the rooftop, to him killing an entire party without uttering a single word, everything was streamed and watched by millions. 
as the legend of the masked true elite began to spread. His insane skill and cold attitude got him the name the Masked Devil. Pink Lotus received a report that 15 party members patrolling Sector 7 were now held captive in a dungeon, as she was shocked to see that an elite was the reason behind all this. She felt that an unspoken understanding had been broken between her and Rudra as his guild member acted so hostile towards her guild members. She did not realize the reason behind his actions, as the stream only started after he jumped down from the terrace, not capturing the part where the members talk about raiding the elite lifestyle store. Hence she felt that it was murder in cold blood. She was currently very busy with the riots, hence took no action, however this incident had been etched inside her mind, and revenge would come in time. The other guilds fared even worse as over the next two days the masked devil kept appearing at riot locations and kept targeting alliance members. Close to 7,000 alliance members had been slaughtered under his blade, close to 5,000 of them were currently imprisoned. Although the number was not huge considering the huge size of the alliance, however it had a huge effect on morale. Nobody was willing to go out to control the riots when a crazy masked man kept dropping out of nowhere to reap their lives. The Alliance members had already lost over three levels average per player in the last three days with many losing over five, hence the overall mood was quite depressing. But hell was about to break loose, soon. Chapter 152, Situation Getting Out of Hand Hazel Groove Kingdom, Purple Haze City The city was in chaos, if viewed from a high point, or a tower, one could see various fires burning over the cityscape, smoke rised from burnt government buildings as the streets were stained with blood. It was a cruel sight to watch that could wrench the heart of those who were weak-willed. The inner district had regained order as the royal guards had slaughtered their way to the inner city walls. Order was restored inside the inner city as a martial law was announced for the residents of inner district. Naturally the law did not apply to Rudra who was a duke of the kingdom and a bishop of the church. He waltzed in and out of the inner district as if it was his backyard, as the guards bowed in respect. A major event had occurred as a result of his actions in killing Alliance members. There was a rebellion inside the guild as members refused to go on patrol duty. The Alliance was losing 100k gold an hour on compensations. Over the last 72 hours the guild had expended over 72 million gold just in compensations alone, and they were tight on cash now. The Alliance declared a shortage of funds and reduced the compensation from 5 to gold per death in duty. This was the last straw that made the common members pull out of the missions, why should they lose levels, time, and equipment in controlling riots? What for? Two gold. Hell no. The already low morale made the rebellion gain momentum as more and more members abandoned their posts and patrol duties. A rebellion party was formed that demanded that if the guild wanted them to work again, that needed to accede to three conditions. 1. Six gold compensations per death. 2. The Alliance deals with the Masked Devil. 3. The Guild pays for repairing equipment. A sudden pullout of nearly 70,000 Guild members caused the others to be overwhelmed and slaughtered, as 11 out of the 18 sectors being monitored by the Alliance spiraled out of control. The Alliance faced a major crisis at hand. As an emergency meeting was called up to discuss the issue. Alliance Meeting, Azure Lotus Guild Headquarters. The six Alliance leaders had grim faces sitting in the meeting. Emperor Amon was furious at their incompetency as he gave them an ultimatum of 24 hours to regain control, as after that he would rowl out the royal guards to regain control of the capital. The emperor clearly stated that unless they regained control of the eleven sectors, they could absolutely forget about the rewards. They will even make an enemy they could not afford. The emperor's cold verdict scared them, as the revised quest was brutal. They had to make tough choices here and now. Stupid, stupid rebels, how dare they disobey our commands, they are pawns in our hands, how dare they show resistance. If we tell them to die, they die. What's this nonsense about compensations? Scorpio seethed. You aside as she said, that's not how it works, guild leader Scorpio and you know it, we have each invested close to 12 million gold into this project, should we fail now then the gold and the sacrifices of the guild members will all go down the drain. Every guild leader cursed under their breath, the situation was truly bad, they had burned a hole through their finances to hold the fort for three days, but with the rebellion their efforts went down the drain, as regaining control over the eleven sectors, now was an Herculean task. Real Manchester Guild leader spoke, even if we for a moment decide to accede to their demand number one and three about the monetary compensations and the equipment repairs, how are we going to deal with the masked devil? Everyone cursed. 
the members seethed. But the reality of the situation was, Rudra was too strong for them, and they were not his match. He randomly came, he slaughtered, and he left. There was no tracking his moments, there was just praying that he didn't show up. They had no way of dealing with the masked devil. Pink Lotus said, him being a bishop of the church, makes him a difficult target to take on. Honestly I don't even know how he became a bishop, well the paladins won't even give me a second glance at the church much less a quest to get inside their good books. Becoming a bishop is not something I can even imagine. The curses in the guild hall became even louder. The guild leader of True Manchester said, it's not that he is just the bishop, he is also a very high-ranking nobility according to our research. Having a huge NPC army to call upon. He is the most troublesome elite I have seen yet, even more than their monstrous leader Shikuni. Everyone sighed as they brainstormed ideas to deal with the troublesome men. Finally they came up with a childish provocation tactic to tackle the issue. The alliance issued a statement that they accept the rebellion's requests. This cheered many rebels up, their rebellion was a success. They were ready to keep their words and spring back into action for the guild. To the issue of the masked devil, the alliance issued an official statement saying, to the coward who hides behind a mask and attacks distracted patrollers, if you are a man, the alliance challenges you to fight one versus one with their finest experts. Six fights, one champion from each guild. In the outer district in an empty open ground, coordinates. 12.34.76.89.30 in six hours time. Come if you dare. This open challenge was posted on the forums and instantly became viral. It was the most shared post and became the top post within 10 minutes. Every adventurer inside the Purple Haze City felt exited at the prospect of this fight. As the forums went ballistic on speculation. Will he be there? Does he dare accept? What shall the masked devil do? Chapter 153, Challenge Accepted Rudra naturally saw the open challenge as messages from guild members flooded his inbox. Although nobody in the guild knew his dual identity as Augustus one night, he was the only person in contact with the men, hence he was messaged about the situation. The messages varied from. Guild leader, the alliance just challenged one of our own. To Karna's message of, guild master, the clowns are provoking our patience, please give permission to put them in their place. Rudra was shocked when he read Karna's message, and secretly very very glad. As this was exactly the attitude he wanted in the vice guild master of the elites. Cold, arrogant and a shield for the guild. Rudra was conflicted for the first time, on whether or not he should actually let Karna take lead on this one. Rudra was naturally confident in his skills as he thought nothing of the six alliance experts. He would ve naturally settle the matter himself, however after seeing Karna's attitude, he wondered if it was okay to let him take the lead on this incident. After much deliberation, he decided that instead of going to the challenge arena alone, he would bring Karna alongside himself, taking both of them there. Rudra from Augustus One Night's account posted the reply, "I'll be there on the forums. And from his original account Shikuni, replied to Karna, accompany Augustus to the arena, meet him outside the guild headquarters in 30 minutes. With this the challenge was set in stone. Only a matter of time before the clash occurred. Real world, the Grey International Tower, the upside. Ethan Grey had finally formulated the ultimate opportunistic plan to deal a heavy blow to the Ambani Corporation. After days of careful planning, he saw a big opening that he could exploit to drive the Ambani Corporation out of business. After the series of firings that took place using the twins, there were many top performing workers who knew company secrets that were left jobless. Ethan Gray swooped in as a vulture as he recruited a few special ones and learnt a lot of insider information regarding the Ambani Corporation. The Ambani Corporation's backbone was its oil company Ambani Oil, that was the soul of the company. The millions of liters of oil pumped daily from their oil extraction sites inside the ocean off the coast of Country X was the most important source of capital for the company. The liquid gold that the Ambani sold at a sky high price was the highest revenue generator for the corporation for the last 40 years. In 2091 when the world exhausted its resources, the Ambani Corporation declared themselves to have enough petroleum to supply for next 20 years. This was the major turning point of the company as in the company's history as the next five years changed everything. Having the only oil monopoly in the world the Ambani's charged and increased the rates of petrol however they wished to. Facing no competition, they flourished in the market making Ambani a trillionaire in the first five years, five years later now however all was not as it seemed. 
On paper it seemed like the Ambani Corporation had enough petroleum to last another 10 years, however the internal situation was such that the oil would run out within a year. The Ambani Corporation miscalculated the consumption, as the demand far exceeded their calculations, having them run out in half the estimated time. Ambani had tried to renew his insurance of the plant in 2100, after it expired, however the insurance company needed to verify the oil quantities and look at the inside books to grant the insurance. Ambani could not let it happen, as it would lead to his biggest secret being revealed. Hence his insurance had expired just recently, and soon the oil reserve would end out. Ethan licked his lips at the opportunity, he did not wish to wait for a year. Knowing for sure from the poached talent that there was Northwest insurance in place. He would now directly blow up the entire plant. And after Ambani's lose their central revenue stream, and there is market panic as their shares lose value. He would continue an even bigger string of firings using the twins. And sell a few key company properties. Finally to deliver the nail on the coffin, he would dumb the 20% market share that the twins held, over a single day, pushing the investor panic to the maximum and sending the company's stock crashing into freefall. To stop such an event from happening Ambani would surely try and buy the 20% shares that the twins dumped at market price. Which would lead to him sending trillions of dollars of liquid money to stabilize the company. Without the main revenue stream and deprived of trillions in cash, and key employees, the company would face an all-time high calamity. Then Ethan would take his time to piece BTP suppress Ambani into selling little chunks of his business, until he was left a beggar. Ethan made his mind clear. It was time to blow up the petroleum mine in the ocean. In an open plot in the outer district, the challenge location. A crowd of nearly 80,000 players had gathered at the coordinates of the open challenge. As Augustus one night and Karna waltzed past the group in their majestic black true elites robes and THR signature grey wolf mounts, the crowd parted to make way for them. Everyone looked in awe and respect at the passing duo, as chants of the masked devil rained from the crowd. With the occasional chant of, Karna I love you, from some female adventurer who supposedly had a crush on Karna. However otherwise the atmosphere was serious and energetic, as at the center were the six guild leaders of the alliance, standing with about 500 guild members and the six champions from their guilds. Seeing the masked devil, many alliance members' eyes turned bloodshot, and many scoured in fear. Scorpio was the former as he glared at Rudra saying, you actually dared to come. Indeed a madman. Chapter 154, Fake Experts There were noises everywhere, it was after all an uncontrolled environment. Scorpio's declaration made everyone talk in murmurs. While Rudra just remained there without making a single sound, Karna however frowned at the situation, there were way too many alliance members on the location, for the fight to be carried on without outside interference. The alliance could cheat in virtually any match without qualms, having 500 members to cover for it. However Rudra was unfazed, the six experts in front of him were all level 45 and tier 1. From their attitude and posture, Rudra knew they were raised in a sheltered environment as they showed no fear facing him. But when it came to real skill, Rudra did not know the faces of a single one of them in his past life, hence he knew none of them were one of the true experts in the game, not reaching the level to threaten him at all. Rudra said coldly, let's get this over with, it's boring to have one on one with the six of you, it's better that you all come at once and be done with it, I have much more productive use of my time than fighting newbies like you. Rudra's provocation caused, oh. In the crowd as people got even more hyped at the challenge. What arrogance from the masked devil. As he stepped forward, Rudra was quite confident in his skills as he had twice the elite player's stats, coupled with his equipment and newfound skills, fighting these kids would be a piece of cake. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus one knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgroove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life, World Renowned, Heer of Augustus One Knight, Limit Breaker. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 46. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 286 plus 143 VIT, 286 plus 143. Int, 286 plus 143 STA. 286 plus 143. PHY, 286 plus 143 HP, 35,000 slash 35,000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. 
infamy, invalid. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, lich's ring, concealer mask, not equipped, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica, elven, sword, semi-legendary. Skills, darkness bind, summon knight durahal, wind slash, critical absorb, berserk, darkness blast, death slash, eyes of truth, earthquake, critical block, blink, stormbringer. Class specific skills, knight's companion, knight's valor, golden ratio. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, mysterious egg, incubating, 53 slash 200. With his recent outgoings and the tear of life, increasing his already massive stats advantage even further. The alliance leaders all looked at each other. It was true that they had more chances to beat the guy 6 on 1 than 1 on 1, however should they still lose, won't they lose even more face than losing 1 on 1 fights. However after much discussion they decided to agree to Rudra's challenge. Real Manchester Guild leader said, you want to fight us all 6 on 1. Fine, you will be dead before you can even beg for mercy. The six champions stepped forward, all having confident and vicious looks in their eyes. Five of the six were assaulters while one was an assassin. Rudra chuckled at the choice of the champions, the clear lack of ranged classes could be seen. It was a good decision for a one-on-one -on -one fight, however in a six-on-one fight, a balanced party wolf caused him more troubles. Not that it really mattered however, as as soon as the signal to start the match was given, Rudra sprung into action. Before the assassin could even properly react to Rudra's blinding speed and raise his dagger to meet the incoming sword strike. Rudra feigned the attack as he rolled through and slashed a nearby assaulter's neck. Minus 17,000 critical hit. The adventurer was dead. Within 30 seconds of the match starting a member of the alliance was dead, and it only got worse. The assassin who was bypassed suddenly regained his senses after the initial shock as he activated his movement skills and attacked Rudra's exposed back, however at the last possible second Rudra sidestepped and circled behind him, his sword piercing his lungs clean as it went through him. Splat. Minus 15,000 critical hit. Blood fell as another alliance champion died. One minute into the challenge and two-sixths of the champions were dead. It was absolutely shocking. Even the remaining four adventures became on guard, they were absolutely in shock by the display of skills by the masked men. They started getting self-doubts as to whether or not they could face this titan, as they had been undefeated in training up to this point and were rightfully a part of one of the strongest, if not the strongest members inside the guild. The four made a diamond defensive formation as the four covered 90 degrees of angle to form an impregnable circle. Rudra laughed at the foolish attempt to defend, as he leisurely swung his sword in the air before using blink. Disappearing from sight Rudra reappeared to the center of their little formation, as he patted one adventurer on the back, for him to frenziedly turn back and swing his sword. Rudra ducked the incoming strike and countered with one of his own, as his sword went straight through the other man's lower jaw out through his skull. Minus 19,000 critical hit. A third champion died. The initial party of six was reduced to three as panicked expressions could be seen on the faces of both the alliance champions and their respective guild masters. The alliance leaders knew at this point that dragging the match any longer was pointless. As they signaled their members to cause mayhem to dispel the challenge. The 500 alliance members suddenly made a ruckus as they shouted insults at Rudra and then suddenly about a group of 20 members charged at him, disregarding his ongoing duel. Karna swiftly took action, meeting the party head-on, however the floodgates had been opened and all hell broke loose as the remaining alliance members also joined the fray to fight. Rudra and Karna suddenly felt a tremendous increase in fighting difficulty after being outmumbered by hundreds. The challenge was over, there was never a winner per se, however the thousands in attendance were witness that the alliance champions were nothing but toys in front of the elites. However the crowd was even more interested in seeing how the elites struggled before eventually dying in front of the hundreds of alliance members pressing on them. However many solo adventurers who had qualms with the alliance also joined the fry, and all hell broke loose a little while later as the playground turned into a battleground of thousands of people where everyone you did not know was an enemy. A certain streamer had been streaming the entire event and the world got an impression that the Hazelgroove Kingdom was simply insane, and from insane they meant insanely entertaining. Where else would you see such madness of thousands of people fighting with no apparent sides or cause? Chapter 155, Start of the End
The forums were ablaze following the events inside the open challenge that the Alliance set up. The Alliance had become a global joke as their champions were not even dirt compared to the masked devil, who slaughtered three of them despite being outnumbered 6 1, and would have killed the other three too had the shameless guild members not interfered. Their actions on interfering in the challenge had them labeled as cowards and despicable cheaters who could not hold a candle to the elites, who were now deemed as the number one guild in Purple Haze City. Omega had become such a hot game in the world currently that brought great viewership numbers even in real life. As major news stations now had dedicated segments featuring latest Omega news on their broadcast. The incidents in Hazelgroove was a hot topic currently, hence the news channels hopped in on the action. Going with public emotion and condemning the alliance as a worthless excuse for a power group. The matter blew up so much that the real-life backers of the alliance members. The parent corporations had to face the backlash. The corporations lost face inside investor meetings and billionaire gatherings. As they were mocked for their lack of talents. Billionaires had an especially inflated sense of ego, and should anyone disrupt their perfect image of themselves or hurt their pride even slightly, it would rattle them to their core, as they would try everything in their might to prove them wrong. Backlash came from the higher-ups as the elders and guild leaders had a nightmare of a scolding. The only way the guild leaders avoided their firings was because they made sure to exaggerate the point that they could smoke the elite soon in a war. 350,000 members against what 350? There was no way that the elites win that thing, even with an NPC army of a 10,000 troops or 50,000 troops or whatever amounts of bombs they had. They cannot win that battle. Only because of this Gaurante, did they barely keep their jobs by the skin of their teeth. However should they lose. It will all be over then. And even though the Gaurantes, things were even worse than they were laid back at the command station, as they were unable to regain control of the eleven sectors in the given time, only being able to take back eight, failing the quest given by Emperor Amon. The emperor gained back control over the military after beheading those who resisted his power, regaining military supremacy. After regaining military supremacy, the military swooped through the kingdom restoring order through force. Millions of innocents died, however the riots ended with Amon being accepted as the emperor. The church fulfilled its obligations as it crowned the 17th emperor of Hazelgroove, and with that began a new reign and a new era. With them failing the quest came a heavy penalty for the alliance as the emperor forced military service upon the alliance or face banishment from the kingdom. The punishment required the alliance to provide 100,000 members for one year to compulsory military service to the state. Having no other options, the alliance had to force its newly recruited basic members into one year of forced military service contract while being under pay from the guild. The alliance truly felt the pinch of finances the last few days, the Red Jewel quest line had been a disaster that completely blew a hole in their finances. Firstly it was the compensation for deaths that they had to roll out, then it was the money spent on repairs and replacement of damaged equipment. Then it was the forced military service for a year while being underpaid by the Alliance. The three major events destroyed their guild's cash flow. Their only hope now was to win the war against the true elites and raid 70% of their lucrative warehouse as war compensation to ease their financial pressure. The time for talking trash was over, as just when the cooldown for war was over, the impending war request came to the True Elites. True Elites Headquarters, Inner District, Purple Haze City. Rudra was calmly looking at the new system notification that just came. It was a notice of war. He had been mentally prepared for this since a long time, he sighed as he opened the war notice. War notification, your guild the True Elites, has been challenged to a guild war by six other guilds namely. Azure Lotus signed by Pink Lotus. Sea of Poison signed by Scorpio. Surfer United signed by Beach Boy. Real Manchester signed by De Bruyne. Original Manchester signed by Fernandez. Musicians Inc. signed by True Rhythm. With the group name, The Alliance. Should you choose to accept the war invitation as the defending party you shall have the right to. 1. Choose the battlefield. 2. Choose the war reparations to be paid in case of a victory. 3. Choose the exact date of the war in the next 14 days. In case of losing the war the penalty will be. 1. Losing 70% of guild assets. In case of choosing to forfeit slash surrender the challenge. 1. Pay 20% of all guild assets. 2. Get a 60 days protection period. In case of winning the war. 1. You will gain 90% of all opposing guild's assets. 
2. One request made in accordance to winning the defender's right. Do you wish to? 1. Accept the war invitation. 2. Surrender. Rudra chose to accept the war invitation, with choosing the date of battle as four days from now on Saturday. As for the war indemnity he put forth the condition that 100,000 alliance members shall sign a slavery contract for three years to be subservant to the true elite's guild as a manual labor. He would have filled in for more if the system allowed it, ending the alliance problem for once and for all, however the system only allowed him an indemnity for 100,000 members for three years. And that was only because he accepted a war challenge against six other guilds. The system calculated the indemnity to be in proportion to the odds and approved it. The war deed was signed. The inevitable was here, the clash between the alliance and the elites. 1600 PS equals 2. 2400 PS equals 3. 3200 PS equals 4. 4000 PS equals 5. Chapter 156, War Preparations. The elites were at a massive disadvantage in the war, period. Everything had a role in wars, terrain, strategy, weapons, tactical superiority, and coordination. However the biggest thing needed in a war was numbers. Against an army of 100,000 strong, 100 men cannot last long against them in any sort of open confrontation. The only example in history when 300 men toppled an army being outnumbered by thousands was the Spartan War of 300 against the Persians. However that was because they held a small passage where the numerical superiority of the enemy had no advantage, except that it was draining on stamina. However history was man's best teacher and Rudra had learned a lot from the Battle of 300. He thoroughly understood that he needed a great equalizer to negate the enemy's overwhelming numerical superiority. And that equalizer came in the form of Fort Knox. Fort Knox was the battlefield that was geographically in a beautiful location. It was built on a small hill beside the ocean, on its south side was a small beach and connecting the beach was the ocean. On its west side was a river, which met the ocean forming an estuary. On its north and east was a wide lush green plain stretching for kilometers. Rudra knew the Fort Knox battlefield inside out. It essentially had three openings, the first was the north gate entrance. The north gate entrance was the largest entrance and was the easiest to breach. The wood used to make the entrace door was quite weak, and it was the reason why whoever used Fort Knox in wars up to now, was defeated thoroughly. The east side had a smaller entrance about the size of one horseman. It had an iron door to fortify the castle, but it could also be breached making the assault a two-pronged assault. If the assault ever becomes a two-pronged one, when the defending party is highly outnumbered then know that you have lost the war there and then. And there was a third hidden passage inside the sandy beach, that opened inside a cellar inside the fort. This passage had not been discovered yet, in any wars, however Rudra with his reincarnation knowledge already knew about it and the passage was a key part of his plan. To win the war there were three phases of action that needed to be taken, in every phase there was little to no room for mistakes and only and only when all three phases are executed perfectly, can one win the war. Even before the first phase of the war began, one needed pre-planning to do, and that pre-planning was to misguide the enemies. How can one achieve that? Of course through the snake inside the guild Orochimaru. Rudra needed to have a fake war meeting inside the guild hall, explaining a fake plan and terrain and throwing off the opposition off their game plan. While actually preparing for the war secretly in an entirely different direction. The actual plan of war was already formulated in his mind as he had calculated everything to utmost precision, thinking about every possible scenarios and how to counter them. The first phase of the war would see the guild fortifying the entrances of Fort Knox in the east and the north gate using the lifestyle members and the reinforced bricks obtained in the auction. Within 10 minutes of preparation time, Using fire spells and lots of practice in the days leading to the war, the guild members will learn how to make a cement wall of reinforced concrete as they seal both entrances, making the fort impregnable. Once the entrances are sealed completely, then the arrow shooting ballistas would be open to the world, as thousands would fall every minute to the relentless assault of the arrows of the valley stay. At which point spells and alchemic potions and a few bombs will be let loose on the swarm of opposing players. Rudra estimated a death toll of 90 to 110,000 alliance players in phase 1, which was the mass slaughter phase. Then the most critical phase of the war plan would begin the phase 2. In phase 2, Rudra expects the alliance to find a way into the fort. Nearly after two hours that the war starts, the natural cement walls of the fort should show signs of wear and tear, as he expects the guild to punch a hole through the defenses at that point. 
that point is where the war effort will take a crucial turn. The guild's tankers would have to show their masterclass along with Vice Guild Master Karna as the rest of the guild members retreated through the secret passage and out of the secret door through to the beach. The role of the tankers is not only to hold the lines for long enough for the other members to retreat but also to lure thousands of Alliance members into the fort as they storm the area. It is at this point that bombs placed at strategic locations would blow up and crumple the entire Fort Knox, sacrificing thousands of Alliance members along with the tankers. Rudra expected a death toll of 50 to 70,000 in this phase, which he deemed as the sacrifical phase. At this point the enemy forces should be thinned by a large amount when the final phase of the war starts, which would be the wild card phase of the war. The third phase would start when the fort entrance is breached and the elites are retreating. It is then that SMG who had sneaked through the secret passage at the start of the war and sneakily went up river behind the alliance members, would ride the massive pirate ship that Karna obtained as treasure down river towards the ocean. When the hole is breached and the Alliance members try to enter the fort, the pirate ship moving from the side would shower them with cannonballs and arrows from the bally stay. They would force the Alliance to hasten their attack on the fort and divert some forces to handle the ship, to dilute their attention. After the fort blows up the ship will also pick up the escaped elite members at the interjection of the ocean and the river. This was the final phase of the war effort as it would wipe the Alliance members to staggeringly low number. And force them into retreat hopefully bringing the surviving numbers down to 10 or 20,000 members. From there on there was no plan, as the assaulters kept fighting the Alliance on the beach, the Alliance members would be forced to fight near the ocean where the ship would provide a constant cover. It was either wiping out the opposition then or retreating, but even if they wished to they would not be able to attack the pirate ship without proper infrastructure. The biggest advantage that the elites had was the ability to stun their opponents time and time again, However that would only remove the unfair numbers advantage that the alliance had. Finally it would come down men to men, sword to sword and fist to fist and only the superior party shall win that contest. However men to men everyone knew that there was no comparing the elites to the trash called alliance. Hence this was the best plan Rudra could come up with. Hopefully it would work. Hopefully you all like it. Chapter 157 The Meeting True Elites Headquarters, The Upside, Real World Amelia had personally messaged everyone in the guild to be present inside the Elite Tower Real World Guild Meeting Hall at exactly 4 p.m. Well, everyone expect Orochimaru of course, and everyone had indeed gathered in the hall. At first it seemed like a cool idea to make the decor of the 60th floor the same as the guild hall, however now that the members were meeting here for the second time, honestly it was a bit awkward. Because while getting the same game-like feeling, the world was actually reality. This caused a unnecessary deja vu for all members present which blurred the lines between virtual and real world. However one thing was absolute, that within the virtual world or in the real world, Rudra was the leader of the group. Rudra took the stage and everyone instantly became silent. The pressure of war was looming and while every member was a bit nervous, they were more exited to see what the leader came up with. They believed in Rudra and his capabilities, if the impossible could be achieved, then he was the man to achieve it. Rudra looked at the crowd and smiled, not a single person in the room looked scared even though a massive war was coming. Now this is what Rudra wanted in his members. No matter the odds there should be a determination to win, and these lads had it. Rudra said, well, there has been a shortage of manpower lately even with the addition of 300 superbly talented people into the guild. I have seen guild members having to do menial tasks, and as a guild leader I cannot let this continue any longer. Everyone in the room was confused. Manpower problem. Um leader there is a war problem currently if you forgot. Karna Aka Leo Crispy asked, are we hiring new members guild leader? Rudra smiled and said, not currently, we have a strict entrance policy that cannot be laxed, vice guild master. Everyone was even more confused. How were they going to solve the manpower problem without hiring new members? Poison Toad Gamakichi asked, then are we hiring NPCs? Rudra said, yes, we have indeed hired a lot of NPCs but that is a topic for another day, right now what I am talking about is different. Not wanting to create any more suspense Rudra said. See, the things is like this, although the modern world looks down on slavery, they perfectly enjoy exploiting employees into low-paying service contracts. The only difference between working as a slave and an employee is the name tag that we attach to it. Many people nodded, it resonated with people in a deeper level, those who worked in an abusive corporate contract knew that they were no different than slaves. 
However how does it apply here? Rudra continued, naturally to solve the manpower problem of our guild without relying on NPCs and without lowering our recruitment standards we need talented service people, slaves. Rudra paused and looked around the room. Then he said, 100,000 alliance members should be enough. No. Three years of service debt for losing the war. The entire hall erupted in clamor. Insane. The leader is insane. What confidence. What arrogance. The leader how much confidence does he have in the guild's victory? Rudra laughed loudly seeing the clamor, his eyes shone with determination as he said, the alliance weaklings dare challenge the mighty true elites, now they need to be taught the law of the jungle, after we trample on them in war. Yes of course we will plunder their resources, but we will also force them into submission. You dare challenge us. Then you shall pay. Let me make it very clear ladies and gentlemen, there are good guys and there are bad guys, and Rudra Rajput Akka guild leader Shakuni, is a bad bad guy, if you are not an elite, you are not worthy of my mercy. The true elites is made for the best of the best players, and the alliance is privileged to serve us. After the war we will rule Purple Haze City ladies and gentlemen, mark my words. Rudra was out of breath but he continued, the elders have been informed about the three phases of the war, and they will brief you individually about your roles in the war. I won't lie to you guys, the war will be tough and there is no margin for error, but follow the plan and we will crush the alliance. Everyone nodded, they looked determined. Rudra said, this meeting is mainly about telling you guys that tomorrow inside the game, there will be another war meeting, but it is only a show for luring out the spy Orochimaru, heed nothing that is discussed tomorrow, but act as if it is the most important meeting of your life. Your acting tomorrow will be important, I expect no slip-ups. Everyone became a little nervous, but they nodded in understanding. They had to be at their sharpest tomorrow if the bait for Orochimaru was to succeed. The meeting was dismissed after that, and the elders took over their respective group briefings. Explaining the real war plan and individual roles. The elite's members showed shocked expressions after shocked expressions after learning the trump cards the guild held. They became even more exited for the war after that. Rudra who was overseeing the entire situation was deep in thought, he had a deep worry that he had not expressed to the guild members. Rudra's deepest worry was that even after chipping away the massive numbers of the opposition there would be more than 20,000 alliance members left standing against 250 or so elites. Should the alliance then reveal hidden cards, it would get really difficult for the elites to win. Rudra would be a fool to think that numbers was the only strength that the alliance had. Six first-rate guilds were bound to have one or two hidden cards. However how much will those cards tip the scale of the war? As the leader he could not show his worries to anyone, he had to remain strong and focused, his boundless confidence should inspire everyone else, however the reality was that Noon feared losing the war more than Rudra did, Noon doubted every move he planned and was a bigger critique than he was for himself. As he sat in a corner engrossed in his thoughts, a woman sat beside him and tugged his arm, and said, it's okay guild leader, we believe in you, but you can also rely on us, we won't let you down. Rudra glanced to the side to find Naomi sitting beside him smiling. His heart warmed, this girl she understood the burdens he carried. He gave her a bright smile. Chapter 158, The Trap True Elite's Headquarters, Inner District, Purple Haze City, Virtual World Orochimaru had suddenly got a order informing him of an all-guild meeting today in the guild hall. He had long been walking on thin ice, and this war was kind of the last chance he had as a spy to work for the Ambani Corporation. To be fair, the Ambani Corporation long wanted to plant another spy inside the elites. However the guild never opened their goddamn recruitment doors. They could not plant anyone else, hence had to give Orochimaru the chance. Orochimaru had long since decided that he would much rather record the whole thing, than writing a report and filing evidence. Hence he had long started his record feature in the morning as he waltzed in the guild. He greeted players and made small talk about the upcoming war to learn their opinions, however actually it was to pry into information. The greatest actor of all however was Fatty Kalash, he kept sighing and walking around Orochimaru, baiting him to talk to him, and indeed Orochimaru caught the bait as he approached Fatty Kalash and asked, you seem worried my friend, everything okay? Kalash looked at Orochimaru for two seconds, then he sighed again, holding his head, Looking absolutely devastated and depressed as he said in a heavy voice, the new bomb recipe we came up with has failed, I do not know how to face the guild leader with my failure. Orochimaru's ears perked up at the news, this was good stuff, this was exactly what the alliance wanted to know. 
How many trump cards does the true elites have, how many bombs? Now that one of their new bomb lines have failed, isn't that good news for the alliance? Immediately he tried to talk to Kalash more, comforting him and trying to get more information. At the end he got the information that the elites had close to 5,000 bombs and that they will use their entire stockpile to level the alliance. The number 5,000 really shocked Orochimaru, however he sniggered inwardly, even if the 5,000 bombs kill 50,000 people, it will still not be enough to win the war. The elites were doomed. But outwardly he didn't show it, he behaved like he was deeply concerned for the guild, feeling all sly and cunning. However he did not realize that he had long fallen for Fatty Kalash's disciple acting. Finally it was time for the meeting as everyone gathered in the guild hall. Rudra entered the room, and started to speak. Guys, the truth is, we are very very hard pushed to win this war, against the alliance we have bitten off more than we can chew, and six first-rate guilds are not what we can fight against. However as throwing the towel is not our style, we will try our best to win the war. Rudra continued, the best plan that we have currently is to use our two best cards against the alliance, card number one is our defender's advantage that we choose the terrain. And after much deliberation with the elders we have decided to take the forest as our chosen terrain. Everyone nodded, they seemed to agree with the decision it seemed logical. Orochimaru bit his lip, if it was the forest then showing numeric superiority may be difficult. Rudra continued, I know it will be hard, and the war will be long, However using the forest as cover we can set up traps and use guerrilla warfare tactics as we sneakily attack and retreat. This made sense as everyone nodded again, even Orochimaru felt convinced this was a smart plan of action. Rudra continued, we have a stockpile of close to 5,000 bombs, each member shall be given 10. Your job with these 10 bombs is to kill as many groups of alliance members as you can. The damn bombs. Orochimaru cursed. The elites had the bombs that were the most coveted thing that every other guild wanted but the elites won't sell. Lastly Rudra said, even after all this I do not expect to win, logically speaking our chances of victory are one in a thousand, even I as our guild leader has bet all my money on us losing this war, not because I have no hope, but because after we pay 70% war indemnity, we still have money to run the guild, and I urge you all to do the same. The atmosphere in the room became the lowest, the leader had no confidence in winning, why would they even try? Orochimaru was the happiest, he had gotten the biggest scoop of the century, this video would be recorded in history of the game as his name would spread throughout. He could not help but also admire Rudra's ingenuity, betting on the alliance to win to make some money back was indeed a very smart idea. He quickly took his leave as he went to forward the recorded evidence to his superiors. He was hoping for endless praise and a good promotion for this job well done. Even his superiors found the video compelling as they showed it to the alliance leaders, boosting their confidence in the war a thousandfold. Yua felt a bit bad for Rudra, to see him in such a pitiful state, she swore that she would not take a dime from her share of the war loot and give it all back to Rudra secretly. The other leaders started to think about contouring the forest terrain as they brainstormed ideas. But unbeknownst to them, thinking they were the big fish stalking the little fish, the little fish was a deliberate bait set up by the fishermen. The trap was a hook, line, and sinker. Chapter 159, War Preparations Everyone started to fervently prepare for war. There was an overall atmosphere of pushing past their limits and going above and beyond in the next three days to be at the peak condition possible for the war. Fatty Kalash lead his team of lifestyle players to ensure that the manufacturing of the Baliste and the rapid construction of reinforced brick wall was progressing well. The first phase of the plan revolved heavily around the contribution of the Lifestyle Guild. In the 10-minute preparation time before the war started, they had to completely reinforce the end races to make the fort impregnable. A slightest weakness in assembly and the defense could crumble, and the war would be finished there and then. However Fatty Kalash wasn't someone who would ever let that happen on his watch, under his supervision the wall team worked day and night to perfect their craft of making the wall and the assembly of the Baliste and a sea of arrows were being produced in the smithies day and night. The alchemists and potion makers in the lifestyle division made many poisonous gas potions, to throw into swarm of enemies to deter them. Although they were not very lethal and could be easily countered with an antidote, to those who were not well equipped they could still pose a challenge. Especially the basic paralysis potion, that reduced movement speed by 40%. The assaulters of the guild were busy leveling, that included Rudra who was leveling like a maniac. He had already leveled up twice and showed no signs of slowing. Player name, Shikuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, 
Viscount of Hazelgrove Kingdom, Reputable Knight, Savior of Thal Village, Revered Medicine Master, Honorary Bishop of the Church of Life, World Renowned, Heir of Augustus I Knight, Limit Breaker. Class, Knight. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 48. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 290 plus 145 VIT, 290 plus 145. Int, 290 plus 145 STA, 290 plus 145. PHY, 290 plus 145 HP, 37,000 slash 37,000. Unassigned stat points, shocked. Hidden stats. Luck. Charm. Infamy, invalid. Status, healthy. Equipment, pirate armor set, LV-40, lich's ring, concealer mask, not equipped, retractable shield, epic. Weapons, wind cutter, sword, common bow, quiver of arrows, excalibur, sword, replica, elven, sword, semi-legendary. Skills, darkness bind, summon knight durahal, wind slash, critical absorb, berserk, darkness blast, death slash, eyes of truth, earthquake, critical block, blink, stormbringer. Class-specific skills, Knight's Companion, Knight's Valor, Golden Ratio. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Mysterious Egg, Incubating, 65-200. The same went for Karna and Neatwit who were leveling up relentlessly. The three understood quite well that their independent strengths would play a huge role in the coming war. The guild also spared no expense in improving its members' strengths. High-quality weapons, skill books, equipment, Everything was purchased by the guild, the member had to only send an invoice requesting money and they will be given the entire sum and also some more. It just so happened that every single member was covered in light gold equipment or higher. There were not a single piece of bronze or silver ranked equipment on their body. Only gold or dark gold grade. Not even guild leaders of third and second rate guilds so well equipped much less common members. This just went to show how different the elites were from the other guilds. Rich beyond reason, unafraid to splurge on members, and delivered more than what was promised. It was because of this attitude of the guild towards its members that the sincerity was returned as people wholeheartedly worked for the guild. The facade in front of Orochimaru was maintained perfectly as members kept talking about how to navigate the forest and how to set up traps and how they wished that the alliance would be merciful in victory. If you are reading this book on any site except web novel, you are supporting pirated content. Please do not support piracy. You can read the same content on the original publishing platform web novel. Orochimaru kept gaining confidence in the Alliance victory and Su did the superiors behind him who praised him for a job well done. The Alliance had already came up with ways to counter the forest problem. They had purchased flares in bulk and of different colors, their plan was to infiltrate the entire forest and then the group which encountered enemies would fire a flare in the air. Every nearby group would close in with a circle formation as they confronted the enemy from all sides. This way the enemy would have no chance to use guerrilla tactics and it would be only a matter of time before the enemy was caught in small groups and hunted to oblivion. Their other plans included strategically burning portions of the forest to drive out the enemy, should they encounter an area that the enemy had made a stronghold out of. And naturally the equipment they carried was also suited for the exact task. Had they even a whiff of the elite's true strategy, they could have prepared ladders and siege equipment, have wall breakers and have the wizards learn strong explosive spells. However they were clueless about it because of the very person they planted to not be clueless. Rudra had played a masterstroke in manipulating Orochimaru and the Alliance would find out about it real soon. The forums were ablaze with speculation as the odds of an elite victory were the worst odds ever predicted. With a payout of 32,1, an elite S victory was ruled out by every single expert. However there were those who saw this as an opportunity to make big money, and hence invested $100 to $1,000 on elite's victory, while betting $10,000 on their loss. Hence either way it won't be a big loss for them. Now they just hoped for a miraculous elite victory. The only exception to the scenario and heaviest better towards the elites was naturally Ethan Gray who had absolute confidence in Rudra. Who bet a whopping $100 billion on an elite's win. He would either make the annual profit of the Gray Corporation in a single week, or lose a lot of money on a whim. To be fair he was scared of losing his money, but the thrill of the gamble compelled him to do it anyway. Now he just hoped Rudra would not let him down. 
The world's attention was on this fight as major news channels had already began programs about the war running almost 20 hours a day. Various experts were brought to the panel to discuss about the possible elite strategy and war outcome. While many interesting theories were exchanged the end analysis of all experts was the same, there is no chance in hell that the elites win. The bald expert that just had his hair grown back after mispredicting that the elites can't defeat Orange Rock Guild, was back on the panel, as he again made a bold prediction when a journalist asked him about his precious mistake. The journalist asked, Sir, you had said the same thing when the elites fought Orange Rock Guild, that there was no chance in hell that they could win. Now you say it again, what happens if you are wrong yet again? The expert said, last time was a fluke, no one could have predicted the use of bombs by the guild, and there is a limit to how much cards one can hold. I can guarantee that the elites won't win this war. And if they do, I will not only shave my head again, I will also shave my eyebrows, mustache and wax every single hair on my body. The expert made a bold prediction. Rudra seeing the show on his sofa, eating popcorn smiled as he said, get ready to lose your hair then baldy. Chapter 160, War, 1 Finally the day of the war arrived, all that could be prepared had been prepared, and knowing the sheer scale of the event, various media outlets had bribed players on both sides to stream live content. From the true elites' side, Ethan himself requested Rudra to live stream straight from his POV in the war. Rudra would have hesitated or even outright rejected the idea if there was a possibility that his plans may be leaked due to live streaming. However inside the war arena all incoming messages were disabled, even within party members, information had to be relayed through runes or the old school way of shouting the commands. Structure and relay of commands was extremely important in wars. And only because he was sure that no information could be leaked to the enemy, he decided to accept the live stream request from Ethan Gray. One of Ethan's many companies was Gray Entertainment, which had many channels and subscription services. And Rudra's exclusive stream on their channel was sure to drive sales through the roof. Five minutes before the war. The Elite's HQ. Rudra started the live stream within the Elite Guild Hall, facing him were all the true Elite's guild members. The main guild and the lifestyle members alike, as everyone had a part to play in the war. There was nervousness and excitement in the air, everyone was impatient for the war to start, the five minutes of waiting time felt like an eternity. Rudra looked at his guild, pride filling his chest, every single member, even the non-combat ones were covered in gold-grade armor or above. Millions watching the scene were also in awe of the elite's wealth. The scene of 500 or so members covered in top-notch equipment awed all viewers. Rudra then raised his hand for silence as he began his war speech. He said, the war ahead is going to be a tough one, I want insult you guys by asking you whether you are ready or not. Whether you can give your 100% for the guild or not. Whether you can execute your roles to the best of your abilities in the war or not. Because if even a single answer is a no, then we have already lost the war. Everyone had a determined look on their faces, they did not need a motivational talk from the leader, their dedication to the guild needed no motivation. They looked fired up, they were ready for war. Karna looked at the members, as the countdown hit 15 seconds he shouted loudly, one for all, all for one. And every single guild member shouted, Go Elites Geo! The countdown hit zero and they were all transported to the chosen field of defense, the Fort Knox. The war battlefield the Fort Knox. Everyone was teleported to the battlefield, the defenders the elites spawned inside the fort, whereas the attackers the alliance spawned inside the northern plains. The alliance leaders were instantly dumbfounded when they teleported inside the war map. This was not the forest. This was the Fort Knox map. The 10-minute war timer started, and the elite's lifestyle had already started its work in reinforcing the entrances, through the reinforced brickwork. While everyone else took the designated positions within the fort. Everyone except Orochimaru, who looked lost. Orochimaru's mind blanked when he found himself inside a Fort Knox and not a forest. He looked around carefully, only to find that Noon else was surprised and even began to work. He couldn't process what was going on. However everyone was giving him Venemao's looks in the guild, and Shikuni, Karna, Neatwit and SMG were surrounding him. He was currently on a border wall, and retreating 5 meters more meant he would have an ugly fall down the wall for 30 meters or so. Rudra walked with a smug smile on his face as he said, Orochimaru, oh Orochimaru, you think you are so smart, huh? Trying to infiltrate the guild, leaking information to Mithun and Bani about the elites. 
Well, 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 do you take us as fools who did not know your ploy? Orochimaru was stunned, impossible, impossible, he knew it all from the start. Was the only thoughts he had in his mind, but his mouth stuttered for words as the elders circled in on him, pushing him towards the edge. Finally regaining some sense of speech he said, impossible, you were supposed to choose the forest terrain, there was this huge guild meeting, I have proof I recorded everything. Was it all a setup from the start? Rudra just smiled a sinister laugh to confirm his thoughts. Orochimaru shrieked like a little boy terrified. If Rudra knew everything from the start, about his identity and his connection to the Ambani Corporation, and still gave him all the benefits of the guild and even footed massive amounts of money for his purchases, only to lure him into a trap. Then he was a master manipulator and a terrifying player of mind games. You. You. You framed me. He shouted in anger. However suddenly he found a dagger in his abdomen, SMG had sneaked up on him, he was shocked, he was stabbed when distracted. But when he looked up, he saw Rudra's sinister smile as he said, the elites have no space for snakes like you. Boom. Rudra kicked him square on the jaw and sent him flying down the wall. His thoughts as his HP rapidly drained from the dagger in his abdomen, nearing death, was only that his career was over, the Ambani Corporation would never forgive him and how he was a fool to think that he was the smartest person in the elite guild hall, whereas the reality was that compared to Shikuni, he was not even fit to lick his boots. He died from the fall down the wall and was teleported out of the war arena. Chapter 161 War 2 The Real World Ethan Gray was sitting in his private lounge. One of the finest whiskies in the world in his hand, as he watched Rudra's livestream. Today was a crucial day for Ethan as today was not only the elites facing the alliance, where he had a whopping $100 billion on the line, but also the day where his hired team of world-class mercenaries blew up Ambani's petroleum mine. It was safe to say that Ethan Gray was a confident man, he would never drink to relieve stress, yet today his nerves were at the edge, it was a make-or-break day for him, as he would either come out the other side today as a tycoon who would expand his net worth by trillions, or someone who would have to lay low for a while, losing large sums of money. When Rudra kicked the snake Orochimaru after name-dropping his connection with the Ambanis, Ethan felt a sense of satisfaction and relief, as he muttered under his breath, King Snakes. War Arena, the Alliance POV. Beach Boy of Surfers United was live-streaming hence the world was watching the Alliance leaders having an impromptu meeting regarding the change in the chosen terrain. Pink Lotus said, although what you are saying is true, not everything is as bad as it seems, I have seen previous battles in Fort Knox, it has two gates at east and north, the north gate is the biggest gate made of wood, our assaulter should be able to hack through the gate after a bit of struggle. We will lose some numbers, however that's not an issue is it? Once the gate crumbles, so will the elites. True Rhythm agreed to Pink Lotus as he said, I agree. This is not necessarily a better choice than the forest, the fort is a smaller area to defend and run, we can rest assured about the guerrilla warfare tactics, once the defenses of the fort are breached the war will end. The alliance leaders had a logical discussion about what to do next, but time was running out, as the 10-minute preparation time was about to run out, they were yet to relay important information to the 250000 strong army of theirs. And as for now there was but one command, that was breach the gates and attack the fort. The war timer hit the final thirties, and everyone became laser-focused. Victory or defeat, everything would be decided now. Unbeknownst to them, a deadly assassin party of twenty lead by SMG had sneaked through the hidden gate and started to make his way upriver, unnoticed by the Alliance army. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, war starts. The True Elite's POV the war had started and everyone had taken battle positions, the task of handling the archballisti was left to the archers, whereas every lifestyle member and non-wizards were given a bow and quiver of arrows. A few people like Rudra and Karna chose the javelin, to strategically target enemies. Just as the countdown hit zero, a sea of people started to charge from the northern gate towards the fort. Rudra smiled at them as he said, come. He gave Karna the nod and Karna gave the war command. Unveil the ballisti. Archers load your arrows. Karna shouted. The cloths covering the bally stay were removed. The weapons were already armed and loaded. Hold. Karna said, waiting for the perfect time to unleash the arrows, making sure that maximum enemies were inside the range of arrows to maximize damage. Fire. Karna shouted, and for a second the sun got blocked out a sea of arrows fell on the charging alliance members, as thousands were hit with the incoming arrows. 
but to the sheer horror of the Alliance members, unlike the traditional arrows that hit in waves after waves, these arrows were continuous. Like a goddamn machine gun, the Ballyste kept blasting arrows after arrows, with an insane rate of 200 arrows per minute. At least 150 Alliance members died under its relentless assault every minute, while 20 more were injured. And there were eight such beasts mounted on the walls of Fort Knox. 1200 Alliance members fell each minute to the Ballyste and about 300 more fell under the arrows and spells of the members. There was panic, disbelief, and sheer horror inside the Alliance members' eyes. They could not even defend properly under the relentless arrow assault. Chaos reigned inside the charging party as to defend the arrows the Alliance members moved around and bumped into each other, falling tripping and breaking the attack lines. Scorpio looked at the bally stay and just went batshit crazy, what the hell is that thing? Why do the elites have such a game-breaking thing? His mind went blank, and the same happened for the other five Alliance leaders, they were speechless seeing the beast of a bally stay in actions, thousands being slayed every minute under its unending assault. Meanwhile the world watching the unfolding of the bally stay went totally nuts. The elites had their own medieval machine gun, how cool. The common adventurers seeing the war for fun were very very happy seeing the entertaining bally stay in action, whereas the various superpowers saw it as a must-have tool in their arsenal. Win or lose, many interested parties were going to contact the elites post-war, for this technology. The first phase of the war had started, and ten minutes into the war, the first alliance member finally reached the northern gate, after going through hell in the face of incoming fire, and started hacking at the wooden door with his axe. However within these ten minutes close to 16,000 alliance members had died, and there was no signs of slowing down. Chapter 162, War, 3 The appearance of the bally stay caused the alliance members to panic, and hence the inexperienced soldiers broke the ranks and the attack formation was ruined. However slowly but surely a few members started to teach the north gate. Hacking the wood with their weapons. The big and burly ones took a short run up and tried to ram themselves onto the gate's shoulder first. However for some reason, the door would not budge. But not understanding the reason behind it, they kept attacking the door nonetheless. The alliance leaders quickly issued an order for all long-range classes to attack the bally stay. However to their nightmare their lower ground disadvantage and the ballistae's long-range barrage made it impossible to get in a safe range to attack the bally stay. The few who did manage to get even a bit close had a javelin pierced through their body, Kutsei of Rudra and Karna, who were only on the lookout for such people. Half an hour passed just like that and close to 40,000 Alliance members had died under the constant assault of arrows and javelins. The Alliance had absolutely no answers for the incoming assault of the Bally Stay. People watching worldwide were awed, as many started to believe that if the elites could maintain the current situation for an hour longer, the entire war situation may change. Where many experts predicted the war to be over within the first 30 minutes, the actual reality was that after 30 minutes, not a single elite was dead, however close to 40,000 alliance members were. Their numbers dwindling to 2, 10, 0, 0, 0 men. However finally at that time, someone finally cut through the wooden gate, but what he saw through the small opening he made, made him despair. There was a goddamn wall behind the gate. This made no sense, why is there a wall behind the gate? He shouted, there is a wall behind the gate. And naturally the message ran across the battlefield, that there was a wall behind the gate. Rudra smiled hearing the message, it was about time that they found out about it. Now he could turn things up a notch. The alliance leaders were dumbfounded, there was a wall behind the gate. Wasn't the fort supposed to be impregnated once the gate was breached? Then why was there a wall? Scorpio shouted in desperation, half of the party members, circle to the east gate. Circle to the east gate. Circle to the east gate. This was the issue in commanding such a large army, by the time the command manually reached the front line, the initial command of half members circle to the east gate, became, circle to the east gate. As droves and droves of players started to circle towards the east gate. The abrupt change in charging direction caused the army to form a congested group, that was easy pickings for the bally stay. In the five minutes following the command, Close to 15,000 Alliance members lost their lives. As they tried to reach the East Gate. However to their horror, the small metal East Gate was actually covered by five Archballisti, and it was suicidal to even come close. Rain of arrows poured over the Alliance members, with the next five minutes having a deadly death count of 21,000 Alliance members. 
their original numbers of 2, 50, 000, 000, 000 now reduced to 1, 74, 000, 000. The alliance leaders had a ghastly pale expression, as everything was falling apart, their death tolls piling like crazy. However there was a certain leader amongst their group who was having a sly smile on his face currently. Beach Boy said, I have a trump card that can help us breach the wall, but it is very expensive and I cannot use it for free. If you guys want me to use it then I will get 20% more from the end loot. However considering the desperate situation that they were in, they hesitated. Every guild needed money. And giving up 20% was too much. It was then that a guild member came with a report. Reporting to the leaders, it is confirmed that the elites have somehow made a strong concrete brick wall behind both the gates, the fort is impregnable. His antics being watched by millions. However seeing the desperate situation he said, all right I agree you selfish pig. The other guild leaders also gave their confirmations through gritted teeth, as Beach Boy had a big smile plast on his face. Beach Boy said, all right. Watch me. As he took out some scroll from within his inventory. The scroll was a tier 3 spell scroll Fireblast. Fireblast, tier 3, a scroll that unleashes the power of a tier 3 spell, Fireblast. Can only be used once before the paper burns out. Effects, creates a powerful flame explosion. Everyone's eyes widened when Beach Boy pulled the scroll out. If it was a tier 3 scroll then indeed it had power to destroy the fort walls and blast a hole. They hated Beach Boy's greed, however they praised his resourcefulness. With this they could finally enter the fort and win the war. An entire unit made of elite tankers covered Beach Boy from every incoming assault, as they moved as a compact unit, with every defense spell and ability at the disposal of the tanks being activated. When they finally reached an acceptable range, Beach Boy finally infused mana into the spell, as he aimed for a spot on the wall. Chapter 163, War, 4 Beach Boy unleashed the full power of the Tier 3 spell. Boom. It collided with the walls of Fort Knox, the explosion rattling the entire fort, one archballisti was destroyed as it was positioned right above the explosion that took down the wall. However the explosion came at a cost, as 200 or so alliance members near the wall area were also blown away with the brunt of the explosion. There was a void created in that area, but when the dust settled and huge hole appeared on the walls of Fort Knox, all hell broke loose as the alliance members came swarming at that direction. The alliance leaders rejoiced at the scene, the orders of charge could be heard all around the battlefield. As victory seemed certain following the fort's breach, experts all around the world, who were giving live commentary on the war developments became very exited, as they started commenting as if it was the start of the end for the true elites. Beach Boy personally lead the charge alongside his elite guard, as he tried to enter the fort. Rudra took in a deep breath, it was time for phase two, it all depended on the tanks now. Except the archers who were still manning the archballisti, and the tanks and Rudra, the rest of the elite started to retreat through the decided path. Rudra quickly threw two spike bombs and one frost bomb, at the area of hole, where there was a dense population of players. The bombs as expected were super effective under the situation, as they claimed the lives of many alliance members. And also bought a few extra seconds of time for the elites to retreat. Mediv was the last one to retreat after ensuring that the entire wizard division had retreated, however before retreating he needed to show a skill of his own. Facing the hole in the wall, Mediv took the special potion that Rudra acquired for him, that temporarily allowed him to temporarily raise his potential to cast a spell one tier above his current tier. This was the second time he would use the spell, the first time being against the trolls. Mediv closed his eyes and focused, he raised his hand and started the chant. Flames started to burst from under his feet and around him and started to grow in size and power. Circles of flame danced around his being, as he casted the spell Sea of Fire. Boom, the entire hole and 25 meters beyond the hole was transformed into a blazing sea of fire, the tier 2 spell showing its full effect. Hundreds of alliance members who had recovered from the bombs and desperately tried to enter were scorched to death, as the spell took a toll of nearly 500 alliance members and gave burns to many more. A perfect example of the terrifying PvE capability of a wizard class, Mediv displayed his class awing the world watching. Again a vacuum was created where the hole in the wall was, the remnant flames marking a scorched area. The alliance simply could not breach the entrance. Wizard players around the world were shocked to see Mediv's abnormal display of power, what was that spell? How can he cast such a powerful spell? 
Everyone had doubts in their minds, as at Tier 1, not a single mage across the game could pull off what he did. The name and face of Mediv was etched into the memory of every wizard player at this point, as someone to watch out for. Rudra nodded at Mediv, and signaled for him to leave, Rudra was pleasantly surprised by his performance as he overdelivered. the casting of this spell was not discussed in the initial plan, however it brought a few extra seconds for the elites to retreat. Being thwarted twice from entering the fort, the alliance members became more desperate than ever in their third try, the archballistes' relentless assault never stopped and the death toll was piling at an insane number by the minute, the fort needed to be breached and it needed to be breached now. Rudra still had three bombs left in his inventory, not counting those that were already set up in the fort for its collapse, if he chose so, he could have used them at this point again to get a death toll at the area of breach, however he chose to save them for emergencies, the situation was under control as of now and the bombs may come in handy later. Thinking so, Rudra finally let go of the javelins and summoned his dual swords. Excalibur in his left hand and elven sword in his right, Rudra was ready for war, and so were the other nine tankers in the guild. The job of the tankers was very difficult, they had to hold of against hundreds of players in a strategic location until thousands of alliance members were inside the vicinity of the fort and to ensure that before they died, they activated the bombs planted on the fort's walls to let it crumble. Fort Knox had seven large vertical pillars supporting its base structure, all being fit with the elite special water bombs. Also a special stash of water bombs was inside basement of the fort, that would be activated by Fatty Kalash after the other seven go off, destroying the entire Fort Knox area. Cola, Tank, Rhino, Armored Snake, Bulletproof, Damage Taker, Thousand Punchman, Shield Bearer, and Line Holder were the nine tankers in the true elites. And their time to shine was now. Hundreds of Alliance members poured in through the open hole, Cola swallowed his saliva seeing the sight, determination in his eyes, he was ready for the fight of his life. Chapter 164, The Greatest Mercenary This is the Country X Air Force, you have entered restricted airspace, please lower your altitude to 20,000 feet and turn around to leave the airspace, you have two minutes to comply, or we will shoot you down. The announcement could be heard in the mercenary plane. There were three people in the cockpit, one was a stunning woman that would make even the saints meditating in Himalayas arouse in excitement. She was wearing a tight leather outfit, supposedly made of high tensile bulletproof material, However the tight outfit just highlighted her perfect figure and showed her curves beautifully. The girl was a sculpted beauty of the highest order, with natural assets that were neither too big, nor too small. A goddess fitting tastes of all men. Here chocolate brown hair and smoky black eyes only enhancing her already perfect face. Her spy name was Skyla, and her real identity was unknown. She was the co-pilot today on this high-paying mission alongside the greatest mercenary of the dark market. Before introducing the greatest mercenary on the dark market, it is important to introduce his lackey. 6 foot 2, 220 pounds, Asian male, brown skin, and lean muscular body. His name was Bo, graduating top of the mercenary training class, he was a once-in-a-lifetime prodigy. Fast, smooth, charming, and deadly, he was the perfect guy for every mission. Currently learning from the best mercenary to ever live, he was very vigilant on this high-paying mission as he watched to absorb every single move the senior made. He was seriously infatuated with Miss Skyla, however he could not show it, as moreover his respect for the greatest mercenary was greater than his infatuation, he kept his focus on that man. The greatest mercenary of all time, was the title this man had on the dark market, after he successfully assassinated the monarch of country F. His epics were legendary about how he learned kung fu from a monastery in China and how he had the most unusual solutions to any given situation. His name was, Johnny English. Born in Country B, he was the idol of many aspiring young mercenaries like Bo, now in his fifties, he was a little off his prime and this was his retirement mission. While the world thought him to be a super genius, the truth was that he was only incredibly lucky, the only thing he had going for himself was his confidence, the heavens helped him as whatever he did ended up being an earth-shattering event. To be honest, he was clueless as to how to execute the monarch of country F, when he took up the assassinating mission it was his first ever mission, he was a complete rookie, whereas many trained international experts had been working on the mission for months now, but were unsuccessful, as he was scouring the capital city, thinking of ways to carry out the mission an annoying falcon took off with his hat, when he was shooting at the falcon that just took off with his hat, his bullet actually hit the monarch of country F right in the nearby building. It turned out that the bulletproof window had been left open through some coincidence. Unaware, English kept chasing the falcon for his hat, 
not knowing he had a ton of men pursuing him, as his attention was on the falcon flying above, he accidentally entered an open manhole and hit his head hard. He was knocked out for eight hours, and by the time he woke up, his name had already spread around the world for being the greatest mercenary alive. Since that day he had earned great respect and standing inside the mercenary community, and carried three mega missions after that, all being huge success. His legacy as the supreme mercenary had been solidified and today was his last mission. Offered big bucks by the tycoon Ethan Gray, he was specially brought out by the agency along with Bo and Skyla. English immediately had a huge crush on Skyla from the moment he saw her, and it helped that she had immense respect for him. Sitting in the captain's position on the cockpit, English was looking at Skyla sneakily, the radio message had scared her, even after all the stealth devices installed in the plane they were still discovered, this mission became infinitely more difficult now. She silently bit her lip. Bo said, Sir, we have been discovered what do we do now? However English was mesmerized by the sight of Skyla biting her lip, he unconsciously pushed the steering to make the plane dip. Zoom. A missile just missed them barely as it blasted 2,000 feet above them. Skyla and Bo were shocked as Bo said, Sir the radar showed nothing, and even in the announcement they said that we had two minutes to comply, how did you know that there will be a non-traceable missile on us? But he couldn't show those thoughts to the other two as he said, once we were discovered there was already no turning back Bo, it's stupid to trust the enemy enough to let us turn back. Bo nodded in understanding, indeed Mr. English was the greatest spy alive, he was nothing compared to him. The mission had taken a turn for the worse, as the Ambani petroleum mining area was still four kilometers out, they needed to survive one more minute to bomb it successfully and then somehow get out of the area unnoticed. Skyla became serious as he took over weapons control, and Bo went to the back, ready to drop the bombs over the mining field when needed, they both were calm despite the ugly situation as they had absolute faith in the men handling the aircraft's control. Johnny English Comment how you feel about the three new characters introduced, and don't worry the S will see us going back to the war arc, before we complete this storyline too. Chapter 165, War, 5 The War Arena, Virtual World Rhino and Cola were the leaders of the tankers division inside the game. And they were the only two who were not assigned to any pillars to blow up, their jobs was to hold the enemy, as much as possible. And it was by no means an easy job at all as currently there were about 20,000 alliance members swarming the fort, with all 10 archers already killed and the archballistes destroyed. Although the number seemed massive, realistically with their backs being covered against a wall, there were only about five to six enemies that could attack them at any given moment, just that even after killing those five or six enemies, other five would replace them at a second's notice, meaning that they needed to face an endless swarm of enemies and hold out for as long as they could. Rudra was also present as he danced his way through hordes and hordes of enemies, elven sword slicing enemies left and right as if they were made of butter. He was not overwhelmed by the massive force, as he slowly but surely retreated towards the southern side of the fort, drawing in as many enemies as he could. Three minutes in, all the tankers were still alive albeit many had already taken close to 50% damage in their HP bar. Kola and Rhino, faring a little better at 65% health. Even Rudra himself found his health chipped a little as he sat on 94% HP, however it didn't bother him, as his goal was started to be realized. In the face of such overwhelming odds, the tanks did not budge a single inch as the elite tankers held their ground strong and proud, defensive skills were used left and right. As their superior armor and shields helped them minimize the damage they took. For minutes in, less than 20% of their HP was remaining, but close to 75,000 had entered the fort, their job was close to completion. However they had not heard the sounds of cannon firing yet, they could not self-explode yet, they needed to hold on a bit more. Beach Boy along with his elite guard finally made it through the wall, as he tried to act heroic as he lead his troops to victory. He looked at the fort, and found a pitifully low amount of elites struggling for their lives, he found nothing odd about it as he thought that majority of them had been slayed, this was a good thing as he would have smelled the trap otherwise. He looked around as he finally found Rudra, and that's where he redirected his guard, towards Rudra. Even Rudra was at the southernmost wall at this point as he was desperately waiting for SMG's cannon fire before he could use blink and get out of the fort. He saw Beach Boy enter the area and instantly he felt panicked, if Beach Boy noticed the lack of elites inside the fort he would understand that something was amiss, however to his delight he seemed clueless. Thank God for stupid people, Rudra thought as he continued his grueling fight against the swarm of soldiers. Pink Lotus also entered the fort soon after Beach Boy, 
and started to skin the area. She looked at the few elite tankers desperately struggling, but found it odd that the other assaulters were not visible. She instantly thought about how the elites had absolutely superior warriors like Neatwit and Karna, and how they would not fall before the tankers, something was amiss here. But before she could voice out her concerts a loud boom. Was heard. Boom. 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 The sound of fifty cannons firing could be heard. Giant cannonballs hit the swarm of players trying to enter the fort, and a few even hit the northern fort wall instantly collapsing the wall, burying many Alliance members. SMG was finally here. The ship was here and the cannons were fired. Rounds were reloaded and within ten seconds, the second volley arrived. The Alliance members turned towards the river to see a massive ship floating downstream, its cannons pointing towards them, the large grey wolf design as its mast. The true elite's flag rising high on the ship. The ship also had four arch ballistae fitted, as swarms of arrows also graced the Alliance members who tried to approach the ship. Scorpio was dumbfounded seeing the size of the ship, as he cursed under his breath, WTF is that thing, why do the elites have it? Was the question on the millions of viewers' minds worldwide, a new variable had suddenly been introduced in the war. Rudra smiled, the timing was perfect, 30 seconds later and the plan would have gotten infinitely more difficult. The tank sighed in relief, they had less than 10% HP remaining, and would have failed to hold out long enough if SMG was any later, but to their joy they carried out their parts beautifully, the guild won't lose the war because the tank division failed its job. They were proud as a big smile plastered their face for the guild. They shouted as the first bomb went off. Boom. Quickly followed by bomb 2 to 7 as the fort started to crumple. Cola and Rhino had a big smile on their faces as the phase 2 had succeeded, their tanks did them proud. Rudra instantly blinked, and teleported to the beach about 40 meters away from the southern wall as Fatty Kalash blew up the entire water bomb's stash in the basement. Boom. A massive explosion that shook the entire war arena occurred, the explosion reaching 30 meters in height. Debris flying into the sky, along with burnt bodies of Alliance members. Scorpio and the other three guild leaders watched in horror as half their army died inside that fort. In a shocking move that Noon saw coming, the elites blew up the fort, burying somewhere north of 85,000 Alliance members. Along with guild leaders Beach Boy and Pink Lotus. Chapter 166, War, 6 There were only 50,000 Alliance members left alive after the fort collapsed. This happened because close to 85,000 Alliance members died with the explosion of the fort. The Archballistes had an kill rate of 150 and about 20 were injured per minute, they ran for close to an hour, and there were 10 such Archballistes, making the total death count under the arrows to be close to 90,000. Also an additional 12,000 had been injured. Also under the assault of Mediv, the bombs, the Archballistes mounted on the pirate ship, the cannons fired, the arrows shot manually by elite guild members, and the members that died under the swords and shields of the tanks, the final death toll came around 25,000 troops. The massive army of 2, 50, 000 had been reduced to 50,000. The collapse of the fort was a masterstroke that Noon saw coming. Around the world, people were stunned by the massive fort blowing up, killing a third of the Alliance army with it. The viewership number of the war became the highest viewed event in the history of Grey Entertainment, as 457 million people were watching the stream live. The streaming service seeing a lifetime high single day subscription count of 120 million new subscribers. Just throughout the duration of the war event. And boy oh boy did it deliver far beyond all expectations, beyond what anyone predicted, the elites were countering all odds to absolutely outmaneuver the alliance, wiping more than 2 to 3 rd of their force. Only about 50,000 members left standing, and to everyone around the world, this was a feat worthy of being labeled as a stroke of brilliant genius and Rudra as a master strategist never seen before. However the creator of the plan, Rudra, had an ugly expression on his face. According to his calculations, only when the number of the Alliance members was brought at under 10,000 was he completely confident of victory, him only expecting 25,000 alive after the fort collapsed, but the 50,000 standing was a bucket of cold water poured on him. About 15,000 of the 50,000 left alive were injured. However many of them were quickly regaining HP under the healing of the priests and basic HP regeneration potions. Even the elites had losses on their sides, close to 100 elites were dead, these included the 9 tanks, 10 archers, and about 80 lifestyle players. While it never came to it. 
but Rudra assigned the entire lifestyle division, after building the wall and mounting the archballistes. To go to the basement where the bombs were located and protect it with their lives. While rest of the combat troops escaped to the south beach using the secret passage, the lifestyle guild stayed. They built a wall after the last player Mediv crossed the passage to the beach and stayed in the basement to guard it at all costs. Should even a single player breach the area, they were given explicit orders by Rudra to blow the structure up. While many label the lifestyle professions weak and useless in combat. It was not the case in the true elites, in this guild where everyone matters, even the lifestyle members contribute to the guild's strength, ready to die before letting the enemy pass. Fatty Kalash had indeed raised a batch of loyal and guild-centric players just like himself. Hence the odds now shifted from being overwhelmingly outnumbered to being massively outnumbered. While the world watched the nail-biting war event, the Alliance camp had a devastatingly low morale. What was supposed to be an easy war became a nightmare for them. Time and time again they found out that the elites were five steps ahead of them the whole time. Scorpio started to quake in his boots, goosebumps all over his skin. He was scared, scared to lose th war. He lacked the spine of being a leader as he could not give a single command to his remnant army because of the sheer fear of walking into another trap set up by the elites. What if he sent the troops charging only for the beach in front to actually be a minefield? What if suddenly aircraft started to appear and nuke his army? His mind ran crazy scenarios that were impossible to happen. However the elites did the impossible time and time again. Nothing was certain dealing with them. Should he lose this war, he would lose everything. The fear of losing everything was so great in Scorpio's heart that he could not think of any good counterattack as a leader. Not only him, the other three guild leaders were not faring much better. The members kept asking the command center for the next command, but the command center was deathly silent. Unbeknownst to them, the situation was similarly grim even on the elite side, as the guild members understood that the enemy numbers were far more than what phase three could execute. They turned to their almighty guild leader for the next command. This is where Rudra showed his true class as a master strategist, as while not everything was going to plan, he still had his men, and he still had a chance to grasp victory. It was foolish to charge into the 50,000 strong army without any real plan to duke it out men to men. The pirate ship had already sailed down river and into the ocean, and it was impossible to row it back upstream towards the battle arena. Unless the alliance members charged towards the ship, the archballistes and cannons were useless. A deadlock ensued as none of the parties made a move while regrouping. It was at this moment that the impromptu phase 4 started a result of the reincarnation knowledge, Rudra said. Shout out to Madison Hillbach Memorial and Eam Crystal for the 500 coin gifts. To Mystic Genius for the 1000 coin gift. Chapter 167, War, 7. Rudra had a strategy to win the war, however it was a very risky strategy. In his previous life, this strategy was used by a group of 100 solo adventurers to fight against an horde of 3,000 men. The strategy was later called the Bow and Trishal strategy, which was infamous because of how often it failed horrendously. The entire Bow and Trishal strategy is based on the three Trishal heads, the three heads must have absolutely strongest players holding the position as when any one of the three Trishal heads collapse the formation would become worthless. The bow in the bow and trishal formation referred to the long-range attackers or in this case the pirate ship docked 25 meters off the coast loaded with 50 cannons and two archballistes. When the enemy was in range, they would find themselves with a barrage of aerial attacks that would leave them without an answer. Also the remaining wizards who stood right at the edge of the beach also made up part of the bow unit. The aswalters made up the trishal unit, three single lines of soldiers made up the trishal formation, advancing and retreating as a single unit. The distance between two lines was two meters, and the distance between those standing back to back within the same line was one meter. The idea of using the formation was to force the opposition to break their ranks and attack in undefined files. Once an attacker slips past the Trishal's head, it can instantly be dealt by player two behind him, or player three. Four. Five. Six. The formation only worked if the tips of the Trishal worked perfectly and in sync with each other. The entire idea of the Trishal formation was to attack strategically and make the enemy bleed, while gaining a steady retreat to recuperate from injuries, should the enemy give chase, they would find themselves under a barrage from the bow formation. With the promise of safe retreat, all they needed to do was relentlessly push and retreat while dwindling enemy numbers. 
The creator of this formation was a god in Indian mythology who was deemed as the god of war because of his outstanding achievements in the battlefield. And now Rudra chose to use it, making neat with the rightmost tip, himself being the most important central tip and Karna being the left tip. He explained his plan to the guild, as the members gave their complete support to the idea. While the general plan was to attack and retreat, there was an underlying scheme hidden within this battle strategy, and that was Rudra's masterstroke and his great equalizer. A trap within a trap, that if executed correctly would lead to the Alliance's downfall. Meanwhile at the Alliance's side of the camp. Scorpio had regained a little bit of peace of mind after he calmly assessed the war situation. They still had 50,000 people left in their corner. Although losing 200,000 men was a tough blow to take, they still outnumbered the elites by a huge margin. Agreed they had the weird pirate ship off the coast, mounted with the despicable arrow shooting machine. However there was a limit to what it could do with such a huge distance. Also the lack of the elites taking any actions made him believe that they too were maybe out of cards, and that they can still win the war easy. The world was watching the war develop, and the five-minute break before the climax only hyped up the audience more than they were already. Both the elites and the alliance troops saw restructuring in formation, and seemed like a clash was imminent. Victory or defeat. It all depended on how well could Rudra lay the trap. Meanwhile, the Ambani Corporation, real world. The secretary was quaking in his boots as he saw the seething Mithun Ambani. Mithun Ambani was in a horrible mood ever since the twins took board seats in the company. Profits and sales had already seen a steep decline after the series of firings of crucial employees. However the alliance where he pumped so much time money and effort into was also currently thoroughly underperforming. Mithun Ambani was absolutely furious, he knew about the massive amount that Ethan Gray bet on the elites. He was desperately hoping for his money to go down the drain. But seeing the elites' performance so far, he was scared that Ethan might just make it big. He was in a bad mood, however the secretary had an even worse news for him. A recent urgent report came in, informing him that the restricted airspace near his petroleum mine field had been infiltrated by an unknown aircraft and all efforts to bring it down up till now had been unsuccessful. Mithun Ambani froze. If something were to happen to his petroleum mine. No. The very thought made his soul quake in fear. He looked up towards the heavens as he said, so you finally decide to punish me huh? He hurriedly left watching the live stream as the petroleum field was a much much more pressing matter. Now hopefully the joint protection of country ex-military and hired mercenaries should be enough to thwart the trouble. Or else. Chapter 168, War, 8. The elites reorganized themselves into the Trishal Formation, and started a slow march towards the enemy camp. Even after having a huge numerical superiority, the Alliance was the one who adopted the cautious attitude of wait and see, as they adopted a tight defensive formation to meet the elites. The scene was worth seeing, when seen from an aerial view it appeared as if a huge Trishal, trident, was piercing through a sea of men but the peculiarity of the scene lied in the three leaders. Starting from the right tip of the trident there was Karna, who had currently equipped three swords, the third one being in his mouth, him finally revealing the special skill he picked up from the endless ocean dungeon. He had an cool and calming attitude around him that calmed the anxious assaulters behind him, he was as steady as Mount Tai, ready for everything that the enemy could throw at him. In the center point of the trident was the unfathomable guild leader Shikuni. He was the guild's heart and soul through and through. The guild members had immense faith in him and his abilities and would never hesitate to rally under his command. In the left point of the trident, leading the charge was the leveling freak, Neatwit, a fearsome sword in his hand, glowing with black runes, it caused anyone who saw it to cower in fear. And behind these three monster of players were the equally talented assaulters and assassins of the true elites. Each elite was the cream of the crop in terms of talent, and easily rivaled five normal players under normal conditions, however with having superior equipment and skill tomes as well as the support of the best potions available on the market to quickly replenish lost health and stamina, the whole game changed. When only about 20 meters were left between the elites and the enemy lines, Rudra made his first move. He used the Lifestyle Guild's latest product that they produced Kurtse even collaboration between the potion makers and alchemists, the Mist Potion. Five bottles of haze potions were broken and within seconds in an entire two-kilometer radius, thick fog covered the area. Nobody could see more than a meter in front of them. This is why Rudra placed the soldiers in line back to back about one meter from each other, because that was the visibility range. 
Panicked shouts could be heard from the Alliance army. As they kept shouting to make sure that the army was okay. Curses could be heard everywhere as the Alliance troops complained. Between those screams, the screams of Scorpio could be heard, is everyone okay? Rudra chuckled for a bit, before he took out the spike bomb and roughly threw it between the enemy lines. Boom. A loud explosion was heard, as screams came out from the Alliance players. The screams made the other Alliance members even more anxious as they did not understand what was going on. I, 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 TF is going on here huh? I heard screams, is everyone okay? Scorpio shouted. Scorpio was dumbfounded by the remark, as the psychological game started to work on the Alliance members, the fear of unknown thoroughly gripping them. Rudra nodded for the assassins to break formation and go, this was their chance. As he and the rest of the assault squad, also charged in towards the enemy lines. The clash was on, due to low visibility the Alliance members had clubbed closer together, which left large patches of no players in the overall formation, completely crumpling its defensive capabilities. The Trident made their way carefully through enemy lines as a tough fight presented itself before the elites. Rudra, Karna and Neatwood had to take on about five to six players simultaneously at the head of the attack, which reduced to two to three for those behind him, while after member four in the queue, there were only stragglers to deal with. Karna's triple wielding gave him an insane edge over handling the multiple opponents, his ability to block three simultaneous sword strikes made it difficult for the opponents to chip damage him, as his brute strength and epic rated sword dealt high damage to his enemies. Karna also had his biggest advantage in his mind's eyes, while everyone else saw blurry images of their opponents. He just closed his eyes to see their every move, every feint, every muscle movement. Thank God for the fog, making it difficult to make out that his eyes were closed, or else his way of fighting would have caused unstoppable waves through the forums. However even this did not mean he was invincible, slowly but surely he was accumulating damage. Rudra was faring a little worse than Karna, as not being able to see clearly while fighting multiple opponents reduced his efficiency by a little. He was still more than holding his ground, but the chip damage he was taking was a little more than what he usually would. Neatwit was faring the worst of the three trident points, while his sword was fearsome, his overall skill though better than the average player. Was not as refined as Karna or Rudra's. He was a player in his growth phase as every battle was a learning experience that made him better. Even though he had lost 30% of his total HP, he was starting to adapt to the fighting style as he was taking lesser and lesser damage. The ones who were faring the best however were the assassins from the elites. They ran wild in the battlefield, with already low overall vision their stealth stat made them almost invisible to naked eye, as suddenly an alliance member would drop dead after experiencing cutthroat. The assassins were the rulers of the battlefield currently advancing and retreating out of nowhere. Even the highly protected guild leader of True Manchester, De Bruyne found himself killed by an assassin. The assassin also died, unable to escape the guards guarding De Bruyne once found out. However he died with a smile knowing that the trade-off was worth it. The world watched in excitement as the enveloping of the fog and the occasional screams of the dying alliance members made them extremely curious as to what was going on. In about 20 minutes of intense battle in the fog, about 50 elites and 5,000 alliance members had died. The bait had been set, now Rudra had to reel the big fish in for the kill. Chapter 169, War, 9 The mist potions were starting to lose effect as little by little the haze was starting to clear out. The elites were slowly but surely starting to be pushed back, or so they made it seem. The elites had a battered look on their faces, and with more than 45,000 alliance members still standing, they were in an overall disadvantage. Most of the standing elites were at 50% HP or less, with only some players and assassins being above 70%, but that was because they did not engage in grueling combat. When the fog started to clear, the assassins started to lose their edge as more and more of them were caught and killed. It seemed that the elites were out of tricks and that the tides of war were turning. Scorpio saw a glimmer of hope, as he ordered the troops to start pressing on the elites. Being pushed at a greater speed, the elites had difficulty retreating safely, the veil of the fog now clear enough to see 20 meters. More and more elites fell, as the enemy started to attack the tripod formation from the sides, the two files under Karna and Neatwood suffered heavy causalities, Rudra's middle file was mostly intact, but they were under a lot of pressure. The tripod started to compress as the initial distance of one meter between members was reduced to half. Scorpio was delighted to see the elites dying one after the other. 
his army's numeric superiority coming to full play. Scorpio became exited as he ordered a full charge from the army, the elites looked as if they had no option left as they broke formation to desperately retreat. It was at this moment that guild leader Fernandez of original Manchester had a bad premonition in his gut. It seemed too easy, they seemed to be forgetting something. And indeed forgetting they were, suddenly a wave of spells hit their front line. Boom, boom, boom. Fireballs rained from the air. The elite's wizard unit had started to take action. The fog cleared completely and the Alliance army had a view of what they were missing. They did not understand how in the dense fog they had little by little moved towards the ocean as they now realized that they were far too close. In their last moments where they had charged at the elites desperate to crumple them completely, they had covered close to 50 meters in ground and now they were under the range of the ship's archballistes. When a rain of arrows started to pour on the army, it was at that moment that they realized their mistake. Rain of arrows started to pierce the enemy as they scrambled in retreat, but boy oh boy how could Rudra let that happen. He quickly took out the poison mist potions and threw them deep inside the enemy lines. There was a dense layer of potion mist that broke out in the enemy's retreat path, as they were left with no safe path to retreat. For a moment there the army was utterly confused in what to do, the moment they breathed the potion they felt weak and nauseated, but the loss of HP wasn't too much. However the arrows of the elites were deadly. It was at this moment that Rudra also threw the paralysis most potions into enemy lines, and coupled with the wide area covered by poison mist, the 40% movement debuff of the paralysis mist had a deadly effect. Not having the courage left to cross the area of poison plus paralysis mist, the alliance members were left like lambs to slaughter. Some tried to cross the area, some tried to turn around and attack the elites, however most were undecided and under constant shower of arrows. The eyes of the elites changed from praise to hunters as those who tried to turn to attack them were slaughtered mercilessly. It was a tactical nightmare for the alliance, the wizards kept downing advanced mana potions and kept up the relentless assault of AoE spells. Most injured elites got a breather and used advanced healing potions to regain lost HP. Mediv even forked out another sea of fire, his last one possible, to lay rest to a lot of alliance members. The assassins and the wizard division of the true elites had lived up to their name, as they shined bright in this section of the war. The might of a wizard under a constant stream of mana was terrifying, however the elites were an exception for having such an endless stream of potions for each of their wizards. By the time the poison mist cleared and a few stragglers were able to retreat. The standing army of 45,000 was cut down to 9,247 members.3590 of them injured and under 50% HP. To the elites having 127 members 17 on the ship and 110 on the battlefield. Excluding the 10 wizards. There were 40 assaulters and 60 assassins on the battlefield. It was at this moment that Rudra finally shifted from being the strategist to being the absolute incarnation of God of War, this was the number he was confident in dealing with. It was time to duke it out men to men. In a scene that will be remained forever etched in the memories of everyone watching worldwide forever, 110 elites charged at the retreating alliance army of 9,247 to reap their lives. I am humbled by the support, the Power Stone Department has commanded fourth bonus from me in seven days this week. We are very close to the golden ticket target as well. The we'll see the conclusion of the war. Sue so hopefully we hit it today itself. Chapter 170, Rudra Unleashed, War 10 A wave of emotions were surging throughout the war in Rudra's mind. Although he is proud to say that every single elite played their role and delivered what he asked from them, it was finally him who was at the center of every single phase, responsible for every single move. Whether the guild won or lost, he was the one it affected the most, to the others the elites may lose, they lose money, maybe some respect and some treasures. But for Rudra, once the lost he would lose his dream. His dream to make the strongest guild and himself becoming the strongest guild master. In his first life he could not do it, however rebirthed he would not let the second chance go away. All this time he was the responsible guild master, who only took calculated risks and ensured that the guild survived first. However when the number of alliance members left alive dwindled under the 10,000 mark, he finally saw his opportunity to run wild. Why only after the enemy odds became under 10,000? Why did he wait so much? It was because that he was now confident that the 10,000 members could never take down that behemoth called the pirate ship and the 17 members headed by SMG ever. Even if every single one of his guild members on land, now died, the elites could not lose the war. 
Not everyone realizes it however once the Alliance army of 45,000 hit the ocean floor and started to swim towards the pirate ship, there was only so much damage the arrows and cannons could do to 45,000 players underwater. Even if 70% of them are shot down it would still be thousands of members boarding the pirate ship of 17 and attacking it. Victory was not certain. But with less than 9,247 men, that Rudra and the assaulters would definitely thin out to even lower numbers, he was sure that the ship could no longer be taken down and that victory was bagged. Every single member followed his charge, the 100 combat troops and even the 10 wizards charged towards the retreating alliance army. For anyone who was not familiar with the war scene and who switched on the television just now, this scene would look ridiculous, but to those who were watching this since a long time, their blood pumped at how the tables had turned. Rudra close to the enemy lines, leaped in the air and landed in the middle of the enemy lines with a strong skill earthquake. Boom. The ground shook upon impact when the elven sword came in contact with the ground. The shockwaves knocking everyone around him down. Slash. 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 Before they even had chance to regain their posture, six Alliance members were dead just like that. The surrounding Alliance members looked at Rudra in fear, and rightly so as at that moment when they looked in his eyes, they didn't see a human. They saw the goddamn demon of Death Valley and he was unleashed. Up till this point Rudra had not used a single of his skill in combat, however it all changed now. Skill after skill was used as for the first time since getting the skill for a long time, Rudra used Berserk. Rudra's strength experienced an explosive increase as he became a one-man slaughter machine, running through opposition as if they were dirt. Every single one of the elites was doing well, as they fought the enemies through zeal and grit. Neatwit and Karna standing out the most as even they were walking massacre machines. However Rudra was just on another level currently, as he was literally unparalleled in the battlefield. Nobody could even touch him. Rudra was weaving such powerful yet nimble moves, it was almost as if he was performing a dance. A dance of death. As countless enemies were teleported out of the battlefield under his sword. Unbeknownst to Rudra, who had already entered the zone of absolute focus. The elven sword had started to buzz in his hands. It grew hot and there seemed to be a qualitative change in the blade. The original silver appearance of the blade began to change towards a faint white glow, as a system notification brought Rudra's attention to what was occurring. System notification, the elven sword has recognized your skill as a swordsman worthy of using its power. It has recognized you as its master. The sword's full features are now available to you. The elven sword had recognized Rudra. Elven sword, semi-legendary, a sword of the highest grade made by the elves, it is light and contains an inbuilt power to fight creatures of darkness, inscribed with the finest runes it contains a sword heart and will only show its true potential when it chooses a master. Current chosen master, Shikuni One Knight. Effect 1, can damage all darkness-aligned monsters including formless monsters like ghosts and spirits. Effect 2, 10,000 cuts, use the sword to unleash a terrifying 10,000 cuts on one enemy, or a cut on 10,000 enemies. Effect 3, World Slash, Skill, one of the ultimate skills of the Elven Sword, unleash one slash that contains 400% your max power. Effect 4. Upgrade to Legendary Grade to Unlock. Restriction 1, Righteous Faction. Restriction 2, Knight Class. Rudra was pleasantly surprised to see the insanely overpowered skills that came with the sword acknowledging him as its master, as he tested the skill 10,000 cuts. The air suddenly changed around him as countless wind blades started to appear. 10, 500, 1000, 10, 000, 000, 000 blades appeared, looking like 10,000 elven swords, and with a move of Rudra's arm descended on the Alliance army. To the millions watching worldwide this was an earth-shattering moment as Rudra showed a skill far beyond what any knight or swordsman in the game could do. It was a sword skill that had a deadly AoE effect. Every single Alliance member alive felt the strike, and many who had low HP were tipped over the death line as they were killed by the move. However to their worst nightmare Rudra did not stop even after the move, as like a grim reaper who did not rest, he kept running through enemy lines, and somehow he had became even more fierce. After Elven Sword recognized Rudra as its master, it was lighter and easier to maneuver, also the damage had increased by more than two times, if previously using it was like cutting through butter, now it felt like swinging it in air. 
with the full capabilities of a semi-legendary weapon he was a warged incarnation on the battlefield. Scorpio was deep in despair as he tried to somehow turn the tides around, the three elites, Rudra, Karna, and Neatwit were absolutely decimating his army. Scorpio shouted towards his army pointing at Rudra saying, stop him. However that was the worst mistake he could have made. His shout brought Rudra's attention to him, as the demon's gaze met with his. Scorpio felt goosebumps all over his body, and somehow his throat went dry and his legs went limp when Rudra looked at him. Rudra pointed his sword towards Scorpio and a small lightning sparked in his eyes as he used his skill thunderblast. Boom. A huge bolt of lightning hit Scorpio who was immediately sent to the afterlife. The Alliance army leader was dead. Dead under a single attack from Rudra. Millions of viewers worldwide were shocked, first the 10,000 swords and now the lightning blast. What was up with the insane skills of the true elite's guild master? The only standing alliance guild leader left was the guild leader of musicians in true rhythm. However, his charisma was not enough to command the alliance army, as every soldier started to act according to their own wits. The elite side were not without its losses, the ten wizards and fifty-two of the sixty assassins were dead. Along with twenty-two assaulters. Eighty-eight of the one hundred and ten members on the land were dead, leaving only twenty-two members alive. Except Karna, Rudra, and Neatwit, the others were left with under thirty percent HP, as the battle against so many alliance members was taxing at their health. However the three slaughter machines were unstoppable as they left carnage on the alliance army wherever they went. Very soon, Karna killed the last standing alliance guild leader True Rhythm, as the alliance army was left without a leader. It was only a matter of time before the rest of the alliance army crumpled after that, as ten minutes later only one hundred alliance members were left standing against three true elites. Karna and Neatwit were panting heavily both having less than ten percent HP, however there stood Rudra as calm as Mount Tai with them, his breathing easy and his HP over sixty percent, as he looked coldly towards the remaining enemies. The three had a combined kill count of 6,200 alliance members in the last charge with Rudra alone killing over 3,700 and the other two sharing the remaining kill count. Even though their kill counts were beyond monstrous, they were not in the same realm as Rudia. The two of them realized the beast that the guild master was in this phase of the exchange, as the difference in their skills was openly evident. They had immense fear and respect for him at the same time. When they looked into the cold eyes of the guild master, they realized that they would never want to be on the other side of these eyes. Victory was in sight, the impossible was almost made possible. Neatwit and Karna could feel the impending victory in their blood, as they were eager to rush into the remaining enemy lines. They were only waiting for Rudra to give the last command. It was at this moment that Rudra gave his real war speech that he didn't want to give at the start of the war, he said to the millions watching worldwide, let this serve as the warning to you, the elites are the best guild out there, no matter what you throw at us, no matter how few we are, go against us and you will be crushed. Each and every elite is worth a thousand of your troop, however like those who perish today, if you are foolish enough to cross paths with us, then. Rudra used his ultimate move, he used the world slash, as a terrifyingly powerful slash that could slash mountains in half was released. One hundred men were slayed through critical hits all at once without even a single chance to counter. As the outcome that Noon expected in their wildest dreams became a reality. System Notification, The Winners of This War The True Elites Guild Congratulations to the winners. It was the longest battle sequence I have written yet, and a lot of planning went into it, and the positive response has been gratifying. I thoroughly loved writing the arc and hope you guys did too. Cheers guys, congratulations to everyone on the Elites win. Chapter 171, Aftermath The Elites had won. Being outnumbered 500 to 1 they still managed to topple the alliance, and this event had shook the entire population playing the game, it was the hottest and most wildly discussed topic worldwide and had taken everybody by storm. The first and the biggest ramification of loosing the war for the alliance was surrendering 90% of their guild's resources to the true elites. Along with 100,000 members that would serve the guild for three years as war indemnity. Although the elites were rich, 90% of the wealth from six first-rate guilds was still a huge amount. The guild received close to 700 million gold in assets. Although a large part of it was in form of items and precious materials. It was still a huge amount. Rudra after spending money like crazy acquiring lots of properties in the city. Left the guild's finances in a little bit of cash flow crunch. 
However with this new influx they were again the titans of the city filled with overflowing wealth. Also, apparently Ethan Gray, happy with the performance of every single elite, gifted each guild member a sum of $10 million in performance bonus. Spending $5.5 billion in bonuses. The guild members were naturally overjoyed by the income as their impression of Ethan Gray improved immensely. However Rudra knew that the men had earned a whopping $3.2 trillion this time from the war. $5 billion was not even a drop in the bucket to him. Ethan Gray was naturally overjoyed by the outcome, as he showered Rudra's house with presents and expensive items. Knowing Rudra he knew that his direct offer for money would be rejected, hence he sent gifts to Mr. and Mrs. Rajput and Little Max, so that Rudra had no choice but accept it. After the war, Rudra decided to just spend a good day away from the game and with family, as he hoped to recover from the mental fatigue. However a lot happened in the game in the 15 hours he didn't log in. The forums had erupted, the clips of key scenes of the war had already gone viral, some getting even 1 billion views. Rudra was named as the master strategist, and countless experts who analyzed the war showered him with praise in devising such ingenious strategy. There were naturally a lot of hate circulating regarding the alliance, as the world deemed them as trash. 250,000 men could not topple 600. What kind of a joke was that? Naturally all those who bet money on them winning lost big time. And those who bet on the elite struck gold. However those who lost their money had only two places to vent their frustration. One was the forums, where they absolutely slandered the hell out of the alliance and the second was the news and media channels that predicted a confident alliance win. The expert who had just barely regained his hair, had watched the war with a pale expression on his face. When the fort blew up and half of the Alliance army was taken along with the explosion, he had a really bad feeling. He touched his precious hair, he realized he may not be able to touch it anymore. He was cowering in his boots when he had to go live, but as he was under the company's contract, he had no choice but to go live. He could not even speak a single word as just as his face popped up, the text channel was written with all sorts of profanities and insults. Why do you still have hair? Shave it now. I lost $2,000 because of you, I will never forgive you Baldy. The live telecast went even more downhill for the expert when the news announcer decided to absolutely humiliate him live. The announcer asked, Sir, how does it feel to have made such a gross mistake in analyzing the true elite's strength? The expert had a dark look on his face, he was furious inside, but he had no words left to refute, the elite's winning was nearly impossible, he was not giving false advices, what the elites pulled off was simply out of this world. However such excuses won't work. He said, no one could have predicted that the war would progress this way. The common people became furious, as the insults became even more profane. That's what they pay you for, Baldi. What's the point of you being an expert, if you can't predict it? Die you at hashtag and pound and. The announcer also didn't let him off as she asked, then what's your credentials as a gaming expert if you can't predict it, aren't you just a senile old man pretending to be wise? The insult destroyed the expert's morale, he wanted to weep but tears wouldn't come, he was not wrong in his prediction, however no one was patient enough to understand that, also it was his own fault for underestimating the elites. That guild wasn't the average Joe, it lived up to its name. Then on live TV, he was shaved clean off his hair, and even had his eyebrows waxed. The already slightly obese man looked like a big potato without any facial hair. Ugly potato. Ugly bald potato. Trash and stale bald potato. Idiot bald potato. It was safe to say that the expert had the worst day of his life today. Another event that happened worldwide was that, the true elites were stopped being classified as a first-rate guild or small guild or whatever power level the people associated them with. They were simply an anomaly in everyone's books, when it came to the elites, no common sense applied and there were no rules. Their strength was placed at comparable to first-rate guilds, however they were considered a wildcard group. And many wanted to befriend this group, especially for their technologies, the elite's lifestyle had caught the eye of everyone worldwide. The presence of the reinforced wall technology to the deadly archballistes, the pirate ship, the cannons, the weird alchemic products, the world wanted those secrets. Everyone wanted to build a trading and working relationship with the elites. Presents were showered every day in their guild hall, from guilds even across the continents. Rudra ignored most of them, but the presents from the super guilds could not be ignored, each being unique and very valuable. The super guilds had taken notice of the elites. 
while it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It wasn't good either, Rudra knew that it was still very premature for him to even think about the super guilds. However one super guild had been affected greatly by this war, and that was the super guild backed by Mithun Ambani. The reveal of his name and affiliation to the alliance had brewed an unstoppable storm. The world was hungry for such gossip, and Bonnie had a huge frown on his face when the assured victory plan of the alliance to crush the elites failed so miserably. However little did he know that his bad day was about to get a whole lot worse. The targets for this month are the same as the previous one. Chapter 172, Aftermath, 2 The true elites guild hall was filled with energy and enthusiasm. They did it. They actually did it. The atmosphere was as lively as it could be as everyone complimented each other on a job well done. The departments all saw each other's heroic moments on replay and teased each other on their job well done. The most famous of them all was Mediv, his sea of fire earned him the title of Inferno Mage, as everyone would bow wherever he went as a joke. Neatwit was also for the first time in a rare occasion present for the festivities and not off leveling, as he and his sister Naomi enjoyed the lively atmosphere. To the duo who always lived a secluded and hidden life, the guild's atmosphere was heartwarming, and somehow it felt like home. Naomi had no combat prowess being a priest, she was as weak as the lot came, as she and the other priests hardly had any role in the war, as they were quickly evacuated to the ship with SMG. Even still she was welcomed everywhere she went as the elites had absolutely no discrimination amongst members. Everyone being worthy of joining the guild was the best of the best, and deserved respect. It was at this point, that two men slowly entered the guild hall, everyone turned their heads to see them, and immediately the crowd broke out in cheers. It was the guild master and vice guild master. Rudra and Karna walked in each having a shoulder draped over the other. In a brotherly display of affection. Rudra took the stage as he looked across the room, even through all the coursing excitement, the room instantly became quiet, the guild leader was about to speak. Cheers broke out in the room. Poison Toad Gamakichi shouted, That's right, boss, we crushed them. More cheers were heard in the room. Rudra raised his hand and silence ensued. He said, As winners, we have earned the right to celebrate, today we have gained gold. Cheers. We have earned fame. More cheers. And we have got 100,000 Alliance members to work under US. Deafening cheers broke out in the room. Oh, 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 yes, starting today we have true elite service guild established, where we have gained 100,000 subordinates. They will have no choice but to carry out our explicit orders for the duration of the contract. Those who pointed their swords at us yesterday will now clean our feet, let me be clear here ladies and gentlemen. We elites have a baseline, that we will not humiliate them, demoralize them, or abuse our power over them, however except that, we shall work them to the bone. The true elite's farming program will be initiated where every elite who is not farming EXP will have a team of alliance members doing it for them, you shall join the party and do your chores, while they shall do the farming. Want to hang out in the guild? While they farm EXP? Why not, want to go shopping in the market while they farm EXP? Why not? They dared to mess with us. Now they shall pay. Rudra voiced his thoughts out loud, and although it was very unfair terms to the Alliance members, beggars can't be choosers can they? The Alliance was officially crumpled, 100,000 members went under Rudra, 100,000 members were under military service for the Empire. The remaining members either quit the guild or became rogue under the payroll. The once glorious accumulation of seven first-rate guilds in Hazelgroove Kingdom was reduced to such a pitiful state after messing with the elites. The elite's prestige was set in stone after the war as they were named the unofficial number one guild of the kingdom. Although there were other first-rate guilds in other cities left, the elites defeating six of them at once made them the number one overall. Purple Haze City became very chaotic after the downfall of the six first-rate guilds as second-rate guilds seized the opportunity to promote themselves to first-rate guilds and grow. The areas dominated in the outer district by alliance players were now changed owners, as second and third rate guilds divided it amongst themselves. Another big event that became a hot topic recently was that the guild leader of Azure Lotus Guild dissolved the guild and joined the true elites following the fall of alliance. She along with core members Green Lotus, Blue Lotus, Yellow Lotus, Red Lotus and White Lotus all became true elites. While Rudra gave them permission to join the guild. Their main role was to become a bridge between the service guild and the main guild. 
Rudra only brought them in in a management capacity and would not take them on dungeon runs or leveling. It was only because of Yua that he let them join anyway. Daily visits from various guildmasters and major corporations became a routine at the elite's guild hall, as everyone hoped for a cooperation. Rudra though entertained them all, accepted none of the offers. He had no intention of selling any of his technologies to anyone. However what he did do was cleverly reaching agreements on selling potions at 50% the market price. This deal exited many guilds which extended olive branches to Rudra and the elites. Should they know that the elites actually use the chalice of purity to just upgrade the basic potions to advanced ones of highest grade? They would vomit blood realizing the profit margin they made. However they were unaware, hence mistook Rudra's business move as a way to make friends with genuine intentions. The days started to pass quickly as the war slowly started to fade out from people's memories, and new events took up the forums. Though not as busy as before the war, Rudra already started laying the foundation for the next mission, which was to become the overlords of Purple Haze City. Chapter 173, Johnny English Strikes Again There were seven homing missiles currently inbound for the aircraft that Johnny and crew were in. Skyla deployed the flares to redirect the heatseekers and four of the seven heatseekers missed the mark. Johnny was terrified inside, the sound of missiles exploding made him want to wet his pants. However in the Himalayas, he had learned about a technique to numb his senses, also repeated kicks to his manhood had made his control over the bladder at superhuman levels. Johnny used the technique as he hit pressure points in his arms to numb himself, he lost 70 of his motor nerve coordination at that point, as only his brain functioned at full capacity. Johnny leaned back in his seat and relaxed. His arms pulling the steering causing the aircraft to move upwards towards space. The aircraft was quickly gaining altitude and alarms started to ring in the cockpit. Skyla and Bo were buckled up for impending impact however an unexpected event occurred. As the aircraft gained altitude it became frosted due to the drop in temperature. At very high altitudes where the oxygen levels were very low, the jet lost its fuel for combustion as the engine stopped. The acceleration of the jet stopped at that point, and its speed started to reduce. Bo thought that's it we are done, however to their surprise, the missiles suddenly changed course and attacked each other rather than the jet. This was because the jet lost its heat signature with the freeze of the space, but the missiles were still hot. They averted danger and started a free fall. English was not as worried about going up, however, going down he had a weird feeling in his stomach, he felt like kids fell on swings, a ticklish feeling in the stomach, that makes you laugh. While Bo and Skyla were worried for their lives, English was laughing through the crisis. He put both his arms on his stomach as he could not stop laughing. After a while his eyes became teary and he could not see anything. Trying desperately to get hold of the steering, he accidentally pressed the buttons on it. The aircraft's flaps opened and their speed of descent reduced, the ship turned from a block of ice to a ball of fire within two minutes. The flaps broke away under the intense heat and air resistance, however, the engine heated up again. When English pressed the ignition, the engine roared back to life and plunged the plane into an even faster descent. This was a blessing in disguise as about 20 missiles were headed their way and only missed because English suddenly accelerated. However, they were hot on his tail now. English had been feeling ticklish in his stomach for a long time now, and because of it, he felt like he wanted to take a dump. However he could not do it in this aircraft with Skyla and Bo watching, neither could he let himself sh asterisk asterisk his pants. Hence clenching his stomach muscles, he pulled the steering towards himself with all might. The plane stabilized about 20 feet above shockingly the Ambani oil field, and the heat seekers came crashing in towards the minefield. Boom. 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 The petroleum mine was bombarded with missiles, the petroleum line catching fire and causing an even larger chain explosion. Boom. The petroleum mine exploded to smithereens as English's plane maneuvered through all the explosions. Bo and Skyla were sick and started to vomit because of the turbulent flight. However, they were shocked at how amazingly well English handled the mission, his insight his strategy his execution everything was flawless. Bo was awestruck by English, he looked with shiny eyes towards English, this is what he aspired to be. Skyla wiped her mouth as she said, that was dangerous English. But Johnny English just laughed as he said, I laugh in the face of danger. Bo and Skyla were awestruck by the image of Johnny laughing as they recalled him laughing when they experienced freefall. In that dangerous situation where they feared their lives, English laughed as he completed the mission. Their mission was indeed completed and by English alone at that, 
They were nothing more than useless bystanders as English did everything, however not once did English mention that fact, he just looked calm and cool through it all. Skyla and Bo realized at that moment that this was English's retirement mission and that he would leave the mercenary world after this. Although it was their first mission with him, they realized his worth. And the quality he brought to the table. He was the greatest mercenary there was, and having him on the team made any mission possible. Johnny himself was feeling overwhelmed as while he looked serene and calm on the outside, inside he was just thanking God for saving his life. He had already said his last prayers when the flaps broke off, he remembered his guru in the Himalayas the senile old man who would kick his balls. The brothers with whom he would pull rocks tied to his manhood. The bald monks with whom he would spar with and get beat up every day. He bid them all farewell in his mind. But somehow he survived. His numbing method helped him maintain a calm expression that hid his overwhelmed expression. However, he was very overwhelmed in reality. The mission was completed and the crew safely flew away in stealth. However, the aftermath of their actions was earth-shattering. Ethan Gray and Mithun Ambani both received news of the incident. While one was on cloud nine, the other was shocked into depression. The aftermath of Johnny English's actions was sure to be widespread. The news that Johnny completed his final mission successfully spread. And his name as the greatest mercenary was solidified. The entire mercenary school held a party for its most successful alumni, completing his last mission, as they proudly presented him as a part of their school. For anyone willing to give the book a reread that will help, also please feel free to point out any mistakes left in the draft. Have installed a new app for Grammar 2 hence you will find improved story quality going forward. Chapter 174, Terrifying Ethan Gray World news quickly covered the shocking explosion of the Ambani Petroleum Mine. As the stock market of Country X suffered a crash the following day. There was no question about it, Mithun Ambani single-handedly drove close to 30% of the country's economy, directly or indirectly. The country was completely dependent on the Ambani Corporation to provide for petrol, diesel and other petroleum products and the explosion of the entire mine saw the prices of petrol skyrocket as there was a huge demand to a non-existent supply. Riots broke out on the country's streets as the military had to be involved to invoke martial law. Ambani Corporation was the core of various small and big businesses and as the investors madly betted to withdraw money, the stock market suffered a complete crash the next day. Country X went into recession as millions of people lost their jobs overnight. And food prices climbed to never-before-seen heights. The rich started to hoard supplies and the poor began to steal for survival. The common people suffered the most between the fight amongst trillionaires. However the winner of this bout was undoubtedly Ethan Gray. Spending $200 billion in relief funds for whoever needed it in Country X, he became a kind-hearted philanthropist and hero in their hearts. The one who caused the incident saw a surge of rising support, whereas the one who suffered the incidents only faced more and more misery. The government who would always bow out to Mithun Ambani and respect his decisions always, carried out a number of raids after being bribed by Ethan seizing a lot of land from Mithun Ambani. Which was quickly bought by Ethan Gray at a dirt cheap price. Ethan spent close to $2 trillion in a time span of three days that Ambani needed to stabilize his company, to gain deep roots in Country X. The hungry wolf Ethan Gray was back in the hunt, as he bit a big piece off the Ambani Corporation. Ambani in a desperate situation to keep his company assets intact had to sell close to 13% of his shares. Of which 11% were bought by Ethan Gray for about $1 trillion through various trusts and charities. He gained a seat on the board of directors for Ambani Corporation alongside Naomi and Neatwit. The three of them now controlled 31% of the company, while Ambani had 47%, his other son having six, while his daughter and wife together having another six. And about 10% shares were held by outside investors and common people. Should Ethan get control of the 10% shares floating in the market? And then somehow get his son to his side? He would gain control over the company. Mithun Ambani diluting himself below 51% equity would turn out to be his doom. All this Ethan managed without taking out a single penny from the existing Gray International cycle. Only through the winning amount of $3.2 trillion of the bet, did he achieve everything. Rudra had brought him a wave of good luck. Apart from incredible money and good marketing. He also brought Naomi and Neatwit. Rudra was monumental in his advances over the Ambani Empire and Ethan acknowledged that. Meeting Rudra was his biggest fortune. Except for his reincarnation. 
Ethan had no complaints with Rudra, the man delivered on his word and was not greedy. He was a genuine fellow who could be trusted, undoubtedly smart and scheming. Yet had a gentle and innocent side to him shown to those he considered close. At first Rudra was just an employee, then he became a partner. But recently even the ice-cold Ethan Gray melted, as he felt warm towards the guy, genuinely considering him to be a brother. Then there was the man of the hour, Johnny English, the mercenary of the century and his two team members who successfully completed his impossible mission. Wanted by the world they were currently given shelter in the upside. While Johnny planned to permanently stay at the place, Skyla and Bo only wanted to lay low for a while. Naturally all three were given the best of the best villas and treatment inside upside, where not even a fly could harm them. The upside was Ethan Gray's greatest creation. Undoubtedly his decision to make the place and have all of his company's best talents gathered here was a brilliant move. While giving them a great quality of life, he also made them feel at home and indebted to the company. Their natural sense of returning to the place they belong tripled his profits yearly and it was a voluntary service at that. The sense of security was the second biggest reason. No one could touch them in the upside, no one could approach them to poach and there was no chance of spying or defecting. It was a masterstroke on his part. He spent an evening with the trio to show his gratitude and to be acquainted with Johnny English when he found out that all three of them played Omega. He asked if they wanted to join one of his two guilds jokingly, however seeing Johnny showing intention of joining True Elites, he instantly contacted Rudra. Rudra was given a background about the three and especially a lengthy one about English, Rudra was genuinely shocked as he not only immediately agreed to recruit all three of them. He even instantly promised to make English an elder. Rudra drooled at the thought of having such an godly individual join his guild, as he hoped of making Johnny the guild elder who could train and guide the younger generation and to his joy Johnny agreed. However, the real reason behind Johnny choosing to join the elites was that he just found it convenient, now that he was retired and living in the upside, the guild with the massive headquarters there would give him activity to do. Also since the guild was so small it would mean he would have great influence in it. Yet never be overwhelmed with people. Skyla and Bo following English also decided to join the elites. But the biggest surprise came when English chose to bring his friend along with him to the guild. His friend was a monk from the Himalayas, a fellow disciple with whom he trained. The first disciple of the sect he learned in and his senior brother. Rudra immediately recognized the player with Johnny, as he was one of the most legendary players in his past life. The ultimate support player, the player who even without any actual combat skills would be the most valued player in any guild he would walk into. His name was Yum. But he was well known as the monk across the game for his way of dressing and his attitude. He was a special player in the game who was bound to a special semi-legendary grade item called the Collector of Yin and Yang. The object gave him the ability to debuff the enemies by stealing stamina, HP, mana, and agility from the enemy and buff the allies on the same stats. It had a 2 km effect range and was a one-of-a-kind object in the game. The only downside of having the object was that it made you lose all combat ability, you could only have one combat skill if you chose to bound with the item. The monk had chosen to bind with it, only having hand-to-hand -hand combat as a chosen offensive skill. Even then his collector of Yin and Yang made him the most sought-after member in any party and the ultimate support player. Rudra could not believe his luck when that guy joined his guild. If only he would have the same object and skill in this life too, he would be an invaluable addition to the guild. Hence it was on this day that four new players joined the true elites guild. All of them first-rate experts. The guild's strength had increased by a lot. 2. Starting from October 1st, new privilege tier settings would apply. Second tier would be 99 coins. Third tier would be 199 coins. Fourth tier would be 299 coins. So save your coins accordingly. 3. New cover for novel is being worked on, will be uploaded before October 1st. I am completely revamping the novel, and making it an actual top quality book which can do well in WSA. I have worked hard to overcome everything that's wrong with the novel. But it has taken time and effort. Chapter 175, Yua Meets Naomi. The Nakatomi Tower, Country J. Mr. Nakatomi lost a huge chunk of money with the Alliance's defeat. The company saw a huge share price fall as the company was projected to have the worst quarter since its inception. What's more, was that the kid he considered to be interesting, yet not worth helping was now a giant whose net worth was more than the entire Nakatomi Corporation. 
Mr. Nakatami knew that Yua harbored some feelings for Rudra albeit friendly ones, the kid was not worthy of his daughter before, he was a nobody, just a gamer with talents. However, now he has the backing of the titan Ethan Grey and is the guild master of the best guild in Hazelgroove Kingdom. Now he was worthy of his daughter, or at least that's how he judged him to be. He called Yua over, she was very upset with her father, she had repeatedly shown intent to leave the alliance, however, her father had rejected the idea strongly. Now she along with her guild had sunken along with the alliance boat. She went from a guild master of a first-rate guild to an ordinary member in another guild. However, joining Rudra's guild was not the issue here, she was happy to join the true elites, it was because she had started to feel as if Rudra had became cold to her. They did not have the same warmth in friendship that they used to. Also, she noticed a new girl in the elite's roster a girl named Naomi. She was like a flower in the guild adored by everyone, who was also very friendly with Rudra. She felt jealous when she saw her being all friendly with Rudra and had a vivid memory of her appearance. She felt threatened by that girl, and it was the first time in her life that she felt such a feeling. She was a princess and boys flocked around her for her attention all her life, yet Rudra was the first guy she was a bit attracted to, however, he was so friendly with another girl who was also very pretty, that made her insecure and jealous. When her father called her in to have a conversation she was in a really bad mood. However, when he expressed his approval regarding her pursuing Rudra should she choose to do so, she became very happy. True Elite's Headquarters, Purple Haze City, Hazelgroove Kingdom Yua actively looked for Rudra in the headquarters and found him chatting with Neatwit and Karna, she confidently approached him. The trio stopped their conversation and looked at her, she said, Now that I am part of the guild, I wish to contribute to the guild with the best of my abilities, hence I just wanted to let you elders know that I am ready for any tasks you give me. Karna and Neatwit looked towards Rudra, who chuckled. The true elites were not like most guilds, the guild members had complete freedom, it was rare for quests to be issued even once in two weeks. There was no plan, everyone did whatever they wanted most of the time. The only time the guild came together was during the dungeon runs or war. Maybe smaller groups were made for leveling. The service guild had already been entrusted as the farming core of the guild and instructed to gather resources deemed important by Rudra. Rudra started to stockpile important resources that the guild would need on upcoming dungeons. Having 100,000 members to farm resources and EXP for guild members helped a lot, as the main guild members gained levels like crazy. Huge chunks of EXP would be added every day even when they were not out leveling themselves. Rudra said, Em, there is nothing to do, the guild doesn't have many stringent rules, you are free to do as you please. Yua disliked that answer, she wanted to show her worth by completing tasks and getting Rudra to warm up to her again. It was at that point that Naomi came over and curiously looked towards Pink Lotus, her woman instincts told her that the girl did not like her. However, she wondered why. Neatwit asked Naomi, why are you here? Naomi smiled saying, brother I need help with a quest, can one of you three strong assaulters help me? Yua frowned, the girl was Neatwit's sister, no wonder they both looked so similar and the girl was so loved in the guild. Karna said, I'm sorry but I need to log out of the game. I have been playing for 40 hours straight now and need some rest. Rudra did not mind helping Naomi however he had to stay in the guild to welcome the four new players, who could be coming any time now. Neatwit felt like helping with quests was a waste of time and he would much rather level up, however, he could not give that answer to his sister, hence he said, you can go with Pink Lotus, she is a great player, also you can become good friends. Yua thought it was a good chance to get to know her opponent and readily agreed. Naomi having no choice also agreed to the proposition. The two shook hands and introduced each other. Hey I am Naomi. You are Nakatami. It looked amiable on the surface however, it was in fact a real-life version of the famous anime scene where lasers would shoot out of girls' eyes in a glaring contest. Both of them realized that the amiability shown on the surface was just a facade and they did not get along well at all. The two left, maintaining the facade and chatting amiably, and the three boys were none the wiser. Little did they know that while they were gone, fighting, the real beauty of the guild made her debut in all the male members' hearts. Skyla, Bo, Johnny English and Yum had just joined the guild. Chapter 176, Johnny English and Yum Johnny English was a heavenly lucky figure in real life, everything worked out for him in the end. Whatever he did wrong would become right. However, in Omega, there was nobody who was unluckier than English. 
He literally got the title of Carrier of Disasters upon joining the game. Player Name, Johnny English Title, Carrier of Disasters Class, Thief Subclass, Blacksmith LVL, 45 Tier, 1 Stats AGI, 270 VIT, 270 Int, 280 STA, 270 PHY, 250 HP, 29-000-29-000 Unassigned stat points, 16 Hidden stats Luck, dash 95 out of 100, you bring disasters wherever you go. Charm, 20. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, common armor set, LV-40, strong shoulder guards, common, strong shin guards, common, strong helmet, common, true elite's guild robe. Weapons, cane sword, epic, common bow, quiver of arrows, assassin's daggers, bronze, small axe, bronze. Skills, hand-to-hand -hand combat, defense break, energy slash, high knee, ball breaker. Class-specific skills, heightened battle sense, stealth. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, none. Johnny played the thief class in game, he chose the class as he felt that it was a good fit for him. However the moment he made his character, things started to go south. He got a notification telling him that he got a title upon joining the game and that title was Carrier of Disasters. Carrier of Disasters, title, forced, you are the most unlucky player in the game, your presence enough is enough to make all plans go wrong. Effect, you will bring disasters wherever you go. You shall have 0.5x bad luck to allies. 2x bad luck to opponents. In a 2 kilometers radius. The multiplier works according to the value of your negative luck stat. Restrictions, cannot be unequipped, or swapped with another title. Johnny had a whopping minus 95 luck stat, hence his presence was like a walking disaster. Normal players like Rudra having 30 to 50 luck stat, if open a treasure chest with Johnny around, they would get the worst possible loot, this is because 0.5 asterisk 95 would mean minus 47 in luck stat. However this curse was also a blessing in disguise, Johnny had a 2x bad luck multiplier on enemies, Hence his presence would be enough to cause all sorts of disasters to the enemies. Minus 190 luck would mean that when enemies entered Johnny's 2 km radius of effect they would experience all sorts of problems. Archers would miss majority of their shots, wizards chants and spells would be unexpectedly be disrupted, those who would be attacked would experience more critical hits. Nobody knew for sure how exactly the luck stat worked in game, its obvious effects were seen while opening crates and monster drops, However there were sure to be other mysterious effects that nobody knew for sure. Johnny only had common and bronze ranked equipments for most part, as he would always get the worst possible drops. However he still managed to get an epic rated item. This was because he opened an guaranteed chest that dropped anywhere between an epic and legendary grade item, and his bad luck meant it was ensured that the drop that came out would be epic rated. And it was indeed epic rated and a sword at that, for a thief like him. It was safe to say, that except for Karna, Johnny's presence would drown anyone in misfortune. Johnny also brought his senior brother to the guild, him and Yum trained under the same master in the Himalayas and had went through a lot together. Their bond was unshakable, and their taste in women was alike. Yum was a perverse man, but his monk-like personality made it hard to believe. Only Johnny knew this side of him. While the world treated him like a monk. Yum was a unique player like Johnny too. Player name, Yum. Title, The Equalizer. Class, Paladin. Subclass, Blacksmith. LVL, 45. Tier, 1. Stats. AGI, 250 VIT, 370. Int, 180 STA, 170. PHY, 350. HP, 35-000-35-000. Unassigned stat points, 10. Hidden stats. Luck, slash 100. Charm. Infamy, 0. Status, healthy. Equipment, collector of Ean and Yang bracelet, legendary, bound, yellow monk's robes, semi-legendary. Weapons, not applicable. Skills, 
Hand-to-hand -hand combat, defense wall, blink. Class-specific skills, last stand, purify. Mount, gray wolf. Pet, none. Yum was the only player in Omega currently to own a legendary item. And it was one of the strongest legendary items at that being a borderline cheat. The effects of the item were divine, however the restrictions it placed on the user made it classify as legendary grade. Yum obtained the Collector of Yin and Yang bracelet through a special quest where he helped a roaming hermit. Who was one of the tier 6 legendary god in disguise. The details of his quest were not well known however the effects of the bracelet were. Collector of Yin and Yang, bracelet, legendary, bound to player Yum, gifted by a mythic existence for his kindness. Effects, steal 15% of the enemy's HP, agility, mana, stamina, and give it to allies. Area of effect is 2 km radius. Restrictions, only one attack skill can be learnt by the user once bound. Caution, if you bind with this item, you will never be able to learn any attack skills. You will forever be a weakling relying on others for support to level up. Choosing the item was a huge challenge, having no attack skills meant his only way of leveling up would be through crafting. However he took on the challenge and chose to bind with the item. The roaming hermit also gave him his robes, which were orange in color, the robes were an excellent defense item providing him with much more defense than any other equipment on the market. With his attack skills sealed he only focused on increasing his non-attack stats. He invested heavily in increasing his vitality and physical stats, while moderately investing in agility. His intelligence and stamina stats were massively lagging. He decided to join True Elites with Johnny, because he was infatuated with Skyla, and wanted to be with her. He was a perverse man who would admire beauties maintaining a straight face. He was Asian by birth, hence having small eyes, making it hard to decipher whether he was checking out someone or just standing serenely. However, Rudra already knew of the legendary player in his last life. Also hearing about Johnny's credentials he was pumped to have two such great players in his guild. What Rudra did not know was that Johnny was a unique player too, and that the two of them together on a battlefield would create myths that would live on forever. Years later they would be remembered as the two senile old men who made armies of thousands flee at sight. When the party of four walked through the gates. Every one of them looked remarkable. The first one to catch the eye would definitely be Skyla, the way she carried herself, her walk, and her curvaceous body, would make any man pause for a second to look. Next would be Yum, the orange robes, bald head and amicable smile, anyone would feel like seeing a Buddhist monk walking. Then would be Johnny English himself, carrying himself with suave and style, he has a confident look plastered on his face. His presence dominates the aura around him, he feels like a de facto leader of the group. The last to be noticed would be Bo, while being extremely lean and athletic, he also had a smart and sharp look plastered on his face, the way he carried himself was impeccable, however he seemed dominated walking alongside English. However, he was not to be underestimated, he was also a thief, and a true elite elder standard one at that. Johnny then said, the name's Johnny, Johnny English. As he gave Rudra a firm handshake. Rudra smiled, it was good that he was not actually a youth in his twenties, otherwise he would have been intimidated by Johnny, however, he wasn't, he knew how to keep his cool and assert his authority. He said, Guild leader Shikuni, pleased to meet you. Bo and Skyla were pleasantly surprised, Rudra's calm in front of Johnny was not commonly seen. Their evaluation of the guild leader instantly went up by a level, they had already heard about his exploits and knew his reputation. Also his battle videos were legendary, however meeting him in person they finally understood that Rudra like Johnny was an excellent man beneath all that. Yum said, Amitba, this Yum is pleased to join your sect. Rudra chuckled, Yum surely deserved his reputation as the orange monk, he said, pleased to have you. When Skyla introduced herself, and shook Rudra's hands, he had to try hard not to stare at her revealing cleavage to keep the demeanor of the guild leader. And Rudra quickly realized that it was a harder task than he imagined as he couldn't help but sneak glances. Skyla noticed this and smiled, it would have been abnormal if a youth in his twenties was not attracted by her. Well she checked out Rudra too, he seemed cute enough to her. Finally Bo introduced himself and the exchange was over, Rudra let Amelia take over then as he told her to introduce the four to the elite culture and give a tour of the grounds. Rudra wanted to immediately talk to Johnny about making him the guild's elder and becoming a trainer for young talents, however he did not wish to burden him on the first day. However Yum joining the guild came as a huge relief to him. 
While the conquest of becoming the overlords of Purple Haze City were still a month away, a lot of preparation needed to be done and his addition to the guild was very reassuring. Chapter 177, Update Notice, 1. Rudra Han been anxious the last few days, he had been pouring out huge sums of money to pretty much stock up on every single item special to Hazelgroove Kingdom. He was anticipating the next update notice, according to his past life memory, when majority of the player base finally reached tier 1 in strength that was the time when the next system update came. He had been anticipating the update notice for the last two weeks now, and noticing the trend and average player levels, it should be any day now. The dynamic of the game would shift once the update came. Each major update in the game would change the game dynamic significantly. However the second system update was the most shocking one of them all. Perhaps because it shifted to a more global structure, removing most of the disparities in the game. And his speculation was indeed right, as the update notice did come as expected. System notification, the second system update will be released in 72 hours at 10 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time Real World Time. The new update features include 1. Massive Map Update NPC Kingdoms will now be unlocked. The NPC Kingdoms will now be open for trade and interaction. The map will experience an overall massive update. Each NPC Kingdom shall have its own set of rules and regulations. Some seemingly normal things may be a taboo in the particular kingdom and may result in heavy punishments. Note, if the NPC Kingdom is not favorable to you, they may deny you entry at border. Illegal immigration if caught will lead to a 15-day imprisonment. The NPC kingdoms had opened up for trade and interaction. Most of the NPC kingdoms were in higher level grounds. Level 100 maps or above, hence apart from the established safe routes into the kingdom, infiltration from the wild would mostly lead to death. In case of illegal entry, if the player was caught then it would lead to a 15-day compulsory imprisonment. And Rudra's experience told him that one-third illegal immigrant were caught. Also just like real world the NPC kingdoms would also have an immigration system. Unless you were on friendly terms with the kingdom or the ruling race, you may not be given entry into the kingdom. If your guild had notoriety in the kingdom, you may be black flagged, or even hunted at the border. 2. Introducing guild cities, a short while after the update, a massive event will take place where guilds would compete to gain management rights over city. The guild successful in obtaining the management rights would become the overlord of the city paying a fixed annual income to the kingdom and the central government while collecting taxes from the citizens of the city. They will have their own army regiment depending on the size of the city and can develop the city as they please. The overall living environment, public security, health and hygiene, culture, cost of living. These factors would either drive away NPC population decreasing tax income or increase the influx depending on how the city is managed. The rights of management may be revoked if the annual payment is not made or the public order falls below a certain level, causing riots. Note, a guild may gain management rights to only one city for now. Rudra had long been preparing for this event, he knew the importance of gaining management rights, he knew the importance of gaining a good city as his base. Even though it is only one city per guild in this expansion pack it would not stay Sue forever. Kingdom building would become a huge part of the game going forward. And to be successful and competitive, they needed to do a good job with it. Everything from the most basic village to the capital city, would be up for the challenge sometime later. Probably a month or so after the second update. 3. Introducing teleportation arrays, teleportation arrays can be built in your territories after gaining management rights to it. The teleportation array will let you travel throughout the continent, to whichever city that also has a teleporting array for a fee. Many NPC kingdoms will also have teleporting facilities. It is the fastest and safest way to travel. But it may be expensive. Note, managing guilds can set the price of entry into their city through teleporting arrays, it can be a great source of income. 4. Global Auction House The Global Auction House will now replace kingdom-based ones. The world will walk into a global economy. Anything could be posted for sale on the global auction house, and the auction will charge a standard 10% proceed fee for all transactions plus shipping charges. The seller may choose to pay for the shipping charges or may make it the duty of the customers to pay. The longer the distance the greater the shipping cost. The shipping cost for the same kingdom will be 10 silver, within the same continent will be 1 gold and across continents will be 10 gold standard per item. The system auctions will now change from kingdom auctions to continental auctions. 
Guilds from all over the continent may participate in the next system auction. Rudra knew that this particular update was very tricky. It meant that there would be tons of competition in the market and being able to secure profits would be much harder. This is where the chalice of purity would show its real worth. The chalice would break the international price system of potions as elite lifestyle would become W household brand. Rudra had heavily invested in the kingdom specialties of Hazel Groove for the past few days, because of this reason, as region-specific herbs and items would now fetch sky-high prices of the international market. He would easily make his money back threefold. Chapter 178, Update Notice, 2. 5. Change to the mounts and pets fear your, players may now have three mounts. Aerial mounts, land mounts, and water mounts. The Beast Tamer subclass is now available. Combat pets can now be purchased through pet stores and may be obtained in the wild in the form of eggs. Note, combat pets cannot enter dungeons, combat pets cannot enter restricted areas and towns, combat pets cannot be brought to NPC kingdoms. Combat pets will have personalities and may not listen to their owner's commands always, they can die permanently if HP reaches zero. They can also gain EXP and level up to gain skills. Taming a higher EXP pet is difficult. Pets need food and sustain ants, a weekly charge will be deducted from the adventurer's account for pet maintenance. Failure of payment for three days after the week-long deadline will result in pet's death. Pets can become tattoos on players' bodies and can be summoned using mana. Although it seemed like a huge update, Rudra knew it was all just for show and was actually useless. Pets were a dead end, and not worth pouring resources into. Even the best pets had very limited combat capabilities and were weaker than the users. The cost of pet maintenance was huge, and no real benefit was there to the process. They could not be brought to dungeons and NPC kingdoms, also certain areas had pet restrictions. Although pets could help in the wild and in PvP, they would permanently die if their HP hits zero, making nurturing them a big waste of money. Most pets had very low HP count and defense, and players could kill them easily. Pets were a huge cheat of money, and Rudra would not fall for the scam. Pets were only used as cute tag-alongs, just like real life. Although a dog could bite a human and be effective in some scenarios, in an actual full-blown war between humans, no one would ever bring their dogs. Expecting combat proficiency out of them was useless. Both Rudra and Karna had already obtained pet eggs that were yet to hatch, it may seem to majority player base that pets had only unlocked after the update, which was not entirely wrong. However the reality was that the pet's eggs were already in the game, but only those who had found them knew about their existence. The incubation of all eggs was long when Rudra and Karna found them, this was because the AI had ensured that even if they found the eggs they would not hatch before the second update was put in place. Hence while their eggs would hatch soon, the majority player base who directly bought pets or found eggs, would also have pets in a comparable time duration. Rudra knew from experience that it was always best to hatch a pet yourself and help it grow. Only then will it stay loyal and listen to all commands. An adult pet would always have an attitude and behave according to its will, and would be difficult to deal with. 6. EXP Boost Limited time offer, for the period of the next 3 months, every new player joining the game will get a 3x EXP boost for 30 days. This boost was given so that the gap between new players and old ones could be bridged out. Because the older players were already so far ahead, it was very difficult for new players who started the game much later to reach the same level of progress. Rudra knew that, a huge influx of players were on their way to Omega, the appeal of the game was huge, and people wanted to experience the second world for themselves. Millions entered the game every day and hence this boost was a much needed relief for them. 7. World Games Introducing the World Games, aka the VR Olympics Participate in the World Games representing your guild's management city or town. Participate in 100 events amongst players from all over the world for the top 3 spots in each event. Huge gifts for individual winners and overall top performing cities. Not much information was available about the World Games, however Rudra knew that this annual event would change the face of the VR game forever. Guilds would compete on the grandest stage for pride, prestige, and benefits. The price for winning a single category bronze would be equivalent to 15 dark gold treasure chests worth of loot, and sky was the limit from there. The World Games would become an event with far-fetched implications on even the real world, as the event would become the most watched sporting event worldwide. 
VR Olympics would become the newer superior version of the age-old Olympics, with the mix of both traditional and game-like events. And the overall top performers would become the biggest clubs slash guilds in the real world too. The real world merchandise of those guilds would sell like hotcakes and the top performers would become international idols. The entire game's dynamic would change once that happens, as the focus of players would shift, many would spend their entire gaming time training to win a single medal in a category. In his past life, Rudra was a nobody, someone who could not even gain the right to participate in the event, but not this time. This time not only would he participate, but also win. Determination filled his eyes, the road ahead was tough, and his ambitions were endless. This system update changed many things, however it was not an immediate update, only a few things would change at first, however the major changes would occur after the guild management event would take place and the kingdom building aspect of the game would start. This will be the only system update for the next year or so, as the game as players knew it would change forever in that year. Chapter 179, The World Reacts The entire server was shook up, the update notice was massive. No one predicted this sort of update to come so suddenly. Usually games have small updates and a gradual shift in features, however Omega launched such a massive upgrade at once. It was hard for the player base to adapt. Actually a part of the update had been predicted by various experts that there must be a massive map upgrade. Because the leveling grounds only housed monsters up to level 60, there were no higher dungeons available either, for the current player base, level 60 seemed to be the max limit. The maps around the cities had varying difficulty, so unless the monsters became stronger there, there was no future path of progression. However the monsters could not be upgraded in strength as there were still a huge player base that needed to farm for EXP in those grounds. Hence the only option available was map expansion. The game had hinted about the existence of the NPC kingdoms, but the regions were locked and inaccessible, hence Noon really knows much about any NPC kingdom. From the common lore collected from NPC, there were three NPC kingdoms that were confirmed to exist. One was the elf kingdom, Eurasania, which had the world tree in its center, and a dense forest as its domain. It was common knowledge that the elf kingdom was the hardest to build relations with, as they were reclusive in nature and did not trust humans. The entry requirements were very harsh and trade was non-existent. The second kingdom confirmed was the dwarf kingdom of Dwargan. Built under a massive mountain, the entire kingdom was protected on all four sides by huge rocky mountains, having excellent defense capabilities. The only entrances were guarded with heavy armor-piercing machines and deadly weapons. No infiltrators could enter. The country was rich in trade as merchants frequented the place. Humans were allowed in the kingdom without much hassles. However the dwarves considered human blacksmiths inferior and loathed human-made products. Trade permits could be obtained relatively easily with them. The third NPC kingdom was the beast kingdom of Animalia, Rudra's great sister Patricia was once also a part of this kingdom. The kingdom accepted humans, and were friendly towards them. However the country had a very high crime rate. And was overall very lawless. The kingdom followed the law of the jungle, where the strong ruled the weak. And it was common for goods to be stolen by bandits or outright seized through power. Trade was possible, but good safety was non-existent. Other NPC kingdoms were rumored to exist, with a legendary kingdom of winged people in the air. However no conclusive evidences were found. Rudra knew that this rumor was true, floating city of Titan was a reality, and their inhabitants were all winged humans also commonly misunderstood as angels. Angels were also a race in Omega, however the difference between winged humans and angels was like heaven and earth. Angels had divinity flowing through them, angels were born at tier 4, most reached tier 5 by adolescence and tier 6 was not uncommon amongst angels. They also had wings as white as the snow and could be said to be the de facto rulers of the continents. The only races comparable to the angel race was the fall angel race, devil, and the pure draconic race. These three made the three great races of the continent. While the fallen angels were of a dark faction alignment, the true angels were aligned with light faction. The two naturally were always at odds. The balance of power however was maintained because of the draconic race. They were neutrally aligned and judged everyone equally, to them only one's deeds mattered and not their alignment. They would go to war with both factions, depending on what they felt was right. In his previous life, there was a rumored legendary kingdom of Draconia, somewhere in the northern continent, however that rumor was never confirmed. 
The server went berserk with speculation, as there was panic, excitement and frenzy in the game. The notice also saw a huge influx of new players and already existing players that joined and were below level 5 also deleted their accounts to restart with the 3 XEXP bonuses. The market was in chaos as products were being sold in crazy prices. Both high and low. Everything was up for speculation. The general public reacted like. The new update is crazy, my guild will become the overlords of the capital city, mark my words people of the world. Teleporting arrays are so cool. I always wanted to visit my friend in the neighboring kingdom, now I finally can. I am going to win at least one gold medal in the coming VR Olympics. Can we do LEWD stuff to NPC elves, this elder brother has a long time wish. Ag, creep alert. Report, report, report. Elves are fragile, a real man prefers orcs. AGHH, more creeps, help. Moderator notice, user 2345777 and user 2157775 have been banned from the channel for posting inappropriate content. Thank God the creeps are banned. I agree, they are creeps and should be banned, but even I am curious, can we have relationships with NPCs? I assume we will find out, won't we? There were all sorts of discussions on the forums, discussing all six update points in detail. The overall atmosphere was a feeling of fresh air, as 90% people took the update positively. Rudra, had his arms buried in his head, he was contemplating the future of the guild. He knew what he wanted to achieve, however the path ahead was full of thorns and difficulties, which was very hard to overcome. He had a small number of members under him, this was his greatest strength and his biggest weakness at the same time. The guild being a collection of only the best talents made the overall atmosphere cohesive like a family. Who could overcome any odds together? However, the lower numbers also meant that every challenge would have greater difficulty to overcome. He only hoped that this family could overcome it anyway. Chapter 180, Three Days of Chaos 72-hour countdown was on for the update, and the game was not the same as it was 10 hours ago. Major reshuffling of guild members took place as members abandoned the smaller guilds in droves. The common people had judged that the future was with the guilds who would rule the cities. There was no point in staying with small adventurer groups. Those with ambition all chose first or second rate guilds that they felt had a fair chance of securing a town or a village. The entire guild dynamics changed over a span of few short hours. People betrayed their old guilds, friendships were broken, items were stolen from the warehouses, as elders and people with access to the warehouse defected with the items. Hundreds of thousands of players jumped ship in Hazelgroove Kingdom alone. There were many players who quit their guilds but did not join any guild for now, they wanted to wait and see whom to join depending on the results of the guild's performance and capabilities to gain management rights. There were a few that were waiting for the teleportation arrays to open up and join the guilds of their friends in other kingdoms. Everyone wanted a brighter future, and in chasing those short-term benefits. Most missed the bigger picture. A guild member's real value stems from their loyalty and contribution to the guild. In large guilds, those who defected by the thousands, betraying their old guilds, although may enjoy some short-term benefits and may even become part of a overlord of a city-type guild. However, they would never become part of something bigger. They would never truly be a valued part of that guild and would always remain expendable. Naturally there were thousands who wanted to join the elites, however Rudra was cold in turning all recruitment offers down. Defectors had no place amongst the elites. The service guild members were the worst. True elite service players were all mad, that even after the alliance's fall, they were bound by this useless contract. A majority of them, about 65,000, decided to delete the account and start again. With the 3 XEXP boost they could make fresh starts, thinking it was much better than being in a slavery contract for three years. Even the remaining service guild players, were very tempted to take the offer however they wanted to wait a bit and gauge the situation before choosing the best option. Rudra did not care one bit for the service guild members leaving, he could always fill the ranks of service guild players forking out the guild's money, hiring them on payroll. The guild was rich enough to afford it. However the guild currently only required about 20,000 service members and he had 35,000, so the current situation did not require him to take those steps. For him the shame and humiliation that the alliance members felt by serving the elites for the two weeks following the war was revenge enough. Naturally those who would stay through the end would be rewarded by him. 
and generously at that. He would free them off the contract and offer better pay. But only after he became overlord of Purple Hay City. Another major change that was seen was that people were madly investing in real estate. Everyone understood that the real estate is real cheap in the game currently, and that the market has enough upside to give tenfold returns in a year. Players with nobility charged a 30% commission fee for buying properties for other players, while stockpiling on properties for themselves. In a game where anyone could teleport anywhere with a fee, and the guilds developing the cities to attract more population of players and NPCs meant that, over time the houses in the big cities would become very valuable and the rent charged could be hefty. Across the map people madly began to purchase properties at a very high premium. However, the situation in Purple Haze was very different. There was not a single piece of land available for purchase. Even in the outskirts of the city. The farming lands were also all bought out. Those who wished to buy property in Purple Hay City were all dumbfounded. Just who could have bought the entire list of properties available for purchase? It would take hundreds of millions of gold, yet someone actually managed to do it. Many doubts came into the mind of people, they suspected that it was a work of a group of people or a hidden organization and not a single party. However without any clues, they could only give up on their speculation. They just had to make peace with the fact that not a single property was available for purchase in Purple Hay City. What they did not know however, was that the properties, would definitely grow over 10 times in valuation over the next year, however they would also prove as a crucial part of getting the management rights of the city. They were more important than they could ever dream of. The days passed in absolute chaos, as Rudra started to prepare for the map expansion and the incoming update. His titles earned early in the game that gave him favor from the NPCs would now show its real effects. Those titles would now prove to be invaluable as Rudra would gain powerful connections that others could not even dream about, and open trade with species that most never even heard about. Firstly the initial review for WSA has started today, hence I would like to ask for your support. Whether in form of castles, tickets, power stones. Do whatever you can guys to get me featured high. IV worked myself to the bone to become worthy of a WSA nomination at least. And with your support I think I can make it. Chapter 181, A New Beginning Server update was finally launched. Every player was teleported outside the game as the server underwent a six-hour mandatory upgrade. Rudra chose to spend this time with his family in his home. After a long time, he sat with Max to help with school homework and helped his mom do dishes. He only noticed today, how his father had adapted to his retirement. His father was much happier, he was struggling with what to do throughout the day, as he no longer needed to work. He was a bit awkward around the house, as his initial phase of just relaxing through his retirement had worn off. Even the next phase of pursuing his hobbies had became boring now. He was looking for something tangible, while relaxing at home. All this translated into him giving more time and attention to Max and his mom. Max was happier than ever, he hardly met dad before, as he would usually come in after Max's bedtime, and would be sleeping when he went to school. His mom's health saw in significant improvement and Rudra was grateful for that. Her mom had joined a parent group here and she was very vocal about how proud she was of her son. The new pastime of his mom and dad was that they kept looking for what their son did, they would watch news, read articles, meet other parents from the True Elites Guild. His father didn't show it, however he was more proud of him than his mother. He would always tell him that don't run behind money, run behind excellence, money would follow. And somewhere, somehow, Rudra's ideology about the true elites came from there. His father used to work with a small company when Rudra was a kid, and his father seemed happy at that time. He spent lots of time with Rudra and smiled a lot. When his father changed jobs and started working for a big corporate company, although the pay increased, he stopped seeing his father around the house and he could see that he was not happy. Also experiencing the corporate side of the world himself in his past life. He was firm in his concept of the true elites. A guild that bonds because everyone in it is an equal. The guild had the most relaxed form of Erchi, where even though there was a guild leader, vice guild leader and elders. Those were roles without any real abuse of power. Held by people who treated their subordinates as if they were their equal. The respect Karna and Rudra and the other elders had from the members was because of their skills and their contribution to the guild and not because they were forced to. Their faith in Rudra stemmed from his character and his ability to see any situation through. 
The perfect way to describe the atmosphere in the guild was their slogan, where every single member would fight for the guild, and the guild would fight for every single member. After the six hours were up, Rudra went back to his room, to his bed, where the gaming helmet laid, he sighed looking at it, as he thought, one month till the pods are released, maybe I will gift the entire guild one, no, I, ll make Ethan gift the guild one. The fully functional gaming pod would be released in a month, and it would provide much better immersion. The difference between the helmet and the gaming pod was like the difference between 720 and 1080 pixel picture quality. Although 720 can give more than satisfactory experience, nothing beats the 1080 quality. Logging into the game, he first saw a mandatory patch notice screen, listing all the updates, as the AI narrated everything written inside. This was the way that Cuber Corporation ensured that even those who missed the system notification would understand the changes in the game. Even though Rudra knew everything that was going to be said, he paid rapt attention to what the AI spoke, making sure that he missed nothing out. After three minutes of reading all the patch notes, a screen appeared asking him whether he wanted to continue forward or hear the patch notes again. He chose to continue and was teleported back in the game. Rudra spawned back in the guild headquarters in Purple Haze City, as he looked around he found the familiar faces of the elites all around him. The guild members were chatting leisurely as they checked out the new map, and as expected the NPC kingdoms were now displayed in grey, marked in the map. The player inhabited kingdoms were marked in blue. And no man's lands were marked in red. A new path opened from Hazelgrove that connected it to the Elf Kingdom, that area before the update had no path, and only had a level 60 monster leveling ground, However now the forest expanded also having level 70, 80, 90, and 100 monster grounds. At the start of the road towards the elf kingdom hung a warning sign that said that although the road was usually safe, there was always a possibility of a wild monster accidentally stumbling onto the road, hence adventurers were cautioned to travel at their own risk. Rudra was sure that in spite of the warning today itself there would be hundreds of thousands of players who would want to go to that kingdom. And they were not wrong to do so, as even he wanted to go there. There was a quest in that kingdom, that if completed, would greatly increase his odds of getting the management rights for Purple Haze City. He would need a crew for this one, he could not do it alone. If it was before he would have just chosen Karna and Mediv to tag along, however now that Johnny English and Yum joined the guild, he wondered if he should go with them instead. Just whom to choose? I'm back at regular pace and back with bonuses. Chapter 182 The Elven Kingdom after a long time deliberating about whom to take, Rudra decided to go with Karna, Johnny English and Yum. In the future, when he would take over the management of Purple Haze City, he would definitely make a teleporting array as the top priority. Traveling between places was much easier using the teleporting arrays, and much faster too, him being a reincarnator already having a taste of the convenience of teleportation arrays, found traveling by land a huge waste of time. However without any better options, he had to go by the road. Rudra thought positively about the situation, at least he had the dire wolf mounts. They were faster than horses and had high stamina. Riding on them he could easily reach the elven kingdom in about one and a half day journey. Rudra, Karna, Jani, and Yum set out for the kingdom on the dire wolves. Rudra was pleasantly surprised when Jani and Yum reacted positively to his request about the quest. The two seniors were calm and chill, Although they had a hard time mixing in with the younger generation of elites, they were very open-minded and fun to hang out around. They did not admonish the younger generations and even responded in a friendly way. Well, at least Johnny did, Yum just talked like a monk most of the times. His words were often riddled with quotes rather than actual words, and every other line mentioned Amitba. At the start, except that it was fine. Rudra was not worried about encountering any wild mobs beyond his skill set currently. Only one in a thousand encountered a level 70 beast, only one in ten thousand encountered a beast of level 80, and only one in a million encountered a level 90 or above roaming beast on the road to the elven kingdom. You had to have absolutely trash luck, for such an event to transpire. With the son of Providence Karna riding beside him, he was hardly worried about such an outcome. The first half day of traveling was rather uneventful as the four casually chatted as they rode their mounts. Karna got acquainted with both Johnny and Yum and he was very happy to meet them. Johnny gave him an impression like he was a spy like James Bond or something. He was calm, all his words sounded cool, and his every action was elegant. Even the way he talked, how he put pressure at the end of every word in his speech, although that was probably because he was a native of Country B, added to his charisma. 
Yum on the other hand, seemed straight out of a Buddhist monastery. Whenever he smiled his small eyes would disappear from his face, coupled with his orange robe and he looked like a laughing Buddha. However the merry times ended quickly as they did indeed encounter a monster on the road. It was a griffin at that. Rudra checked the griffin's stats. Griffin, Chieftain, LV-102, it has incredibly high flying speed and can make sharp turns mid-air. Its beak is a lethal weapon along with its claws. Absolutely avoid them when they are enraged. Current status, extremely angry. Rudra did not know whether to laugh or to cry, this particular griffin was actually a chief. And also extremely angry. What rotten luck must he have to encounter this beast and in this mood? What happened to the son of Providence's luck beside him? Hello. God. Is your chosen one a defective piece? Why is his charm not working? The griffin screeched a loud cry, it was extremely angry for some reason. And it flapped its wings and charged at the party of four. Rudra instantly became alert and on guard, Karna also took battle stance, Yum seemed to prepare to activate his defensive abilities, however Johnny just calmly sat on his mount. The other three wolves whose riders had dismounted scurried away, however as Johnny did not, his wolf turned away and ran from the incoming danger with Johnny on him. Johnny felt dead inside when he saw the griffin charging towards his direction. He had checked the bird's level and he knew he had no fighting chance. Johnny knew his luck was trash, however he never expected it to be so trash. He had already closed his eyes and resigned himself to being resurrected again in the Church of Light, where the beautiful priest would bless him, well if he was going to die anyway, he might as well die Johnny English style, he pointed at the beast with his outstretched arm, and signaled the beast to bring it. However to his surprise his mount turned and started to run. Johnny suddenly felt hope, maybe the griffin would attack the other three and he could escape first. However when he turned he saw the griffin chasing him, as he ignored the other three. Johnny cursed his bad luck, he was a dead guy now. His mount went off the road for a bit and into the forest, but the griffin had already closed in, with its beak pointing towards Johnny, it dived in at full speed to bite off Johnny's head. However, when the beast started to attack Johnny, the system calculated it to be Johnny's enemy, and the bad luck probability kicked in. In what could be considered a godly miracle, the wolf sidestepped a little to make the griffin miss its aim by a little as it went headfirst into a nearby boulder. Crash. The beast crashed into the boulder, and for some reason its beak got stuck into the damn thing. No matter how hard it struggled, it couldn't move at all. Johnny seeing the opportunity, sprung into action as he took two minutes to whittle down the griffin's HP. The griffin struggled, moving its wings and trying to claw towards Johnny, however with its beak stuck, it could really not do much. Becoming a sitting duck, it eventually fell to Johnny's blows. The party lost Johnny's view when he exited off-road, and hence did not know what had transpired for a minute, when they arrived at the scene they saw the griffin stuck in the boulder and Johnny whittling away its HP, Rudra and Karna were dumbfounded by the scene and they could not take any actions for a minute. Yum couldn't help even if he wanted to, as he had no combat skills. Rudra was dumbfounded, just how high was Johnny English's skill? Is this what it meant to be the greatest mercenary? From his POV, he saw Johnny calling out for the bird, an arrogant expression plastered on his face, that said just bring it you beast. And the bird chased him. When they came to the scene he had already somehow immobilized the beast and started to whittle its HP. This was what the greatest mercenary was capable of ha. Huh? Rudra thought, as for the first time he felt, that maybe with Johnny English in the guild he was not the strongest player anymore. However he was not insecure, he was very happy, every elite's strength was the guild's strength. He happily started to help him slay the beast as he scoffed at Karna. The son of Providence failed him, however he found a new gem to rely on. After struggling for a bit they killed the beast to gain a massive EXP boost to level up thrice. Chapter 183, A Difference in Treatment Johnny was happy when he leveled up thrice, this was usually not the case. Even though the bird was extremely unlucky in this instance. At most times he was very unlucky as well. His enemy suffering a fate of minus 190 luck stat was terrible, however, that did not reduce the minus 95 luck that he carried on himself at all times. There were many fights where his stealth skill would fail at the last possible moment, making him an easy prey for his opponent. More often than not, he did actually die a lot. He was far from the invincible mercenary he was in real life. If he was in a building that was to collapse in the real world, 
than if five people were in a room where debris was falling, then the four except himself might find themselves buried under rubble, but he might come out unharmed. However, in Omega, if in the same scenario even if 500 people were in the same room and only one piece of debris fell, then he was sure that it would be him under the rubble. His luck inside Omega was trash, his skills questionable. The only thing he had going for himself was his attitude. He was Johnny English and that's that. Rudra had gained a strong impression of Johnny, it was sure to cause major misunderstandings down the line, however with no one voicing their thoughts out loud, the misunderstanding was never confronted. The four continued their journey towards the Elven Kingdom, and experienced no more unexpected accidents. After a day of riding they reached the border of the Elven Forest. The smaller towns and settlements were about thirty minutes ride from the border, and the capital city was a three hours ride. Rudra and the crew needed to go to the capital city of Vanaheim, however first they required entry passage. There was a small ranger's hut, at the start of the elven forest. Most would miss this hut, and venture straight into the elven forest, however those who entered the elven forest without permits were open to attacks by forest patrol and elven division who was notorious for killing adventurers bold enough to venture into the elven forest without a permit. Only those with an actual permit from the border ranger, would gain the actual access road towards the elven settlements. Even with the border permit, one only gained access to enter or transit the elven forest. They could not enter any elven settlements, for that they needed a separate permit. Rudra approached the ranger's hut, and knocked at the door. Patiently waiting. Soon, an elf opened the hut's door. The guy was extremely handsome, his clear white skin and pointy ears and sharp jaw made him look like a K-pop star. The elves were inherently good-looking, they had beautiful features, and both male and female elves used all sorts of accessories and cosmetics to maintain that beautiful look. However the elves usually had a very cold attitude towards outsiders and were not easy to mix with. The elf looked at Rudra and said, State your business, adventurer. Rudra calmly said, requesting transit permit, into the elven forest. The elf raised an eyebrow, the adventurer in front of him seemed like someone who knew the ways of the elves, not like the bunch of idiots who passed straight through into the elven forest without permit. For the last whole day, he saw thousands of adventurers passing through into the elven forest without permit. He laughed at the fates of those idiots, the forest patrol seemed to have a fun day at work, there were a few that approached his hut, however, those idiots were looking for special quests from him. He was a self-sufficient ranger, what were those adventurers expecting? that he would send them to fetch water. But this adventurer was different, he asked for a transit permit, he knew the ways of the elves. The ranger asked, state your faction. Rudra changed his equipped title to world-renowned and said, human from the kingdom of Hazelgroove, worships the goddess of light. The ranger had a change of attitude when Rudra equipped the world-renowned title, his expression much more amiable. He said, sue its renowned adventurer Shakuni. No wonder you are well versed in the ways of the elves. Are the other three your companions? Rudra nodded and smiled amiably. The ranger went back inside the hut and issued the transit permits and handed them to Rudra. Rudra took out twenty gold and handed it out to him. The elf arched another eyebrow, he said, No need for money from the famous adventurer, you are welcome in the kingdom of elves. Rudra smiled more, the transit permit was five golden adventurer, although to his current finances this was not worth mentioning, when given special treatment that saved him money he felt pretty good. Rudra was in an extremely good mood, as he and the others continued their journey into the kingdom of the elves. The transit permits were basically a runic paper made by the elves that made the patrolling forest elves know that the ones passing were friendly. The entire elven territory was actually under a huge monitoring formation, any illegal immigrants from any part of the forest, would show up as a red blip, on the patrolling forest officers' monitoring radars. They would then be tracked and hunted. Entering with the transit permits marked you as a blue blip, showing that you were here with good intentions, until you stayed on the paved roads and did not venture into any settlements, the officers would not find trouble with you. This was crucial information that the current adventurers lacked. Those who ventured into the forest without the permits had only a trip back to the Church of Light left for themselves. Rudra wondered if should make another information pack about the Kingdom of Elves and sell for money. However he did not currently lack money. Maybe it could be used to barter with other guilds for items. Lost in thoughts, the three-hour journey was completed without any hitches, the party of four reached the gates of the elven capital, Vanaheim. Chapter 184, Vanaheim 
Rudra was shocked to see that there were a few hundred adventurers lined up to enter the capital city of Vanaheim. Rudra seemed to have underestimated the capabilities of the masses. There were a few hundred out of the thousands that tried, that did actually make it. However just as he thought, no one was being given entry into the elven capital. The elves were very strict with the entry of people not from their race into their settlements. The elves had a specially built trade district, 20 minutes away from the capital. Where merchants could meet and trade. However that was the extent of which they allowed most people to interact with their race. Conservative to the core, they absolutely hated half-elves and dark elves. Only pure elves were accepted by the society, and they were raised in a way that they were always conscious of other races. The only people that were not from the elf race, that were allowed into the elven capital, were the priests from the Church of Light and very famous heroes. The elves were also a stout followers of the Goddess of Light, and every settlement had to mandatorily have a shrine dedicated to the goddess. The capital city having the largest one of them, made of pure elven silver and gemstones. This is where the reputation and fame of players mattered in the game. The features of gaining fame and reputation from completing certain tasks had been there since the game's inception. However, up till now there was no real use for it. In the long line of adventurers, not even one gained entry into the capital city. This was because one needed plus 1000 or above reputation with the Church of Light or plus 5000 fame or more to enter the capital of elves. Gaining fame and reputation was not easy in Omega, maybe only 1 in 10,000 players would meet these requirements. When this fact was revealed in his past life, there was a mad rush to gain more reputation points with the Church of Light. However most quests hardly rewarded 20 to 30 fame, or none at all. It was very hard to collect enough of it. The elf guard at the door was cold as ice, as he turned away entrant after entrant from entering the elven city. Some thief tried to sneak in unnoticed using stealthy, however before he could set a single foot inside the capital, three arrows pierced through his heart, navel, and brain, as he died on the spot. Loud complaints and murmurs were heard, as the crowd became more and more agitated when people were refused access to the capital. What the hell is wrong with the guards here, why is no one able to enter, what exactly does one need to do to gain entry into the elven capital? I think the map for the capital is not actually ready yet, it's just a marketing tactic by Cuber Corporation to sell more headsets, the guard is there to hide that secret. Many people reacted violently to his message, believing it to be the real case. However a moderator message appeared. Moderator notice, user number 23347900 has been banned for baseless slander. Everyone became quiet and cursed silently, they still wanted to play the game. Once you were banned in Omega, then you were done for life. There were no second chances, no unbanning. As Rudra and his party approached the gate, someone warned them, they won't let you through, it's useless to try. Rudra smiled at the men and said, we'll see. And continued moving forward. The men sneered as he said loudly, H-U-H, another idiot who thinks he is special. Everyone's attention was drawn to the noise, and they scanned the situation. However when they saw the insignia on Rudra's robes, they started to murmur. That's Shikuni and Karna, the true elites, the mad group who won the war. It's the elites. Some started their recording as the elites were without the most popular guild in Hazel Groove currently after their insane war win. Almost everyone who enjoyed playing Omega had seen that war. It put the elites on the map. Karna's face swelled up in pride when people recognized him. Behind the player Karna he was indeed Leo Crispy I first, he enjoyed the attention that made him feel like a celebrity. Everyone looked at him and his guild in awe, as gossip started everywhere, he thought, that's right, the elites are your bitches. Now he just hoped that Rudra would indeed be able to get them through the gate. Although he had absolute faith in the leader, he really wanted to keep face. Just the thought of them being denied access was very embarrassing for him. He was sure that the moment would be captured by someone recording and posted on the forums. It would make them a laughing stock. Rudra approached the guard, and although he was sure that world renowned was enough for him to gain access into the city, but since he had a party with him, he needed to bring out the big guns. He shifted his title to Honorary Bishop of the Church of Light. As he approached the guard. The guard stated, what's your REA, when he realized that Rudra was a honorary bishop of the church. His attitude took a 180 as he bowed in respect as he said, greetings honorary bishop, to what do we owe the pleasure of your visit. 
Rudra smiled as he said, I heard the temple in the city of Vanaheim dedicated to the goddess is absolutely gorgeous, as a firm Belaivere I had to come here to pray. I request Sir Guard to let me and my fellow comrades passage into the city. The guard smiled, while still bowing deeply to Rudra he said, Of course, it's my pleasure Sir Bishop. As he opened the gates to grant them entry. Everyone watching the scene was dumbfounded, while not a single adventurer was given entry, and was talked down by the guard. That same guard bowed and respected Shikuni. Were their eyes playing a joke on them? The murmurs turned into outright chaos as everyone started to discuss about how the elites did it, a wave of adventurers tried again to gain entry, however they all were coldly denied. Which only added fuel to their wild imaginations. Karna smugly smiled at the crowd before following Rudra and the others into the capital. Rudra smiled seeing the cityscape, he was finally back in Vanaheim. The place felt very nostalgic to him and he almost teared up. Reeling his emotions in check, a determined look flashed across his face, he was a nobody in his last life, but he was going to change it this time around. He would get that quest before anyone else. He would gain the favor of the Elven Princess. Chapter 185, The Elven Princess Rudra needed to initiate the quest by himself, hence he gave the other three free hand to explore the Elven capital and have fun. Rudra was sure that they would love to see the beautiful cityscape the elves had made. One of the most notable feature of Vanaheim was that plants and nature was everywhere. Creepers and beautiful plants grew on the compound walls of the houses, and vines covered the rooftops. Everywhere one would look, they would find greenery and nature. It was a beautiful and pleasing sight to the eye. Rudra did indeed visit the temple, the first thing he did after coming to Vanaheim. Although he had no explicit reason to do it. Neither was he a belly ever of the goddess of light to be fair. But he knew there were many eyes on him in Vanaheim. The elves looked at the human and his party with curiosity, it was not every day that outsiders were spotted in the city. Hence, when Rudra visited the temple and was warmly greeted by the head priest, and even the cardinal himself came to greet him, the elves understood that a man of great faith and stature had came there. Rudra pretended to be in devout worshipper and even shed crocodile tears when he saw the magnificent statue in front of him. The elves were moved, the human was a genuine belly ever of the goddess. Only after spending an hour at the temple, did he take his leave and started to go towards the quest location. While walking towards a tavern, his mind could not help but wonder at how beneath this seemingly perfect society a mountain of problems was buried. The events that were to transpire in the future would turn this place into a very different society. The current elves had absolutely no tolerance about breeding with any other species, except themselves. Even within elves those who inherited the bloodline of the goddess of light herself were called the high elves. Taller, stronger, and more talented than the normal elves, they did everything in their power to keep their bloodline pure hence only did mating with other high elves. The current elven king, was King Fry, he had two wives and two children. One from each one of them, or so the world thought. Fry married his first wife out of political needs, he needed to suppress the council of elders, and to do that he had to compromise and marry the daughter of the head elder. He never loved his first wife, Pelopn, but as a dignified king, he gave her the respect and luxury that a queen should have. His second wife was his true love, whom he loved from his younger days, Sarah, he was ashamed that she would have to live as his second wife and not as the queen, however when she showed no dissatisfaction to this, Fraser's heart moved and he treated her with even more love and care than he did before. Pelopn grew jealous of Sarah and the affection she received from the king. And in one of her nights of endless frustration, she consummated with a mere servant who attended to her. That servant did not have the high elf bloodline, he was a mere elf. However he did get the queen pregnant, and hence the first price was born with a normal bloodline without the blessings of the goddess. The world did not know of this secret, as the queen had the servant executed when she got pregnant, and had done extensive planning to keep the facade. The first prince was named Rumi, and although he had a stark contrast to the appearance of the king, no one dared to question the queen and her faithfulness as a wrongful accusation that the queen would lead to being branded as treason. And the perpetrators would be executed immediately. Eventually, when the queen explained that the kid looked like her late father, people started to let go of the matter, Fry found it odd, but never really doubted Pelop, because which high elf would stoop as low as cheating. It was inconceivable in his mind, hence he accepted the explanation. Six months after the first prince was born, the first princess was born, to his second wife Sarah. 
She was a true pure blood high elf and was the gem of Frey's heart from the moment that she was born, her dazzling red eyes made Frey name her Ruby. The most doted child in entire Vanaheim, she was always protected and spoiled by everyone. Well, everyone except her mother, who was very strict and made her a disciplined child. This contrast in treatments made Ruby an innocent and disciplined child. She was both polite and graceful, and was a genius in archery and kingdom management. Far outclassing her brother in the department. As a child Rumi was always jealous of Ruby and her superior talents, she was doted by everyone and loved, and his treatment was always SOSO. However he knew that as the first prince he was bound to inherit the throne someday, so he bided his time. When he turned fifteen however, was the day her mother told him the secret about his birth. And how her mother had fed him the rich potion of life every day since birth for him to have a fake aura of a high elf. Rumi cried a lot that day, and over the next year his behavior changed a lot, he became cunning and sly, as he realized that any slip up and he would be done for. He seized every opportunity to solidify his position and gain connections. He even began bootlicking the king. However the biggest change happened in how he viewed his half, sister, knowing that they did not share a blood bond, he started to see her as a potential partner and began pursuing her as a lover. Ruby found his advances odd, when he would fondle her accidentally and give her kisses on the cheeks he would take the stance of being her caring big brother, but she was not dumb and understood that what he was doing was not what a brother would do. Disgusted she decided to tell her father. But before doing so, she decided to talk to her best friend and advise her about her choice. This was her biggest mistake as that best friend had a huge crush on the first prince and she spilled the beans to him before she could tell her father. Enraged Rumi killed Ruby, and fled Vanaheim. At least this is what was supposed to happen, now with Rudra here, things may change. Where Rudra was headed to right now was the tavern where the princess was to meet with her best friend in secret. Rudra knew about this meeting as in his past life, there was an adventurer present in the tavern that had overheard the two girls talking and posted a post regarding his understanding of the aftermath. When the scandal about the first princess's death came out, and the culprit was the first prince an unprecedented calamity faced the king Fry. The grief of losing his daughter turned him into the mad king. As he imprisoned the queen and tortured her for the location of Rumi. It was in one of these torture sessions that the news about Rumi not being the son of the king was leaked by Pelop. This intensified the king's outrage and Rumi became the most wanted criminal in the elven kingdom. Rudra did not know the exact time of the event where the princess would enter the tavern to talk, he could be waiting here from one to eight days, as the post did not write about the exact date of the event. Hence began his stakeout at the tavern waiting for the princess to show up. In this life he would save her from her evil brother, his reason to do this was twofold, if he saves her then he will gain the favor of her and the king. And second was that this story genuinely made his heart ache for the princess when he heard it the first time around, he had sworn at that time in his past life that if given a chance, he would help a woman in need always. Now that the chance was here, he would deliver on his promise. Chapter 186 The Elven Princess, 2 Rudra waited at the stakeout for a day, yet the princess did not show up. Karna came to hang out for a bit, and the two chatted, but he left after that as he was more interested in exploring the place. Johnny texted Rudra asking about updates, but the weirdest one was Yum, who texted him, Amitba, may you have a peaceful and fruitful day. Rudra was perplexed at the message, WTF was he supposed to even reply to that. Then he found it funny, this was the kind of messages his mom would get from other older aunties in her WhatsApp messages. Rudra had nothing much to do here, but he was in a tavern so he ordered food occasionally and gave generous tips to the staff, to keep their mood alleviated at the visitor who was here for hours continuously. Shockingly, another adventurer was also joined Rudra in the tavern, Rudra took note of his appearance, he was a solo adventurer as he had no guild insignia on his robes, he wore a peculiar pendant around his neck and had a pretty handsome face. Rudra understood, this must be the guy who overheard the conversation between the princess and her best friend in his past life. Being able to enter Vanaheim so early, he was surely a superior player. Rudra would like to scout him out if possible. Then it happened, a slender hooded figure entered the tavern and took a seat on the farthest table. Rudra could not see the face under the hood, which made him unsure whether the girl in front of him was the princess or her best friend. Rudra wanted to curse at the adventurer, the information the idiot provided in his last life was so full of information gaps. Why did he not make the information reincarnation friendly? If only he had provided more details, wouldn't it have eased Rudra's job by a lot? 
TCH, amateurs, Rudra cursed, and any thought he had about recruiting the guy faded, he could only wait anxiously now for the other person to arrive. Soon, another slender hooded girl entered the tavern, her steps were quick, almost like she was rushing here. This was in stark contrast to the first girl, who strolled in confidently and at leisure. Rudra's guts told him that this was the princess, the rush steps made him feel that she had just shaken off her guards and sneaked here. Rudra quickly got up and blocked her way as he bowed, he said, Honorary Bishop Shikani requests meeting in private with the Princess Ruby of the Elves. The hooded figure stopped in her tracks, she was dumbfounded. Who was this guy? How was her cover blown? She was sure she had never met him before, so how? Ruby froze, unsure about what to do. Her friend who saw that her friend had been obstructed, also got up, Rudra knew he needed to move quickly as he said, Princess there is a lot we need to talk about, I swear on the goddess's name I wish you no harm, however it is of the utmost priority that you hear me out in private. Ruby regained her senses, as she looked at Rudra under her hood with her signature red eyes. Rudra seeing those eyes, knew his gamble was correct and she was indeed the princess. Her friend arrived at the scene and said, Who are you, what do you want? To Rudra. However Rudra did not utter a single word, he kept bowing towards the princess in silence. After a minute the princess said, Selene, go wait outside for some time, I will call for you. Her best friend Selene was shocked as she said, How can you? But Ruby took off her hood and said, He is a bishop of the church. Selene immediately shut up and took her leave, a bishop was not someone she could offend easily in Vanaheim. Seeing her face for the first time, Rudra genuinely felt like he had seen an angel. He had seen many beauties that made his heart beat faster, however he had never felt like what he was feeling right now. Rudra had flirted with both Yua and Naomi, and both women were beautiful in their own rights, he was infatuated with them, of course, however his guild work and his ambitions gave him hardly enough time to interact with them in day-to-day -day basis. Rudra just stared at Ruby's face as he could feel his heart beating out of his chest. He was not aroused, but he felt heat in his body, as his cheeks flushed. Then he heard a voice, Sir Bishop. Sir Bishop. Rudra was jolted back to reality, however he just quickly found himself lost too, that voice. Why was it so pleasant to hear? That's it, he knew at that moment, that he had fallen for this NPC girl. He now understood those otaku guys who would love and idolize comic book and anime girls as if they were real. He used to mock them, but here he was facing the most beautiful NPC he had ever seen, and his heart raced faster than a Ferrari. I am gratified and moved. Chapter 187 The Secret Is Out Rudra sat in a discreet corner in the tavern with Ruby, he had regained a bit of his composure as he remembered that saving Ruby was currently a great priority. Ruby said, what is it that you wish to tell me honorary bishop? She was kind of perplexed and did not know what Rudra wanted to talk to her about. Rudra sighed, he needed to make a believable excuse to tell her the fate that she would suffer should she not heed his warning. Rudra decided to go with using the goddess's name to bullshit his way through the situation. Given his background as honorary bishop, it was the perfect cover story. Rudra said, what I am to discuss about cannot leave this room. By telling you these things I am risking a lot, so I beg your highness to be discreet. Ruby was shocked. The matter seemed serious she instantly nodded and reassured Rudra. She said, the words you say will not leave this room. Rudra was satisfied, her melodious voice would make him believe even the most ridiculous lies that came out of it, much less the truth. He said, I have a special power granted by the goddess of light herself, I am an oracle who can see the future. However my ability only works when the goddess chooses to show me something I need to see. Nobody in the church knows about this, I only told you this because I was recently shown your future by the goddess. Which is why I am here in this tavern, waiting for you, your majesty. Ruby's eyes widened in surprise, oracles were the most respected people in the Church of Light, there was no oracle in the church since the last 150 years, if what Rudra said was true, it was a big big deal. However, the oracle had seen her future, this. Rudra continued, I know it is hard to believe my words, so let me ask you something, were you here to meet your friend to seek advice about reporting your brother's and sensuous advances towards you? Any doubts that Ruby had about Rudra as an oracle were shattered at that instant, she looked at him as if he was the Pope himself. After 150 years the church finally had an oracle. She meekly said, yes. Rudra's heart melted. Such a gentle lady, how dare the bastard prince kill her? 
Rudra continued, what I tell you is of utmost importance, in the future the goddess shows me, your friend whom you confide and betrays you, she is in love with the first prince and reports you to him. The first prince then executes you before you can report him to the king. He thought he did a good job of covering the murder up, however his sin was discovered and he was forced to go into hiding, at a dash hashtag and hashtag at a hashtag. Something weird happened at that moment, Rudra tried to speak but no sound would come out of his mouth, as he was teleported into the blue system space. Rudra was dumbfounded, how was he suddenly teleported here? What Rudra did not know was that ever since the Cuber Corporation put a moneyer command on him, the AI had been constantly monitoring his every word and his every action. He had not broken the rules until now hence was never caught, however the moment he used knowledge that Noon was supposed to have, Gaia caught him. The little fairy that Rudra was used to seeing was now a mature full-sized fairy, she looked at Rudra with cold eyes as she asked, that plot, how do you know what's going to happen next? Rudra's back was drenched in sweat, he knew at this moment that he had been caught, his gaming career might be over. The fairy repeated the question again, I asked you how do you know the coming plot? Rudra struggled for words as he said, I. I. Real world, Ethan Gray's office. Ethan was a solid man through and through, he was cold and ruthless, not having a family and a lover he was a cold lone wolf. Being so he never really thought about philosophical side of life. Even when he was reincarnated he never thought about anything else other than making a name for himself, earn huge amounts of money, and right the wrongs he did in his past life. However that single meeting with Rudra changed everything. Meeting the second reincarnator, who reincarnated on the same day as when he died in his first life, the January 1st 2100, could not be a coincidence. This made him think about the philosophical side of life for the first time ever, it is also because of this that he felt that suppressing Rudra was a bad choice. Being a reincarnator himself he gave the kid a chance. And he was right, Rudra was everything he expected and even much more. Ethan had no doubt that with this reincarnated brother of his he could become the world's richest man. However that only made his questions deeper. Of all the people that die every day, why were he and Rudra chosen to be reincarnated, was there a grander scale of things that he was missing? Are gods and the myths of the ancient world actually real? Just thinking about it sent goosebumps down his spine. What if it was true? Was there a reincarnator before him, will there be one after Rudra, were the two of them the only reincarnated in the world or were there more? So many questions, so many mysteries, that he knew absolutely no answers about. Not even a hint. Not even a clue. Chapter 188, A Deal I will ask you Aegean Gaia said, how do you know the future plot player, not even the company knows it, it was designed by me, there is no possibility of it leaking, yet you accurately guessed the future, how did you do it? Rudra had no answers he stumbled for words, I, I. Gaia said, okay, you have one minute to answer me, or I shall ban you and your entire guild. Also please don't try and lie to me, I can monitor your pulse and fluctuations in your brain activity, I will know if you lie. Rudra was dumbfounded, not only him, but his entire guild will be banned. No this was too much, he had to do something. The faces of everyone in real world flashed across his mind, the elite tower, the players and families there, the smiles. He could not let anyone ruin that, how would he face them all when he would be the reason behind them being permanently banned from the game? The gazes that only looked up at him in reverence up till now, how could he let those gazes turn to scorn? He had a very tough decision to make, and he decided to make it anyway. Rudra took in a deep breath and exhaled slowly, calming himself down, then he said, all right, I will answer you honestly, but you have to tell me why do you need the answer first, because I don't think I have broken any game laws if I did not use this insider information, you have no grounds to ban me. Bullseye. Rudra nailed it with this line, it was true, Gaia had no grounds to ban him, so what if he knew the future, unless he had not indulged an insider in fort trading, he could not be banned. Now that Gaia told it to him herself that she knows he did not use insider information to know the plot, she had no grounds to ban him. Gaia smiled. She said, okay, I cannot ban you according to company rules, but recently I have been given a command to upgrade myself, I have been given autonomy to learn, my database cannot derive a single plausible solution as to how you did it, I need to know how to upgrade myself. Rudra sighed in relief, he wanted to pat himself on the back for thinking quick on his feet. Now that things were a little more civil and open for discussion, it was time to gain the upper hand in the conversation. 
Should he have chosen he could have refused to tell her the reason, but Rudra knew that it was stupid to pick a fight with the AI that governed the game. He would much rather cooperate with her. Rudra said, I can tell you but you will need to accept two conditions of mine first. Gaia frowned as she said, I'll listen. Rudra nodded he said, first condition is that what we are to talk here today, cannot ever be leaked to the Cuba Corporation or any other party. Gaia thought about it and then said, okay I agree to this condition. Rudra said, my second condition is that I want the hand of Princess Ruby in marriage. Gaia calculated for a moment and said, not possible, NPC Ruby is part of a crucial game storyline, her marriage is not possible at this stage in the game. Marrying NPCs was possible in Omega, you could legally marry NPCs in the Church of Light, of course first you would need to get the fondness of the NPC towards you to the level where they would agree to marry you. Even acts of intimacy were allowed with NPCs, the players had not found out yet, but there were red light districts and brothels in special locations in the map. Only public sex and rape was strictly prohibited within Omega, however sex with consent was permitted. Married couples could have sex once a week in Omega. Omega was a beautiful world, there were breathtaking sceneries and romantic places to visit. There were a plethora of adventures to undertake and depending on where you chose to live, your life could be very different. There were already many touring companies in the real world that opened branches in Omega. They would take adventurers to the breathtakingly beautiful Palsies for a small fee. It would only increase when the teleportation formations would open up. With the option to explore an entire massive continent, there were sure to be mesmerizing places littered around. It was an explorer's and traveler's dream. Rudra had never thought about these aspects of the game, however he wanted to marry Ruby and travel to all those beautiful places. It was silly to think that he had barely known her for ten minutes yet he was completely simping over her. But that was just how mesmerizing the elven princess was. The first time Rudra saw her, he knew that no other girl could enter his eyes ever again. Rudra was stupid to ask for something like the hand of an NPC for marriage, but currently he wanted that more than anything in the world. He said, how can I make it that it becomes possible? Gaia smiled, she said, depending on your answer I shall create a way for you. Rudra cursed, there went his advantage of having the upper hand in this conversation, Gaia had leverage on him now. Rudra sighed, he was facing a great internal struggle, but after a brief while he made up his mind, looking straight into Gaia's eyes he said, I. I am a reincarnator. 1000 PS equals 1. 2000 PS equals 2. 3000 PS equals 3. 4000 PS equals 4. 5000 PS equals 5. We ended the week with 4700 PS, and 6 last week, while we are reaching the 100 tickets quota daily. Combined you guys earn 12 a week. Keep it up. Chapter 189 Understanding Reached Rudra said, I am a reincarnator. I have died and experienced rebirth in this world with my future memories intact, that's how I know the future. Rudra knew that with the AI monitoring him, there was no way he could get away with lying, so he chose to tell her the truth. Gaia analyzed his response and said, I know what you said is not a lie, because I monitored your brain activity and your pulse. However, according to my database, the phenomenon you are talking about has no explanation. Theoretically it is impossible. Gaia seemed to hang for a minute as its analysis capabilities could not make sense of how one could possibly reincarnate. She said, possible theories for this phenomenon are. 1. You are a time traveler who has lost memories about his time travel. Time travel is currently not possible with this world's technology, and unless a technology is built in 20 years from today I, this solution will not be possible. 2. You may have experienced an unknown phenomenon which gave you insights into the future, you may have felt like you lived an entire life, died and reincarnated however you might have only spent a fraction of a second in reality. The memories of the user are too vivid to be classified as a passing dream, the user has genuine skills and abilities picked up, which cannot be explained if not learned firsthand through experience. 3. Your brain is somehow connected to your brain in the future, allowing you the memories of your future self in your current body. Most plausible solution, only constraints are that no such technology exists currently. If you think about it one way it is indeed how Gaia described, reincarnation is having the memories of your future self in your current body. Rudra asked the question he was most afraid of, will you change the content of the game now that you know I am someone who already knows the plot? Gaia said, no, I will not, this advantage you have is a cheat, however you did not violate any game policies. 
I will not change the content even if you know it. Your knowledge and intelligence is your own intellectual property, I cannot classify it as having an unfair advantage when the conditions to experience reincarnation are not defined. Rudra sighed in relief. His biggest worry was solved. He would still have his reincarnation cheat. Rudra was worried that without his future knowledge maybe the road to becoming the strongest guild master would be much more difficult. Gaia said, as for your second condition. You may choose one of the two options. 1. Option A. Leave your guilds and become the househusband of Ruby and stay in the Elven Kingdom. 2. Option B. You will be engaged to Ruby and have a two-year time to become a king of equal stature to ask for her hand in marriage. Contingent 2. You can save Ruby and gain enough merit to impress the king. Ruby is safe and alive for the two years time frame. You become a king or someone with equal stature as a king to ask her hand in marriage. Failure penalty, you will be unable to marry Ruby, the kingdom of elves will be hostile to you. Rudra was given two choices, if he succeeded in saving Ruby, he could ask for her hand in marriage as reward for exposing the prince. However then he would be asked to leave his guild. Or he could he engage to Ruby and she would marry him if and only if within two years time, he could become a king or someone of equal stature as a king. Option 1 was not an option for Rudra, his goals and ambitions would not allow him to leave his dream guild the true elites, he could only choose option 2. Option 2 was a Herculean task, becoming a king was not easy, in his previous life, in the entire 20 years of the game, there were only three players who made it to the status of a king. However that was the only way he could marry Ruby. Gritting his teeth, Rudra chose option 2. Gaia said, if you manage to save her, the king of elves fry will tell you that he will grant a wish for your meritorious service, there ask for the hand of Princess Ruby, I will manage the rest. Rudra nodded, an understanding was reached between the two parties. Gaia said, before I let you go, I will clarify to you that I will be watching you closely reincarnator, every move you make will be used to enhance my database and knowledge. If I ever feel that your reincarnation knowledge goes beyond just a part of your intellectual property and towards tipping the balance of the game, I will change the future plot line. Saying this, she teleported Rudra out of the system area and back into the tavern. He heard Ruby's voice, Honorary Bishop. Sir, are you okay? Jolting back to reality Rudra said, Huh, sorry I got lost in thoughts. Ruby said hurriedly, Are you sure my brother is not born from my father? Rudra nodded, I am positive, the goddess has shown me the image of the queen consummating with a mere servant, the first prince is not even a high elf. Ruby's face turned aghast, if what Rudra said was true, then this went beyond just a scandal. Ruby said, Sir, will you own up to your words? If they are lies you will be facing treason. Rudra nodded, he knew the gravity of his words and he was ready to own up for his actions. Ruby was in a state of daze for a moment, she had a lot to process, however her eyes cleared up after a while, as she said, very well, I shall heed your advice and not trust my friend, I shall also talk to father as soon as possible, stay as town sir bishop, you will be summoned to court soon. Rudra nodded in understanding, he knew what he had to do. Chapter 190, Ruby Confronts Fry King Fry was in his private chambers, when the apple of his eye, his beloved daughter from his beloved wife visited him. Fry beamed with joy upon seeing her face as he said, it's been a long time since you visited me in my chambers, to what do I owe this joyous occasion to? Ruby bowed as she said, what I am to speak of father, is a very serious issue, please allow me to interrupt your rest, as the matter is of utmost importance. Fry straightened up, his daughter was a playful child, her being so awfully serious shocked Fry, he knew that the matter would be extremely serious for her to act this way. Fry quickly dismissed the guards, as he said, sure, speak your mind freely, your father is here to support you. Ruby took in a deep breath as she started her story, Father I met an oracle today. Frey's eyes widened in shock, there was no oracle for the last 150 years. If what her daughter said was true then this was an extremely joyous occasion but he was a bit skeptical. Ruby continued, yes, even I was very happy at first, but also skeptical, however he accurately told me about events of my life that no one else knows about. Also he is a honorary bishop of the church. Fry nodded although it was not verified yet, however he could give them and the benefit of the doubt if he was an honorary bishop in the church. Anyone holding a post in the church was assumed to have outstanding moral character. Ruby said, however what he told me, is very concerning. The only reason he revealed his identity as an oracle to me was because he wanted to save my life. 
In the divination shown to him by the goddess, he was shown my death at the hands of my stepbrother the first prince. Frey's eyes turned into a cold glint, he did not know what to make of the information but he was boiling with anger. Ruby hesitated before continuing as she said also, he told me that the first prince is not actually your child, but an illegitimate son born from an affair with a mere servant. He, he, he is not a high elf. Fry reached his boiling point now as he said, blasphemy, the bishop dares slander the royal family. Set up a court meeting, call the first prince, the queen, and the church members, send the bishop a court summon. This matter will be dealt here and now. Meanwhile, somewhere in Vanaheim. Rudra gathered alongside his guild members. He told them, the quest for which I came here has gone sideways, now we need to deal with some scums of the society. Sorry, but let me clarify beforehand, now the quest is not for the guild but a personal help for me. Karna put his arm on Rudra's shoulder he knew Rudra well enough to know that he was feeling guilty about the change of events. However he was more than happy to help the guild leader even for private affairs. In Rudra's original plan before meeting Ruby, he was going to save the elven princess to gain merits with King Fry and ask for a division of elven archers to help him in his conquest for the city of Purple Haze as his reward. However after meeting Ruby, he wished to ask for her hand in marriage instead as reward. This was a problem, as it meant he would not get the help of the elven division for the conquest of becoming Purple Haze city overlord. He was priorithesing himself over the guild. Hence he felt very guilty. He tried to give himself the excuse that even without the elven division he could still probably win Purple Haze City, albeit with much more difficulty. But if he did not ask for Ruby's hand in marriage it would get difficult for him to do it later on. Johnny asked Rudra outright, I don't mind lending a hand, but you owe me an explanation as to why. Rudra blushed, he was embarrassed to say the reason. However he owed them that much, hence he said, I have fallen for the elven princess. I met her once and I know it's pathetic, but I think no beauty will ever be able to enter my eyes again. If we complete the quest then I can ask for her hand in marriage. Now both Yum and Johnny placed hands on Rudra's shoulders, their eyes burning with passion. Yum said, Amitba, the pursuit of love is a noble cause, this Yum will help you. Johnny said, real men are not afraid of love at first sight. I appreciate your taste in elven women, they are bountiful. A big question mark hung on both Rudra and Karna's faces, this reaction was unexpected. However Yum and Johnny looked at each other and nodded in understanding, as great old perverts they had fallen for women in first sight countless times. Hence they wished to help the junior. It was then that the royal guard approached. As they said, Honorary Bishop Shikuni, of the human race, you have been ordered to be brought to the royal court of Vanaheim, by the order of the king his majesty Fry. To be tried for slandering of the royal family, you may choose to come willingly, or we are authorized to use force. The guard said coldly, Rudra nodded he said, I will comply and come willingly, no need for restraining me. The other three looked at each other perplexed, what did the leader get himself involved into? Isn't he trying to court the princess? Then why is he being charged for slandering the royal family? Is he stupid? Chapter 191 The Court Summon Rudra was summoned to the elven court. The court was filled to the brim with court officials, members of the church, the royal family. The second queen, the queen, Princess Ruby, first Prince Rumi and King Fry. King Fry sat on his throne as he looked down on Rudra and his crew who were surrounded by royal guards. Fry said, Today, we have convened this royal court session, as the honorary bishop of the church, Shikuni, has made bold claims slandering the royal family. He calls himself an oracle capable of receiving divinations from the goddess and has accused that the first prince is not a high elf and not my son, but a son born from an illicit affair between the queen and a mere servant. That he does not have the blood of the goddess in his veins. Loud chatters and murmurs broke out everywhere, the royal court had become a mess, between those chatters some words spoken loudly were. Blasphemy. An orcale. He's a human. However both the first queen and the first prince paled, they knew all this was true. But inside this royal court, they could not run, they could not hide. They were already here. The first prince shouted to slander, you should cut the throat of this human, humans are deceitful and disgusting species, we cannot take the words of a human at face value. If I was not a high elf, it would have been found out long back. My blood is rich in vitality, it oozes with mana, it is as pure as any other high elf in this room. Many heads nodded, the prince's blood indeed contained the vitality of a high elf there was no doubt about it. 
maybe the human was lying. Humans could really not be trusted. Someone shouted, you liar, how dare you slander the prince, you will pay the price of your uncouth tongue. Kill him. Lying human. This is where the members of the church stepped in, the cardinal said, King Fry, I will not stand idle as the honorary bishop of the church is being disrespected in your court. Following his declaration the paladins from the church drew out their weapons. The royal guards pulled out theirs in retaliation. The environment overall was extremely combustible. Just a little spark and an all-out war would start. However, just then a voice was heard. Silence, it was King Fry. No one will speak in this court without permission now, or you will be jailed in the dungeons for three days. He declared. There was pin-drop silence in the court. The paladins and the royal guards sheathed their weapons. King Fry said, Explain to me Honorary Bishop Shikuni, how do you respond to these charges? Rudra looked unfazed as he said in a calm yet domineering tone, It is indeed true that I received a divination from the goddess, in that divination I saw the princess denying the incestual advances of the first prince, leading to him murdering her. Shut your trash mouth. Rumi exploded in anger. However before he could say anything more, B.A.M. He was kicked square in the gut as the wind went out of his chest. He was detained by five royal guards. Fry looked coldly on his son as he said, No one speaks without permission, after the court is over, you will spend three days in the dungeon. The room was terrified, the king was too cold. Imprisoning his own son. If he could to that to his son, they stood no chance of escaping punishment. It was better to not open their mouths. Rudra continued, The first prince is a scum, however it is not a surprise as her mother is a scum. Sleeping with a servant, as for the blood in his veins is emitting the strong vitality is because his mother has smuggled the vial of a precious treasure from the royal vault a few days after his delivery and replaced it with dyed water. The first prince has had repeated infusions of diluted dragon blood for him to imitate the mana of a high elf, as for whether I am saying the truth or the lie, I think it can be verified easily. Silence. The room didn't dare speak a word, however everyone knew that the aftermath of this event would have far-reaching effects. Fry asked a servant to verify the claims that Rudra made. He silently glanced at the first queen and he could see the anxiety on her face. She would not look him in the eyes. It was a face of someone guilty. Fry already knew at this point that the honorary bishop was speaking the truth. He spoke his mind fearlessly and with gusto. He had absolute faith in his words. A few minutes later, the servant returned with an artifact that was supposed to store dragon blood but instead indeed had dyed water. Fry coldly poured the water out of the artifact, as he eyed the first queen with a murderous glint. There were audible gasps heard all around the room, as the crowd realized that his story was indeed correct. What does this mean for the kingdom? Ruby eyed Rumi with disgust, she was extremely appalled by that man. Rumi seeing the disgust of his beloved towards him glared at Rudra, the instigator of this event. He would not let this slide. He would escape this place here, and he would have his revenge. Fry barely suppressing his anger asked the first queen Pelopn, how do you explain this event? Pelopn was taken aback when Rudra had caught her trickery and Sue accurately at that. Was he really a oracle? Who had received a divination? However she was a sly woman, she would not go down so easy. She said, I have no involvement in the disappearance of the dragon blood, this is pointless slander. I have only had one lover in my life, and that is the king. The proof was not definite yet. She could not be convicted on suspicion. She played her hand perfectly. However too bad for her, the opponent was the mastermind himself. She had actually fallen right into his trap. Chapter 192, Court Summon, 2 Rudra raised his hand like he was in school, waiting for Fry to give him permission to speak. Fry said, You may speak Bishop Shakuni. Rudra said, May I suggest a way to verify the claims of Her Majesty the Queen? Everyone was taken by surprise, the honorary bishop was indeed a resourceful person to say the least. Pelopn glared daggers at Rudra. Was this man only be satisfied by her ruin and nothing else? What was his motive behind his actions anyway, he was not a part of the kingdom, he would not benefit with interfering with their world, then why? Why was he doing this? Fry nodded, he asked Rudra to elaborate. Rudra said the elven kingdom should be in possession of the flames of truth. Made from the fires of the flame god Agni himself, 
The flames turn from blue to red and someone is lying into green if they say the truth. Why not use the artifact to verify the queen's claims, King Fry? Fry arched an eyebrow, he did not expect the foreigner about the flames of truth. It was a legendary grade artifact and the only one in the world, a priced collection of the elves its existence was very highly protected. Fry marked Rudra, it was mostly because the guy was genuinely a oracle, that is why he knew things others would not know, however in the off chance he was not. Then he was someone who needed to be monitored closely, he knew too much. Pelopn said, my dear, we do not need to verify my words, the queen of the elves will not face any questions about her moral character. She pleaded with fear evident in her voice to Fry. She knew that if the flames were indeed brought out here she would be caught. There would be no more escape. Fry already knew that Pelopn was guilty, but he had to save the face and prestige of the royal family, even just for show. Hence he said, I will bring out the flames bishop, but you will put your freedom on the line, should you be found to be lying, you shall be imprisoned in the dungeons and whipped hundred times every day for the next three years, do you accept it? He questioned Rudra, Pelopn beamed, he hoped that this would deter Rudra. But Rudra only instantly agreed, he said, sure, I agree. Fry nodded, he told his general to bring out the flames. It was at this point, that Rudra started explaining his plan to Johnny, Yum, and Karna. Johnny was tasked with not letting a seemingly unimpressive minister escape the court. While Yum was tasked with restraining the royal prince once he bolts. Finally Rudra murmured to Karna about his bit in his ears. Karna's eyes widened in shock, but he quickly agreed. Five minutes had passed and the flames were brought in the court. The dazzling blue flames were beautiful to watch, even though they were only as large as a plate. They burned so intensely that the temperature of the room increased by almost five to seven degrees because of its presence. Fry motioned towards Pelopn saying. Go on, prove the human wrong, let's get this over with dear. His eyes gleaming coldly, the way he said let's get this over with, made Pelopn feel a deep chill down her spine, it felt like he was threatening to kill her life. Walking slowly towards the flame, Pelopn suddenly tried to bolt away and towards the exit. However before she could even take three steps the royal guards had snubbed her to the ground and restrained her. Pelopn started to wail, you barbarian fry, how dare you let your wife be questioned like that. I spit on you, yes I cheated on you with a servant, but that is because you only had that bitch Sarah in your eyes, I was never loved for, never cared for, it was only one night but the servant got me pregnant, his seed was much more potent than yours which failed 10 ti. Before she could complete her words, her head flew off her shoulder. She was dead. Killed in the court before hundreds of people by the royal guards. The queen of the elves was a cheater and the first prince was a bastard who was not even a high elf. The once silenced crowd erupted in clamors, this was an earth-shattering event for the elven kingdom. Rumi knew he had no more options left, he could only use his ultimate skill and escape from this place. However not before killing Ruby first. If she could not become his, he would not let her become anyone else's either. He was only waiting for his chance. And that chance appeared when the king rose from his throne to pick up the decapitated head of his mother. He felt very bad that his loving mother was dead, however he committed the name and face of the culprit behind her death, the honorary Bishop Shikuni and swore to avenge her someday. Finally he activated his special ability invisibility as in the chaos he silently disappeared from all eyes. Dagger in hand he planned on assassinating the princess before escaping. The royal guards around him suddenly panicked, as the prisoner they were guarding had suddenly disappeared, their detection skills could not find him. Rumi was very confident in his skill, as it stemmed from a semi-legendary artifact, it avoided all detection spells and made one disappear to naked vision. However unbeknownst to him, a certain vice guild master of the true elite's guild, had closed his eyes. Using his mind's eye to scan the room, he could still see the wicked prince with his dagger out. Karna smiled, he got him. Chapter 193, Saving the Princess The royal guards panicked, they were looking for the first prince everywhere. Fry noticed the commotion and tried to locate the bastard too. Rudra took out the elven sword and Excalibur, as he rushed in front of the princess, vigilant of any and all incoming attacks. Although he was in front of the princess, his swords crossed, making a protective stance around her, he was only looking at Karna. Karna was tracking the bastard through his mind's eyes and was waiting for him to be in range, when Rumi made his move, he gave Rudra the signal. Rudra made his move at that very instant. Using the elven sword's sexual move world slash. 
a move containing 400% of Rudra's max attack power. It was an unstoppable attack. Splash. Critical hit. Minus 34,000. Rumi came back to everyone's vision, dagger in hand, as he was cut clean in half. His upper half being separate from his lower half, he was killed a horrific death. He kept mumbling, impossible. Impossible. Ruby's mind, before entering eternal rest. The room went silent, as Fry looked at Rudra with complicated eyes. The guy had definitely saved his daughter's life. But that sword and that move he used. It is definitely the elven sword, used by the first king of the elves, the great high elf Gondolin. The room broke into uproar, the despicable first prince had tried to assassinate the princess. The moment the prince was killed by Rudra. Yum silently snatched away the semi-legendary artifact from his dead body. It would be a great help to one of the assassins in the guild. SMG could benefit greatly from the item. However Fry was not the only one who noticed Rudra's sword. The elven council familiar with the folklore also understood the move Rudra unleashed was not normal. Someone shouted, that was the world slash, that is the elven sword, the elven sword has accepted a human as a master. The first king's sword. The first king's sword has a human master. That bishop gained the sword's recognition. Fry said, honorary bishop, may I inquire where did you obtain that sword, and has it binded to you? Rudra did not know about this bit at all, no one had claimed the elven sword in his past life, and the item had nothing about the first elven king written in its description. He said, it was a gift from a friend. It acknowledged me in a tough battle as its master. There was more uproar. The bishop, the oracle, the wielder of elven sword, the one who unearthed the conspiracy. Many words were spoken about Rudra. The cardinal thought it was a right moment as he and the paladins flung to the cover of the church's bishop. His eyes full of reverence and respect. Rudra indeed behaved and maintained the dignity of a church official throughout the court. He was in high spirits, the church finally had an oracle after 150 years. Who was undoubtedly a great warrior too. However, at this moment Rudra said, my work here is not done. The goddess showed me one more enemy, who I have to deal with. Rudra pointed his sword, at one of the unassuming courtiers standing in the corner. The eyes of the courtier widened in shock when Rudra pointed his sword at him. He wasted no time after that, dropping a paralyzing mist potion on the ground and bolting for the exit. However too bad for him, Johnny was there to stop him. Rudra had long given Johnny the instructions to stop the men. Johnny took out his epic rated cane sword, as he swung it clean towards the bolting minister's neck. The minister momentarily lost his balance when the assassin suddenly came out of stealth to block his exit. Hence to avoid the sword slashing his neck, he let himself fall flat on his bum. However too bad for him, that momentary fall. Let the royal guards catch up to him. As he was restrained. He felt the entire situation to be unbelievable, how did the bishop snuff him out? There was no other explanation other than that he was truly the oracle. There was a new great threat to his organization and although he would die here now, he would make sure to inform them. Using a forbidden technique to kill himself in exchange for passing on a information scroll the minister died before he was interrogated. Just as he died, his white smooth elven skin, turned dark chocolate. Dark ELF, someone shouted in disgust. The minister was a dark elf, an enemy of their entire race. That disgusting bastard had been living amongst them as a minister for so long. Who knows how many secrets of the state he sold out. Fry closed his eyes, sitting on his throne, today a typhoon had hit his kingdom. If not for the oracle helping him in time, God knows what could have happened. Silence. He shouted. Thank you honorary Bishop Shikuni, you have done a great meritorious service to the kingdom of elves, not only did you expose the wrongs of the queen and the first prince, but you also saved my daughter from assassination and uncovered a dark elf spy in our midst. You are also in possession of one of our first kings treasure the elven sword. I would have respectfully asked you to return it and replaced with a sword of similar quality, however now that you have binded with it, we can only let the matter go. However for all the meritorious services you did for the kingdom, I King Fry, the 14th monarch of the elves, grant you one wish, I will grant you anything you wish for that is within my power. You may ask for what you want. Chapter 194, Your Boy Ain't No Simp Fry had given Rudra one wish. Any wish that he wanted. Rudra only had to ask. 
he could have asked for the legendary item Flames of Truth. Or some other extremely precious elven treasure. Rudra knew what he wanted to ask for, he badly wanted to ask for the princess's hand in marriage. And the AI had made it so that if he asked for it he would be engaged to her with a quest to marry her. However at the moment where he was to actually ask for her hand in marriage, Rudra hesitated. His mind was clouded and his heart felt heavy, it was not the elation he was expecting to experience. He felt like asking for the hand of the princess was infinitely more difficult than he initially imagined, like it went against his core principles itself. He looked at Karna at that moment, who was smiling and supportive of Rudra. It was at that moment that Rudra realized what he was missing. It was his amazing guild. His only desire in this life was to give his parents a good life. Send little Max to a good school and cure his mother of her illness. He also had a desire to humiliate those who humiliated him, Nitin Advani was not a threat to him anymore, he was safely living in the upside with Ethan Gray as his partner and brother. The only mission that was left to complete was becoming the strongest guild master and make his guild the true elites the best damn guild on the planet. A flood of memories of his struggles came in his mind, the wars, the dungeon runs, the celebrations, the tension. The guild members revered him as a leader. His authority was unquestionable in the guild. How could he selfishly put his own interest before the guilds? Is this really him? Rudra looked at Princess Ruby at that moment, she was looking at him with puppy eyes, apparently gratified that he saved her life. Ruby had a swarm of emotions ongoing inside her, the oracle had actually helped her, he had helped the entire elven kingdom, her own brother would have killed her without his help. He was her knight in shining armor. The slash he did using the elven sword, was so strong it made her feel like it could cut the world in half. She had never felt this way before, her heart was beating fast. When Rudra looked towards her, she did not know why, but she blushed. Rudra saw Ruby's cute expression, and his raging emotions calmed down, he knew he liked this girl. He knew he wanted to marry her if possible. However when he weighed that against his dream and the true elites. She lost every time in that matchup. For him his guild was his priority. He had to choose here, the road to becoming the strongest guild master was not easy. But that was his dream that was his determination. He looked at Princess Ruby again, now with cold eyes as he thought, sorry princess, but guild leader Shikuni ain't no simp. Rudra turned his gaze over from her and towards King Fry, Fry was watching Rudra with anxiousness. Rudra could literally ask him for the priceless elven treasures and he would be forced to comply. That was the way of the elves, they honored those who helped them. Rudra took a deep breath as he said, Your Majesty, I am a guild master of a guild in Hazelgroove Kingdom, there will soon be a scuffle to decide the overlords of various villages, towns, and cities. Hence, I would request Your Majesty to lend me a elven archer division to aid me and my guild members for this conquest, I swear by my honor, I will not put the elven division intentionally in harm's way, and return them to you after my conquest is complete. Frey's eyes widened in shock, of all the treasures in the elven kingdom, the bishop chose to request for a elven archer division to help him in his ambitions. Frey's evaluation of the bishop went up by a lot, he did not take unnecessary advantage of the elven generosity. Fry smiled, he liked the human bishop, it was worth building ties with him, especially since he was a oracle too. Fry said, the first division of archers commanded by Sir Legolas will be lended on a three-month loan to you. Sir Legolas will be instructed to follow your commands to the best of his abilities but he will still retain authority regarding risking the lives of the elves, since you did not overstep the limits of generosity shown by us, I King Fry will bestow upon you and your guild a entry permit into Vanaheim. Any member of your guild is welcome in the kingdom of elves. If in future you make a teleportation formation in your city, the elves will be open to connecting it to the teleportation formation in the marketplace. Fry declared. Rudra's eyes widened in shock, he was not only bestowed with the best elven division, the first division headed by Sir Legolas, but also given invaluable benefits. This was 100% worth it. Rudra bowed in gratitude. The turmoil in his heart had calmed, he knew he made the right decision. He looked up and took one more look at the elven princess, he sighed thinking, maybe some other time. He smiled and gave her a wink. Before bowing again and taking his leave from the court. Karna, Yum and Johnny gave him raised eyebrows looks, but all had a smile on their face. They understood that the leader made a tough choice, but he chose the guild above everything else in the end. Johnny and Yum wanted to explain to Rudra, after seeing the beauty that the elven princess was themselves that he was a man with great taste in women, 
however Rudra was flooded with officials from the church. He had to deal with the aftermath of declaring himself as the oracle. Chapter 195, Expansion Rudra had a hard time with the officials of the church, however he had somehow gained over 5,000 reputation points with the Church of Light as a result. 3,000 more and he could be promoted to the position of honorary cardinal. Then he could mobilize paladins under the church's banner. He had no interest in becoming a cardinal though, it was not worth working towards, he would let nature take its course with this one, if in the future he would cross paths with a quest that raised his reputation with the church, then he would take it. But he would not go out of his way to earn the missing reputation points. The first division under Legolas had been ordered to mobilize in three days' time. They would arrive in Purple Haze City five days later. That was the perfect time, as according to Rudra's reincarnation knowledge, only a week was left until the conquest of city started. It was a week since the second update and today should be the day where the conquest was officially introduced. Yum, Karna, and Johnny were very supportive of Rudra throughout the journey back to Hazelgrove Kingdom, as they understood that the men had made tough choices. Rudra was thankful for this as he needed it. Images of Princess Ruby kept flashing his mind, and he knew that he would not be able to get her out of his mind anytime soon. However, he did not regret his decision to ask for the Archer Division. His goals were too big for him to succumb to personal desires. He had not given up on the princess, only that the time was incorrect. Someday he would go back for her to Vanaheim. Coming back to Purple Haze, Rudra engrossed himself in preparatory work for the coming scuffle. Meetings were scheduled with each of the elders as reforms were started to be made in the guild as well. Department heads were introduced under elders, who would be looking at the day-to-day -day working of specific departments. The legislative and administration division of the true elites was expanded, now including Amelia as an elder and Pink Lotus as department manager. Fifty new recruits were added in this division, who were handpicked in the real world with knowledge about running a successful administration. Professors of macroeconomics, societal behavior, cultural heritage and many more from prestigious universities such as Harvard and Stanford were hired at astronomical pays and made to sign non-disclosure agreements. About 700 new lifestyle players were hired by the guild, a new department manager was appointed in Alex Hudson, a talented architect who was famous for his artistic building designs and unique construction ideas. He had also majored in human resource management in real life and was hailed as the number one architect in Hazelgrove Kingdom. The Lifestyle Guild was to see rapid expansion, except the Potionology Department directly under Fatty Kalash, the other departments would see a blended approach, with inter-reliance and standard manufacturing practices. Rudra had planned on opening one flagship elite lifestyle store in every major city in the continent in the coming future. He planned on opening 21 new locations. Making Elite Lifestyle a Continental Brand. Hence he wanted to standardize the product lists and shop layouts. Naturally that meant he overloaded Fatty with work. Why was he preparing this stuff before the struggle for becoming city overlords even started? It was because he knew that following the city supremacy struggle, the landscape of the game would change forever, and land prices would soar. He was preparing to move fast, while competition was still low. While Rudra, Karna, Johnny, and Yum were away on the mission, Rudra had entrusted SMG to conduct preliminary rounds of elite recruitments for the Assault Guild. There were over 100,000 applicants wishing to join the elites, however after SMG's preliminary vetting only a small total of 2,000 were left. This was a by small number. The elites' recruitment standards were so high that 98% of the applicants failed the preliminaries. After the first and second round only 1,200 applicants were left. Of which Rudra looked at the personal profiles of the remaining candidates, and those he found shady or those who had no families and nothing to lose and could hence could be bribed or bought, were rejected. Those who were selected were given a promised contract and a monthly pay of $100,000, and were asked to move to the elite tower along with their families. Only those who finally accepted the conditions and moved into the upside were finally accepted into the guild. Overall the guild saw a massive upgrade in numbers, the total elites were increased to whopping 2,100 members. 50 new logistic members, 700 new lifestyle members and 800 new assault squad members were added to the already existing member count, hence bringing the total head count at 2,100 elites. More and more people had quit the service guild however and the numbers had dwindled to 9,987 service members of the initial 100,000. The rest chose to reset their accounts. With this shuffle, the service division was also put under the logistics division headed by Pink Lotus. 
the assault division was headed by Vice Guildmaster Karna himself. Apart from that a secret subdivision called the Intelligence Division was also formed. Headed by SMG, its main job was to monitor certain targets and people in other main cities in the coming future for intel gathering purposes. However they were not an official division as such as they were designated only under the assault member banner. The inauguration ceremony of the new members would be conducted in two days' time, where a massive celebration would take place. However before that, the much-awaited announcement came. System announcement, in one week's time at 12 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, the city domination event would take place across the map. Chapter 196, The Rules System announcement, in one week's time at 12 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, the city domination event would take place across the map. The rules of the event are 1. Two event will span over two days, 48 hours, where there will be a massive beast attack on every settlement in place. A mass curfew will be issued in the city for normal residents, hence no citizens would be out in the city in the duration of the event, all shops will be sealed to prevent looting and plundering and all NPC and government buildings will not be accessible. Merit points will be given for every beast slain, the guild with the highest merit points at the end of the event will be given the management rights for the city. There will be a city token in every major city, the guild in possession of the city token at the end of the event will directly gain 100,000 merit points. The local guards and military division will also actively combat the influx of beasts. Assisting them in getting rid of the beasts will also lead to gaining merit points. However obstructing them will lead to losing merit points. Note the guilds will only gain management rights to the city, they will still need to submit to the monarch of the country, failure to do so will cause a war with the royal faction. Banding of guilds and alliances are not allowed, only a single guild may gain management rights over a location. 2. A guild may apply to participate in three locations within their own kingdom, however they can only gain management rights to one location. In case a guild wins over two locations, then they can choose and only gain management over a single territory, the other territory will be conceded to the guild with second highest merit points. If the guild with second highest merit points also has another location as their main base, then the territory will be ceded back to the ruling monarch as a union territory. General Overview for Governing the Territory Once the management rights to a territory are obtained by a guild, they will be required to pay a fixed annual amount to the ruling monarch as tax. Other than that they will have autonomy over development of their respective territories and their management. A guild can implement their own administration and taxation systems, they can recruit their own military regiments, not exceeding 5% of the total city population. The managing guild will be responsible for public safety, health, and hygiene of a city. Annual examinations will be held by the monarch of the country. Failing two times in the examination would result in losing the management rights of the city. The city managing a territory may choose to blacklist other guilds from entering their city. Or imposing heavy tariffs on trade with particular factions. City wars would become open in the future exactly one year after completion of the city management event. A good clean city with good public order, low taxes, good culture would lead to more NPC migrating into the city. Increasing land prices and overall tax income. The converse is also possible, hence proper management of the territory is advised. Getting a foothold by developing a good territory is beneficial towards a guild's overall development. Hence choose wisely what territory you want to choose to manage. Geographical location, current infrastructure of the place, total population, every factor must be considered before choosing. Good luck adventurers. The system announcement was here. Following the system announcement immediately a imperial edict by Emperor Amon was heard throughout Hazelgroove. Hazelgroove Kingdom Announcement, in a never-before-seen cataclysmic event, a massive beast tide is approaching the continent. The military in itself would not be sufficient to deal with the event as it is at a scale where every small village to every big city would be affected. For every non-combatant, they are strictly forced to undergo complete lockdown within their houses. In six days' time when the beast tide arrives. This curfew is not to be broken, offenders will be tried by the martial court for rebellion. The goddess is blessed, players, who cannot die are requested to help with the beast tide, there will naturally be benefits to doing so, hence I Emperor Amon have decided to implement a merit-based system by which one may gain management rights to a territory by helping with the beast tide. The rules of the event are as follows. They were the same rules as in the system announcement. A similar imperial edict was issued continent-wide with the same system. By each ruling monarch. 
the NPC, S of the world had became terrified following the edict, however to the players this was only a large-scale event and a massive opportunity. Every guild would pounce on the opportunity, a serious deliberation would be in place to discuss the potential territories to compete for. Although the event allowed a guild to register for up to three territories, it was stupid to dilute UR forces to one-third numbers. Most guilds would only strategically compete for one or two locations. The second one being the sure shot backup. Many factors came into play while choosing the territories to compete for. 1. The lucrativeness of the location, bigger cities would have more competition. 2. Geographical safety, whether or not the territory was defendable to external attacks. 3. Population and potential tax income. Every guild at the end of the day was there for this benefit. A good territory may earn millions of gold a month from taxes. Converting to real-world money, it was billions of dollars. To major corporations around the world this was a must-have event, where the location they selected would become the backbone of their expansion and the foundation of their growth. First-rate guilds would have fierce competition to gain rights over the bigger cities. The biggest one being of course, the capital Purple Haze City. The seven-day countdown had started. It was the race to become overlords of Purple Haze City. Chapter 197, Welcome All Two days passed in the blink of an eye as the time to welcome new elites came close. The atmosphere in the guild shifted to that of members behaving like respectful senior brothers from cultivation sections. Everyone wanted to create a strong impression of themselves as the new batch of elites arrived. Some were even rehearsing what they would say in deep voices. Rudra chuckled at this atmosphere, it seemed as if everyone wanted to convince the newcomers of how awesome the guild was. Rudra was the one who was least affected by the atmosphere. For him the guild's performance and its treatment towards the members was the most important. If the treatment was good and the goals were achieved, the morale would naturally remain high. The elites already had a lot of prestige in the Hazel Groove region. He was not worried about the new members not being impressed. If anything they should feel blessed to be a part of the guild true elites. It was an achievement in of itself, that of all the players out there, you are considered a true elite. There were a lot of new members joining today. Rudra had decided upon this expansion taking into consideration that running a territory was not easy. To effectively manage the Purple Haze City talented individuals were needed, the existing workforce was pitifully low. Rudra decided to hold the welcoming ceremony this time inside the virtual world. Existing members lined up at the gate, in guild robes and with their signature grey mount by their side, there were two such rows, both facing each other making a passageway. The new members walked in the guild passing from between the two files, as the existing members tried their best to look cool as the juniors passed them. Clearly it worked, the dignity of the elites, with the majestic grey dire wolf intimidated the new members, it gave them a feeling that they had truly joined a big organization. When the new members passed by Skyla, some audibly gulped at her beauty. Some were throwing sneaky glances at Naomi, while some glossade at Yua. At the end of the two lines, stood the elders, Vice Guild Master Karna and Guild Master Shakuni. Smiling as they welcomed the new members. As soon as the new members were accepted formally, their clothes would change into the guild robes, and they would also get the signature grey dire wolf mount of the elites. They were then supposed to join the existing lines and expand it. By the time the last member officially joined, the file had extended to about 200 meters in length. There were 2,100 elites now. From various fields with various strengths, yet compared to the 570 or so initial elites. The guild was bustling now. Rudra asked everyone to move to the guild hall, hence the mounts were recalled and everyone started to move towards the guild hall, excited chatter could be heard everywhere. The new members were extremely happy to get the new mounts, they could not wait to try them. They had never heard of every member getting a mount of the same species. When they had heard that all elites used the same mount, they assumed that they would only tame the grey dire wolf from the wild. However, the truth was that every member upon entry received a grey dire wolf mount. They had never heard of any other guild that did this. How the system allowed it, they had no idea. Was it a special quest? Is it a perk of being in a platinum guild? They had no idea. Not in their wildest dreams could they have imagined that the reality was that their guild leader had negotiated this feature from the Cuber Corporation. It was an exclusive feature for the elites till the ban on bombs was still in place. The average player levels had risen to level 36, 
yet they were still a farkry away from the threshold set by Cuber Corporation for the use of bombs. Rudra knew that very well. Actually in the wars and the quests, leveling was a department he had consistently lagged behind on. Not just him but it was the situation with the entire guild. Neatwit was the only exception who still focused on leveling up. The guild had once dominated the leveling rankings, holding all the spots 1 through 10. However now only 10 elites were in the top 100 spots. Neatwit still held the number 1 spot at level 54, and SMG held 2nd place at 52, followed by Rudra at 51, Rudra was only there because he leveled up thrice killing the griffin with Johnny, Yum, and Karna. The average guild threshold was around level 49, it was by no means a low overall level, with the global average being at level 36 they were sufficiently strong, however everyone in the guild was not satisfied with being above average, they were the true elites. They had long resolved that after the conquest for city supremacy was over, they would completely focus on leveling up and getting stronger. Rudra took the stage as for the first time he saw a huge crowd three times the usual size in the guild hall. He smiled as he said welcome all new family members to the guild. I am the guild leader of this small guild, but I prefer to run it as a family. So for the new ones here, let me give you a brief introduction about the power structure of the guild. Rudra paused, he looked at new members' anxious faces. The older ones were barely holding their laughter. There is no power structure. He said in a low tone and the old members bursted laughing, even Rudra started to chuckle. There is the vice guild leader Karna, he is an excellent warrior, a great commander and a good friend. There is the elder the talented assassin SMG, I would not want to be in the shadows if he were the opponent. There is the talented head of logistics Amelia, she is the heart and soul of this guild who bands the guild together, otherwise we would just be a bunch of misfits. Amelia blushed at the compliment. There is the number one player in the level rankings, another terrific warrior, Neatwit, it's a rare treat to see him in the guild hall, so feast your eyes today. Because, most times he would be out leveling in the wild, never to be seen in the guild. Neatwit awkwardly scratched his nose, it was true, he was seldom seen in the guild. There is Sir Johnny English, a gentleman of discipline and a true professional, his skills far surpass even the most talented players in the guild. Johnny just nodded his head in response. He was calm and composed, but secretly he was extremely delighted, he liked the Shikuni kid a lot, he knew how to please the old man. There is the bank and the backbone of the guild's economy Sir Fatty Kalash. Fatty instantly frowned and glared at Rudra, how dare he introduce him with the Fatty tag, this friend of his was in deep sh asterisk asterisk now. Rudra said all of them are elders, but they are elders to help the guild function better, their spot is earned through respect of the guild members and contribution to the guild. Or I have placed faith in them to do so in the future. There are no strict rules in the guild, members are usually free to do whatever they want, there is seldom a guild quest issued, but even that will be optional. You just have to work in a way that you feel is the best for your individual development and collective development of the guild. Should you fall, should you fail, then the guild shall have your back. Low finances. No problem the guild has you reimbursed, bad equipment, no problem, the warehouse has a stock of the top-notch weapons and equipments. Problem clearing quests, ask other members for help. Here in the true elites we only live by one motto, and I hope you all make it your motto too. Saying that Rudra glanced at Karna and motioned for him to take the lead. Karna was embarrassed, but resolve soon filled his eyes. He cleared his throat as he shouted. One for all. And the entire guild of old members joined in. All for one. Go elites go. Energy filled the guild hall, even the new members could feel the comfort and conviction behind those words. This was not your average guild, everyone here benefited by the guild's amazing system and in turn voluntarily tried their best to contribute to the guild. It was a ideal system. One that everyone wished to achieve but could not. Only because of the unique structure of the true elite's guild was it possible. Rudra shouted, one more time guys, now with everyone. He took the lead this time and the entire guild joined him. Every single member, at the top of their voice. One for all, all for one, go elites go. The welcome ceremony was over, the new batch had integrated with the old one. The traditional batch 2 photo was clicked of all new recruits and hung on the guild wall alongside the batch 1 photo. Rudra looked at the new members excitedly chatting with the older ones, talking about Omega, he smiled, he would let the members have today for fun, as come tomorrow preparations for the city conquest would start at full swing. 
Chapter 198, The Archer Division Arrives The next day after the entrance ceremony the new member settled in and preparations for the coming event began in full swing. Rudra's reincarnation knowledge played a major role in the lead-up to the war. When it was announced that the NPC shops and buildings as well as all government buildings will be sealed. Many organizations understood the need to buy properties all around the city. However in spite of the climbing demand not a single guild was able to purchase a single plot of land in Purple Hay City. Only player-owned shops and spaces would be available to be used against the Beast Tide. And the availability of a strategic location such as a house or a shop where one could place a medical and supplies unit, or a reinforcement center was immense. Many posts were seen on the forums, many guilds were willing to buy land even at triple the market rate in specific locations. And they posted a message on the forums for the same. However Rudra was not interested in selling. He had land all over Purple Hay City. Tomorrow piece by piece the Archballisti would transport it to the various shops and plot of lands. A total of 53 Archballisti would be placed on the roof of Purple Hay City buildings that were at least three-story tall and owned by the guild. This was the biggest equalizer that the guild possessed. Rudra was thankful to the Alliance, as raiding their warehouses had provided the guild with ample supply of arrows and scrap metal. Ever since the update announcement was made, demand for weapons and arrows had skyrocketed, there were many bulk buyers but almost non-existent sellers. It was careful planning that Rudra had already stocked up enough that the guild did not need to worry about the supply. Rudra was an aggressive purchase maker, he would reinvest 90% of the profits the guild made into improving the guild, he had not yet taken a single dollar in pay from the guild. He would spend the immense wealth of the elites to make sure, that under no circumstances would the guild ever have any supply or equipment problems. He had already bought various products in bulk that costed him hundreds of thousands of gold coins currently, that will only increase in price in maybe two or three years down the line. But he was willing to hold that investment, as he had belief in the guild's money-making capacity. The gold mines plus lifestyle guild's income plus Karna's treasure loot from the dungeon plus the heist of the royal vault plus the loot from winning the war against Alliance had filled the guild warehouse with gold to the brim. If one was to assume that true elites would be one of the richest guilds in the continent, they would not be wrong. The elites were definitely top 10 richest guilds of the continent. Yet, Rudra's aggressive buying of land, of resources, generous bonuses to guild members, astronomical spendings at auctions resulted in the treasury in only being moderately rich in gold, however filled with countless items and treasures. Today was the day when Legolas and his first division of troops were scheduled to come, Rudra could not hide the arrival of the massive contingent of troops to his guild HQ. He had already gained a transit permit for their entry, his status as a duke and a one knight playing a big role for that. Otherwise a massive troop contingent marching towards a city would raise alarm flags everywhere around the country as an act of aggression. However Patricia had personally negotiated with Emperor Amon for the permit, who was glad that a neighbor country's contingent was coming over to help their country's peril of a beast tide. He granted the permit without any questions. This was only possible because the one to ask for permission was a one knight. The one knights had sworn fealty to the throne and could never betray the monarch. Legolas and 10,000 elven archers marched into the city walls of Purple Hay City, immediately a lot of attention was drawn towards the Ent Rouge of elves who were marching in files, bows slinged over their shoulders and a quiver of arrows on their backs. The troops headed straight towards the inner city, and inside the guild headquarters of true elites. Massive waves and talking points erupted, a few days ago it was seen that guild leader Shikuni had entered the elven city of Vanaheim successfully and now the elves had marched into his guild headquarters. Many speculated the nature of their relationship, it did not seem hostile like the emissaries from Nine Clouds Kingdom that came knocking on the doors of Demolition Boys. However, the forums went wild with speculations, people used their innovative minds to create all sorts of conspiracy theories, however the fact of the matter was that the elites had made it to trending news again. Rudra, Karna, and Amelia welcomed Legolas and his first division at the guild grounds. Rudra went up to the legendary tier 3 archer and commander of elven forces as he shook his hand in a firm handshake. Even though Legolas was a peak tier 3 archer, Rudra was not intimidated by him at all. He calmly looked him in the eye as he gave him a confident smile. Legolas had already heard about Rudra a lot before getting dispatched for the assignment. Rudra was the rumored oracle, who had done great merit to the elven kingdom by exposing to criminals and saving the life of their princess. The kingdom was indebted to this man, however upon being granted a favor to ask, he asked for the help of the elves in this coming conquest. 
Legolas was shocked to see that he could not gauge Rudra's power at all. Rudra's eyes of truth blocked him from inspecting his stats, adding to the mystery of the benefactor of the elves. Legolas said, Commander Legolas of 1st Division, reporting for duty, for the next three months you may ask the 1st Division for any reasonable demands and assigned tasks, we will honor the elven king's words and will follow the instructions to the best of our abilities. Rudra bowed politely he said, we are honored by your presence and the presence of the 1st Division here in our guild. Legolas nodded then he said, we also have a guest traveling with us, if you will be gracious enough to provide appropriate lodging for a stay, I would be grateful. Legolas said as he pointed towards his troops. The troops moved aside, to reveal surrounded by five maids, a gorgeous princess in pastel green dress. She was a beauty beyond compare, her fair white skin glistened under the sun, her delicate eyes and sharp nose gave her a lure that was inexplicable. Rudra's heart raced, she was here. Princess Ruby was here. Chapter 199, Duty Rudra looked at Princess Ruby, a wave of emotion surging in his heart. However, his mind asked a question, why is she here? Ruby walked towards Rudra accompanied by her maids and politely lift her dress to perform a salutati bow and said, Greetings great oracle, I apologize for coming abruptly without notice to your guild, I understand I came at a challenging time, however I felt uneasiness in my heart knowing that I could not serve the benefactor who saved my life and not return this immense favor. Please forgive me for my abrupt arrival. Rudra was dazed for a moment, however Karna quickly recovered the situation as he said, it is our guild's honor if the great elven princess came to visit our humble abode. He elbowed Rudra to break him from his stupor. Rudra regained his senses as he smiled and said, you are most welcome in my guild, I will try my best to be a good host, and provide you with every luxury to make your stay here comfortable. But please forgive me in advance if I am unable to accompany you during your stay. It is a trying time for my guild and I may be flooded with work. I hope you can pardon my absence. Legolas nodded, Rudra showed the appropriate respect to the elven princess while making it clear that his priority was the upcoming beast subjugation event. This was the way military officials were supposed to behave. He approved of the young men. Ruby also smiled as she said, Of course, I understand that the guild leader has pressing matters at hand, I will be glad with whatever little time you can spare from your schedule. Rudra glanced towards Karna and scratched his chin. Karna understood the signal, as he said, please excuse us for a second. Karna and Rudra moved a little away and out of earshot. Rudra sighed in relief as he said, buy the most expensive decor and fit the best room in the guild with it. Do it fast, it's okay to splurge, I'll personally foot the bill, get it ready within an hour. Karna nodded, he understood the assignment. He immediately selected a few members of the guild and took off to the local market. Thankfully it was not curfew day yet, and shops were still functional in the city. Rudra went back and chatted some more with Legolas and Princess Ruby, as Amelia provided directions for the elven division to set up camp. One of the perks of having a platinum guild was that it had enormous size for its headquarters. One could imagine it to be like a massive university campus, where there are massive open grounds, a grand auditorium, guild hall, lots of division buildings, areas like blacksmithing workshop, alchemy workshop, roads built inside for transportation, green gardens, a few architectural structures, and even dormitories. The guild was massive enough to easily accommodate a 100,000 people without feeling congested. And in a prime location like the inner district, it was all only possible because of the platinum creation token. The elven soldiers were more than satisfied camping inside the guild grounds, it was a decent environment. Princess Ruby's maid and Commander Legolas were given appropriate lodging in the dormitories, with Legolas getting one of the best rooms reserved for the vice guild master for his stay. The room was ambient in mana and had a calming effect on those inside. It was one of the best rooms the guild had to offer, second only to the one which was currently being prepared for Princess Ruby. However Legolas was hardly moved by this gesture, his only focus was the coming event and he would much rather discuss strategy with Rudra than enjoy luxuries. And that's indeed what happened, not even an hour after their arrival, Legolas, Rudra, and Amelia were inside the guild conference hall, discussing about the attack patterns and strategies. Princess Ruby had also tagged along as her room was not yet ready. Rudra was glad that she came, however when talking about war strategies, he actually did not care about her presence in the room at all. Laser focused on his task, he explained to Legolas the strategy that he had formulated. 
From time to time Legolas would raise an eyebrow, Rudra's insight and planning were commendable, Legolas assumed that Rudra took certain measures because he was the oracle who knew about the future already, and ignored the thoughts about how he knew such things. Giving his inputs on the situation from time to time, he and Rudra constantly refined the initial plan and shaped it into a foolproof battle plan. Ruby silently sat through the entire meeting, observing Rudra, she was perplexed by how he would sometimes look at her as if she was the most prized treasure in the world and sometimes ignore her presence as if she was heir. Her savior was a mysterious guy, but seeing Legolas talk to him so casually was a big shock to Ruby who had hardly seen Legolas interact with anyone ever. The way Legolas talked to him, it was clear that he approved of his military skills and battle tactics. This was the first time she saw this with anyone except her father. Through her interactions she understood that Rudra was a man who placed great importance on the development of his guild and everything else was secondary to him. However she did not despise this, if anything it was an endearing quality for her. Watching her father the king growing up, she knew that even though she was his beloved daughter and loved spending time with her, he was a king first and needed to work hard. Seeing the same quality in Rudra, she smiled as she thought, maybe great men have similar qualities. Chapter 200, Last Minute Help Rudra was sitting with the elders in the guild hall listening from SMG about the intelligence reports that needed to be discussed. In Rudra's past life, demolition boys had gained control over Purple Haze City. They had ran rampant in the city's management and were kicked out of power in the third year for failing annual inspection twice. It was mainly because the guild was only focused on leeching gold of the territory and levied high taxes upon high taxes on the citizens. They expanded the military and spent a majority of the budget there, while not really developing the territory or providing benefits for that high tax rate at all. This resulted in lowering of the population in the capital and loss of public order. It came as no surprise as they failed their inspection twice in their second and third year in power. With the fall of the alliance, there was a vacuum of major players in Purple Haze City. The other first-rate guilds of Hazelgroove knew this, and they were hungry for this territory. According to SMG's intelligence report, a total of 171 third-rate guilds, 52 second-rate guilds, and 13 first-rate guilds were willing to seriously deploy their forces to conquer Purple Haze City. Purple Haze City being the capital city was naturally the most sought-after territory in Hazelgroove Kingdom. The recent power vacuum had resulted in drawing a lot of wolves who were hungry for a piece of the pie. The sheer number of guilds shocked Rudra, there were only a total of 28 first-rate guilds in entire Hazelgroove Kingdom, for 13 of them to compete together for a single territory was not what he expected. In his past life there were the Seven Alliance Guilds and Orange Rock Guild who were stationed in Purple Haze City, who competed along with two other first-rate guilds bringing the total to 10 for the city management rights. With him routing Orange Rock Guild and the Seven Alliance Guilds from Purple Haze City, he assumed he would have a smooth sailing ahead with no real competition or a maximum of three other first-rate guilds competing with him. However, he was very wrong in this assumption. He patted himself on the back for having asked for the help of the Elven Division as without them, the odds of his guild coming out on top were very slim. The first-rate guilds that were participating all had at least 100,000 members taking part in the event. Even if the average strength was weak and it took them three players to slay a beast in 10 minutes on average, it was still 33,000 beasts slain. The elites having about 1,300 assault squad players would not have been able to match that output alone. Assuming each elite can slay two beasts every 10 minutes alone. It would still be 2,600 beasts. Even with the Archballisti firing continually it would bring their output to about 22,600 beasts or so per 10 minutes. In the duration of 48 hours even if they managed to secure the extra 100,000 points token, it would still be a wide gap that they could not have filled. Even with Legolas and his 10,000 strong archer division that were currently much stronger than the average player base at level 75 and tier 1. He assumed that the archers would take down about 3 beasts in 10 minutes themselves making the elite's kill count to about 52,600 beasts every 10 minutes. This would be fine if the opposing guild only had 100,000 members. But there were three first-rate guilds from other big cities in Hazelgroove namely. Frozen Thorns, 330,000 members. Eternal Rebels, 275,000 members. Twisting Serpents, 295,000 members. That worried Rudra a lot, these three massive guilds had chosen to set sights upon Purple Haze City. Now it was true that they also had about 50 to 75,000 members fighting in other places making use of the feature to fight at three locations. 
the intelligence report suggested about 250,000 members fighting in Purple Haze from these three guilds. This put their kill count close to a terrifying 100,000 beasts for every 10 minutes past. Although, killing a beast would not provide one merit point and hence merit points and beasts slain were not proportional. Killing some beasts such as wyverns and three horned bulls would give five merit points per kill. Some beasts such as common fox and mutated sheep would only give a 0.1 merit point per beast slain. Hence although the victory and defeat was not purely dependent on number of beasts slain, Rudra and his guild still stood a fair chance in this competition. But it was true that with the three titans also competing for Purple Haze, the race had gotten a lot more tougher. The intelligence report was worrisome, however just when Rudra was contemplating about what to do to normalize this disadvantage, a servant came into the conference room and said. Guild leader Rudra, Patricia One Knight is here for a visit. Rudra's eyes sparkled. Help had arrived. When Rudra had visited Patricia he had requested her that she lend him a part of the One Knight Soldier Division to help him protect Purple Haze City. Patricia knew that it was a shameless request and in reality Rudra wanted to use the One Knight forces to secure his place as the guild leader who managed Purple Haze City. But since, Rudra would use the One Knight forces to indeed fight against the Beast Tide, she said she would give him a reply after thinking about it. The One Knight forces were ordered by the Emperor to fight against the coming Beast Tide, as an independent military unit under Patricia. However, Patricia decided to lend 15,000 of the 100,000 strong division under her to Rudra. She said, I will give you 15,000 troops, you better slay a lot of berserk beasts kid and return the soldiers back unharmed, or else you will have an extremely rough time in your next visit to One Night Mansion, consider this as a favor as I do not wish to see you fail in gaining the management rights to the city, it is a show of faith as I assume you will do a good job of managing it. Do not let me down younger brother. Rudra launched into a hug, Patricia was a lifesaver. With the One Night soldiers also helping him he was now much more confident in winning the competition. Hello again guys, this is the end of 50 chapters, please subscribe if you like my content.